Section 70 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. The Development of the Colonial Empire of Britain, 1739 to 1760. Part 1. When the unwilling Walpole was driven into war with Spain in 1739, by the clamors of the nation, he believed that he was about to become responsible for a very dangerous struggle, for he had private knowledge of the existence of the, quote, family compact, end quote, and knew that France was ready to back up Spain. England, on the other hand, was entirely without allies. Having gone to war in defense of her maritime commerce, a subject in which no other power felt any interest. As a matter of fact, however, the war was necessary and wise, for we were bound to come into collision with France and Spain sooner or later on the matter of trade. They could not endure to look upon the rapid expansion of England's commercial and colonial power, which had been increasing at a prodigious rate since the Peace of Utrecht. Our merchants were beginning to seize an ever-growing share of the trade of the world, and to oust the French, Dutch, Spanish, and Portuguese from all the more distant markets, especially those of Africa, India, and the remoter East. In India, the East India Company was making advances which exasperated its French rivals. In South America, the Spaniards felt that their ancient monopoly was gradually slipping from their hands. In North America, the prodigious growth in strength and population of our seaboard colonies threatened a speedy end to the French settlement in Canada. Since the acquisition of Nova Scotia and Newfoundland by the Treaty of Utrecht, the English dominions seemed to shut out from the sea the vast but sparsely populated tracts along the St. Lawrence, which still belonged to King Louis. In the West Indies, Jamaica and Barbados were gradually drawing away the wealth of the Spanish colonies of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Hispaniola, the old centers of the sugar and tobacco trade. The French and Spaniards, therefore, had good reason to fear and hate England, and if we wished to keep our control of the commerce of the world, we were bound to fight for it. It was a misfortune, however, that we were committed to the struggle while Walpole was still minister. Disliking the war, he would not throw himself heartily into it, grudge spending money, and refuse to undertake any serious operations. A few expeditions to Spanish America were all that he sent out. The first, under Admiral Vernon, though composed of no more than six ships of war, took Puerto Bello, one of the chief harbors of the Spanish main, 1739. But a second and much larger armament under the same leader failed disastrously before Cartagena, partly owing to mismanagement, partly to the marsh fever which struck down the English in their trenches, 1741. Walpole bore the discredit of his sluggish action and his failures. He was bitterly attacked in Parliament by all the Whigs whom he had been excluding from office for the last twenty years, and gradually saw the reins of power slipping from his hands. In time of war, all his bribery and jobbing could not avail to save him. His bought majority dwindled away, and early in 1742, he was defeated in the House of Commons and forced to resign. He retired into private life and died three years later, making no further show in politics. He was succeeded by a coalition of all the Whig factions under the nominal premiership of Lord Wilmington, the greatest non-entity in the whole cabinet. The real chiefs of the new ministry were Lord Carteret, an able diplomatist with a vast knowledge of European politics, and the two Pelhams, Thomas, Duke of Newcastle, and Henry, his younger brother. These two kinsmen were a pair of busy and ambitious mediocrities who stuck like limpets to office. They had been reared in Walpole's school, understood all his arts of management and corruption, and had served under him to the last, though for a year or more they had been quietly intriguing for his fall, in order that they might succeed to his power. 
The Carteret Pella ministry had to face a much larger problem in European politics than the mere struggle with Spain. During the last year, the whole continent had been set ablaze by the war of the Austrian succession. In 1740 died the Emperor Charles VI, the Archduke Charles, who had been a claimant for the Spanish throne in the days before the Peace of Utrecht. He was the last male of the House of Habsburg, and his death opened a question somewhat resembling that of the Spanish succession in 1702. Charles had determined that his broad dominions, the Austrian archduchies, the kingdoms of Hungary and Bohemia, the Austrian Netherlands, and the duchies of Milan and Parma in Italy, should pass in a body to his daughter Maria Theresa. He chose to ignore the fact that his own elder brother, Joseph I, had left two daughters, who on any principle of hereditary succession had a better claim to the Habsburg inheritance than their younger cousin. The elder princess Maria Amelia was the wife of Charles, the reigning elector of Bavaria. Charles VI spent the last twenty years of his life in arranging for his daughter's quiet succession. He drew up an instrument called the, quote, pragmatic sanction, end quote, by which she was recognized as his heiress and got it ratified by the estates of the various principalities of his realm. He also induced most of the powers of Europe at one time and another to guarantee this settlement. England, France, Spain, Prussia, and Russia had all been brought to assent to it by concessions of some sort. Only the elector of Bavaria, the prince whose rights were infringed by the pragmatic sanction, had consistently refused to accept any compensation for abandoning his wife's claims. But when Charles died in 1740, it was seen how little the promises of most of the European powers were worth. The accession to the Habsburg heritage of a young princess with a doubtful title was too great an opportunity to be lost by the greedy neighbors of Austria. When Charles of Bavaria laid claim to his uncle's dominions, and presented himself as a candidate for the imperial throne, he got prompt assistance from many quarters. The first to stir was Frederick II, the able and unscrupulous King of Prussia. Frederick had some ancient claims to certain parts of the Duchy of Silencia. He had also a devouring ambition and the best disciplined army in Europe, an army which his eccentric father Frederick Wilhelm had spent a whole lifetime in organizing. Without any formal declaration of war, Frederick II threw himself on Silencia and swept out of it the armies which Maria Theresa hastily sent against him, 1741. Then France and Spain threw in their lot with the Elector of Bavaria. Louis the Fifteenth had his eye on the conquest of the Austrian Netherlands, while the old Philip V wanted the duchies of Parma and Milan for his younger son. Thus beset by France, Spain, Prussia, and Bavaria, it seemed certain that Maria Theresa must succumb. Her rival Charles was chosen emperor by a majority of the electors, and it seemed as if the imperial scepter was about to pass from the House of Habsburg. The Austrian Netherlands, Silencia, Bohemia, and the Milanese were all invaded at once and the armies of Maria Theresa could not make head at so many points against the numerical superiority of their foes. The only ally to whom she could look for aid was England, who was already the open enemy of Spain, and who could not tolerate the conquest of the Netherlands by France. An appeal for aid to this quarter met with a ready response. George II was anxious to help the Queen of Hungary because he disliked his nephew, Frederick II, and did not wish to see a Bavarian emperor. Carteret, the leading spirit in the ministry, was even more eager for the fight. He was a far-sighted man who had realized the fact that England must inevitably come into collision with France from their rivalry in trade and colonization, and he therefore held that France's enemies were our friends. It was his wish to see England embark boldly in the strife and sent a large army to Germany to aid the Austrians. If France were involved in an exhausting continental war, he held that she would be unable at the same time to keep up a maritime struggle with England. Accordingly, 
The ministry promised the Austrians a large subsidy, took 16,000 Hanoverian troops into British pay, and sent all the available strength of the National Army to Germany. George II, who was burning for the fray, placed himself at the head of the Anglo-Hanoverian forces and moved rapidly down to the Mine to attack the flank of the French army, which was invading Austria. The fortunes of Maria Theresa now began to look more prosperous. Carteret got her to buy off the ablest of her assailants, the King of Prussia, by ceding him Silencia. When Frederick had withdrawn from the struggle, the French and Bavarians were driven back from Austria and retreated up the Danube. It was against their flank that George was operating in 1743, when his rather rash advance into the midst of foes, very superior in numbers, brought on the Battle of Dettingen, July 27, 1743. Finding that he was beset by forces nearly double the strength of his own 30,000 men, the king faced about to retire up the banks of the line. But the van of the French army of the Duc de Noailles outmarched him and threw itself across his path at the village of Dettingen, while the main body of the enemy was rapidly coming up on his flank. George hastily formed up his troops as they arrived and dashed forward to cut his way through, leading the advance in person. He was entirely successful, drove the French into the mine with great loss, and completely extricated himself from his difficulties. This was the last occasion on which a king of England has ever been under fire. Further successes followed the victory at Dettingen. The Austrians overran Bavaria, and the Emperor Charles was obliged to lay down his arms and ask for peace. Carteret, who had followed the king to Germany, called together a congress at Worms, at which the representatives of England, Holland, Sardinia, and Saxony guaranteed the pragmatic sanction and the integrity of the dominions of the House of Habsburg. Next spring, the Allies pledged themselves to invade France, and Carteret, in his moment of triumph, drank to the restoration of Alsace to Germany, a wish not to be fulfilled for another 127 years. But England and Austria were still far from their goal. The attack on France had to be postponed because the unscrupulous Frederick of Prussia renewed the war in the north and fell upon the rear of the Austrians. They withdrew great bodies of troops to face him and were left comparatively weak on their western front. Not long afterwards, Carteret, the soul of the Continental War, lost his place at the head of the ministry. His jealous colleagues, the two Pelhams, were anxious to get rid of him and took a mean advantage of his long absences in Germany. They allowed him to be attacked as favoring a Hanoverian, not an English policy, and as consulting the wishes of the king rather than those of the parliament. Carteret was violently assailed by a young politician named William Pitt, whose cry was always that France should be assailed at sea and in her colonies, not on her continental frontiers. The Pelhams would not defend him, and suffered him to be loaded with many ungrounded accusations. The opposition called his ministry, quote, the drunken administration, end quote because he was somewhat flighty in his demeanor and was known to love his bottle of port over well. They accused him of lavishing on German allies money that should have gone to our own fleet and raised such a storm of words against him that the Pelhams had their excuse for throwing him over, a feat which they accomplished at the end of 1744 to the great detriment of England. William Pitt, when a minister himself in later years, confessed that he had discovered in the course of time that Carteret's plans were excellent, and that he had himself put them into practice with success, after having so often denounced them as ruinous and reckless. The Pelhams thus became supreme in the conduct of affairs, and stuck to office as closely as their master Walpole. Henry, the younger of the two, quote, a fretful, suspicious, industrious mediocrity, end quote, was Prime Minister till he died in 1754. His elder brother, the Duke, then succeeded him, and kept his feeble hand on the helm of state till he lost office in 1756. English policy under these two narrow and shifty borough mongers soon lost the vigor that the guidance of Carteret had imparted to it. 
The war with France continued, but no longer with the same success as before. In the spring of 1745, the armies of Louis the Fifteenth, under the able Maurice of Saxony, the Maréchal de Saxe, as the French called him, fell upon the Austrian Netherlands. Maria Theresa had so few troops in this quarter that the defense of the Belgian provinces fell entirely upon the English and Dutch. The Allied armies did not act together with much success, and the Dutch general, the Count of Valdec, quarreled with his colleague, George, Duke of Cumberland, the younger son of George the Second. It was this want of cooperation which led to the loss of the bloody battle of Fontenoy, May eleventh, seventeen forty five. The French army was besieging Tournay when Valdeck and Cumberland came up to relieve it and found the enemy drawn up along a line of wood strengthened with redoubts on their flanks, a position much like the neighboring field of Mount Plaquet, where Marlborough had won his last fight thirty-six years before. While Valdeck skirmished feebly with the French wings, the stubborn and reckless young duke pushed into the center of the hostile army with a solid column of English and Hanoverian infantry, he broke through two lines of the French, and cut their host in twain, but failed for want of support on the flanks. He was encompassed by the French reserves, and forced back with fearful loss to his old position, but the enemy were too maltreated to molest him further. End of Section 70、section、71 of A History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. The Development of the Colonial Empire of Britain, 1739 to 1760. Part 2. The campaign of 1745 was still undecided when the greater part of the English army was suddenly called home to face a new and unexpected danger. The ministers of Louis the Fifteenth had determined to try the effect of stirring up a Jacobite rebellion, hoping to distract the strength of England, even if the House of Hanover could not be overthrown. James Stuart, the, quote, old pretender, end quote, was now elderly and had always been apathetic, but his son Charles Edward Stuart was a young prince of a very different character. Reckless, adventurous, and light-hearted, he was the very man to lead a desperate venture. The French gathered an army of fifteen thousand men at Dunkirk, and promised to put it at his disposal if he would invade Scotland. But a storm scattered the transports, and the troops were ultimately drawn off to the war in Flanders. Nevertheless, Charles Edward resolved to persevere, and, on hearing of the flight of Fontenoy, slipped off on a small privateer and landed at Invernessshire with no more than seven companions, quote, the seven men of Moidart, end quote, as the Jacobites called them. His arrival was quite unexpected, and he had nothing more to rely upon than the traditional attachment of the Highlanders to the House of Stuart. The chiefs of the West were dismayed at the recklessness of the venture, and it was with difficulty that the enthusiasm and personal charm of the young prince induced them to take arms. At first only a few hundreds of the Camerons and Macdonalds joined him, but the absolute imbecility displayed by the English government encouraged him more and more to make the venture. The Marquis of Tullibardine, an exile since 1715, roused the Perthshire clans, and the insurrection spread to south and east. The Pelham cabinet only got news of the prince's coming three weeks after his landing in Mordart. They were in no small degree alarmed, for well nigh the whole army was over sea in Flanders, and no one knew how far disaffection might have extended in England and the Scottish lowlands. The only troops in the north were four battalions of foot, and two newly raised regiments of dragoons. The small army of three thousand men was entrusted to Sir John Cope, one of the incompetent men whom the Pelhams loved to employ because they were pliant and docile. Cope hurried north, hoping to relieve the two isolated military posts of Fort William and Fort Augustus, the sole garrisons of the West Highlands. 
but finding the insurgents in possession of the pass at Cori, Iraq, over which his road ran, he swerved eastward to execute a long circular march by way of Inverness. Thus, he was no longer placed between the enemy and the lowlands, and left the way to Edinburgh open. The prince's generalship was always bold even to recklessness. The moment that Cope had passed north of him, he dashed down into Perthshire and struck at the capital of Scotland. He met with no resistance till he was quite close to Edinburgh, when six hundred dragoons, the only force left in the lowlands, fled before him at the skirmish of Colt Brig. The Scots of the south, Whigs and Presbyterians though they were, showed an extraordinary apathy. They did not join the prince, but they refused to take arms for King George. The militia of Edinburgh, whom the half-hearted magistrates had called to arms, dispersed when the Highlanders appeared at their gates. Thus Prince Charles was able to seize the city, to proclaim his father king at the market cross, and to hold his court in Holyrood. Soon, however, he had to fight to preserve his conquest. Cope, on hearing that the Highland army had passed southward, had hurried to the coast and taken ship with his men, hoping to reach Edinburgh before the prince. But on landing at Dunbar, he found that he was three days late, and that he must fight if he wished to recapture the city. Advancing to Preston Pans, he camped there in a strong position covered by a marsh. But the Highland army crossed the difficult ground in the dusk of dawn, and fell upon him in the early morning. Cope threw his men into line, and waited to be attacked. The result was a disgraceful rout. The wild rush of the clansmen carried all before it. The bayonets of the regulars proved no match for Target and Claymore, and the dragoons on the flanks fled in wild panic. Cope left the field among the first, and brought the news of his own defeat to Dunbar, September 21st, 1745. The news of the fall of Edinburgh and the Battle of Preston Pans came like a thunderclap to the English government. There was hardly a soldier in the land, save the royal guards in London, the militia had not been called out, and the temper of the people was unknown. The imbecile Pelhams were at their wits' end, and it is said that Newcastle even made secret overtures to the pretender. If Charles Edward could have marched forward the morning after his victory, there is no knowing where his success would have ended. But the prince halted for five weeks, to allow the Highlanders to stow away their plunder, and to raise and arm new levies. This delay was fatal to him. It gave the ministry time to summon over the English troops from Flanders, and to call out the militia, a numerous, if not a very serviceable, body. When Charles Edward moved forward again on November 3rd, his chance was already gone. Marshal Wade lay at Newcastle with 10,000 veterans. The Duke of Cumberland, with the rest of the army of Flanders, was ten days behind him. The guards and militia of the southern counties lay on Finchley Common to protect London. The prince, ignorant of the fact that Jacobitism had almost disappeared in England during Walpole's peaceful rule, imagined that Wales and the North would rise in his favor, if only he were to show himself beyond the Tweed with an army at his back. Leaving four thousand men to garrison Scotland, he crossed the border with six thousand picked clansmen, routed the Cumbrian militia at Carlisle, and pushed rapidly southward into Lancashire. Before he had been ten days in England, he saw that he had been deceived as to the temper of the country. Hardly a man joined him. Not two hundred recruits were found for him in the Tory county of Lancaster, which had put two thousand men in the field in the old days of, quote, the fifteen, end quote. Hoping against hope, the prince pushed on still further, skillfully eluding the armies of Wade and Cumberland, who tried in vain to enclose him between them. But the Highlanders began to melt away from him, to drive home the cattle they had lifted, and the Jacobite chiefs were dismayed at the utter apathy of the English Tories. By the time that Derby was reached, the rebel army had dwindled down to three thousand men, and it seemed likely that if Charles Edward persisted in advancing, he would arrive at London alone. 
Overborne by the arguments of his followers, he gave the order to retreat, December 6th, 1745. He was ignorant of the effect that his advance had caused in the South. Panic prevailed in London, and on the, quote, Black Friday, end quote, when the news of his arrival at Derby arrived, the timid ministers had been preparing for the worst. The king's plate had been sent on shipboard, the Bank of England had paid away every guinea in its reserve, and the militia at Finchley were fully persuaded that they were to be attacked on the next day by ten thousand wild clansmen. The Highland army slipped back to Scotland with little difficulty, evading both Wade and Cumberland, whose heavy regiments could make no speed over the snowy December roads. On recrossing the border, Charles called up his reserves, and was soon at the head of ten thousand men. He trusted to maintain his hold on Scotland, even if England was unassailable. When the royal troops advanced, he inflicted a smart check on their vanguard at the Battle of Falkirk, January 17th, 1746. But the English came pouring northward in numbers, which he could not hope to resist. The fiery Duke of Cumberland had more than 30,000 men on the march by the spring of the new year, and fresh levies were forming behind him. The Jacobite leaders saw that the day was lost, though hitherto all the fighting had been in their favor. Their undisciplined bands began to disperse once more, and the prince must have known that, unless the French came to his aid, the ruin of his cause was at hand. He was constrained to retire northward, first to Perth, then to Inverness, with an ever-dwindling host. Cumberland pushed on in his rear with eight thousand picked men, resolved to revenge the disgraceful days of Preston Pans in Falkirk. The rest of the English army followed at leisure. Charles Edward would not yield without one final blow. With the five thousand men who still followed his standard, he marched out from Inverness, and attacked the Duke on Culloden Moor, April 16th, 1746. Cumberland was ready for the fight. He had warned his troops to receive the Highland Rush as if it were a cavalry charge, doubling the files and presenting a triple line of bayonets by making the front ranks kneel, while the cannon were placed at intervals between the regiments. The clansmen charged with their usual fury, but were staggered by the artillery fire, and almost blown to pieces by the triple volley of three ranks of infantry delivered at a distance of only fifty paces. The survivors straggled up only to perish on the bayonets. The prince's left wing, where the MacDonald clan had held back on a foolish point of tribal jealousy, was still intact, but when the English cavalry advanced, Charles saw that the day was lost, and bade his followers disperse. Cumberland tarnished the glory of his victory by the savage cruelty which he displayed. He gave no quarter, shot two hundred prisoners in cold blood, and burnt every dwelling in the glens of the rebel clans. A price of thirty thousand pounds was put upon the head of Charles Edwards, who lurked for five months in the West Highlands before he could find a ship to take him to France. He passed through countless perils in safety, and found no man among his unfortunate followers mean enough to betray him in the day of adversity. The story of his romantic escaped sky in the disguise of the maidservant of Flora MacDonald is well known to all. After this gallant, if reckless, expedition, Charles Edward never appeared again in English politics. He did not at first despair of striking another blow, and in 1750 paid a secret visit to Britain to see if a second insurrection were possible. But in England the Jacobites were almost extinct, while in Scotland they had been so sorely crushed that they had no power to stir again. The prince had to return, having accomplished nothing. Hope long deferred makes the heart sick, and in middle life Charles Edward grew apathetic, took to drinking, and became only the wreck of his old self. When his father died in 1765, he proclaimed himself king as Charles III, but never made another attempt to disturb the peace of England down to his death in 1788. With his brother Henry, a cardinal of the Roman Church, 
the male line of the Stuarts expired in 1807. The English government dealt very hardly with the insurgents of 1745 to 1746. Three Scottish peers, the Lords Kilmarnock, Balmerino, and Lovett, were beheaded, as was Colonel Townley, the only Englishman of rank who had joined the prince. Many scores of men of less note were hanged or shot. A series of bills was passed in Parliament for weakening the clans and sapping their loyalty to their chiefs. One forbade the wearing of the highland dress with its tribal tartans. Another abolished the feudal jurisdiction, which gave the chiefs power over their followers. Another made the possession of arms a penal offense. Good roads were pushed up into the remoter valleys, and an attempt was made to get rid of the Gaelic language by making English compulsory in schools. A few years later, William Pitt took the wise step of endeavoring to turn the restless military energy of the Highlanders into patriotic channels, and raised several of the kilted regiments which have since distinguished themselves on so many British battlefields. By the end of the century, the Highlands were as quiet as any English shire, and Jacobitism had faded away into a romantic sentiment. End of section 71section seventy two of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a history of england by charles oman the development of the colonial empire of britain seventeen thirty nine to seventeen sixty part three the war with France and Spain dragged on for three years more, under very indifferent management on both sides. The withdrawal of the English army from Flanders in 1745 had given the French an advantage in the Netherlands, from which they had greatly profited. They had overrun the whole of the Austrian provinces, and in 1746 threatened the frontier of Holland. Cumberland and his army were recalled, after the suppression of the Scottish Rising, to check the advance of the Maréchal de Saxe. But the Duke suffered at Lawfeld, in front of Maastricht, a defeat of much the same character as that of Fontenoy, July 2nd, 1747. Nevertheless, the French in the following winter consented to treat for peace. They had fared badly along their frontier on the Rhine and in Italy, and looked upon their successes in Belgium as only sufficient to entitle them to ask for a mutual restitution of all conquests. Moreover, their maritime trade had been completely ruined by the war, and several of their colonies had fallen into English hands. Hence came the Treaty of Aachen, Aix-la-Chapelle, signed in the spring of 1748, to which all the powers who had been engaged in the war of the Austrian succession gave their assent. Maria Theresa had finally to acquiesce in the loss of Silesia to the king of Prussia, and to make smaller territorial concessions in Italy to Spain and Sardinia, giving Parma to one, and a long slip of the Duchy of Milan to the other. The remainder of her vast dominions she maintained intact, while her husband, Francis of Lorraine, was acknowledged by all parties as emperor in succession to the unfortunate Charles of Bavaria, who had died in 1745. England, France, and Spain restored to each other all that each had taken, no very considerable amount, and left the great question of their colonial and commercial rivalry quite unsettled. Another and a greater war was required to decide it. The results of the fighting beyond the seas between 1739 and 1748 had not been very important. We have already mentioned how the English had failed at Cartagena in 1741. On the other hand, they had captured the French island of Cape Breton off the mouth of the St. Lawrence in 1744 and had maintained with success a desultory struggle with the enemy along the inland frontier of Canada. One hazardous expedition against the Pacific ports of Spanish America had been carried to a brilliant end by Commodore Anson, 
who followed in the steps of Drake by capturing the great Acapulco galleon with the yearly hoard of the mines of Mexico on board. 1743. Like Drake, too, Anson returned to Europe by the Cape route and brought his ship, the Centurion, back to Spithead in 1744, thus completing the circumnavigation of the world in three years. While these comparatively unimportant events had been happening on the American side of the globe, the first war waged between England and France in India had been giving promise of more serious results. Down to the commencement of the 18th century, the great empire of the Mughals had dominated Hindustan, and the traders of the English and French East India companies had been no more than visitors to the coast, allowed to build factories at convenient ports by the bounty of the great Mughal. But in 1707 had died Zeb, the last powerful monarch of that house, and since his death, the vast Mohammedan empire which his ancestors had built up was falling rapidly to pieces. Everywhere the Mughal viceroys, or, quote, Nawabs, end quote, were making themselves independent of their imperial master at Delhi. The native tribes of India also, more especially the brave Marathas of the western Deccan, had been throwing off the Mussulman yoke and starting on a career of conquest. The European settlers in the ports of southern India profited immensely by this relaxation of the central control which the Mughal government had been wont to exercise, and assumed a much less deferential tone when dealing with the revolted Nawabs who now ruled in the Carnatic, Bengal, and the Deccan. It was first during the War of the Austrian Succession that the English and French ventured to engage in hostilities with each other without paying attention to the native powers, whose sovereign rights they were thereby impugning. The factories of the two powers were scattered along the Coromandel coast in curious alternation, and it was here that the struggle took place. The English were based on their chief settlement at Madras, the French on their stronghold at Pondicherry. Four years of fighting gave a decided superiority to the French, who were headed by Duplex, a man of great energy and far-reaching views. He was the first to discover the part that might be played in Indian politics by native troops officered and drilled by Europeans. These sepoys, sipahis is the more correct form, had originally been small armed guards employed by the governors of the factories. Duplex discovered from a chance encounter at Saint Thomas, 1746, that a small body of these disciplined mercenaries could defeat whole hordes of native cavalry and used his discovery with skill and promptitude. Raising large numbers of sepoys, he built up the first regular army that had been seen in India. In his struggle with the English, he was very successful. Madras and almost all the other English factories fell into his hands, and it looked as if the French were to be the sole power in southern Hindustan. The complete triumph of Duplex was only prevented by his quarrels with his colleague La Bourdonnais the governor of the Mauritius, who had come to his aid at the head of a fleet. They were both energetic and arbitrary, refused to fall in with each other's plans, and so failed to completely expel the English from the Coromandel coast. The other settlements of the East India Company, the island port of Bombay, the old dowry of Catherine of Portugal, and the factory of Fort William at Calcutta in Bengal, were not molested. To the intense disgust of Duplex, the Treaty of Aachen stipulated the mutual restoration of conquests, and the English settlements were all given back in 1748. In India, as in America, all was left unsettled, and the struggle for supremacy had to be deferred for a space. Eight years of uneasy peace followed the indecisive and vague Treaty of Aachen, 1748 to 1756. England, under the feeble rule of the two Pelhams, 
seemed to have sunk back into the same condition of prosperous lethargy which had been her lot in the uneventful days of Walpole. In her political history, there is nothing of moment to relate. The Pelhams had almost silenced opposition by the simple expedient of finding places in the cabinet or the public service for any one who might have made himself dangerous to them. Even the eloquent and energetic William Pitt, the consistent denouncer of all ministers, had been quieted for a time by the gift of the lucrative post of paymaster of the forces. Room was found for so many and diverse persons in the Pelham cabinet that it was known as the, quote, broad bottom administration, end quote. The Pelhams, though using the old Whig catchwords about liberty and reform, were, like Walpole, only anxious to keep things quiet and to preserve themselves in office. Hence, there is little or nothing to record of their doings. We may mention, however, the creation of our celebrated Three Percents by Henry Pelham, who was somewhat of a financier, his sole accomplishment. The national debt, then a sum of seventy-eight million pounds, was paying four percent at the time of the Treaty of Aachen. The Premier, seeing that the public credit was good and money cheap, resolved to reduce the rate of interest. This he accomplished by borrowing money at 3% to pay off all those national creditors who would not accept the new scale. The conversion was accomplished with ease and relieved the revenue of some £500,000 a year of expenses. The debt, thus reduced and simplified, received its new name of, quote, consuls, end quote, all the old loans having been consolidated into one. 1750. A word may also be given to the reform of the calendar in 1752. England up to this time had used the, quote, old style, end quote, or Julian calendar, invented by Julius Caesar 18 centuries before. A slight error in the calculation of the great Roman had made the year too short, and in the lapse of the ages this error had grown by accumulation into as much as eleven days. England, later than most nations, adopted the Reformed, or Gregorian calendar, named after Pope Gregory the Thirteenth, during the Pelham administration. Thus, the change being made on September 2nd, 1752, the day that followed became the 14th instead of the 3rd. This bewildered the multitude, and was made a serious charge against the minister by many ignorant folks, who complained that they had been defrauded of eleven days of their lives. In such comparatively trifling events, the middle years of the eighteenth century passed away. The stagnant times of the old Whig oligarchy were drawing towards their close, and the movements which were to stir England so deeply in the next generation were beginning to develop. We have already spoken of the increasing commercial supremacy of England in the period. This growth in foreign trade was now beginning to be supplemented by an increased activity in manufacturing industry, which was to be the distinguishing mark of the second half of the century. But the first signs of it were already apparent before 1750. The earliest attempt for the improvement of the inland communications of the kingdom may be traced to 1720, when the Irwell Canal was opened to Manchester. As important a landmark is the discovery of the process of smelting iron by means of coal in 1740. Up to this time, iron had always been worked with charcoal, and the manufacture of it had been almost confined to the wooded districts of southern England most especially to the Sussex Weald. But the new process opened up the Yorkshire iron mines, which were to completely supersede those of the south, for in the north iron and coal are found together in most convenient proximity. All this development, however, belongs to the times of George the Third rather than those of George the Second. Even more important in the history of the social life of England than the expansion of her commercial resources 
was another change which began about the middle of the 18th century in the sphere of spiritual things. The Whig supremacy in the state, which had begun in 1714, had the most deplorable results on the church. Walpole and his disciples were men quite out of sympathy with any religious impulse. Their lives and morals would not bear looking into, and they openly scoffed at religion. To them, the church was simply a field of patronage for friends and dependents, and a machine for supplementing the working of the state. Down to the time of Anne's death, the Tory party had been supreme within the bounds of the establishment, and the Whigs, therefore, viewed the whole body of the clergy with suspicion. They stopped in 1717 the meetings of convocation which had existed from time immemorial, wishing to prevent the clerical body from finding a mouthpiece. They systematically officered the church with Whig bishops, of whom nothing was asked but political orthodoxy. As was likely, the men chosen on this principle were often most unfit pastors of the church. A Walpole or a Pelham was not likely to select men whose characteristics were fervor or enthusiasm. The Whig bishops were generally of two classes. Either they were prominent political clergy, court chaplains and the like, who laid themselves out to win preferment by their sermons, or they were, quote, Greek play bishops, end quote, to use an expressive phrase, mere scholars whose title to promotion was to have edited a classic author or ruled a public school. Both classes were, as a rule, very inefficient. Many were scandalous non-residents, and seldom went near their diocese, dwelling in London all the year round and haunting the court. Remote sees like Bangor or Carlisle hardly knew the face of their bishops. Some of these prelates were more notable for their political than their religious orthodoxy. Of these, quote, latitudinarian, end quote, bishops, perhaps the best known as Hoadley, whom the Whigs promoted to four sees, one after the other, in spite of the fact that his views on the Trinity were hardly consistent with his position as a member of the Church. It was not to be expected that such prelates would be in touch with their subordinates, the country clergy, who still for the most part remained Tory in their views, looked on the least measure for the political emancipation of dissenters or Romanists with horror, and nourished a strong personal dislike for the first two Georges and their ministers. Hence came such a breach in the unity and organization of the church as had never been seen before. The upper clergy were careless and unspiritual. The lower clergy grew lethargic and apathetic under the neglect of their superiors. There was a general tendency to praise common sense and morality, and to sneer at theological learning or evangelical fervor. This general deadness in the church could not long continue without causing a reaction. The great feature in the second quarter of the 18th century was the appearance of the, quote, Methodist, end quote, movement of which John Wesley was the originator. Shocked by the want of energy and enthusiasm among the clergy, Wesley, a fellow of Lincoln College, Oxford, devoted himself to active evangelical work, and especially to public preaching. He is first heard of as preaching to the poor of neglected Oxford parishes, and to the prisoners in the jail, 1729. A few years later, he went out as a missionary to America, and labored in the backwoods of Georgia. Returning in 1738, he resumed his work in England, passing from place to place, and addressing large congregations of all sorts in conditions of men. His fervent eloquence and enthusiasm came as a revelation to the neglected masses of the cities, or to congregations condemned to many years of sermons on dry morality. He spoke of sin and conversion with an earnestness which had not been seen since the days of early Puritan enthusiasm. Wesley and the numerous followers who sprang up to join him might have inspired the church with a new spirit of fervor if they had but been permitted to do so. 
But unfortunately, the latitudinarian bishops disliked his emotional harangues and his clear-cut dogma, and the parish clergy often treated him as an intruder when he appeared inside their cures. Hence, though a strong churchman at first, he was gradually driven into schism and became the founder of a new nonconformist sect instead of the restorer of the spirituality of the church from within. Towards the end of his sixty years of labor, 1729 to 1791, he took the final step of ordaining preachers and allowing them to celebrate the sacraments, thus committing his followers to abandoning the national church. His work, however, was not without its effect inside the Church of England. Many who sympathized with him remained churchmen, and from them came the evangelical, or newer, low-church party within the establishment. From Wesley and his contemporaries began a decided improvement in the moral life of England. After remaining at its lowest ebb in the eighty years that followed the Restoration, it began to mend about the middle of the century. The change is marked in all the most characteristic spheres of action by an increased humanity to prisoners, paupers, and slaves, an improved tone in literature and the drama, and a growing demand for the observation of a higher standard of morals by public men. Political corruption and ostentatious ill-living, which had been the rule in the beginning of the 18th century, had become the exception at its end. But if England was more serious and more moral by the end of the century, no small share in that result must be attributed to the sobering effect of three long and desperate wars, which more than once seemed about to be the ruin of the realm. Between 1756 and 1815, there were to be 36 years of war to 23 of peace, and two whole generations were bred up in times of stress and trouble, which developed the sterner virtues and taught men no longer to sneer at fervor, whether displayed in patriotism or in religion. The Seven Years' War, into which England was plunged in 1756, while still under the imbecile guidance of the elder Pelham, was the most important struggle in which she had engaged since the days of the Spanish Armada. It definitely settled all the points which had been left undetermined by the Peace of Aachen, and gave her the empire of the seas, and the lion's share of the commerce of the world. Her hold on these gains was to be shaken in later wars, but never lost. The Seven Years' War, like the War of the Austrian Succession, had two sides, the colonial and the European. In 1756, as in 1742, England, while contending for her own objects beyond seas, was also subsidizing a powerful continental ally who had his own interests to serve in order to distract the attention of France from the more distant struggle. The new war resembled the old in another respect. In each case it was the colonial quarrel which first came to the front. The European strife was a later development. The causes which provoked the Seven Year War were to be found both in America and in India. In both of these quarters, the representatives of England and of France came to blows before the mother countries had resolved on war. The quarrel was the result of natural causes which made it inevitable and not the deliberate work of the timid Newcastle or the selfish Louis the Fifteenth. It was in India that the first hostilities broke out, not very long after the Peace of Aachen had been signed. We have already mentioned how the French governor, Duplex, had raised an army of sepoys, and resolved to employ it for the furtherance of French interests in southern India. He was enabled to do this by the fact that a war of succession had broken out in each of the two great native states which were neighbors to the European settlements on the Coromandel coast. In the Deccan, two princes of the Nizam family, an uncle and a nephew, were disputing for the throne of Hyderabad. In the Carnatic, a rebellious minister was trying to usurp his master's throne. 
Duplex resolved to sell the aid of his army to one pretender for use against the other. The appearance of his disciplined battalions on the field settled the fortune of war at once. He gained for his ally Mozufer Jung the whole of the Hyderabad dominions. Then he turned against the Carnatic, slew the old Nawab in battle, and drove his son, Muhammad Ali, into Trichinopoly, his last stronghold. The rebel minister, Chunda Sahib, was then saluted as ruler of the land. The two new Nawabs soon became the mere creatures of Duplex, whose military strength completely overawed their motley armies. They lavished millions of rupees upon him, and Mozufer Jung gave him the title of Supreme Vizier of all of India, south of the river Krishna, and appointed him permanent chief of his army. Duplex was in truth master of southern India, a fact viewed with dismay by the English settlers along the Coromandel coast. They had, in rivalry with him, espoused the cause of the two Nawabs whom he had crushed. One of these princes was now dead, the other besieged in his last stronghold. The rulers of Madras despaired, but a single bold spirit persuaded them to venture a blow against the power of the Frenchmen. Robert Clive, the scapegrace son of a Shropshire squire, had been sent out to Madras as a clerk in the East India Company's service to keep him out of mischief. But he changed his pen for the sword and became a captain in the company's army. Now he persuaded Governor Saunders to entrust him with a few hundred men to make a diversion in favor of the besieged Nawab, Muhammad Ali. To draw away the army which was beleaguering Trichinopoly, Clive resolved to strike at the capital of the Carnatic, the town of Arcot. Marching by night and with great speed, he seized the place and fortified himself in its citadel. He was at once attacked by the forces of the Chunda Sahib, aided by a division of the army of Duplex. But he contrived to inspire his five hundred men with such obstinate courage that they repulsed all the assaults of ten thousand enemies and finally compelled the Nawab's army to withdraw foiled. 1751 after thus winning Arcot, Clive was entrusted by the Madras Council with all their disposable troops, two hundred Europeans and seven hundred English sepoys. With these reinforcements he took the field against Duplex and Chunda Sahib, routed a number of French detachments, and finally recovered the whole of the Carnatic for Muhammad Ali, the protege of the English. Chunda Sahib surrendered to his enemy, who had him murdered, Duplex played a losing game against his great arrival for two more years, and was finally recalled in disgrace by the French government, 1754. Thus the English carried out the lesson which the great Frenchmen had taught them, that India might be conquered with Indian arms, and that its princes might be made the vassals of the mere traders who had paid them humble tribute a few years before. With the establishment of the English suzerainty over the Nawab Muhammad Ali and his realm of the Carnatic, begins the English Empire in Hindustan. Clive and Duplex had posed as the mere auxiliaries of the Nawabs, and their struggle was not supposed to commit the mother country to war. But a less disguised form of hostilities between England and France commenced somewhat later in America. Its cause was the want of any definite boundary between the settlements of the two nations. It was the ambition of the English colonists to push westward from Pennsylvania and Virginia and gradually to colonize all the wastelands, sparsely inhabited by savage Indian tribes, which lay between them and the Mississippi. But the French had another and a no less ambitious scheme. Besides their dominions in Canada, they possessed another colony at the mouth of the Mississippi, round the town of New Orleans. They claimed that this territory of Louisiana stretched up to the headwaters of the Great River, and it was their object to connect it with Canada by a string of forts placed along the Mississippi and its tributary, the Ohio. 
If they could have carried out this gigantic and wide-stretching plan, they would have shut in the English colonies between the Allegheny Mountains and the sea, and prevented them from extending into the interior of the continent. The weak point of the plan was that the French were far too few in numbers to execute any such project. Though they counted among them many hardy backwoodsmen and fur traders, who had explored all the waterways of the West, they could not back these pioneers up with solid masses of population. There were not more than 180,000 French emigrants in America, while the English colonies boasted at this time nearly two million sturdy settlers. In spite of this disparity of numbers, the French governors were set on executing their venturous scheme. It was their active advance into the wilderness that lay between Canada and the English colonies that brought about the first collisions with the English outposts. The three northern links of the chain that was to join Canada with Louisiana were Fort Ticonderoga at the south end of Lake Champlain, Fort Niagara near the Great Falls between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and Fort Duquesne at the headwaters of the Ohio. The first and last of these were a very few miles from the English back settlements, and their establishment in 1754 to 1755 was looked upon as a direct challenge by the inhabitants of Pennsylvania and Virginia. In 1754, a party of Virginian militia, headed by Major George Washington, of whom we shall hear much later on, made a dash on Fort Duquesne. But they were beaten and forced to surrender after a fight at Great Meadows. This provoked the colonies, and at their request, General Braddock repeated the attack in the next year with a force of 2,200 men, part of whom were British regulars. But he was drawn into an ambuscade by a very inferior force of French and Indians. His force was disgracefully routed, and he himself was slain. The fighting at once began to spread, and both England and France sent out reinforcements to America. Yet, the two nations were still nominally at peace, and the French, who were just about to engage in a great war in Germany, were not anxious to commence hostilities with England at this particular moment. Newcastle, however, precipitated the outbreak of the struggle by a characteristic half-measure. He sent out Admiral Boscawen with orders not to attack all French ships, but to intercept a particular squadron carrying troops to Canada. Boscawin met it and took two vessels after a fight. This made war inevitable. It broke out in the spring of 1756 and opened with a series of disasters for England, a fact which causes no surprise when we remember her forces were under the direction of the imbecile Newcastle. End of section 72《Section 73 of A History of England》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman The Development of the Colonial Empire of Britain 1739 to 1760 Part 4 just at the same moment, another struggle was commencing on the continent. The Empress Maria Theresa had never forgiven the King of Prussia for robbing her of Silesia in the hour of her distress, fourteen years before. She had devoted much time and trouble to forming a great coalition for the purpose of punishing the plunderer, and had secretly enlisted in her alliance France, Russia, Sweden, Saxony, and most of the smaller German states. For the unscrupulous and rapacious Frederick was not viewed with love by his neighbors, and it was easy to combine them against him. His venomous pen had made enemies of two vindictive women, Elizabeth, Empress of Russia, and Madame de Pompadour, the all-powerful mistress of Louis the Fifteenth. And though political expediency did not prescribe war with Prussia to either Russia or France, yet personal resentment 
brought it about. The open war between England and France had broken out in the spring of 1756. In the autumn of the same year, the continental struggle began. Getting secret intelligence of the plot that was maturing against him, Frederick resolved to strike before his numerous adversaries were ready and invaded Saxony. He overran the whole electorate and annihilated the Saxon army in a fortnight. But Austria, Russia, Sweden, and France immediately fell upon him, and he had much ado to avoid being crushed by brute force of numbers, for Prussia was but a small state of five million souls, while the Confederacy ranged against her counted half Europe in its ranks. Alone among a host of foes, Frederick was desperately in need of an ally, and only one ally was possible, England. For both England and Prussia were now at war with France, and it was obvious that they ought to aid each other against their common foe. Moreover, the English government was itself sadly in need of assistance, for the war had opened with a series of disasters in more than one quarter of the world. The most serious loss had been suffered in the Mediterranean. A French fleet and army under the Duc de Richelieu had slipped out of Toulon and fallen on Menorca, the Spanish island which had formed part of England's plunder at the Peace of Utrecht. The English garrison was weak, for it had always been supposed that we were strong enough at sea to prevent the enemy from approaching this important possession, which was to us then what Malta is now. But when the Mediterranean fleet, under Admiral Byng, came up to relieve the troops beleaguered in the citadel of Port Mahon, a disgraceful sight was seen. The English admiral, finding that the French squadron was slightly superior to his own, refused to fight, and fled away to Gibraltar, though his second-in-command urged him hotly to risk everything in order to save the island. The deserted garrison held out a month longer, and then was forced to surrender. June 1756 nor was this the only disaster with which the Seven Years' War opened. Montcalm, the French commander in Canada, made a dash against the frontier garrisons of the British colonists in America, and took Forts Oswego and William Henry, our outposts on the northwest. Still more shocking news was on its way home from India. The Nawab of Bengal, a cruel and debauched tyrant named Siraj Ud Dawla had picked a quarrel with the governor of Calcutta, the English factory near the mouth of the Ganges. Suddenly declaring war in June 1756, the same month that Menorca was lost, he captured Calcutta with ease. In his hour of triumph, he bade his guards thrust all his captives into the, quote, black hole, end quote, a small dungeon not much more than twenty feet square, which had been wont to serve as the prison of the factory. No less than 146 persons, merchants, officials, soldiers, and women, were driven into this confined space, and locked in for the night. They were tightly wedged together, had no air save from two narrow barred windows, and could not move. In the stifling heat of a Bengal June, nearly the whole of them perished of suffocation. Only twenty-three, one of whom was a woman, were found alive the next morning. The horrors of the black hole were soon to be revenged, but long ere the news of the punishment which Clive wreaked upon the Nawab came home, the Newcastle ministry had been driven from office. The popular outcry at the mismanagement of the war, and above all the loss of Menorca, had been too great for the feeble Newcastle to withstand. It was in vain that he arrested Bing and promised to try him for cowardice. 
For Bing could not be made the scapegoat for disasters in America or India and the universal indignation against Newcastle's administration of the war forced him to resign in November 1756. Shortly after, the admiral was tried by court-martial, condemned, and shot for disobedience to orders and for criminal feebleness, though he was acquitted of any treasonable intent or personal cowardice. His death served, as Voltaire remarked at the time, quote, pour encourager les autres, end quote. And English admirals since then have never shirked an engagement with an enemy of only slightly superior force. The king summoned the opposition Whigs to form a cabinet, and William Pitt and the Duke of Devonshire took office. Pitt as we have already had occasion to remark, was the fighting man of the Whig party and the advocate of a vigorous colonial and commercial policy. He was the one statesman of the day who commanded the confidence of the nation because he was the only one whose reputation was entirely free from the stain of political corruption. He was an able, eloquent man whose scathing denunciations of the errors and feebleness of the late ministry were convincing to all who heard them. It remained to be seen if his own administration would prove more successful. At first, however, it seemed likely that Pitt would have small opportunity of trying his hand at the helm. Though he was trusted by the nation, he was not trusted by the House of Commons. Newcastle set himself to overthrow his successor by bidding his hirelings in the lower house to vote consistently against the new ministers. Moreover, King George disliked Pitt for his vehemence and his pompous language. Hence came a vexatious crisis in April 1757 when Pitt found himself in a minority in the House of Commons and was dismissed from office by the king. But the public outcry against the proposed resumption of office by Newcastle was so loud that a curious and not very satisfactory compromise was arranged. The Duke offered to take Pitt as his colleague and to give him a free hand in the management of the war and all foreign policy if he himself were permitted to retain the direction of domestic affairs. Pitt believed himself to be necessary to his country. He thought that he could bring the war to a successful conclusion, and that no one else could do so. Hence, though he was thoroughly acquainted with the mean and intriguing spirit of the Duke, he took his offer. Newcastle wanted no more than the power of managing Parliament and dispensing patronage. His ideas of government went no further. In return, he placed his subservient parliamentary majority at Pitt's disposal. The result was, as a shrewd contemporary observer remarked, that, quote, Mr. Pitt does everything, and the Duke of Newcastle gives everything. End quote. The Pitt Newcastle ministry lasted nearly six years, and its excellent results almost justified the ignominious compact on which it was founded. Soon after Pitt got the control of affairs, the fortune of war began to mend. His first attempts at launching expeditions against France were, it is true, unsuccessful. The Duke of Cumberland was sent to Hanover to defend the electorate against the French, but he suffered the same misfortune as at Fontenoy and Lawfelt, once more showing himself a brave soldier, but a bad strategist. At Hostenbeck he was defeated and, retiring northward, was pressed back against the North Sea near Stade and forced to sign the Convention of Kloster 7, by which the Hanoverian army laid down its arms. June 
1757. This disaster exposed the western frontier of Prussia to the French, and might have proved the ruin of King Frederick. But that marvelous general saved himself by the rapid blows which he dealt to west and east. Flying into central Germany, he routed the French at Rossbach, November 5th, and then, returning to Silesia before the Austrians had missed him, he defeated the troops of the Empress at Luthen, December 5th. Thus he won himself six months' respite, and during that time Pitt raised another army for service in Germany, which was placed under Prince Ferdinand of Brunswick, a distant cousin of the royal family, but a general of very different order from the unlucky George of Cumberland. This force effectually protected the western borders of Prussia and the electorate of Hanover from the French during the remainder of the war. With the opening of the year 1758 began a succession of victories all over the world, which effectually justified the claims of Pitt to be the restorer of the greatness of Britain. He had everywhere put new vigor into the struggle by placing young generals, chosen by himself, at the head of his expeditions, and by raising loans for war expenses with a profusion which appalled more timid financiers. Part of this wealth was lavished on the King of Prussia, whose aid was invaluable in distracting the forces of France. Quote, I am conquering Canada on the plains of Germany, end quote observed Pitt to those who reproached him for the vast subsidies which he sent to Frederick. And the epigram was true, for the reinforcements which were absolutely necessary if France was to retain her American possessions were being sent across the Rhine to join in the great European struggle. Pitt, in fact, was working out to a glorious end the policy which Carteret had sketched nearly twenty years before. While Ferdinand of Brunswick, with his Anglo-Hanoverian army, beat the French at Krefeld and kept them back on the Rhine, June 1758, still more important things were being effected in America. A general advance was made along the whole front of the French possessions in America. In the north, Admiral Boscawen and the young General Wolfe captured Louisbourg, the strongly fortified capital of the island of Cape Breton. In the south, Fort Duquesne was occupied by a force consisting mainly of colonial militia, and thus the line of French communications between Canada and Louisiana was effectually cut. The jubilant colonists changed the name of the place to Pittsburgh in honor of the great minister. Only in the center of the advance was a reverse sustained. There, the French commander, the gallant Montcalm, had collected the bulk of his forces behind the ramparts of Ticonderoga to bar the line of advance up the Hudson. General Abercrombie was repulsed with fearful loss when he attempted to take the place by assault, though his men did all that could be done, and Pitt's New Highland regiments absolutely filled the ditch with their bodies ere they could be forced to retire. But the fall of Canada was only delayed a few months by this check to the British arms. The next year, 1759, was even more fertile in successes. The naval strength of France received its final blow in two decisive battles. The French Mediterranean fleet ran out of Toulon and tried to escape into the Atlantic, but Admiral Boscawen met them off Lagos in Portugal and took or destroyed most of the vessels. Some months later, Admiral Hawke attacked the French Atlantic fleet, which had come out of Brest and was lying in Quiberon Bay. Though a fierce storm was raging, he ran into the bay and forced the enemy to engage. In the heat of the fight, Many of their ships were driven ashore and lost, 
while Hawk carried off two prizes, and only a few out of the hostile fleet escaped into the mouth of the river Vilen. After the battles of Lagos and Quiberon Bay, the enemy never attempted to appear at sea in any force during the remaining four years of the war. Indeed, the French marine was almost entirely destroyed, for sixty-four line-of-battle ships had been sunk or taken in 1758 to 1759. In the same year, a great victory had been gained in Germany. When the French reinforced their army of the Rhine and again pushed forward towards Hanover, Prince Ferdinand gave them battle at Minden and inflicted on them a defeat which sent them back in haste towards their own borders. The chief honor of the fight fell to seven regiments of English infantry which received and repelled the fierce charges of the whole of the cavalry of the French army but a slur was cast on the victory by the misconduct of Lord George Sackville, the general of the English horse, who refused, out of temper or cowardice, to charge the broken enemy and complete their rout. Nevertheless, the fight did its work and proved the salvation of our ally, Frederick II, who was just at this moment in the depths of despair. He had suffered a fearful defeat at the hands of the Russians at Kunersdorf, on the Oder, and was only saved from complete destruction by being able to draw aid from the victorious army of Prince Ferdinand. But events of far greater import had happened in America during this summer. Pitt had sketched out a concentric attack on Canada from three sides. General Amherst had taken Ticonderoga, the fort that had baffled Abercrombie in the previous year, while another expedition captured Fort Niagara and the other western strongholds of the French. But the main blow was struck in the north. An English fleet appeared in the St. Lawrence and put ashore General Wolfe, Pitt's favorite officer, with an army of 8,000 men. Montcalm hurried to the spot with all the French regulars in the province and a horde of Canadian militia and hastened to the defense of Quebec, the capital of the land. The place was very strongly placed, being protected on two sides by the rivers St. Lawrence and St. Charles, and watched by Montcalm's entrenched camp at Beauport. After failing to break the French lines, Wolfe ventured on a hazardous flank attack. The cliffs overhanging the St. Lawrence were believed to be inaccessible, as there was only a single precipitous goat track which mounted them, and this was protected by a guard. But Wolfe resolved to risk the danger of assaulting them. His men dropped down the river in boats under cover of the night, reached the foot of the crags, and crept up one after another on hands and knees, pulling themselves up by the aid of trees and shrubs. The French picket at the top was surprised and fled. Thus Wolfe had four thousand men in line on the ground above the cliffs, quote, the heights of Abraham, end quote, before the day dawned. When they became visible to Montcalm, he was forced to come out of his impregnable lines and fight in the open, under pain of losing Quebec. There followed a short, sharp conflict in which the English had from the first the advantage. The Canadian militia fled in panic, the French regulars were cut to pieces, and Montcalm himself was mortally wounded. But Wolfe had also been struck down in the moment of victory, he lived just long enough to hear that the battle was won and died on the field, September 13th, 1759. He was only thirty-three and, had he survived, would have had a long career of glory before him. But to have conquered America for England was in itself a sufficient title to immortality. For the Battle of Quebec was the decisive day in the history of the continent. 
The wrecks of the French army evacuated the capital and fell back on Montreal. Thither they were followed in the next spring, both by the forces under Amherst, which had ascended the Hudson, and by Wolfe's army from Quebec. Surrounded by vastly superior numbers, De Vautrey, the Viceroy of Canada, was forced to lay down his arms and surrender the remnant of the French possessions in the north. Thus ended in ignominious failure the great scheme which Montcalm had formed for securing inland America for his king and penning the English colonists between the ocean and the Alleghenies. The British flag now waved without a rival from the North Pole to the boundary of Spanish America. Meanwhile, events of importance had been happening in the Far East. While England was laying her hand on the Western continent, she was also winning her first territorial dominions in India. We have already told the tale of the Black Hole and the fall of Calcutta. Its sequel has yet to be related. Just when the news of Siraj ud Dawla's wicked doings reached Madras, Clive chanced to return from England, where he had been for two years on leave. The task of chastising the Nawab was at once made over to him. He was entrusted with one regiment of British troops, the 39th, which bears on its colors the honorable legend Primus in Indus, and with two thousand Madras sepoys. With this small force, he did not hesitate to invade the vast but unwarlike province of Bengal. He forced his way up the Hooghly and recovered Calcutta with ease. But he hesitated some time before advancing into the interior to strike at the Nawab's capital of Murshidabad. Soon, however, he learnt that Siraj ud Dawla was hated by his subjects, and that his own ministers were ready to betray him. Armed with this knowledge, Clive advanced from Calcutta as far as the village of Plassey, where he found himself in face of the Nawab's hordes, fifty thousand irregular horse and foot of the worst quality. The English were attacked but feebly and half-heartedly, for the enemy had no confidence in their prince. Moreover, Mir Jafar, who commanded one wing of his army, had sold himself to Clive for the promise of his master's throne, and held aloof all day, like Northumberland at Bosworth Field. At the hour of noon Clive bade his men charge, and the contemptible soldiery of Siraj ud Dawla fled before the assault, though they outnumbered the English by eighteen to one. Only the Nawab's French artillerymen stood firm and were bayoneted at their guns. This battle, which gave England the rich realm of Bengal, was won with a loss of only seventy-two men to the victors. Clive soon seized Morshidabad and installed Mir Jafar as Nawab in his master's room. The deposed tyrant was caught by his successor and promptly strangled. Mir Jafar ruled for the future as the dependent of England, paid the East India Company a tribute, and acted as their vassal. Thus Bengal, though not annexed, was for all practical purposes made a part of the British Empire. Clive sullied his laurels by two acts which show the unscrupulous character that was allied with his great talents. Before Plassey, a Bengali named Omitund discovered the intrigue with Mir Jafar and threatened to reveal it to the Nawab. Clive bought him off by a forged promise of money signed with the name of Admiral Watson. When the danger was over, he avowed his forgery to the traitor, who thereupon went mad with rage and disappointed greed. After Plassey, Clive committed his second fault by accepting for his private use huge sums of gold which Mir Jafar offered him. When taunted with this, 
he only replied that, quote, he was astonished at his own moderation, considering the enormously larger amount that he might have asked and received. End quote. 1757. After settling Bengal and defeating an attempt to reconquer it made by Shah Alum, the heir of the great Mughals, Clive returned to England in 1759 to be saluted as the conqueror of the East. While Clive was overrunning Bengal, the English armies in the Carnatic were making an end of the small remnants of the French power in India. The operations were protracted till in January 1760, Sir Eyre Coote routed the last French army at Wandawush, and ere another year was out, Pondicherry and all the other strongholds of the enemy were in his hands. While England was thus triumphant alike in Europe, India, and America, and Pitt was at the height of his glory, the old king, George the Second, died suddenly in his seventy-eighth year, October 25th, 1760. His death made an instant change in the national politics both at home and abroad, for his successor was not one of those sovereigns who were contented to obey their ministers and to meekly bear the yoke of the great Whig oligarchy. End of section 73「Section 74 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 35. George III and the Whigs. The American War, 1760 through 1783. Part 1. In the last two centuries of English history, the accession of a new king has not often caused a complete revolution in politics. The change of sovereigns often gives us an unfortunate and misleading cross-division, cutting periods in two that are really one, or making us dream that there is a unity in periods which are really divided in their interest and meaning. This was not the case, however, when George III succeeded his grandfather, George II. For the last time in English history, the change of kings implied a real break in the continuity of the politics of the time. The new monarch was only 22 years of age and was totally unversed in affairs of state. George II had lived in bitter enmity with his feeble and factious son, Frederick, Prince of Wales, the non-entity of whom the contemporary satirist wrote, since it's only Fred who is alive and is dead, there's no more to be said. After the prince's death, the old king had transferred his dislike to his son's widow and his grandson. George III had therefore been brought up almost in seclusion. The most notable point in his education was that his mother, Augusta of saxe gotha had taught him to despise his grandfather and his grandfather's position in the state. He had been told from his earliest years that the position of a sovereign who allowed himself to be led and governed by his ministers was degrading. When you come to the throne, we are told that his mother said, George, be king. The idea had taken root, and the young prince had made up his mind that he should rule his ministers, not his ministers him. That the cabinet should be responsible to the king as well as to parliament was the keystone of his theory. He would have the choice of his ministers lie in his own hands, not in those of the great Whig houses. George did not wish to rule unconstitutionally, to fly in the face of parliament, or to govern without it, as the Stuarts had tried to do. He had, indeed, such a belief in his own good intentions that he thought that they must coincide with the nation's will, and there were circumstances which for some time bore him out in his view. George's main bent was to assert his individuality and to take the chief share in the governance of the country. 
The other features of his character are easy to describe. His tastes were frugal and his private life strictly virtuous, a thing that had not been known in an English king for more than a century. He was sincerely pious, though, as some critics observed, he was better at scenting out other persons' sins than his own. He had an enormous capacity for hard work, though no very great brain power to guide him through it. He had a great share of self-restraint and reticence, so that it was not easy to guess what plans he had in hand when he did not wish them to be known. Above all, he was terribly obstinate, with the obstinacy of a good-hearted man who feels he is in the right and believes that he will be doing wrong if he gives up his own opinion. Lastly, though he had no power of appreciating greatness of any kind, he called Shakespeare, quote, sad stuff, only one must not say so, end quote, and thought Pitt a bombastic old actor. Yet he had great penetration in measuring littleness in others. This made him exceedingly fitted to cope with the average Whig statesman of his day. When George came to the throne, he was greeted with the usual popularity which attends a new and untried sovereign. He showed himself affable and good-tempered, a model of decorum and respectability, and won all hearts by his English habits and prejudices. His grandfather and great-grandfather had been Germans in mind and language. George III took the first opportunity of declaring that he was English-born and bred, and that, quote, he gloried in the name of Britain, end quote. By doing so, he won all men's hearts. Thus, in the beginning of his struggle with the Whigs, he had the inestimable advantage of personal popularity with the nation. The king had, as we have already said, passed his youth in seclusion with few friends and no organized band of retainers. He had to build up his own party if he wished to carry out his schemes. This he at once began to do. Descending into the arena of politics, he set to work to make himself a following, much as Newcastle or Walpole had done in a previous generation. But George, unlike those statesmen, had not to rely on bribery or borough-mongering alone. He could count on all the prestige and attraction which surrounds the crown to draw men into his net. Some of the, quote, king's friends, end quote, as his followers grew to be called, were politicians bought by pensions or titles, but many were honest supporters who found their pleasure in displaying their loyalty to the crown. In a special, George won to himself from the first the very considerable remnants of the old Tory party. Jacobitism had now become such a thing of the past that the vast majority of the Tories were ready to accept with enthusiasm a king whose views exactly coincided with their own old doctrines. For George was a stout defender of the Church of England, in which his godless old grandfather had never professed any interest. He held the ancient Tory doctrine that the royal prerogative should be actively exercised in the affairs of the nation. Most important of all, he hated the Whig oligarchy, a fact which could not fail to recommend him to their long-oppressed rivals. Hence it came that the most prominent element among the king's friends was drawn from the Tory party. One condition was demanded of all who joined that body, implicit obedience to George's will the will of a man of limited abilities and narrow mind. This fact sufficiently accounts for the results that the king's friends never included any men of marked talent. To obey George in all things would have been too trying for any one of real genius or breadth of spirit. The king's first and most injudicious way of attempting to interfere in politics was worked out through the medium of Lord Bute. That nobleman was a Scottish peer of respectable character, moderate abilities, and a rather pedantic disposition. He had aided the Princess of Wales in giving George such instruction in statecraft as he had received. Bute was almost absolutely unacquainted with Parliament or practical politics. Yet, a few months after his accession, the king insisted that the Pitt-Newcastle cabinet should take his old tutor into partnership. 
Butte was made one of the secretaries of state and at once began to show a great independence of the nominal prime minister. He rebuked Newcastle for keeping the details of his political jobbing from the king and for filling posts without consulting royalty. At the same time, he spoke strongly against the continuance of the war with France, and most particularly against the lavish subsidies with which the great war minister was maintaining our much-tried ally, the King of Prussia. The fact was that George had observed that the Whig ministry depended for its strength on the combination of Newcastle's corrupt influence over Parliament with Pitt's hold on the nation, secured by successful war. To end it, he wished to deprive the Duke of his patronage and to close the war, so as to make Pitt no longer indispensable. In this matter, the king's private designs clashed most unhappily with the interests of England, for Pitt's vigorous policy was still bearing the best of fruits. Ere King George had been a year upon the throne, Pitt could announce to him that Pondicherry, the last French fortress in India, Belle Isle, a large island off the coast of Brittany, and Dominica, a rich West Indian island, had fallen into his hands. After these last disasters, the ministers of Louis the Fifteenth began to make overtures for peace, which Bute wished to accept, but Pitt withstood him, partly because he thought that England had yet more to gain, partly because he had secret knowledge that France was trying to create a diversion by stirring up Spain against us. Charles III, the king of that country, was an old enemy of England and had offered to renew with his cousin, Louis XV, the, quote, family compact, end quote, of 1733, the old pact of the Bourbon princes for the checking of English maritime supremacy. Having news of this transaction, Pitt advised instant war with Spain, but Bute opposed him, and when the king openly gave his support to his old tutor, Pitt was forced to resign the office which he had held for five years with such credit and distinction. October 5th, 1761. The king received the great minister's resignation with joy and next set himself to get rid of Pitt's unworthy colleague, Newcastle. That old jobber clung to his place till May 1762, but finding that the king was determined to strip him of his crown patronage and thwart him in his management of the House of Commons, he was finally forced to follow Pitt into retirement. Thus, Bute became the chief minister of the realm. The king's favorite was to hold power for less than two years, but into that short space many important events were compressed. The war with Spain, which Pitt had declared to be imminent, broke out in 1762, and the French hoped for a moment that they might be saved by their new ally. But Spain's power proved to have declined so low that her interference made no difference to the fate of the war. The able generals and admirals whom Pitt had discovered and promoted made short work of the Spanish fleets and armies. Ere he had been a year at war with England, Charles III saw two of his greatest colonies fall into the hands of his enemy. Havana, the richest city of the West Indies, and Manila, the capital of the Philippine Islands in the Far East, were both in English hands by the end of 1762. In the same space of time, Admiral Rodney captured Martinique, St. Lucia, and all the rest of the French West Indies. Meanwhile, Ferdinand of Brunswick, with the Anglo-Hanoverian army in Germany, had maintained his old superiority over the French army of the Rhine. Stripped of her colonies with her fleet entirely destroyed, her armies on the continent beaten back, and her exchequer completely drained dry, France was now compelled to sue for any terms that Butte and King George would grant her. Her ally, Spain, equally disheartened by the turn which the war had taken, followed her example. Nothing could please the English king better than the conclusion of peace. He gave Butte a free hand and readily consented to the conclusion of the Treaty of Paris, February 1763. By this agreement, France ceded to England the vast province of Canada and all her American claims 
east of the Mississippi, retaining only some fishing rights on the coast of Newfoundland, which have proved very troublesome in our own day. At the same time, the West Indian islands of St. Vincent, Tobago, Grenada, and Dominica were surrendered, as well as the African settlement of Senegal. France also undertook to keep no garrisons in her factories in Hindustan when they should be restored to her. She gave back Menorca, which she had held since Bing's disaster, and withdrew her armies from Germany. But she received back much that she had lost, and had no power of recovering Belle Isle in Europe, Martinique, St. Lucia, and Guadalupe in the West Indies, Gori in Africa, and all her Indian establishments. In a similar way, Spain ceded to us the swampy and uninhabited peninsula of Florida, which rounded off the line of our North American colonies, but she received back the two wealthy settlements of Havana and Manila, which she could never have regained by force of arms. The Peace of Paris was not received with enthusiasm in England. It was said, and truly, that Pitt would have asked and obtained much better terms, and that it was weak and futile to restore to France and Spain their lost colonies. Yet, looking at our enormous gains, it seems absurd to complain. The treaty made England supreme in America and in Hindustan, and ratified her permanent ascendancy at sea. When so much was secured, it appeared greedy to ask for yet more, for never by any previous treaty had England won so much or brought a war so triumphantly to a close. But one blot on Butte's reputation cannot be passed over. He deserted, most shamelessly, our useful if unscrupulous ally, King Frederick of Prussia. Having gained what England required, he left Frederick to shift for himself, withdrawing our armies from Germany and stopping the liberal subsidies which had maintained the king's famishing exchequer. If fortune had not favored him, Frederick might have been ruined by the loss of his only ally. He was saved, however, by the unexpected withdrawal of Russia from the hostile ranks. He proved able to hold his own against Austria, his one remaining foe, and brought the Seven Years' War to an end by the Treaty of Hubertsburg, ere the year 1763 had expired. But he never forgave England for the mean trick which Bute had played him and would never again make an alliance with her. When the war was over, Bute found his position as prime minister quite unbearable. He was clamored at by Pitt's numerous admirers for making peace on too easy terms. At the same time, the Whig borough mongers who followed Newcastle took their revenge on him in Parliament by rejecting all his bills. He was decried as an upstart Scot, a mere court favorite, quote, the Gaveston of the 18th century, end quote and the enemy of the greatness of England. Though he lavished the public money and the crown patronage on all sides, even more shamelessly than Newcastle had done, he could not hold his own. Bute was a sensitive man, and apparently could not bear up against the odium which his position as a court minister, disliked both by the nation and the Houses of Parliament, brought upon him. In April 1763, he laid down the seals of office, much to the regret of his royal master. End of Section 74。Section 75 of A History of England。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 35. George III and the Whigs. The American War, 1760 through 1783. Part 2. Thus, King George had been defeated in his first contest with the Whigs. He was compelled to draw back for a moment and to rearrange his plans. His next scheme was to try the effect of playing off the various clans and factions of the Whigs one against another. 
for the fall of the great Pitt Newcastle cabinet had split the Whig party into a complicated series of family groups and alliances, divided by no difference in principle, but only by matters of personal interest. The king thought that he could make and unmake ministries by the unscrupulous use of the votes of his friends in Parliament, and so hold the balance between the various sections of his enemies, till he could reduce them all to powerlessness. To succeed the Earl of Bute, George made choice of the Whig leader whom he thought least objectionable, a narrow-minded statesman named George Grenville, who had hitherto shown himself fairly amenable to the royal influence. But the king had made a mistake— Granville was as obstinate as himself, and when he found his master interfering in his patronage and intriguing with his followers, he allied himself with one of the great Whig clans, that headed by the Duke of Bedford, a faction which was jocosely called the, quote, Bloomsbury Gang, end quote, because it centered at the Duke's residence, Bedford House, Bloomsbury. The Grenville-Bedford ministry only lasted two years, 1763-1765, and was overthrown by another Whig alliance, whose principal leaders were the Duke of Grafton and the Marquis of Rockingham. But short though its tenure of office was, it left its mark on history. In England itself, the act of this cabinet which made most noise was the prosecution of Wilkes, John Wilkes was a member of Parliament, a party journalist of gross scurrility and a man of scandalous private life, but he had the good fortune to be made twice in his life a martyr to oppressive government. He had grossly libeled Lord Bute in his newspaper, The North Britain, but his chief offense in the eyes of Grenville was that he had, in number 45 of that publication, made abusive comments on the royal speech at the end of the session of 1763. For this, he was illegally seized and imprisoned under a general warrant, a document issued by Grenville, not against him by name, but against Quote, the authors, printers, and publishers of number 45 of the North Britain, end quote. He was acquitted when put on his trial under the plea that he had been illegally arrested. Quote, a general warrant is no warrant because it names no one, end quote, was the decision of Lord Mansfield, the Chief Justice. And so this dangerous and tyrannical form of arrest was declared illegal. Wilkes posed as a victim of arbitrary government and obtained great popularity in spite of his infamous character. But Grenville then prosecuted him for publishing a blasphemous and obscene poem. Feeling sure that he would be condemned, Wilkes absconded to France and lived there four years. He was accounted by many a victim of malicious political persecution and never lost his favor with the mob of London. But while raising this storm in a teacup about the worthless Wilkes, George Grenville was committing another and a very different mistake in a matter of the highest importance. It is to him that we must attribute the first beginnings of the quarrel between England and her North American colonies. The Seven Years' War had left behind it a heavy burden of debt and taxation, and George Grenville, while searching around for new sources of revenue, was struck with the bright idea that he might tax the colonies. Accordingly, he brought forward in 1764 and passed in 1765 a bill which asserted the right of Parliament to lay imposts on our possessions overseas and proceed to prescribe that certain stamp duties on legal documents were in future to be paid by our American colonies. The proceeds were to go to maintain the British troops quartered among them. The Stamp Act was bitterly resented by the inhabitants of America. It was the first circumstance that really taught the 13 colonies, which lay scattered along the coast from Massachusetts to Georgia, to combine in a common movement. Hitherto, they had been without any formal bond of union between themselves. Legally, New York had no more to do with Virginia than, in our own day, Jamaica has with Tasmania. Each was administered as a separate unity depending immediately on the English crown. 
their origins and the character of their population were very different. The Puritan farmers and seamen of Massachusetts, the slave-owning planters of Virginia, the Anglo-Dutch of New York, and the Quakers of Pennsylvania had few sympathies in common. Hitherto, they had been jealous of each other. Colony quarreled fiercely with colony, and the chief tie that had kept them together was the common dread which all felt of the aggression of the enterprising French governors at Quebec. It was this fear of the French which had enabled William Pitt to induce them to join loyally in his great scheme for the conquest of Canada. Now that the restraining influence of their dread of France was removed, the colonies were no longer compelled to lean so closely on England. They were rapidly growing in population, wealth, and national spirit. It only required some common provocation to make them forget their petty local jealousies and turn fiercely to defend what they believed to be their rights. This provocation the pedantic George Grenville now proceeded to supply. Grenville had much to say on his side. It was quite fair that the colony should pay something towards the expenses of the Seven Years' War, which had largely been incurred for their benefit. It was rational that they should be asked to maintain the troops still quartered in America for their protection. And the Stamp Act imposed on them a very small tax, only some few thousands a year. Moreover, Grenville had studied the old precedents and could show clear instances of imperial taxation levied in the past from various possessions overseas. But above the letter of the law, statesmen are responsible to the nation for the wisdom as well as the legality of their actions. It is no excuse for the unwise minister to plead that he has the statute book on his side, if it can be proved that he has common sense against him. It is for this reason that Grenville and his two successors, Grafton and North, are held to have incurred a graver load of responsibility than any other British statesman has ever borne. The main line of protest which the colonists adopted was grounded on a favorite maxim of William Pitt, that, quote, there should be no taxation without representation, end quote. That is, that any persons taxed ought to be represented in Parliament and allowed a share in voting their own contributions. It was, of course, impossible in those days to ask that American representatives should appear in the House of Commons, an idea which the remoteness of their country and the slowness of communication with it rendered absurd. What the colonists therefore meant was that, being unrepresented, they ought not to be taxed. They were growing so strong that they would no longer endure to be treated as mere dependencies and governed solely for the benefit of England. Serious trouble would have ensued if George Grenville had been able to persist in his schemes, but he was overthrown in 1765 by the machinations of George III, who bade the 80 or 90 king's friends in the Commons to vote against him and combine with the opposition Whigs to turn him out of office. Granville was evicted and dismissed. He was replaced by a new combination of Whig clans. The new cabinet was formed by the junction of the Marquis of Rockingham and the Duke of Grafton, to whom the old Duke of Newcastle was for the moment allied. Lord Rockingham was a more moderate man than Grenville, though a less able one. He disliked trouble, and to silence American complaints took the very wise step of repealing the Stamp Act. But the Rockingham administration lasted only a year, for in 1766 the king's friends once more received orders from their master to overthrow the cabinet of the day. Rockingham was left in a minority and forced to lay down his seals, and a second Whig faction had felt the weight of King George's hand. The next ministry marked a new shifting of the political kaleidoscope. Pitt, who had been out of place since 1761, was now invited by the king to take office. He consented, believing, as he always did, that he was the one man able to administer the British Empire. 
To fill up his cabinet, he chose some of the younger Whig leaders, who were ready to serve under him from their admiration for his personality. The chief of them were the Duke of Grafton and Lord Shelburne. But the Pitt-Grafton ministry lasted for a few months only. Pitt was growing old, and his powers were weakening. He felt the hard work of the House of Commons too much for him, and, on taking office, retired to the House of Lords as Earl of Chatham, July 1766. But even there, the strain overtaxed his strength. Less than a twelve-month after he had taken office, he was stricken down by illness, which took the form of brain trouble. He grew incompetent to transact any business, and the cabinet which he had formed passed entirely under the control of his colleague, the Duke of Grafton. The ministry of the Duke of Grafton proved the most disastrous that England has ever known, with the single exception of that of Grafton's immediate successor, Lord North. It was this Whig administration that finally renewed the struggle with America, which had been suspended since the repeal of the Stamp Act. With the Duke's assent, Charles Townsend, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, brought in a bill for raising in America duties on tea, glass, paper, and painter's colors. The whole was to bring in about 40,000 pounds a year. Like the Stamp Act, this measure distinctly affirmed the right of England to tax her colonies without their consent. The Americans remembered that their previous resistance had been crowned with success and commenced an agitation against the new act. A brisk fire of petitions was kept up by the houses of representatives of the various colonies who besought the king, both publicly and privately, the House of Commons and the ministers to remove the tax, restating their old theory of, quote, no taxation without representation, end quote. Moreover, the colonies began formally to correspond with each other and to find that the same spirit of discontent prevailed in all, a fact very ominous for the home government. At the head of the thirteen colonies was Massachusetts, whose capital, Boston, was the largest town in America and a very thriving port. Its seafaring population had the greatest objection to the new customs duties. Mobs were continually filling the streets to demonstrate against England, and as early as 1768, the rioting grew serious. In 1770, Boston saw the first bloodshed in the American quarrel. A party of soldiers, stoned by a mob till they could no longer keep their temper, fired and shot four or five rioters. This, quote, massacre, end quote, as the colonists called it, brought the bitter feeling against England to a head. The Grafton cabinet at home could not at all understand the feelings of the Americans. They supposed that it was the mere amount of the tax that was causing discontent, and contented themselves with pointing out that it was insignificant, not seeing that it was the principle of taxation, not the small sum actually levied, that was exasperating the colonists. But the Duke and his followers were not to see the end of the matter. In 1770, their day of reckoning with their master, the king, had arrived. George III had been perpetually increasing his band of followers in the commons, and the new Tory party was grown large enough not only to hold the balance between two Whig cliques, but to make a bid for power on its own account. The Grafton ministry fell before a double assault. Pitt, whose health had now recovered so far that he was able to appear in his seat in the House of Lords, was thundering at them for their misconduct of American affairs. But another difficulty was far more actively operative in their overthrow. The irrepressible John Wilkes had returned from France, had stood for the county of Middlesex, and had been elected. The cabinet declared him ineligible on account of his old outlawry and made the House of Commons expel him. Nothing daunted, Wilkes appeared as a candidate again and was re-elected. Then Grafton and his majority enacted that the defeated opponent of Wilkes, who had received only 300 votes, was the legitimate member for Middlesex. 
This iniquitous step roused public feeling. It was said that liberty was at an end if the ministry could appoint members of parliament in defiance of the votes of the electors. Even Charles I, in his worst days, had not falsified the results of elections as the Whigs of Grafton's party were doing. Stormed at by Pitt, scurrilously libeled by the able but malignant political writer who signed himself Junius, hooted down by the mob of London and abandoned by the king's friends, in his moment of distress, Grafton resigned. It was generally thought that another Whig ministry would appear on the scene, probably an alliance between Pitt and Lord Rockingham. This, however, was not to be so. The king had been counting up his forces. Having upset in succession four different Whig ministries, he now thought himself strong enough to renew the experiment which he had tried in Butte's day. Accordingly, the nation was surprised by the news that George had made Lord North prime minister. North was a parliamentary jobber of the same type as Newcastle. He was a good-natured, indolent man of limited intelligence, but shrewd and businesslike. He made his bargain with the king and undertook to carry out his policy. He was the tool, George the Hand, that guided it. End of Section 75Section 76 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 35. George III and the Whigs. The American War, 1760 through 1783. Part 3. For the next twelve years, 1770 to 82, George ruled the nation according to his own ideas and led it into the most slippery paths. His compact body of King's friends, aided by mercenary helpers from among the Whigs, preserved a constant majority in Parliament under the astute management of North. The old Whig clans raged in impotent wrath, but could not shake the ministry. Their expulsion from power had one good effect. It taught them to put some reality into their old assertion that they were the people's friends and the guardians of constitutional liberty. In their day of adversity, they began to advocate real reforms, though in 50 years of power they had executed none. The younger men among them, such as the eloquent Edmund Burke, began to stir the questions of constitutional reform, which were to be brought into play later on as the new principles of the Whig Party. They denounced parliamentary corruption, ministerial jobbing, and attacks on the liberty of the press, or the rights of the constituencies. Hints were dropped that the old rotten boroughs must be abolished, and more members given to the populous counties and cities. But while the Whigs were talking of reforms, North and his master were actually engaged in bringing a much more exciting topic to the front. In four years, they succeeded in plunging England into a desperate war with her transatlantic colonies. The new ministry was determined to persevere with the old scheme of the Grenville and Grafton cabinets for taxing America. North, under his master's orders, remitted the taxes on paper and glass, but insisted on retaining that on tea. His persistence led to open violence in America. In 1773, a mob disguised as Mohawk Indians boarded the tea ships in Boston Harbor and cast the chests into the sea. The local authorities pretended that they could not discover the rioters. In high wrath, the government resolved to punish the whole city of Boston. North produced a bill for closing its harbor to all commerce and compelling the ships that had been wont to trade with it to go to the neighboring port of Salem. This unwise and arbitrary bill was followed by another yet more high-handed which annulled the charter of the state of Massachusetts, depriving it of its House of Representatives and making it a crown colony to be administered by government officials and judges sent out from England. This punishment far exceeded anything that the people of Boston had earned by their rioting and made all the other colonies tremble for their own liberties. 
The Massachusetts Government Act was the last straw which broke down the patience of the Americans. The representative bodies of all the colonies passed votes of sympathy with the people of Boston and ordered a general fast. Soon after, they all resolved to send deputies to a general congress at Philadelphia in order to concert common measures for their defense against arbitrary government. This body, which had no legal status in the eye of the law, proceeded to act as if it were the central authority in North America. It issued a Declaration of Rights, which set forth the points in which the liberties of the colonies were supposed to have been infringed. But it also took the strong step of declaring a kind of blockade against English commerce by forbidding Americans to purchase any goods imported from the mother country. In view of this threatening aspect of affairs, Lord North began to send over troops to America, foreseeing that a collision might occur at any moment. He was not wrong. While fruitless attempts were being made to pacify the offended colonists without giving in to their demands, actual war broke out. The House of Representatives of Massachusetts, while abolished by royal mandate, had migrated to Concord and resumed its sittings there. Seeing that this act of consummacy must lead to an attempt to dissolve it by force, it called out the local militia and began to collect munitions of war. General Gage, the governor of Boston, on hearing of this, sent out 800 men to seize and destroy these stores. This force was fired on by a small body of Massachusetts militia at Lexington, where the first blood shed in the war was spilt. After burning the stores, the British troops started to march back, but were set upon by the levies of the district, who kept up a running fight for several hours and drove the regulars into Boston with a loss of 200 men. April 19th, 1775. This skirmish proved the beginning of a general war. When the news spread, all the colonies sent their militia into the field, and the Congress at Philadelphia formally assumed supreme authority and named a commander-in-chief. This was George Washington, a Virginia planter who had seen much service in the last French war and was almost the only colonist who possessed a good military reputation. No choice could have been better. Washington was a staid upright, energetic man, very different from the windy demagogues who led the rebellion in most of the colonies. His integrity and honesty of purpose made him respected by all, and his readiness of resource and unfailing cheerfulness and perseverance made him the idol of the willing but undisciplined bands who followed him to the field. Ere Washington reached the seat of war in Massachusetts, a battle had been fought. The colonists were defeated, but not discouraged, for at the fight of Bunker's Hill, June 17, 1775, they maintained their entrenchments for some time against the regulars and were only beaten out of them after a very stiff combat. General Gage, a very unenterprising man, was so disheartened by the losses of his troops that he did not follow up his victory and allowed Washington to reorganize the beaten colonists and blockade Boston. The struggle was now bound to be fought out to the end. When the Congress sent to London the Olive Branch Petition, a last attempt at a peaceful settlement, the king bade Lord North return it unanswered, as coming from a body which had no legal existence. The small regular army of England, some 40,000 men scattered all over the world, was obviously unable to cope with so great a rebellion, so the government had to begin raising new regiments and enlisting Hessian and Hanoverian auxiliaries in Germany. While these new forces were being got ready, a whole year was consumed in preparation, the Americans had all their own way. In March 1776, the royal troops were forced to evacuate Boston, the only stronghold that they held in the colonies. Three months later, the Congress took the decisive step of throwing off all allegiance to England by publishing the Declaration of Independence and forming the 13 colonies into a federal republic, July 4, 1776. Very shortly after, the English reinforcements began to appear and General Howe, with 20,000 men, landed on Long Island in the state of New York. For a moment, it appeared as if the rebellion would collapse before this formidable army. Howe beat Washington at the Battle of Brooklyn, 
August 1776, he retook New York and then landed on the mainland and overran New Jersey. The colonial army disbanded in utter dismay, and only four or five thousand men kept together under Washington. But in the moment of victory, the English began to realize the difficulty of their task. The land was everywhere hostile and could only be held down by garrisons scattered broadcast. But America was so vast that enough men could not be found to garrison every port and city. When Howe began to distribute his men in small bodies, Washington swept down upon these isolated regiments and destroyed them. The English general was forced to halt and to send home for yet further reinforcements. He was not denied them, for George III had set his heart on teaching the rebellious colonists that he could not be defied with impunity. While Howe was sent fresh regiments and ordered to take Philadelphia, a new army of 8,000 men was dispatched to Canada under General Burgoyne and bidden to march by Lake Champlain and the Hudson River to attack the colonies in the rear. Meanwhile, a third force from New York was to ascend the Hudson and lend a helping hand to Burgoyne. Half of this plan only was executed. Howe won the Battle of Brandywine over Washington and took Philadelphia, but Burgoyne failed lamentably. The distance he had to cover was too great. After struggling with difficulty across the wilderness that divided Canada from the States, he found himself with a half-starved army at Saratoga. Here he was beset by all the militia of the New England States under General Gates. They outnumbered him by two to one and held strong positions in the woods and hills which he could not force. The troops from New York failed to come to his aid. His retreat on Canada was cut off, and after hard fighting, he laid down his arms with 5,000 starving men, the remnant of his much-tried army. October 17, 1777. The news of the surrender at Saratoga flew all round the world and had the most disastrous consequences. Judging that England had at last involved herself in a fatal struggle, her old enemy France resolved to take her revenge for all that she had suffered in the Seven Years' War. The ministers of the young king, Louis XVI, thought that they might now win back Canada and India and shatter the commercial and colonial supremacy that Britain had gained by the Treaty of Paris. In December 1777, France recognized the independence of America. In February 1778, she declared war on England. Spain, bound as of old by the family compact of the Bourbons, and eager to win back Menorca and Gibraltar, followed suit in the next year. Holland was added to our enemies in 1780. The interference of France profoundly modified the face of the war. Instead of a mere local struggle between England and her colonists, it became a general contention all over the world for the same prize that had been disputed in the Seven Years' War, the Empire of the Sea. But this time, England had not only to fight her old foes, but her own children. Moreover, she was deprived of the aid of Frederick of Prussia, the most useful of allies in the old contest, for, disgusted by the conduct of Bute and George III in 1762, he refused to hear of any renewed alliance with England. Nothing could have been more difficult than the problem which England had now to face. With all her disposable army overseas in America, she found herself threatened by an invasion at home and saw her possessions all over the world beset by France and Spain. Gibraltar and Menorca, the West Indies, and all our other outlying posts were held by garrisons of wholly inadequate strength. The fleet, which, owing to the continental character of the American struggle, had been hitherto neglected, was suddenly called upon to act as our main line of defense and proved too small for its task. King George was as obstinate and courageous as he was narrow-minded. With a firm resolution that was admirable but unwise, he stood forth to face the whole world in arms without yielding an inch. It was in vain that the aged William Pitt whom the news of foreign war called out from his retirement, came down to the House of Lords to speak for reconciliation with America at all costs. He urged that we must not fight our own kith and kin, but seek peace with them and turn all our forces against the foreign foe. 
After an impatient harangue, he fainted in his seat in the house and was carried home to die. May 11, 1778. The French commenced the war by sending supplies and money to America. Soon after, they dispatched a fleet and an army to the same quarter. This had a marked effect on the face of the war. The English lost in 1778 all their strongholds in the colonies except the island city of New York. But this reverse only led the king to try a new attack on the Americans. The southern states of Georgia and Carolina were known to be less zealous for the cause of American independence than the other colonies and to contain many loyalists. It was resolved to transfer the English army to this quarter. 1779. Accordingly, Lord Cornwallis, an able and active officer, was charged with the invasion of the South. For a time, the English carried all before them. They took Savannah and Charleston and overran all Georgia and South Carolina. Many of the loyal colonists took arms in their favor, and it seemed that England would save at least a part of her ancient inheritance. The American government was much alarmed and sent southward all its disposable troops headed by Gates, the victor of Saratoga. But Cornwallis beat this large army at Camden, August 1780, and added North Carolina to his previous conquests. But with a mere 10,000 men scattered all over three vast states, he was unable to maintain any very firm hold on the country, and his flanks and rear were harassed by predatory bands of partisans who slipped round to raise trouble behind him. He treated these guerrillas as brigands and shot some of them when captured, a proceeding which served no end but to exasperate the Americans. Persevering in his ideas of conquest, Cornwallis, in 1781, collected his army and, leaving a very scanty garrison behind him, set out to invade Virginia. He beat the Americans at Guilford Courthouse, March 15th, and chased Lafayette, a young French officer who was commanding the colonists in this quarter, into the interior of Virginia. But finding his army worn out with long marches and incessant fighting, he dropped down on to Yorktown, a seaport on the peninsula of the same name, to recruit himself with food and reinforcements from the English fleet, which had been ordered to meet him there. This march to Yorktown ended in a fearful disaster. Cornwallis found no ships to welcome him. A French squadron had intercepted Admiral Graves when he set out from New York. Outnumbered by three to two, Graves retired after a slight engagement, and it was the Frenchman de Grasse who now appeared off Yorktown to blockade instead of to succor the harassed English troops. At the same time, Washington, with a powerful American army reinforced by 6,000 French, appeared on the land side and seized the neck which joins the York Peninsula to the Virginian mainland. Thus, Cornwallis was caught in a trap between Washington's army and the fleet of de Grasse. He made a desperate attempt to escape by breaking through the American lines, but when it failed, was forced to surrender for want of food and ammunition with 4,500 men, the remnants of the victorious Army of the South. With him fell all hopes of the retention of Georgia and Carolina by the British. The feeble garrisons which he had left behind were swept away, and the fortress of Charleston alone remained of all the conquests which he had made. October 1781. New York, in a similar way, was now left as the only British post in the North. Under this disaster, it seemed as if England must succumb, more especially as it was but one of a simultaneous batch of defeats suffered in all corners of the empire. Menorca was captured by the French in the same autumn after a vigorous defense. All the West India islands, save Jamaica and Barbados, suffered the same fate. In India, a French fleet under Ducifrin was hovering off the coast of Madras, while at the same time Hadir Ali, a famous military adventurer who had made himself ruler of Mysore, invaded the Carnatic from the inland, cut an English army to pieces, and ravaged the country up to the gates of Madras. At home, too, matters were looking very dark. The dull and reactionary government of North had been suffering a stormy trial. 
In 1780, the strange and fantastic Gordon Riots had seemed for a moment to shake the foundations of society in London. Lord George Gordon, a fanatical and half-crazed member of Parliament, had stirred up an agitation against some bills for the relief of Romanists which had come before the lower house. He raised a mob which burnt many Catholic chapels, destroyed the houses of unpopular persons, and then turned to indiscriminate plunder. The ministry and the magistrates showed a strange weakness before this outburst of anarchy, and it was left to King George himself to order the troops to act against the mob and get the streets cleared by the prompt shooting of plunderers. In Ireland, things were far more dangerous. In the absence of the regular army, the ministry had permitted the Protestants of Ireland to form volunteer corps for the protection of the island from French invasion. But the volunteers, finding themselves the only force in the land, proceeded to follow the example of America by agitating for the complete parliamentary freedom of Ireland and the repeal of Poynings Act, which subjected the Irish to British legislature. It was only their fear of their own Catholic countrymen which kept them from demanding separation, and all through 1781-82 an open rebellion seemed possible at any moment. Nor had England a single soldier to spare to repress such a rising. Indeed, the trouble only ended by the complete surrender of the English government. North's successors, in May 1782, granted the Irish the home rule they demanded, and for 18 years, 1782 to 1800, the Irish legislature was completely independent of that of Great Britain. The general breakup of the British Empire seemed possible and even probable in 1782, but two great victories saved it. Admiral Rodney, on April 12th, met the French fleet in the West Indies and inflicted a crushing defeat on it off St. Lucia, capturing his opponent, de Grasse. This restored English maritime supremacy in America and led to the recovery of most of the lost West India Islands. A similar triumph in waters nearer home followed in the autumn of the same year. A great French and Spanish army and fleet had been besieging Gibraltar since 1779. It made its final attack in September 1782, bringing up vast floating batteries to compete with the artillery of the rock. But General Elliot, the indefatigable governor of the place, destroyed all these cumbrous structures with red-hot shot, and a few days later, an English fleet under Lord Howe arrived and relieved the long-beleaguered garrison. Six months before the relief of Gibraltar, Lord North, seeing all things round him in disaster and sensible that the king's policy was no longer possible, laid down office. To his grief and humiliation, George III was forced to call his enemies the Whigs into power and to surrender the administration of affairs to them. A Whig cabinet under Lord Rockingham was formed, which immediately made overtures of peace to the United Colonies, conceding complete independence. The Americans were half bankrupt and wholly tired of the war. They accepted the terms with alacrity, and to the disgust of their French allies, made peace in April 1783. This left France and Spain committed to a war which was no longer going in their favor. England had reasserted her old maritime supremacy and seemed very far from crushed, but she was so disheartened that it was well known that she would make vast concessions to end the war. The Allies consented to treat and granted the new Whig ministry comparatively easy terms. England ceded Menorca and Florida to Spain, and St. Lucia and Tobago, Senegal and Goree to France, besides restoring the Indian factories of the French. So, by the Treaty of Versailles, September 1783, ended the disastrous War of American Independence. End of Section 76「Section 77 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. Machina. A History of England by Charles O'Man. Chapter 36. The Younger Pitt and the Recovery of English Prosperity, 
1782-1793, Part 1. Results of the War When England bowed before the force of circumstances and concluded peace with America, France, Spain and Holland in 1783, she had touched the lowest point of weakness which had been her lot since the 15th century. Peace had been imposed by victorious enemies after a fruitless struggle of eight years. English armies had grown accustomed to defeat. English fleets could barely hold their own upon the seas. Money had been spent with a lavish hand, and the national debt was doubled. As a result of all her efforts, England had not only to surrender smaller possessions all over the world, but to witness the loss of her great western empire, the thirteen colonies which had been the pride of her statesmen, and one of the main outlets of her commerce. A blow such as the loss of America seemed likely to be fatal to England. Not only was her prestige gone, and her pride humbled, but she was left with her finances in an apparently hopeless condition of exhaustion, and her internal politics in a state of complete disintegration. King George's great experiment in autocratic government had completely failed. He had led the nation into disaster and bankruptcy. His ministry had been struck down by the course of events, the irrefutable logic of the American war. Lord North had retired, his master had been forced to own himself beaten, and to make over the conduct of the realm to a Whig ministry. But the Rockingham cabinet was evidently a mere stopgap. George's skilful policy of the last twenty years had so divided and broken up the Whig party that it was difficult to reconstitute a strong cabinet from its remnants. When peace with America and France had been secured, that peace being the one great mandate which the nation had given to the Whigs, it seemed likely that the perennial jealousies of their cliques and clans would once more wreck the party, and that the king, with his steady power of intrigue, his pension list and his power of patronage, would succeed in placing some second north in office. Changed character of the Whigs The Whigs, however, were no longer their old selves. The great effect of their twelve years' exile from power had been to teach the better men of the party to detest the old methods of parliamentary corruption and family jobbery which they had learnt from Walpole and Newcastle. The Whigs had failed to realise the hatefulness of these practices when employed by themselves, but when their own engine was turned against them by the King, they began to see its shame. That the party which professed to represent the people and to forward the immortal principles of the revolution should ground its power on official bribery and corruption was humiliating to the better men in the Whig camp. Hence it came that the nobler spirits among them resolved to protest against the old methods, and to claim that the victory of their party over the king in 1782 should result in something more than a distribution of the loaves and fishes of office among their partisans. Unhappily, however, much of the old leaven of corruption still hung about the Whigs, and the section which represented it was just about to perpetrate the worst piece of jobbery which their party ever committed. Death of Lord Rockingham, the Shelburne Ministry The one thing in which all sections of the Whigs could agree was dislike of the royal influence, as employed by George III. The first end, therefore, which the Rockingham cabinet set before itself, was to cut down the means of corruption which the king possessed. The pension list was diminished, no single person was to be allowed to draw more than £300, the secret service funds in the royal hands were cut down, and a certain number of the useless and expensive offices about the court abolished. This was all very well so far as it went, but much more was needed, and it was very uncertain how much time would be granted to the new Whig ministers to carry out further reforms. Their leader, Lord Rockingham, died suddenly in July 1782, long ere the formal treaties of peace with France and Spain had been signed. He was a man of slender abilities, but honest and popular, and able to keep his party together. On his death, the old clan rivalries of his followers burst once more into life. The King sent for Lord Shelburne, the leader of the Liberal and Reforming Party among the Whigs, and offered him the premiership. But Shelburne was viewed with bitter dislike by many of the Whig chiefs. His sharp tongue and his love of intrigue made him many foes, and when he took office they refused to serve under him. On the mere ground of personal jealousy and resentment, the larger half of the party went into opposition and joined the Tories. Not only the old family cliques that represented the corrupt and selfish Whigs of an earlier day, but many of the younger men, who called themselves the Friends of Liberty and Reform, took this suicidal step. Among them was Charles James Fox, the most able and open-minded man in the party, but irregular in his private life a gambler and a lover of the bottle, somewhat tainted with the failings of a political adventurer, and too factious to be altogether honest in his actions. Fox had been a Tory in his earlier years, but had quarrelled with Lord North in 1772, and after that date had joined the opposition, become one of its chiefs, and been the first to favour peace with America. William Pitt the Younger Shelburne took office, therefore, with a comparatively weak following. 
So many of the old leaders had refused to aid him that he was constrained to give the post of Chancellor of the Exchequer and leader of the House of Commons to a young man of twenty-three, William Pitt, the second son of the great Earl of Chatham. This appointment, startling though it appeared, was a very wise one. The younger Pitt was the most remarkable man of his age. He had inherited from his father high principles, an enthusiastic belief in the future of England, and a sympathy for the cause of reform. He had been reared as a Whig, but had no sympathies for the old parliamentary jobbing and corruption of the party. His personal integrity was as great as that of his father, and his hatred of intrigue and bribery even greater. Though quite new to the House of Commons, he made a sensation on his first appearance in it, which showed that men saw that the mantle of his father had fallen upon his shoulders. His self-confidence and belief in his own powers were as great as those of Chatham had been. But he was devoid of the theatrical pomposity which had sometimes marred the effect of his parents' eloquence. As Chatham had believed himself the destined saviour of England from the dangers of foreign war, so it was his son's aim and end to deliver England from internal faction and to build up a great constitutional party which should combine loyalty to the crown with liberal and progressive legislation. This party, as Pitt imagined, would consist of the more enlightened Whigs, the section of the party which had once followed his father and now obeyed Shelburne. That it would ever grow to be known as the Tory Party would, at this moment, have been beyond his comprehension. Fall of Shelburne. The Shelburne Ministry only held office for nine months, July 1782 to April 1783. From the first, it was doomed to fall before the hostility of the Whig opposition. It survived long enough to ratify the final conclusion of the peace negotiations which the Rockingham Cabinet had begun, but it fell before a factious motion of Fox. Who moved a vote of censure on the very reasonable and moderate terms on which peace had been bought from France? This motion was supported by the ominous combination of the old Tory supporters of Lord North with the discontented sections of the Whig Party. It drove Shelburne to instant resignation. Fox and North combine, but no one could have foreseen the strange sequel to this vote. To the surprise of all save those who were in the secret, it was suddenly announced that Fox and North were about to unite their forces. Not for a single division, but for a permanent alliance. Lord North seems to have imbibed in his long tenure of power, from 1770 to 1782, a craving for office at any price. Seeing that the king was too weak for the moment to replace him in his old seat, he plotted an unnatural union with his foes, the Whig clans. He could command the allegiance of that section of the Tories who cared more for place and power than for their loyalty towards the crown, of the men who had aided King George from purely personal and corrupt motives. Now he offered Fox and the Duke of Portland, the Whig leaders, the invaluable aid of this solid phalanx of votes if they would admit him into their alliance. Having no political aims or principles of his own save a desire to possess power and patronage, he could undertake to fall in with any schemes that they might desire. To their great discredit, the Whigs closed eagerly with this immoral proposal and took North into partnership, though they had been spending the last ten years in vehement abuse of his methods of government and his mean subservience to the king. The Coalition Ministry. Hence came into existence the Coalition Ministry of April 1783, in which the followers of North and Fox sat together under the nominal control of the Duke of Portland, one of the chiefs of the old Whig families. The cynical immorality of the combination displeased every one. The king was enraged with his old hireling North for leading away half the Tories to join the hated Whig oligarchs. The nation was puzzled and disgusted to see men who had so often abused each other. Combining from no better motive than mere lust for power and office, but unpopular though the new cabinet was, it was for the moment supreme in Parliament by means of its overwhelming majority of votes. Pitt's reform bill rejected. The continued existence of the coalition government would probably have led to a return to the ancient corruption of Walpole and Newcastle. What the principles of the new Whig administration were was sufficiently shown by the fate of a reform bill to abolish rotten boroughs and increase the representation of populous districts. Which William Pitt brought forward in the summer of 1783, the ministry frowned on a measure which would diminish their power to buy votes, and the bill was rejected by a majority of 144. But fortunately for England, the coalition was not to last for long. It fell partly because of its unpopularity with the nation, and partly because the king tried against it the last of his autocratic methods of interfering with politics. Fox's India Bill. In November 1783. Fox brought in a bill for rearranging the government of our Indian possessions, a measure which had become necessary in consequence of changes in that country, which we shall have to narrate a few pages later on. The manifest failure of the East India Company to provide for the good administration of the growing empire, which was falling into its hands, 
rendered the interference of the home government imperative. Fox produced a bill for taking the rule of our Indian possessions entirely out of the power of the company, which was in the future to confine its activity to commerce alone. All the English officials in India, from the governors of presidencies down to ensigns in the army and clerks, were to be selected by a council of seven commissioners in London, nominated by Parliament. The names of the seven were given, and they were all violent partisans of Fox and North. The bill, good in many ways, was liable to censure in the one point that it gave the Ministry a fund of patronage, which was certain to be abused. The Fox North cabinet was nothing if not unscrupulous, and when it got control of the £300,000 of annual patronage which the East India Company possessed, there is no doubt that it would have employed it to forward Whig family jobs and political corruption. An opponent of the bill complained that it took the diadem off the king's head to place it on that of Mr Fox. Much was also said as to the injustice of stripping the company of its chartered rights. The King and Fox's Bill The India Bill, however, passed the Commons, and then came before the Lords. To throw it out, the King now took the unprecedented step of sending down to the House a paper written with his own hand, which Lord Temple was to show to such of the peers as he thought fit. It was to the effect that whoever voted for the bill was not only not His Majesty's friend, but would be considered as his enemy. This notice was given to all who wavered or who did not wish to incur the King's personal enmity. It led so many of the weaker Whig peers to abstain from voting that the bill was thrown out by a majority of nineteen. George's conduct was quite unconstitutional. If it were possible for the King to engage in such an underhand intrigue against his own cabinet, the system of government by responsible ministers became impossible. The Coalition Resigns The Whigs revenged themselves by passing a vote through the Commons, stigmatising Lord Temple's conduct in showing the paper as a high crime and misdemeanour. Nevertheless, they had to quit office, though they boasted that they would soon be back again, since George could not find any other ministry to put in their place. December 1783 End of section 77section 78 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by l machina a history of england by charles oman chapter 36 the younger pitt and the recovery of english prosperity 1782 to 1793 part 2 pitt takes office they were mistaken however the king, ready to dare any expedient that would keep the hated coalition out of power, had offered the position of Prime Minister to William Pitt. The ambitious young statesman accepted the charge and took office, though he could only rely on the support of the Shelburne Whigs, the reforming section of the party, aided by the king's friends, as those of the Tory party who had not followed North were once again styled. The General Election the sight of a Prime Minister of twenty-four, backed by a weak minority, moved the derision of the partisans of Fox and North. They said that they would drive him to resign in three weeks, and at once threw out all the bills which he brought before the House. But, instead of resigning, Pitt was resolved to dissolve Parliament and to face a general election. He knew that his own name was great with the nation, and that the coalition was universally detested and condemned. His policy was crowned with enormous success. Almost every borough and county where the election was free and the voters numerous declared against the candidates whom Fox and North recommended. No less than 160 supporters of the coalition lost their seats, and Pitt came back to Parliament with a clear working majority in his favour, March 1784. Pitt and the King Thus began the long and eventful ministry which was to last for the next 17 years. With the triumph of Pitt, English politics are lifted to a higher level, and lose the mean and petty aspect which they had displayed ever since the days of Walpole. For the first time since the century began, England was in the hands of a minister of a spotless personal integrity, who possessed broad views and a definite political programme. His power was enormous, for, in return for having delivered the King from his hated enemies the Whigs, Pitt was granted the royal support even for measures which his narrow-minded sovereign hardly understood and could not love. George tolerated in him a policy which would have maddened him if it had been pursued by the Whigs. In return, the minister treated the King with a loyalty and a personal regard which were perhaps hardly deserved by his master. The New Tory Party Pitt took from the elder Tories the loyalty which they had degraded into subservience, and from the Whigs the liberal and reforming principles and hatred of corruption which they had preached but not practised. On the basis of the two combined, he strove to build up a party, new in fact if not in name, from the scattered knots and sections of politicians who had united to oppose the iniquitous coalition of Fox and North. 
the wonderful success of the earlier years of his administration fixed him firmly in his seat and enabled him to carry out his policy. The Financial Situation He found the country still in the depths of the depression caused by the American War, with a deficit of £12 million and a national debt which had just mounted up to what was then considered the crushing sum of £200 million. So low was public credit that consuls only stood at 60. Yet in five years Pitt could show a prosperous balance sheet, a revenue rapidly increasing without any additional taxation, a scheme, if a faulty one, for extinguishing the national debt, and the three percents at par. The fact was that in 1784 the state of England was not so bad as it appeared. Financially, the American war failed to ruin the country because new sources of wealth were developed exactly at the moment when they were wanted. To replace the comparatively small commercial profit which we had been wont to draw from our lost western colonies, a sudden increase of wealth came flooding in from our new eastern empire in India. Nor was this all. Even more important were the new channels of profit opened by the development of our home manufactures. Improved Communications We have already spoken of the symptoms of an approaching development in our domestic industries which were beginning to be felt toward the end of the reign of George II. This movement came to maturity in the earlier years of George III. While the king was wrangling with the Whigs and sowing the seeds of the American War, a revolution was quietly transforming the character of English trade. Between 1760 and 1780, a network of canals had been constructed to connect the centres of manufacturing life. The muddy lanes, which England had hitherto called roads, began at last to disappear, and a multitude of turnpike acts created new highways along which traffic could readily make its way. The fast-travelling coach superseded the lumbering stage wagons, which had crept from town to town. Development of the North Along the new roads and canals rolled a vastly increased volume of trade. The great discovery of the last rain, that iron might be smelted with coal, made northern England, where coal and iron lie side by side, a great manufacturing district instead of a thinly peopled range of moors, and before the century was out, Yorkshire and Lancashire had become the most important industrial centres in the realm. Mechanical Inventions A few years after the expansion of the iron industry came the growth of textile manufactures, fostered by the new discoveries made by Watt and Arkwright. The former, a Glasgow instrument maker, began the application of steam to the setting of machinery in motion. The latter, a barber at Bolton, perfected the details of that machinery and showed that it was possible to do quickly and accurately with iron what had hitherto been done slowly and more clumsily with human fingers. Where previously the spinner and weaver cooperated with the precarious motive power of running water, the new mills, working by steam and able to establish themselves wherever coal was to be found, made their appearance. Thus the price of production was enormously lessened, and English woven goods became able to underbid any others in the markets of the world. For as yet no other nation had learnt the use of steam and machinery, and England had a monopoly of the new inventions. Our linen, woollen and cotton manufactures were increasing with an astounding rapidity, and wealth and population mounted up by leaps and bounds. It is true that the new factory system was to lead to many social troubles and miseries. In the haste to grow rich, the mill owners took little thought of the bodily or moral welfare of their workmen. In the new centres of population, the lower classes were crowded together in narrow and unhealthy streets, forced to work too many hours a day, and grievously stinted in their wages as competition grew fierce. But these evils were only beginning to develop, while the rush of wealth produced in the new industries was apparent at once. Improved Agriculture Moreover, the growth of manufactures had stimulated other sources of prosperity. The increased population called for a larger food supply, and therefore forced agriculture to develop. Waste and more were everywhere being ploughed up to raise corn for the new thousands who annually swelled our ranks. It is said that more new ground was taken into cultivation in the years between 1760 and 1780 than in the whole century which preceded them. Thus the landholding classes shared in the prosperity of the manufacturers. Nor was it only in the quantity of new corn-bearing land that progress was seen. The older acres also were cultivated with improved methods and brought forth double their former produce. Growth of Wealth the growth of manufactures and the development of agriculture were enough in themselves to account for the marvellous ease with which England bore the burdens imposed upon her by the American War. So greatly was the national wealth increased that losses which had seemed ruinous at the time were forgotten in ten years. The £120 million of debt incurred in the struggle were no longer a nightmare to chancellors of the Exchequer. It became evident that the country had suffered no incurable wound in the disastrous struggle with America, France and Spain. Pitt's Financial and Commercial Policy 
Pitt, then, fell upon a fortunate time when he took office in December 1783, but we must not deprive him of the full credit of restoring the prosperity of English finance. It is a great title to praise that he saw the bright side of things when other men were hopeless, and it must be remembered that his own enlightened conduct of affairs had much to do with the improved condition of the country, for he was far ahead of his contemporaries in his knowledge of finance and political economy. First of all English statesmen, he had studied the laws of wealth and the workings of international commerce. He had found an inspiration in Adam Smith's celebrated book The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, and from it had convinced himself that free trade was the true policy of England, and that the old and narrow commercial policy of restriction and protection was radically unsound. In all his legislation he bore this principle in mind, and the realm profited thereby to no small extent. End of section 78「Section 79 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by L. Mackiner. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 36. The Younger Pitt and the Recovery of English Prosperity. 1782-1793. to 1793, Part 3. Peace Abroad. The first ten years of Pitt's rule, 1783 to 1792, were a time of profound peace, both at home and abroad. Though his foreign policy was not weak or vacillating, the young premier avoided all collisions with our neighbours. A slight difficulty with Spain in 1789, about our colony on Vancouver's Island in the North Pacific, is hardly worth mention. The Whigs Powerless. Meanwhile, Pitt's ascendancy at home was complete. The disgrace of the coalition still hung over the parliamentary opposition. There seemed to be hardly any reason for the longer existence of the old Whig party, which followed Fox, Burke and Sheridan. The popular principles on which they had always pretended to rest had now been adopted by the opponent whom they styled a Tory. The opposition in the years 1783 to 1793 was factious rather than honest. The Whigs had to see measures which they could not but approve, carried by their political enemy, or else to withstand them on the inadequate ground of pure party spite. The spectacle of a conscientious and enlightened minister, opposed by men who could find no real fault with his principles or measures, disgusted the nation, and the Whig party sunk into a disrepute which proceeded from a general belief that it was insincere. Not least among the causes of its ill odour with the country was the close connection of its leaders, Fox and Sheridan, neither of them men of a high moral reputation, with the Prince of Wales. For the young prince's dissolute habits, wanton thriftlessness, and unfilial conduct towards his father rendered him a byword among right-minded men. Yet the only hope of the Whigs returning to office lay in the help of the younger George. He had promised to dismiss Pitt and call Fox to office if ever he were able, and when in 1788 his father was stricken down with a temporary fit of insanity, it seemed that he might be able to carry out his design. But the king recovered before his son had been formally named regent, and the Whigs lost their opportunity. Pitt and Foreign Trade The early years of Pitt's domination were a period of active legislation. He took in hand many schemes, and brought most of them to a successful end. His enlightened views on free trade were shown by a commercial treaty with France, which took off many prohibitive duties, and much increased the commerce between the two countries, 1786. He also attempted to remove all trade restrictions between England and Ireland, but was foiled by the factious Irish Parliament, which refused to ratify the terms which he offered. Smuggling he succeeded in reducing to a low ebb, by lessening the exorbitant duties on tea and spirits, so that the excess of profit on smuggled goods was no longer large enough to tempt men to incur the risk of capture. Domestic Reforms We find Pitt abolishing the shocking scandals of public executions at Tyburn, supporting measures for the abolition of the slave trade, repealing most of the ancient legislation against Romanists, and opening the bar and the army to them. He turned the ancient punishment of being sold into slavery on a tropical plantation, which had hitherto been the lot of convicts, into the comparatively mild form of transportation to Botany Bay, the penal settlement in Australia, established in 1788 as our first possession in that continent. The Canada Bill of wise and liberal dealing with the colonies, Pitt set an example, which has ever since been followed, in his Canada Bill of 1790. This measure gave a liberal grant of responsible government to that great colony, where so many of the exiled loyalists from the United States had settled down after the war. But perhaps the most important of all the measures of the years 1783 to 1793 were those dealing with India. 
Pitt had to face not only the problems which had called forth Fox's India Bill, but some further difficulties of a personal kind. A word as to the history of our Indian Empire is required to carry it on from the point where we left it, after Clive's conquest of Bengal and the final rout of the French at Wanderwash, 1760. Indian Politics It was impossible for the English to halt in the position which they had then reached. Most especially was it unlikely that they would long bear with the unsatisfactory state of affairs in Bengal and the Carnatic, where the East India Company had taken the Nawabs under their protection and made vassals of them, but had not thought out any scheme for making those princes govern in accordance with English interests and ideas. It was intolerable that we should be responsible for the misrule of effete oriental despots, while keeping no real control over them, for, except in the suburbs of Madras and Calcutta, we made no pretense to territorial sovereignty. Battle of Buxar The feeble Muhammad Ali in the Carnatic did no worse than pile up mountains of debt and quibble with the governor of Madras, but Mir Qasim, the Nawab of Bengal, was made of sterner stuff. Resenting all interference of his suzerains in the governance of his realm, he rebelled against the company, and sealed his own fate by massacring 150 English merchants of the factory of Patna. This brought down prompt chastisement. He was driven out of Bengal, and forced to take refuge with his neighbour, Suraj ud the Nawab of Aud, who consented to espouse his cause. But at Buxar, Major Munro, with a handful of sepoys, defeated the united armies of the two Mohammedan princes, 1763. This important victory gave England the control of all northeastern India. She enthroned a new Nawab in Bengal, but made him a mere puppet and tool, with no real authority. For the future, the company administered Bengal and Bihar in its own name, under the authority of a grant from Shah Alum, the powerless Grand Mogul of the day. At the same time, Aud came within the sphere of British influence, for Siraj ud was forced to become our ally and to pay us a subsidy. Clive's Reforms Shortly after this pacification, Lord Clive came out again to India to act as Governor of Bengal. His second tenure of power lasted two years, 1765 to 1767, and was notable for great improvements which he introduced into the governance of the land. Hitherto the English officials and military commanders had received very low pay, while placed in positions where money-making was easy. Many succumbed to the temptation, and accumulated fortunes by blackmailing the natives, by selling their patronage, or by engaging in private trade. Clive wisely stopped these sources of corruption, by raising the salaries of his subordinates, but forbidding them to trade with the country or to receive gifts from natives. His reforms were much resented, and almost led to sedition among the military, but he carried them through with a strong hand, and left the army and civil service much improved and purified. Ill health forced him to return to England in 1767, where some years after he put an end to himself in a fit of depression. Warren Hastings, Governor-General For the next six years our Indian possessions were ruled by men of lesser fame, and were unvexed by foreign wars. But in 1773 a new era began. In that year a Governor-General was for the first time appointed and entrusted with the command of all the three presidencies of Bengal, Madras and Bombay. The first man placed in this office was the greatest who has ever held it, the able and undaunted Warren Hastings. For twelve years this stern ruler maintained the prestige of the English name in India, though he had to face the fearful storm of the American War, which shook the foundations of the British Empire in every part of the world. Not the least of his achievements was that he asserted his own will in every crisis against the strenuous opposition of his factious council, who, headed by Philip Francis, the virulent writer of the Letters of Junius, did their best to thwart every scheme that he took in hand. Execution of Nandukumar Hastings began his rule by placing in English hands all the posts in the administration of justice and the collection of the taxes, which had hitherto been in the charge of natives. This led to increased revenue and pure law. But the Bengalis did not at first understand the methods of the new courts, which in some ways worked harshly enough. When Sir Elijah Impey, the first Chief Justice, hung for forgery the great Calcutta banker, Nandukumar, Nunkumar, they could only believe that he suffered because he had offended the Governor-General by intriguing with Francis and the other discontented members of council. Hence came a most unjust accusation against Hastings and Impey of having committed a judicial murder. The Rahilla War The worst trouble which Hastings experienced was the continual cry for increased dividends with which the directors of the East India Company kept plaguing him. They were not particular as to the way in which money was to be earned, and the Governor-General sometimes tried strange expedients to satisfy them. The worst was the hiring out to Asaf ud the Nawab of Aud, of English troops for use in wars with his neighbours. 
by such aid that prince subdued the Rohilas, an Afghan tribe on his northern frontier. The only excuse that Hastings could plead for this undignified traffic was that the Rohilas were a race of plunderers and a public nuisance to northern India, 1774. The Maratha War, 1778. A little later, an attempt to extend the English influence in western India involved Hastings in a dangerous war. The Bombay government wished to acquire over its neighbours, the Marathas, the same sort of suzerainty which Madras exercised over the Nawab of the Carnatic, and Bengal over the Nawab of Oud. With this object, a treaty was concluded with a prince named Raghunath Rao, who claimed to be Paishwa, or head of the Maratha Confederacy, by which he was to be lent troops, and to pay in return a large subsidy to the company. But the other Maratha chiefs, headed by Skindia, the most powerful of their race, refused to acknowledge Raghunath, and attacked the company. They utterly defeated the Bombay army, and the credit of the British arms was only saved by a daring experiment of Hastings, who made an English army march from Bengal right across northern India. This force took Gwalior, Skindia's capital, and overran the province of Gujarat. The Marathas made peace, ceding to Hastings the island of Salset, but the attempt to make them into vassals had distinctly failed, and had to be postponed for twenty years. Hyder Ali But the greatest danger which Hastings had to face came from the outbreak of the war with France in 1778. It is true that his troops easily captured Pondicherry and the other French settlements, but they could not prevent their enemies from stirring up against them a very dangerous enemy. This was Haider Ali, a Mohammedan military adventurer who had built up an empire for himself in southern India. He had usurped the throne of his master, the Raja of Mysore, and had conquered all his neighbours by the aid of a great mercenary army of fanatical Muslims. While Hastings was still engaged in the dangerous Maratha war, the French easily induced the ruler of Mysore to interfere in the struggle, for he coveted the rich dominions of our vassal, the Nawab of the Carnatic. Hastings' Extortions Haider Ali poured his hordes of predatory horse down from the plateau of Mysore into the Carnatic. They swept over the whole country, and burnt the villages at the very gates of Madras. Hastings, already involved in one war, and vexed by a French fleet under de Souffren, which was hovering about, felt himself at his wit's end for troops and money to resist the 100,000 men whom Haider had sent against the southern presidency. To raise new resources, he harshly fined Shaita Singh, Raja of Benares, a vassal prince who was slack in contributing to the war. For failing to give £50,000, the unfaithful Raja was mulcted in the sum of £500,000. When this was unpaid, Shaita Singh was deposed from his throne. More funds were procured from our ally, the Nawab of Oud, in a not very reputable way. When Hastings asked him for aid, Asafud Dawla answered that he was penniless at the moment, because his late father had illegally left the state treasure to the Begums, his widow and mother. He asked permission from Hastings to extract the hoard from the old ladies, and did so by the cruel imprisonment and torture of their servants. Of course the Governor-General was not responsible for the Nawab's methods, but he profited by them. More than one million pounds was torn from the Begums, and served to pay the expenses of the Mysore War. Battle of Porto Novo that struggle, which had begun under such unfavourable circumstances, was finally carried to a glorious end. The veteran Sir Eyre Coote, who had won the Carnatic at Wanderwash twenty years before, now saved it by the victory of Porto Novo, July 1781. Hyder's multitudes were routed, and he was driven back into the hills. Next year he died, and the throne of Mysore fell to his son, Tipu Sultan, a cruel and fanatical prince of talents very inferior to those of his father. After two years of war, Tipu was constrained to make peace, and to cease from molesting the Carnatic, 1784. Hastings' work was now done. He had saved our Indian Empire by his hard fighting with the Marathas and the rulers of Mysore, at a time when England, oppressed by war in Europe and America, could give him no aid. He had organised the administration, increased the revenue, and set justice on a firm basis. If some of his acts had been harsh, yet all should have been pardoned him when his difficulties were taken into consideration trial of Hastings. But when Hastings came home in 1785, hoping to receive the thanks of the nation and to be rewarded with a peerage, he was woefully undeceived. His enemy Francis had returned from India before him, and had laid before Fox and Burke, the leaders of the Whig opposition, all the doings of the last ten years painted in the darkest colours. He persuaded them that Hastings was a tyrant and a monster, and moreover that a damaging blow could be dealt to Pitt by impeaching the great governor. For if the Prime Minister defended him, as was likely, he might be accused of protecting guilt and malfeasance. The Whigs therefore demanded with loud cries the impeachment of Hastings, but Pitt, rather to their surprise, granted it. 
Then began the famous trial of the Governor-General before the House of Lords, which lasted fully six years. Accused of having judicially murdered Nandu Kumar, of having illegally sold British troops to the Nawab Asafud Dawla, and of having cruelly oppressed Shaita Singh and the Begums of Oud, Hastings was acquitted on every point. But the law expenses had ruined him, and the nation's indifference had soured him, so that he died an unhappy and disappointed man. Pitt's India Bill Hastings was succeeded as Governor-General by Lord Cornwallis, the victor of Camden, and the vanquished of Yorktown. This honest and brave man was set the task of governing India under a new constitution. In 1784, Pitt had passed an India Bill, not very unlike that of Fox. It gave the Crown the supreme power over the company, making the Governor-General and the Board of Control in London nominees of the Crown. But the company was still left its patronage, its monopoly of trade, and a certain undefined power over the Governor-General, which led to much trouble in the future. Cornwallis's Indian Policy Cornwallis ruled British India for seven years, 1786 to 1793, and, though he had gone out with no intention of engaging in wars or aggrandizing the company's dominions, was driven by the force of circumstances into a policy which was practically identical with that of Warren Hastings. War with Tipu of Mysore The Sultan Tipu of Mysore, always restless and quarrelsome, made war on all his neighbours, till at last, in 1789, he attacked the Raja of Travancore, a vassal of the company. Resolved to crush the Sultan, Cornwallis built up a great alliance with the Nizam, the Mohammedan ruler of the Hyderabad state, and with the chiefs of the Marathas. Standing at the head of this confederacy, the English appeared for the first time as asserting a predominance over the whole peninsula. Neither the Marathas nor the Nizam gave any very material aid towards the suppression of Tipu, but Cornwallis proved able to accomplish it without their assistance. His first advance into Mysore was foiled by lack of provisions, but in the next year, 1791, he forced his way into the heart of Tipu's realm, beat him at the Battle of Arikera, and then stormed the lines of Seringapatam, which covered the Sultan's capital. A few more days' fighting would have put it in the hands of Cornwallis, but when Tipu humbled himself and asked for peace, he was spared. Nearly half his dominions were taken from him, part to be added to the Madras presidency, part to be given to the Nizam and the Marathas. It was fortunate that Tipu did not delay his attack on the Allies for a few years. If he had waited a little longer, he would have found England deep in her struggle with the French Revolution. As it was, he was so crushed that he gave no trouble for eight years more. The Perpetual Settlement Hardly less important than the Mysore War was Cornwallis's well-intentioned but ill-judged measure, the Perpetual Settlement of Bengal. This was a scheme for permanently fixing the land revenue of that province by assessing a fair rent to be paid to the company, as Supreme Lord of the Soil, which should not vary from year to year, but remain forever at the moderate figure at which it was now settled. But unfortunately Cornwallis did not make the bargain with the ryots or peasants, the real owners of the land, but with the zamindars, a class of hereditary tax collectors who were one of the legacies left to us by the old Mughal rulers of India. As the government made its contract with the zamindar, for the rent of each group of villages, and undertook never to ask more from him than a certain fixed amount, it became the interest of this tax-collecting class to screw up the contributions of the villagers to the highest point, as the whole profit went into their own pockets. The rack-renting led to a general strike among the peasantry, who agreed to withhold their rents, and to go to law with the Zaminders en masse, knowing that they could choke the law courts for years by sending in thousands of appeals at the same moment. The result of this conspiracy, much like one that was seen in Ireland only a few years ago, was to ruin most of the Zaminders, who became liable for the land tax to the government and could not raise it while the riots were fighting them in the courts. In any other country than Bengal, this crisis must have led to agrarian civil war, but the Bengalis preferred litigation to outrages, and affairs ultimately settled down. Later legislation has wisely taken note of the rights of the riot, as well as those of the zamindar, but the pledge of the perpetual settlement has never been broken, and to this day the lands of Bengal pay no more to the Crown than the moderate assessment of 1793, a standing proof that the British government keeps its word. Cornwallis came home in 1794 to find England plunged in the greatest war that she has ever known, that with the French Revolution. End of section 79「
England and the French Revolution, 1789 to 1802, Part 1. The Meeting of the States General. In the year 1789, when Pitt was in the zenith of his power, strong in the confidence of the nation and the king, signs of trouble began to appear across the British Channel, which attracted the attention of all intelligent men. The Great French Revolution was commencing. In May 1789, King Louis XVI summoned the States General of France to meet at Versailles in order to consult with him on measures for averting the impending bankruptcy of the realm. It was nearly two centuries since the last states general had assembled, and nothing but dire necessity drove the king to call into being the assembly which his despotic ancestors had so carefully prevented from meeting. But France was in a desperate condition. The greedy and outrageous Louis the Fourteenth and the vicious spendthrift Louis the Fifteenth had piled up a mountain of debts which the nation could no longer support. The existing king, though personally he was mild and unenterprising, had been drawn into the war of American independence and wasted on it many millions more. The only way out of the difficulty was to persuade the nation to submit to new imposts, and most especially to induce the nobles to surrender their old feudal privilege of exemption from taxation. France under the Ancien Régime the king and his ministers were only thinking of the financial trouble, but by summoning the states general, they gave the power of speech to discontented France and found themselves confronted by a much larger problem. The realm had been grossly misgoverned for the last century by a close ring of royal ministers who constituted a bureaucracy of the most narrow-minded sort. Louis the Fourteenth had crushed out all local institutions and liberties in order to impose his royal will on every man. The the lesser kings who followed had allowed the power to slip from their own hands into those of the close oligarchy of bureaucrats whom the Grand Monarque had organized. France, under the Ancien Regime, was suffering all the evils that result from over-centralization and red tape. The smallest provincial affairs had to be referred to the ministers at Paris, who tried to settle everything, but only succeeded in meddling and delaying all local improvements. The most hopeless feature of the time was that the nobility and gentry were excluded from all political power by the Parisian bureaucrats, though suffered to attain all their old feudal privileges and exemptions. Thus they were objects of jealousy to the other classes, yet had no share in the governance of the realm or opportunity to temper the despotism of the royal ministers. Two old medieval abuses survived to make the situation of the country yet more unbearable. Offices of all kinds were openly bought and sold, while taxation was not raised directly by the state, but leased out to greedy tax farmers, who mulcted the public of far more than they paid into the national treasury. Growth of Discontent, Voltaire and Rousseau While the government was in this deplorable condition, public opinion had of late been growing more and more restive. All the educated classes of France were permeated with deep discontent. Ideals of constitutional government, borrowed originally from English political writers, were in the air. The recent alliance with America had familiarized many Frenchmen with Republican institutions and notions of self-government. The opposition was headed by the chief literary men of the age. The stinging sarcasms of Voltaire were aimed against all ancient shams and delusions. Nothing was safe from his criticism, and most of all did he ridicule the corrupt Gallican church with its hierarchy of luxurious and worldly prelates and its bigoted and superstitious lower clergy. While Voltaire was decrying old institutions and teaching men to be skeptical of all ancient beliefs, his younger contemporary, the sentimental and visionary Rousseau, was advocating a return to the state of nature. He taught that man was originally virtuous and happy, and that all evil was the result of over-government, the work of priests and kings. He dreamed of a renewal of the golden age, and the abolition of laws and seats. All men were to be brothers, and to live free and equal without lord or master. Smarting under the narrow and stupid rule of the Ancien Regime, many friends 
Frenchman took these utopian ideas seriously and talked of setting up the reign of reason and humanity. Hence it came that all the claims and aspirations of the French Revolution were inspired by vague and visionary ideas of the rights of man and demanded the destruction of old institutions, unlike our English agitations for reform, which from the Magna Carta downwards have always claimed a restoration of ancient liberties, not the setting up of a new constitution. The National Assembly when the dull but well-intentioned Louis the Sixteenth had once summoned to the States General of 1789, he soon found that he had given himself a master, for the deputies of the Sieurs Etat, or Commons, instead of proceeding to vote new taxes, began to clamour for the redress of grievances of all kinds. When the king, like Charles I, threatened to dissolve them, their spokesman answered, We are here by the will of the people of France, and nothing but the force of bayonets shall disperse us. King Louis was too weak and slow to send the bayonets. He drew back and allowed the states general to organize themselves into a national assembly and to claim to represent the French nation. Storming of the Bastille the obvious weakness of the king encouraged the friends of revolution all over France to assert themselves. On July 14, 1789, the mob of Paris stormed the Bastille, the old state prison of the capital, and massacred the garrison. The king made no attempt to resent this riot and murder. Then followed a rapid series of constitutional decrees by which the assembly, backed by the pikes of the Parisian mob, abolished all the ancient despotic and feudal customs of the realm. It seemed for a moment as if a solid constitutional monarchy might be established, but the king was too feeble and the reformers too rash and wild. The taint of riot and murder hung about all their doings, and they were constantly calling in the mob to their aid. Foreseeing a catastrophe, the greater part of the French royal family and noblesse fled the realm. Year long, the king became little better than a prisoner in his own palace. English Sympathy with the revolution. These doings across the channel keenly interested England. At first they met with general approval. It looked as if France was about to become a limited monarchy, and as the personal and dynastic ambition of the Bourbons had always been the cause of our wars with them, English public opinion looked with favor on the substitution of the power of the National Assembly for that of the king. It was thought that France, under a constitutional government founded on English models, could not Failed to become the friend of England. Pitt expressed in a guarded way his approbation of the earlier stages of the revolution. Fox became its vehement admirer and panegyrist. He exclaimed that the storming of the Bastille was the greatest and best event in modern history, conveniently ignoring the cold-blooded massacre of its garrison which had followed. The greater part of the Whig party followed their chief and expressed unqualified praise for the doings of the French. Some of the more enthusiastic members of the party visited France and corresponded with the leaders of the revolution. Others formed political clubs to encourage and support the reformers across the channel. The Reaction Criticisms of Burke but the mood of generous admiration and universal approval could not last for long. As the revolution went on developing, while the outbursts of mob violence in France grew more frequent, and the National Assembly plunged into all manner of violence and arbitrary legislation, there began to be a schism in English public opinion. Fox and the more vehement Whigs still persisted in finding nothing to blame across the channel, explaining the violent deeds of the Parisians as mere effervescence of the mercurial French temper. But, curiously enough, it was a Whig, and one who never tired of singing the praises of our own Revolution of 1688, who was the first prophet of evil for the French movement. Edmund Burke, Fox's old colleague and ally, was an exponent of that view of constitutional liberty which looked on mob laws even worse than the despotism of kings. He fixed his eyes on the murderous riots in Paris and the spectacle of the humiliation of Louis the Sixteenth, not on the fair promises of a golden age made by the milder French reformers. The prospect of anarchy shocked him, and he used his unrivaled eloquence to warn the English nation to have nothing to do with a people of assassins and atheists. When a separation once appears between liberty and law, neither is safe, was his cry. And, unlikely as it appeared at first, Burke was entirely in the right. Nothing which he predicted of the French Revolution could exceed the realities which ere long came to pass. Attempted Flight of Louis the Sixteenth 
The consciousness of their own uncontrolled power was turning the brain of the French assembly and maddening the Parisian populace. They were irritated but not checked by the weak resistance and futile evasions of Louis the Sixteenth. At last they persuaded themselves that the king and the nobility were conspiring to take away their newly won liberties, while in reality Louis and his nobles alike were paralyzed with dread and only thinking of saving themselves. In the summer of 1791, the unfortunate king took the the fatal step of trying to escape by stealth from Paris. He stole away in disguise with his wife and children. They had got halfway to the eastern frontier before his absence was discovered. A chance caused his stoppage and discovery at Varennes. He was seized and sent back to Paris, where he was for the future treated as a prisoner, not as a king. Intervention of Austria and Prussia from this moment, it was the fixed belief in France that Louis had been about to fly to Germany in order to incite the despotic monarchs of Austria and Prussia against his country. In the assembly, the wilder party began to come to the front, preaching republicanism and crying that France could not be saved by constitutional reforms, but required bloodletting. Ere long, the symptoms of violence and anarchy, which had frightened Burke in England, exercised a still stronger effect on the rulers of the continent. Francis of Austria and Frederick William II of Prussia, alarmed as to the republican propaganda in France, and warned by the fate of their fellow king, began to concentrate their armies on the Rhine and to concert measures for putting down the revolution. On learning their plans, the French Assembly declared war on them in April 1792, but at first their raw levies fared ill against the Germans. Defeat, as always in France, was followed by the cry of treason, and on the 10th of August the Parisian mob stormed the Tuileries, slew the king's guards, and called for his deposition. A Republic proclaimed the September Massacres. The Democratic National Convention, which now superseded the Assembly, proclaimed a republic to the populace had massacred many hundreds of persons who were rightly or wrongly supposed to be the King's friends, September 2nd, 1792. The Convention gave its tacit sanction to these atrocities, in which some of its more violent members were personally implicated. Attitude of Pitt the news of the September massacres and the proclamation of the Republic cleared up forever the doubts of the English people as to the character of the French Revolution. Pitt's judicial attitude towards the movement had at last changed. In 1790, he had doubted whether it were good or bad. By 1792, he was convinced that it was dangerous, anarchic, and detestable, but still hoped to avoid coming into actual conflict with it. He was, in his heart, a peace minister, and it was circumstances not his own will, which were to make him the fomenter of leagues and confederacies against France for nine long years of war. When Austria and Prussia invited him to join them in their attack, he at first refused, but he was much disturbed by the bombastic Edict of Fraternity, which the Convention published, appealing to all the nations of Europe, all governments are our enemies, all peoples our friends, said this document, and the multitude in every land were invited to overthrow kings and ministers and receive the aid which France would give. Pitt looked upon this as an appeal to anarchy addressed to the discontented classes in England, and was much disturbed when he found that it was welcomed by some of the Whigs of the more popular and democratic section. A small but compact body of these extreme politicians were doing their best to frighten England into a frenzy of reaction by their unwise and unpatriotic conduct. Two clubs called the Corresponding Society and the Constitution Constitutional Society were founded in London for the propagation of revolutionary doctrines. They were composed of men of no weight or importance, visionary politicians with a craze for republicanism, men of disappointed ambitions who longed for a political crisis to bring them into notice, mob orators, and such like. These bodies deserved contempt rather than notice, but in view of the doings overseas, they attracted attention, and their noisy declamations in favor of the wilder doctrines of the French Revolution frightened the public. Especially was an outcry raised by the books and pamphlets of the celebrated free-thinker and Republican writer Tom Paine, the most blatant apologist of the atrocities in Paris. Panic in England, Repressive Legislation 
The average Englishman was sufficiently disgusted by the language of these home-grown revolutionaries from the first, but when more and more blood was shed in France, a measure of alarm was mixed with his dislike of the noisy clubs. Men began to remember the permanent existence in London of a large body of the dangerous classes. It was easy to assume a connection between the French government, the English revolutionary societies, and the dregs of the London streets. And indeed, a few wild spirits do seem to have talked to French agents of foolish plans for starting riots, setting fire to the capital, and seizing the tower arsenal in order to arm the mobs who, as they fought, would follow them. But the thousands of rioters and anarchists had no existence save in the brains of the French government and the alarmed and indignant English Tories. Their supposed designs, however, led to an unhappy panic in English legislation. The habeas corpus act was suspended, the right of free meeting restricted, even free speech in a measure fettered, by a wholly unnecessary series of government measures, which were in reality directed against a few hundred silly but noisy fanatics. It was like using a sledgehammer to crush a wasp. The moderate Whigs joined Pitt. Unfortunately, the ultimate effects of this scare were destined to endure throughout the twenty-two years of the coming war, and even after its end. The atrocities committed by the French revolutionists and the foolish talk of their English admirers were the cause of the secession of liberal legislation in England for a quarter of a century. Pitt himself, who had hitherto led the party of reform, felt the revulsion. His long series of wise and enlightened bills seizes in 1791, and his name became comes, unhappily, connected with stern and repressive laws of unnecessary severity. But it was not to be wondered at that he should act so, when we find that the larger half of the Whigs, the professors of an exaggerated zeal for liberty and popular government, now joined the Tories. After a continuous existence of a century, the Whig party suffered complete shipwreck. The majority of its members followed Burke in concluding an alliance with Pitt. Only a minority remained in opposition with Fox. In a party division taken before the actual commencement of the French War, Fox was followed by only fifty of his own party when he attempted to oppose a warlike address to the Crown. It may be worth noting that this wave of revulsion against the French Revolution is reflected in the English literature of the times. The younger authors of the day, such as Wordsworth and Sophie, are liberal and even republican when they begin to write, but after the worst side of the French movement developed, they rapidly slide into enthusiastic patriotism and denunciations of French anarchy and wickedness. End of section 80section 81 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a history of england by charles oman chapter 37 england and the french revolution 1789 to 1802 part 2 Louis the sixteenth executed, France declares war on England. When this was the state of English public feeling, two events conspired to urge the nation into the war for which men had gradually been preparing themselves. The first was the trial and execution of the unfortunate King of France. The Jacobin party, the followers of the bloodthirsty Marat, the blatant Danton, and the coldly ferocious Robespierre were now swaying the convention. They impeached Lewis, not so much for any definite acts of his, as to show that they were determined to be rid of monarchy. The coalized kings of Europe threaten us, said Danton. Let us hurl at their feet as a gauge the head of a king. Lewis was sent to the guillotine on the most empty and frivolous charges, January 21st, 1793. His unfortunate wife, Queen Marie Antoinette, followed him thither a few months after. Pitt immediately withdrew the English ambassador from Paris and began to prepare for war. But the actual casus belli was the determination of the French, who had now overrun Belgium, to open the Scheldt and make Antwerp a great naval arsenal. When Pitt protested, the convention declared war on George III, under the vain belief that the English people would take their side, and overturn Pitt and his master. The king and his parliament mean to make 
war on us, wrote a French minister, but the Republicans of England will not permit it. Already these free men show their discontent, and refuse to bear arms against their brethren. We will fly to their succor. We will lodge fifty thousand caps of liberty in England, and when we stretch out our arm to these Republicans, the tyranny of their monarchy will be overthrown. So on February 8th, 1793 began the great war which was to last with two short intervals till july seventh 1815 if england and france alone had been engaged in the struggle the famous saying about the impossibility of a duel between the whale and the elephant might have been applicable France, with her new levies just rushing into the field, had an army of something like five hundred thousand men. The English regular troops available for war overseas were, in 1792, about thirty thousand strong. On the other hand, the English fleet had one hundred and fifty three line of battle ships, the French only eighty six. The one nation was almost as superior by sea as the other by land. It was evident that we could only attack the French by land if we had continental allies, while France could not harm us by sea until she had secured assistance from other powers to increase her navy. But if with our limited army we could not hope to equal in the field the legions of France, we had one means of attacking her on land, the use of our power as the richest nation in Europe. Austria, Prussia, and the German states had large armies, but little money. England had much money, if few men. Accordingly, it was by liberal subsidies to the military powers of the continent that we from first to last fought France on land. History records nine separate coalitions which Pitt and his successors drew together and cemented with English gold in order to stay the progress first of the French Republic, then of the great man who inherited its position. English naval supremacy, Lord Howe's victory. The moment that the war began, the naval supremacy of England enabled her to seize most of the outlying French colonies. At the same time, our fleets moved down to blockade the great naval arsenals of Brest, Toulon, and Rochefort, where the French navy was cooped up. So thoroughly were the hostile fleets held in restraint that there was only one important sea fight in the first three years of the war. In the summer of 1794, the Brest squadron came out to convey a merchant fleet and was caught in and completely beaten by Lord Howe on the glorious 1st of June. Vigorous Government of the Convention, the Reign of Terror the years 1793 to 1794 were the hardest part of the war for the French. The coalition against them now comprised England, Austria, Prussia, Spain, Holland, and Sardinia. Assailed on every frontier by foreign enemies, they had also to face a formidable royalist rising in La Vendée and Brittany. Yet the convention made head against all its foes. The Jacobin faction, headed by the ruthless Robespierre, put a fearful energy into its generals by the summary method of sending every officer who failed to the guillotine. The sanguinary despotism which they exercised was a thing of which the most tyrannical monarch would never have dreamed. They had impeached and slain the Girondists, or moderate Republicans, in the summer of 1793. Six months later, Robespierre, determined to be supreme, had seized and executed his colleague and rival, Danton, and all his faction. The reign of terror made Paris a perfect shambles. 1,400 prisoners were guillotined in six weeks, and Robespierre called for yet more blood. Military success of the French. But these horrors within were accompanied by vigor without. Quickened by the axe hanging over their necks, the generals did their best and finally succeeded in beating back the allies whose motley armies failed to cooperate with each other and had no one commander who could direct the whole course of the war to a single end. English reverses in Flanders and at Toulon. England's part in these early years of the war was neither important nor glorious. The Duke of York, the second son of George III, was sent with 20,000 men to aid the Austrians in Flanders, but he was a very incapable commander, got beaten by the French at Hondeschu near Dunkirk, and was forced back into Holland, and at last chased as far as Hanover, 1793-94. to 94. 
Another failure was seen at Toulon in the same year. The royalist inhabitants of that town called in the English to their aid and surrendered its arsenal and fleet, but the place was indifferently defended by General O'Hara and fell back into the hands of the Republicans after a short siege, mainly owing to the ability displayed by a young artillery officer named Napoleon Bonaparte. The only compensating advantage was that, before evacuating the place, the English were able to burn the French fleet and arsenal. Fall of Robespierre, the Directory Pitt had said that when all Europe united against the nation of wild beasts and madmen, two campaigns would settle the business. But at the end of 1794, things seemed further from a settlement than ever. For the coalition against France, after faring ill in the field, both in Flanders and on the Rhine, began to show signs of breaking up. That this was possible came from the fact that the reign of terror and the domination of the implacable Robespierre were at last ended. The time had come when he and his associates, having guillotined all available royalists and moderates, were reduced to preying upon their own party in their insane desire to find imaginary conspirators against the Republic. Robespierre fell at the hands of the rank and file of the Jacobins, who found the rule of the dictator intolerable, when it began to imperil their own necks. Having long shared in his misdoings, they sent him to the guillotine when he began to terrify them. July 1794. Talion, Berer, Barat, and the other leaders in Robespierre's overthrow were, if less ferocious than their master, full of vices of which he could not have been accused, profligate, venal, and corrupt. But however bad they were, they yet reversed Robespierre's policy. The executions and massacres ceased, and the reign of the guillotine came to an end. The convention dissolved itself in 1795, and gave place to the government of the Directory, a committee of five ministers, of whom Barat was chief. Prussia and Spain acknowledged the Republic. This Directory, though venal and greedy, was a settled government, with which foreign powers could treat, not a gang of bloodthirsty madmen like Robespierre and his crew. When the Jacobin propaganda of murder and massacre was ended, several of the powers of the coalition determined to make peace with France. Prussia and Spain had drawn no profit from the war, and had lost men and money in it. Accordingly, they withdrew their armies and acknowledged the Republic. Holland had been overrun by the French in 1794, after the Duke of York's defeat, and forced to become an ally of her conqueror. Hence the strong and well-equipped Dutch fleet is found for the rest of the war on the side of France. Policy of the Directory Alliance with Spain Thus England, Austria, and Sardinia alone remained of the original Confederates, and the war began to grow more like the old struggles in the early years of the century. It ceased to be a war of opinion between England as representing constitutional monarchy and France as representing rampant and militant democracy. We find the Directory taking up the old policy of the Bourbons, claiming the frontier of the Rhine on land, and aiming at breaking the strength of England at sea in order to seize our colonies and ruin our commerce. For the future, the French government was not set on stirring up the London mob and deposing George III, but on fomenting war in India and rebellion in Ireland so as to break our national strength. The likeness of the struggle to the old times of the family compact became still more notable when, in 1796, Spain, from reasons of old commercial jealousy, was induced to declare war on England and join France. We had now to face the united fleets of France, Holland, and Spain, a much more formidable task than had hitherto been our lot. Bonaparte in Italy, Treaty of Campo Formio Things seemed almost desperate for England in 1797, when we lost our last continental allies. The Directory had made Napoleon Bonaparte commander of the Army of Italy in 1796. In two campaigns, that marvelous general overran the Austrian and Sardinian dominions in the Valley of the Po, and then, pushing on, crossed the Alps and invaded Austria from the south. When he was less than a hundred miles from Vienna, the Emperor asked for peace, and obtained it from Bonaparte by the Treaty of Campo Formio at the price of surrendering Belgium and Lombardy. October 1797 England threatened with invasion. 
Thus, England was left alone to face France, Holland, and Spain, whose fleets, if united, outnumbered our own. For the next three years, the safety of England hung on the power of our admirals to keep the junction from taking place. Six English fleets were always at sea, facing the six great naval ports of the Allies: the Texel, Brest, Ferrol, Cadiz, Cartagena, and Toulon. It was clear that if one or more of the blockaded fleets got away and joined another, the English would be outnumbered at the critical point, and if once beaten, could not prevent an invasion of England. If only the command of the Channel were lost, there was nothing to prevent the victorious armies that had overrun Germany, Holland, and Italy from coming ashore in Kent or Sussex. Financial panic in England. In return, Pitt called on England for a great effort. The war expenditure was increased to forty-two million pounds a year, and every nerve was strained to keep up the fleet. This enormous outpouring of money drained the exchequer to such a degree that public confidence began to fail. And in February 1797, there almost occurred the national disaster of the bankruptcy of the Bank of England. A long and steady demand for hard. Cash by creditors who feared the worst drained the bank reserve till there was no more gold left. A crash was only staved off by Pitt passing in a single night a bill for suspending payments in gold and for making bank notes legal tender to any amount, so that no one could demand as a right from the bank five guineas for his five guinea note. This state of things lasted till 1819, when cash payments were renewed. The mutiny at the Nore, but, but this trouble was nothing compared to the awful danger three months later, when the Channel and North Sea fleets burst out into mutiny in April 1797. These mutinies were early examples of the phenomena which we know so well in our own days under the name of strikes. The sailors had suffered greatly from the long blockading service, which kept them perpetually at sea off the French and Dutch ports. Their pay was low, their food bad, and their commanders in many. Any cases harsh and cruel, they had therefore much excuse for themselves when they demanded a better diet, higher pay, a fairer distribution of prize money, and the dismissal of certain tyrannous officers. But the time they chose for their strike was inexcusable. For a while they lay idle at Lanore and Spithead. The French and Dutch might have sailed out, joined, and mastered the Channel. At first, it was feared that the navy had been corrupted by French principles and was about to declare for a republic and join. The enemy, but it was soon found that, with a few exceptions, the men were loyal and only wanted redress of grievances. Pitt wisely granted their demands, and they returned to duty, refusing to follow a few wild spirits who wished to begin a political insurrection. Few or none protested when Parker, the sailor demagogue, was hanged, and the fleet, which had been in mutiny in the summer, went out in the autumn to victory. Battles of Camperdown. And keep Saint Vincent. Some weeks after their opportunity was passed, the Dutch fleet came out of the Texel, hoping to find the North Sea still unguarded. But Admiral Duncan absolutely annihilated his enemies at the hard-fought Battle of Camperdown, October 1797. Some time earlier, another decisive victory had crushed the Spanish fleet. The Cadiz squadron of 27 line-of-battle ships had slipped out to sea, but Admiral Jervis, well seconded by his great lieutenant. Lieutenant Nelson followed them and beat them off Cape Saint Vincent, though he had only fourteen ships with him. This was the most extraordinary victory in the whole war when the disparity of numbers is taken into consideration. The victories of Saint Vincent and Camperdown were the salvation of England, for the naval crisis was tided over and the union of the hostile fleets prevented. During the remainder of the war, the French often threatened invasion, but were never able to get that command of the Channel, which they might have seized without trouble during the mutiny at the Nore. The restored dominion of England at sea was all the more important because of the danger in Ireland, which was now impending. Ireland under the Parliament. Of seventeen eighty-two, 
Though Ireland had obtained her home rule parliament in 1782, her troubles were as far from an end as ever. The government of the island was still in the hands of the Protestants of the Church of Ireland alone, and the Romanists and Protestant dissenters were still excluded from many political rights. Thus six-sevenths of the people had no part in governing themselves, and the five-sevenths who were Romanists were even yet subject to many of the repressive laws against their religion passed in the reign of William the Third. though in 1792 they were at last granted freedom of public worship and allowed to vote for members of Parliament, they could not sit therein. The rule of the Irish Tories was harsh and arbitrary. From the outbreak of the French Revolution onward, they had suspected, and with justice, that the French would endeavour to raise trouble in, in Ireland, for there alone in the British Isles was to be found a discontented population, held down by a minority which governed entirely in its own interests, and took no heed of the desires of its subjects. There had always been close communication between France and Ireland since the old Jacobite days, and and many Irish exiles were living beyond the seas. Hence it was not strange that first the discontented Protestant dissenters and afterwards the Roman Catholics put themselves into communication with the French, the latter more reluctantly than the former, for they were the most bigoted of Papists, and much disliked the atheists and freethinkers who guided the revolution. From 1793 to 1798, Ireland was being undermined with secret societies, much like like the Fenians of our own days, whose intrigues the Tory government strove in vain to detect and frustrate. The United Irishmen The chief of these associations was called the United Irishmen, because it worked for the combination of the dissenters of the North and the Romanists of the South in the common end of rebellion. The original leaders in the conspiracy were all hot-headed radical politicians, who had been fired with the enthusiasm of the French Revolution. Their chiefs were Lord Edward Fitzgerald, a young nobleman of republican proclivities, Wolfe Tone, a violent party pamphleteer who had hitherto called himself a Whig, and Bond, a Dublin tradesman. Hoche's attempt to invade Ireland. These conspirators did not at first intend to rise without getting aid from France, and till 1796 there was never much chance of their friends overseas being able to send them help. But when the fleets of France, Spain, and Holland were united, it seemed possible to send an expedition to Ireland. In December 1796, the press squadron took on board 16,000 men under the young and vigorous General Hoche, and made a dash for the coast of Munster. Slipping out while the English blockading squadron was blown off by a storm, Hoche's fleet got safely to sea, but the ships met with a hurricane and were so beaten about and dispersed that only half of them reached their rendezvous at Bantry Bay in County Kerry. Hoche, their leader, never appeared, and Grouchy, his lieutenant, the man who in later years was Napoleon's unlucky marshal, shrank from landing with 7,000 men in an unknown country where he could detect no signs of the promised insurrection. He lost heart when returned to Brest without having been met or molested by the English. If he had landed, there is no doubt that the whole south of Ireland would have risen to join him. In the next year there was an even greater peril of invasion while the English fleet was in mutiny. The Dutch squadron, which was beaten at Camperdown, had been given Ireland as its goal, and might have got there unopposed if it had started six weeks earlier. Harsh Measures of the Irish Government Conscious of the danger which it was incurring, the Irish government was stirred up to vigorous measures. All the loyalists of Ireland, the Orange Men, as they were now called, had already been embodied in regiments of yeomanry, and were ready to move at the first alarm of rebellion. Lord Lake, the commander-in-chief in Ireland, was directed to disarm the whole Catholic population and to search everywhere for concealed arms. The order was carried out with more vigilance than mercy, as the task of finding the weapons was entrusted to the Orangemen of the Yeomanry Corps, who were determined to crush their rebellious countrymen at any cost. They employed the roughest measures to elicit information, flogging the suspected peasants and torturing them with pitch caps and pointed sticks till they revealed the hiding place of their 
their weapons. But if cruel, Lake's measures were completely successful. In Ulster, where the search began, no less than 50,000 muskets and 70,000 pikes were seized, and if the same energy had been displayed in other parts of Ireland, the rebellion of 1798 would have been impossible. But the outcry caused in the Irish and English parliaments by the rough doings of the yeomanry prevented the full execution of the disarmament, and the United Irishmen of the South retained their concealed weapons and waited for the signal of revolt. Outbreak of the Rebellion The crisis came in the spring of 1798, when the government were at last put by an informer on the track of the Central Committee of the United Irishmen. The leaders and organizers who had so long eluded them were thus caught and lodged in Dublin Castle, save Lord Edward Fitzgerald, who fought with the police who came to arrest him, slew two, and was himself killed in the struggle. The seizure of the chiefs, instead of wrecking the conspiracy, caused it to burst out with sudden violence. Violence, for the Irish thought that all was discovered, and that rebellion was the only way to save their necks. An abortive rising in Ulster was easily put down, but in the southeast of Ireland the whole countryside rose in arms, and great bodies of insurgents attacked not only the loyal yeomanry, but every Protestant family in the district. The rebels were under no central control, and were headed only by village ruffians and ignorant and bigoted priests. Acts worthy of the Parisian mob were perpetrated by the peasantry of Wexford, where the rebellion was strongest. They shot the Bishop of Ferns and many other non-combatants, including women and children. On Wexford Bridge, they put several scores of persons to death by tossing them in the air and catching them on pikes. At Scullabo, they burnt alive a whole barn full of prisoners. Battle of Vinegar Hill for a fortnight there was sharp fighting in the south, for the rebels showed as much courage as ferocity. But the orange yeomanry were stirred to frantic wrath by the atrocities of their enemies, and put down the insurrection with little aid from the regular troops. The decisive fighting was at the fortified camp of Vinegar Hill, the chief stronghold of the rebels. When it was stormed, and when Father Murphy, the leader of the Wexford men, had fallen, the peasants dispersed. The atrocities which they had committed were prompt avenged, and the triumphant orangemen hanged or shot hundreds of prisoners with small attention to the forms of justice. General Humbert's Expedition Two months after the Battle of Vinegar Hill, a small French expedition succeeded in slipping out of Rochefort and landed in Connaught. But the back of the rebellion was broken, and though General Humbert routed some militia at Castlebar, he was soon surrounded and captured by Lord Cornwallis, the Lord Lieutenant, who beset him with a tenfold superiority of numbers. Pitt's scheme for uniting England and Ireland. The Great Rebellion of 1798 led to the Legislative Union of England and Ireland. Pitt and his lieutenant, Cornwallis, thought, rightly enough, that the rising had come from the fact that the large majority of the Irish were handed over without representation or political rights to be governed by the minority. They devised two schemes for bettering the state of the land. The Romanists were to receive emancipation, that is, the same rights as their neighbours of the the Church of Ireland, and at the same time an end was to be put to the Dublin Parliament and the Irish members incorporated in the Parliament of Great Britain. For emancipation without union would have given the Romanists a majority in the Dublin Parliament, and led to a bitter struggle between them and their old masters, which must have ended in a second civil war. The Act of Union Passed the process of persuading or bribing the Anglo-Irish Protestant aristocracy to give up their national parliament took two years. They bitterly disliked the idea and were only induced to yield by a liberal shower of titles and pensions and a goodly compensation and cash distributed among the chief borough owners and peers. It was not till February 18th, 1800, twenty months after the rebellion had been crushed, that the Irish houses voted their own destruction. For the future, Ireland was represented by 32 peers and 100 commoners in the parliament of the United Kingdom. After completing the Union, Pitt began to take in hand his scheme of Catholic emancipation, but he was not destined to carry it through, a fact which was in a short time to have a widely felt influence on English politics. End of section 81. Section 82 of A History of England. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 37. England and the French Revolution, 1789-1802, to 1802, Part 3. Bonaparte in Egypt. Meanwhile, the French war was still raging. Having failed to win command of the seas, and having been equally disappointed in their plans for causing rebellion in Ireland, the French Directory tried another scheme for injuring England. Napoleon Bonaparte, the young general who had conquered Italy in 1796-7, to was now the first man in France. He had lately formed a grandiose scheme for erecting a great empire in the Levant. From thence he intended to strike a blow at the English dominions in India, which he regarded as the chief source of our wealth. The venal and incapable members of the Directory feared Bonaparte, and were glad to get him out of France. They at once fell in with his plan, and gave him the Toulon fleet, and an army of thirty thousand men, keeping his destination a profound secret— Bonaparte sailed from Toulon in May 1798. He piratically seized Malta from the Knights of St. John as he passed, to make it a halfway house to his intended goal. Then, pushing on eastwards, he landed at Alexandria, and in a few weeks overran the whole of Egypt, though France had never declared war on the Sultan of Turkey, the ruler of that land. Once seated there, he began to develop a gigantic scheme for the conquest of the whole East, vowing that he would build up an Oriental Empire and attack Europe from the rear. His first care was to send emissaries to Tipu Sultan, the son of our old Indian enemy, Hyder Ali, bidding him to attack the English in India with the assurance of French support. Battle of the Nile Soon after Bonaparte had taken Cairo, he heard that the ships which had brought him to Egypt had been destroyed. Admiral Nelson, the commander of the English Mediterranean fleet, had arrived too late to prevent the French army from disembarking. But finding the squadron lying in Abukir Bay, he determined to destroy it. The enemy lay moored in shallow water, close to the land, but Nelson resolved to follow them into their anchorage. Sending half his ships to slip in between the enemy and the shore, he led the other half to attack them on the side of the open sea. This difficult maneuver was carried out with perfect success. First the van, then the center, then the rear of the French fleet were beset on two sides. The squadrons were exactly equal in numbers, each counting thirteen line of battle ships. But so great was the superiority of the English seamanship and gunnery that eleven out of the thirteen French vessels were sunk or taken in a few hours. This brilliant feat of naval tactics had the important result of cutting off Bonaparte power to return to France. He was penned up in Egypt as in an island, with no way of egress save by the desert route to Syria. Nor could any further reinforcements reach him from France, since the victory of the Nile gave Nelson complete command of the Mediterranean. But Bonaparte did not at first show any dismay. He was firmly established in Egypt, and had resolved to persevere in his attempt to conquer the whole east with his own army. Siege of Acre. In the winter of 1798-99, to he crossed the desert and flung himself upon Syria. He turned the Turks out of the southern part of the land, and won a great victory over them at Mount Tabor. But before the walls of the seaport of Acre, he was brought to a standstill, not so much by the gallantry of the Turkish garrison, as by the activity of a small English squadron under Sir Sidney Smith, which harassed the besiegers, threw supplies into the town, and landed men to assist the Pasha when the French tried to take the place by storm. Bonaparte used to say in later days that but for Sidney Smith, he might have died as Emperor of the East. At last he was forced to raise the siege and to retreat on Egypt, where he found startling news awaiting him, May 1799. 
renewed coalition against France. While he was absent in the East, Pitt had found means to start a new coalition against France in which both Russia and Austria were engaged. The imbecile directory was quite unable to keep these foes at bay. An Austro-Russian army drove the French completely out of Italy, and at the same time another Austrian army defeated them in Germany and pressed them back to the Rhine, while an English force under the Duke of York landed in Holland to threaten the northern frontiers of the Republic. Return of Bonaparte Bonaparte had expected something of the kind, knowing the imbecility of the directory, and he was now ready to pose as the saviour of France and to make a bid for supreme power, for his ambition ran far beyond that of being merely the chief of French generals. Leaving his army in Egypt, he ran the gauntlet of the English fleet and safely reached France. Bonaparte First Consul The accusations of mismanagement which he brought against the directory were supported by French public opinion, especially by that of the army. With small difficulty, Bonaparte defroned the directory and dispersed by force of arms the Council of 500, which represented parliamentary government. He then instituted a new form of constitution, which was in reality, though not in shape, a military despotism. Under the title of First Consul, he he became the supreme ruler of France. November 1799. Battles of Marengo and Hohenlinden, Peace of Luneville. The nation acquiesced in this change because Bonaparte had pledged himself to save France from the coalition if he was entrusted with a dictatorship. He kept his word. Crossing the Alps by the path of the great St. Bernard, where no large army had crossed before, he got into the rear of the Austrians in Italy, and then beat them at the Battle of Marengo, June 1800. Cut off from their retreat, the Austrians had to surrender, and all Italy fell back into the hands of Bonaparte. Later in the same year, the French won an equally crushing victory in South Germany at Hohenlinden, where General Moreau annihilated the Austrian army of the north. Russia had already withdrawn from the coalition, but the eccentric Tsar Paul had conceived a great admiration for Bonaparte and did not object to a despot, though he hated a republic. The Duke of York had been driven out of Holland long before, and France was triumphant all along the line. Austria, threatened with invasion at once on the west and the south, was forced to ask for peace, and by the Peace of Luneville, recognized Napoleon as ruler of France. 1801. Lord Wellesley and Tipu Sultan, Southern India subdued. Thus England was once more left alone to fight out her old duel with France, or rather with the vigorous and able despot who had made France his own. But the struggle was no longer so dangerous as in 1797-98. to In every quarter of the globe, the English held their own in the year 1799-1801. to In India, the intrigues of Bonaparte had caused Sultan Tipu of Mysore to attack the Madras presidency. But he was opposed by a man of great ability, Lord Lord Wellesley, the new Governor-General of India, the first statesman who boldly proposed to make the whole peninsula of Hindustan subject or vassal to England. Wellesley dealt promptly and sternly with the Sultan of Mysore. He was beaten in battle, chased back to his capital of Seringapatam, and slayed at the gate of his palace as he strove to resist the English stormers. It was in this siege that Wellesley's brother, Arthur Wellesley, the great Duke of Wellington of a later day first distinguished himself. On Tipu's death, half Mysore was annexed, the other half given back to the old Hindu Rajas whom Tipu's father had deposed. May 1799. The complete subjugation of southern India was shortly afterwards carried out by the annexation of the Carnatic, where the descendants of our old ally Muhammad Ali had fallen into utter defeatness. They had, moreover, been detected in intrigues with Tipu during the late war. Capture of Malta, the French expelled from Egypt. The conquest of Mysore was not the only English success that resulted from Bonaparte's expedition to Egypt. In 1800, we took Malta from the garrison which he had left there. In 1801, the more important task of reconquering Egypt itself was undertaken. Sir Ralph Abercrombie landed on Abukir with 20,000 men. He twice defeated the French in front of Alexandria, but fell just as he had won the second battle. He had, however, done his work so thoroughly that the hostile army 
was compelled to capitulate and to evacuate Egypt, which England then restored to the Turks, March to August 1801. The armed neutrality, Battle of Copenhagen. Bonaparte had still one carriage to play. He used the personal influence which he had acquired over the eccentric autocrat of Russia to endeavor to stir up trouble for England in the north. At his prompting, Tsar Paul induced his smaller neighbors, Denmark and Sweden, to form the armed neutrality with the object of excluding English trade from the Baltic. England at once sent a great fleet to the north. It moored before Copenhagen, the Danish capital, which commands the main entrance to the Baltic, and summoned the Danes to abandon the armed neutrality and permit the English to pass. The Prince Regent of Denmark refused, and the Battle of Copenhagen followed. The slow and pedantic Admiral Sir Hyde Parker was proceeding to dilatory tactics, but his hand was forced by his second-in-command, Nelson, the victor of the Nile. Disregarding his superior's orders to hold back, Nelson forced his way up the straits to Copenhagen, sunk or took nearly the whole Danish fleet, and silenced the shore batteries. When he threatened to bombard the city, the Prince Regent asked for an armistice and abandoned the armed neutrality. April 1801 Death of the Tsar Paul Nelson now entered the Baltic and would have attacked Russia, but the death of Tsar Paul saved him the trouble. The tyrant had so maddened his nobles by his caprices and cruelty that he was slain by conspirators in his own bedchamber. His son, Alexander I, promptly came to terms with England and abandoned his French alliance. Pitt and Catholic Emancipation just before the Battle of Copenhagen had been fought, England lost the minister who had guided her in peace and war for the last seventeen years. The pilot who weathered the storm, as a popular song of the day called him. Pitt resigned his place on a point of honor. In the spring of 1801, they met the first united parliament of Great Britain and Ireland, and before this new assembly, the premier intended to lay his promised bill for the relief of Roman Catholics from their political disabilities. This measure was destined to cause the great statesman's fall. The bigoted and stubborn old king whom he had served so faithfully had a stronger prejudice against justice for Catholics than against any other reform that could be mooted. He imagined that any measure giving them emancipation would be against the terms of his coronation oath, and openly said that he would never make himself a perjurer by giving his royal assent to Pitt's bill. The Prime Minister had an exaggerated view of the duty of loyalty, and a great personal regard for his old master. On the other hand, he had solemnly pledged himself to the Irish Romanists to back their cause as long as he was in power. Under the circumstances, he thought himself bound to resign his office and retired in March 1801. Addington succeeds Pitt, Madness of the King. George replaced his old servant by a man infinitely beneath him, Henry Addington, a commonplace Tory, one of Pitt's least able lieutenants. This vapid non-entity had the single merit of want of originality. He went on with Pitt's policy because he could devise no other. But his weakness and subservience to the crown might have induced George III to revert to some of his former unconstitutional habits if the old king had not gone mad soon after. He recovered his senses after some months, but was never the same man again, and was liable to recurring fits of insanity, which at last became permanent. It was the feeble Addington who was fated to bring to an end the first epoch of the great war with France, though he had not been concerned in the labor of bearing its brunt. Bonaparte had failed in all his schemes against England, alike in Egypt, India, and the Baltic. The French navy was crushed, most of the French colonies were in English hands, he was accordingly glad to make peace, partly in order to take breath and build up a new naval power before assaulting England again, partly in order to find leisure to carry out his plans for making himself the permanent ruler of France, for he was set on becoming something more than first consul, and needed time to perfect his plan. 
the peace of Amiens. England was not less desirous of peace. The long stress of the war had wearied the nation, and the load of debt which had been piled up since 1793 appalled the ministers. When Bonaparte offered to treat, his proposals were eagerly accepted. Negotiations were begun in October 1801, and peace was signed at Amiens on March 25th, 1802, with France, Spain, and Holland. It was not unprofitable. Bonaparte undertook to withdraw the French armies from Naples, Rome, and Portugal, and gave up any claims to Egypt. He made his allies, the Dutch and Spaniards, surrender to us the rich islands of Ceylon and Trinidad. Malta, now in English hands, was to be restored to the Knights of St. John. On the other hand, England recognized Bonaparte as first consul, and restored to him all the French colonies which we had conquered, from Martinique in the west to Pondicherry in the east. Considering the imminent danger which we had passed through in the last nine years, the nation was glad to obtain peace on these respectable, if not brilliant, terms. It was hoped that our struggle with France was at last ended. End of section 82All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 38. England and Bonaparte. 1802-1815. Part 1. When the Treaty of Amiens had been signed, the English people firmly believed that the Great War was ended, that the period of stress and anxiety of heavy taxation and huge armaments of threatened invasions and domestic strife was finally closed. Bonaparte, who needed an interval of peace for the working out of his domestic policy, had affected a frank, liberal, and conciliatory spirit in dealing with our diplomatists, and had produced on them the impression that a reasonable as well as strong man was now at the helm at Paris. The France with which we had come to terms was no longer the wild and militant republic of the old Jacobin days, but a well-ordered and strongly centralized monarchy, though its ruler did not yet bear the title of king. If Bonaparte had really intended to accept the situation and dwell in peace beside us as a loyal neighbor, the Treaty of Amiens would have needed no defense. But Addington and his fellows had not gouged the first consul's true character or the peculiarities of his position. He had risen to power by war, his power depended on his military prestige, and a permanent peace would have ruined his control over his army, which he had gorged with plunder and glory, and turned into a greedy and arrogant military caste. But it was hard to expect English statesmen to see through the character and designs of a man whom the French themselves had not yet learnt to know. And when an honorable peace was preferred, it would have been wrong to refuse it. The internal condition of England called for rest and retrenchment. Schemes of Bonaparte. But the First Consul's real objects in concluding the Peace of Amiens were purely personal and selfish. He wished to recover the lost French colonies and to rebuild the ruined French navy. He needed peace to reorganize the control of France over her vassal states in Holland, Italy, and Switzerland, which she had bound to her chariot wheels during the late wars. Most of all, he required a space of leisure to prepare for that assumption of monarchical power which he had been plotting ever since his return from Egypt. His conduct towards England. While England was thinking only of peace, and while thousands of English were embarking on the continental travel which had been denied them for nine years, Bonaparte was already beginning to show the cloven hoof. In the autumn of 1802, he annexed to France the continental half of the dominions of our old ally, the King of Sardinia, and the Duchy of Parma. He sent 30,000 men into Switzerland to occupy the chief passes of the Alps. He ordered the vassal republics in Holland and North Italy to place prohibitive duties on English merchandise. These actions, though irritating, were not actual breaches of the peace, but things grew more serious when he made the impudent request that we should expel from our shores the exiled princes of the old royal house of France, and that our government should suppress certain newspapers which criticized his rule in France too sharply. These demands were, of course, refused. The First Consul then began to harp on the question of the evacuation of Malta. The island was still garrisoned 
garrisoned by English troops, as its old masters, the Knights of St. John, were not yet in a position to resume their dominion there. When England refused to evacuate Malta at once, and ventured to remonstrate about the annexation of Piedmont and Parma, Bonaparte assumed a most offensive attitude. He summoned Lord Whitworth, her ambassador at Paris, into his presence, and in the midst of a large assembly at the Tuileries, delivered an angry harangue to him, declaring that the English cabinet had no respect for honor or treaties, and was wishing to drive him to a new war. He did not wish to fight, he said, but if he once drew the sword, it should never be sheathed till England was crushed. War declared, seizure of English subjects in France. This insulting message roused even the feeble Addington to anger. With extreme reluctance and dismay, the cabinets began to contemplate the possibility of a renewed war with France. A royal message was laid before Parliament asking for increased votes for the army and navy, which had just been cut down on account of the peace. Bonaparte, on the other hand, began to move masses of troops towards the shores of the English Channel and to order the building of many ships of war. Addington attempted further negotiations for steving off a collision, but met no response from the First Consul, who refused to listen to any offers till we should have evacuated Malta and recognized the legality of his annexations in Italy and Switzerland. Nothing could be done to bring him to reason, and on May 12, 1803, our ambassador left Paris and war was declared, only thirteen months after the signing of the Peace of Amiens. Bonaparte had perhaps been intent on bullying the English cabinet, and had fancied that they would yield to his hectoring. He showed intense irritation when war was declared, and committed a flagrant breach of international law by seizing all the English tourists and travellers who were passing through France on business or pleasure, and imprisoning them as if they were prisoners of war. They were about ten thousand in number, and Bonaparte had the cruelty to keep them confined during the whole of the war. Another sign of his malice was that he kept accusing the English government of instigating assassins to murder him. There was, indeed, hardly a crime which he did not lay to the account of his enemies. The second act of the great drama of the French War had now begun. The first had lasted nine years. This was to endure for eleven, from May 1803 to March 1814. The whole war is indeed one if we regard it as the last struggle for commercial and maritime supremacy between England and her old rival, and compare it with the Seven Years' War and the War of American Independence. Nature of the Contest Between England and France but, on the other hand, the aspect of the strife was greatly changed by the fact that England had no longer the principles of the revolution to fight, but was engaged in a struggle against an ambitious despot, a world conqueror who had no parallel save Caesar or Alexander the Great. The France of Bonaparte only resembled the France of Robespierre in the unscrupulous vigor of her assaults on her enemies. She was no longer professing to fight for a principle, the deliverance of oppressed peoples from the yoke of monarchy, and the proclamation of liberty, equality, and and fraternity for all men. Though Bonaparte still made a parade of being a beneficent liberator, yet France was now fighting to make herself the tyrant state of Europe, to win power and plunder, not to carry out the principles of the revolution. In the long struggles that followed the declaration of war in 1803, Bonaparte at one time and another struck down every government in Europe that dared to stand against him, but England he could never subdue. From the moment when Sidney Smith turned him back from the walls of Acre, down to the moment when Wellington drove him a broken and defeated adventurer from the hillside of Waterloo, it was always England that stood between him and complete success. Hence it came that he honoured her with a venomous hatred such as he never bestowed on any other foe. It may be said with much truth that his whole career after 1803 was a crusade against England, and that all his actions were directed to secure her ruin, whether that ruin was to be brought about in the open strife of contending fleets, or in the slow but deadly working of laws aimed against English commerce and industries. When Bonaparte was meeting and beating the Austrian, the Prussian, or the Russian, he felt that he was fighting the hired soldiers of England, for every confederacy against him was cemented with English gold. The final object of all his continental wars was to crush us. His victories were all means to that end. In a contest between a single despot and a free state, the former has in many ways the advantage. He has no parliament to 
to criticize his actions, no public opinion before which he is bound to justify his every deed. He can work out his schemes in his own brain, and give them the unity that a single mastermind inspires. He can secure the implicit obedience of his lieutenants, because he alone can make or mar their career. On the other hand, the policy dictated by an English cabinet of a dozen men was prone to lack consistency and singleness of aim, and their plans and projects were divulged to Parliament, criticized by opponents, and trumpeted out to all Europe by the press before they were well set in hand. It was no light responsibility that the Addington Ministry took upon themselves when they declared war on the unscrupulous First Consul. The long struggle which followed may be divided into four epochs. In the first, 1803 to 1805, Bonaparte strove to settle the national duel by an actual invasion of England and lamentably failed. In the second, 1805 to 1808, England fought by subsidizing foreign allies while Bonaparte struck at his enemy by the continental system a plan for starving English trade. In the third period, 1808 to 1814, a new aspect was given to the struggle by the interference of England on land. Instead of relying on subsidies, we poured troops into Spain and met the French face to face. At the same time, the intolerable oppression which Bonaparte exercised over all the states of the continent led to national risings against him, which finally, in 1814, wrought his downfall. The fourth period comprises only the hundred days of March to June, 1815, in which the tyrant tried to seize once more his old place in power and suffered his final defeat at Waterloo. Bonaparte resolves to invade England. In the opening months of the war, Bonaparte set his mind on bringing the struggle to a rapid conclusion by crossing the Channel and invading England. He dispatched 120,000 veteran troops to the coast between Dunkirk and St. Valery and fixed his own headquarters at Boulogne, where the cliffs of Folkestone and Dover were actually in sight. The Channel is but a ditch, he said, and anyone can cross it who has but the courage to try. A fog might enable his whole army to slip across unseen, or a fortunate Gale might drive away the English fleet for the short twenty-four hours that he required. Hundreds and afterwards thousands of flat-bottomed boats were collected at Boulogne, the neighboring ports, and fitted up, some as armed gunboats, some as transports. The troops were trained to embark with extraordinary speed, so that they might not lose a minute when the signal for sailing should be given. But from June 1803 to September 1805 they waited, and yet the signal was never given. Defensive Measures, the Volunteer Movement, Recall of Pitt England faced the trial with wonderful courage. The nation was so wrathful at the wanton renewal of the war by Bonaparte, and at his arrogant threat of invasion, that it made efforts such as had never been dreamed of before. While the Addington Ministry was doubting how best to meet the projected attack, the nation itself solved the problem by the great volunteer movement. Almost every able-bodied man in England and Scotland offered himself for service. By the autumn of 1803, there were 347 fells volunteers under arms, besides 120,000 regular troops and 78,000 militia. This was a marvellous effort for a kingdom which then only counted 15 million souls. The volunteers, it is true, were imperfectly trained, often insufficiently officered, and unprovided with a proper proportion of cavalry and artillery, but when we consider their numbers and enthusiasm, it is only fair to conclude that even if Bonaparte had thrown his 120,000 or 150,000 men into Kent or Sussex, he would have been able to do little against such a vast superiority of numbers. Not contented with enrolling men for land service, the government displayed great energy in strengthening our first line of defense, the fleet. The dockyards were worked with such zeal and speed that 166 new vessels were added to the navy before the year was over. Blockading squadrons were hastily sent out to face all the French and Dutch naval ports as they had done in the old war. Not the least of the signs of national enthusiasm was that, in obedience to the public voice, Pitt, whose name was now bound up with a vigorous war policy, was recalled to the helm of state with the king's consent, while the weak Addington retired into the background. Attempted Irish Rebellion, English Success in India 
While Bonaparte was drilling his army for rapid embarkation and multiplying his gunboats, he utilized the time to stir up trouble for England in all parts of the world. He gave his approval to a wild scheme for an Irish rebellion, headed by the rash young revolutionary Robert Emmett, whose only achievement was to cause a riot in Dublin, murder Lord Kilwarden, the Chief Justice of Ireland, and get himself promptly hung. A more dangerous blow was aimed at our empire in India. French military adventure had been many and prosperous in the native courts of that country ever since the days of Duplay, and the first consul hoped by their aid to stir up the Nizam and the Maratha powers against England. But he had to deal with the able and vigorous Lord Wellesley, the greatest governor-general that India had known since Warren Hastings. Wellesley forced the Nizam to dismiss his French officers and allied himself with the Peshwa, the nominal head of the Maratha confederacy against the other chiefs of that nation. In 1803, Lord Lake conquered Delhi and the Doab from the French mercenaries of Scindia, the most powerful of these rulers, while Arthur Wellesley, the governor-general's brother, was fighting further to the south against Scindia himself and the Raja of Berer. In the brilliant battles Vasi and Argam, this young general beats the Maratha hosts, though they were nine to one against him. The two hostile princes were forced to make peace and cede to the East India Company their outlaw dominions, Scindia's fortresses in the north, which became the nucleus of our northwestern provinces, and the Raja of Berar's province, Varissa, which was added to Bengal. 1804. End of section 83. Section 84 of History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 38. England and Bonaparte. 1802-1815. to 1815, Part 2. Bonaparte assumes the title of Emperor. In the winter of 1803-4, Bonaparte began to doubt the wisdom of attacking England with his flotilla of gunboats and transports only, and resolved to wait till he could concentrate in the Straits a fleet of line-of-battle ships capable of beating off the English Channel squadron. While this plan was being worked out, he brought the internal affairs of France to a crisis. In the spring of 1804, an abortive royalist conspiracy against him was detected, and he took advantage of it to assume a higher and firmer position in the state than that of First Consul. Accordingly, his servile senate requested him to accept the title of Emperor. In May 1804, he forced the Pope, who stood in mortal dread of annexation, to come up to Paris and preside at his coronation, a great and costly pageant, which marked the end of even the shadow of liberty in France. Bonaparte assumed the title of Napoleon I, thus making his own strange Christian name, notable for the first time since history begins. He determines to employ the Spanish fleet. When his coronation festivities were over, Napoleon set his mind seriously to the task of concentrating a great fleet in the Channel to cover the crossing of his army. In the autumn of 1804, the days of the old naval leagues against England in 1782 and 1797 were renewed, when the Emperor forced Spain to join him, demanding either a monetary contribution or an auxiliary fleet. The feeble Charles IV chose to give the money for the vessels which bore the treasure were seized by an English squadron, and Pitt promptly declared war on Spain. By utilizing the large Spanish fleet, Napoleon thought that he could gather together an armament strong enough to keep the channel open for the crossing of the legions which lay at Boulogne. But meanwhile, English blockading vessels were already watching Cartagena, Cadiz, and Ferrol, as well as Toulon and Brest, and a hard task lay before the Emperor when he determined to concentrate the scattered naval forces of France and Spain. While Napoleon was busy with this scheme, Pitt had been returning to his old policy of finding continental allies for England and stirring them up against France. Austria and Russia had been greatly displeased by the same reckless annexations in 1803 which had driven England into war, but their grudges might not have grown into an anti-French coalition if it had not been for the energy of Pitt's diplomacy and the large subsidies which he offered. Napoleon's naval 
evil scheme. In the spring of 1805, things came to a head. On the one hand, the French emperor's scheme for the invasion of England was ready. On the other, Pitt's continental allies were secretly arming. Napoleon's plan was complicated but ingenious. Its strength lay in the fact that it was not easy for the English to judge what exactly would be his method or to provide against it. He ordered the French Mediterranean fleet at Toulon to take advantage of the first rough weather and to escape from its harbor whenever the English blockading squadron now headed by the ever active and vigilant Nelson should be blown out to sea. Then his chief admiral, Villeneuve, was to slip past Gibraltar and to join the Spanish fleet at Cadiz, driving off the English ships which were watching that port. The united Franco-Spanish armament was then to sail right across the Atlantic to the West Indies as if to attack our colonies there, but the real object of this demonstration was to entice Nelson, who was certain to chase them when he found their route, far away from Europe. For when they had reached the West Indies, the Allied fleet were to turn sharply back again and steer across the Atlantic for Brest, where they would find another large French fleet, blockaded by Admiral Cornwallis and the English Channel Squadron. Villeneuve, as the Emperor calculated, would be able to deliver the Brest fleet some weeks before Nelson could appear in Europe. He would then have seventy ships to oppose the thirty-five with which England guarded the Channel, and with such overwhelming superiority would be able to clear the Dover Straits and convoy across the army which had been waiting so long at Boulogne. Villeneuve escapes to the West Indies. In the first part of this great naval campaign, the Emperor's elaborate scheme worked well. Villeneuve slipped out of Toulon, while Nelson's fleet was blown away by rough weather. He hurried away to Cadiz, liberated the Spaniards there, and was off to the West Indies before Nelson could find out what had become of him. Very tardily, the great English admiral discovered his route and hurried across the Atlantic in pursuit. In due pursuance of the scheme of Napoleon, Villeneuve turned back and steered for Brest, while his pursuer was seeking him off Barbados. Battle off Cape Finisterre but here the good fortune of the French ended, and a combination of chance and skill saved England. So slow was the Franco-Spanish fleet, and so bad at seamanship, that Nelson gained many days upon them. He luckily chanced upon a ship that had seen them turn back, hastily shifted his own course to follow, and sent to England to warn the lords of the Admiralty that Villeneuve might be expected off Brest. With most commendable haste, a squadron under Admiral Calder was organized to encounter Villeneuve before he could reach Europe. It sailed out just in time to meet him as he got into the Bay of Biscay and fought him off Cape Finisterre. Villeneuve was not a man of nerve, and though Calder's squadron was far inferior to his own, he turned aside after an indecisive battle. So Napoleon heard in August 1805, to his disgust and wild anger, that the fleet which was to enable him to cross the Channel had not appeared off Brest but had dropped into Ferrol to refit after the fight with Calder. Villeneuve retires to Cadiz, return of Nelson. Then to make things get worse, Villeneuve sailed from Ferrol not for Brest, but for Cadiz to strengthen himself yet further with Spanish reinforcements. This delay enabled the eager Nelson to arrive in European waters, and at the critical moment he and Calder, with 28 ships, lay outside Cadiz, while the 35 Franco-Spanish vessels were within its harbor. The emperor's plan was therefore wrecked, and no chance remained of the longed-for fleet sailing up the channel to meet the 150,000 men who sat idly waiting for it at Boulogne. Napoleon abandons the plan of invasion. Seeing his scheme shattered, while at the same time rumors of the Austro-Russian coalition had reached him, Napoleon dropped his long-cherished invasion scheme. He suddenly turned his back on the sea, and, declaring war on his continental enemies, before they were ready for him, came rushing across France toward Germany with incredible speed. But before he started, he sent his unfortunate admiral at Cadiz a bitter letter, in which he taunted him with cowardice for having turned away from Brest and ruined the plan for invading England. Stung to the heart by the imputation of want of courage, Villeneuve came out of Cadiz to fight Nelson in order to show that he was not afraid, not in order to secure any useful end, for the time for that was over. Battle of Trafalgar 
Off Cape Trafalgar, 27 English ships met the 33 Allied vessels, and at the great battle of that name, completely destroyed Villeneuve's fleet. Nelson's splendid naval tactics easily compensated for the disparity of numbers. Seeing the enemy lying before him in a long line, he formed his own ships into two columns and swooped down on the center of the Franco-Spanish armada. He cut the enemy in two and destroyed their midmost ships ere the wings could come up. Of the thirty-three hostile vessels, nineteen were taken and one burnt, but in the moment of success the great admiral fell. He had led the attacking column in his own ship, the victory, and pushing into the thickest of the enemy, was laid low by a musket ball ere the fight was half over, but he lived long enough to hear that the day was won and died contented. October 21st, 1805. In her grief for Nelson, England half forgot her joy at the most decisive naval triumph that we had ever gained, for Napoleon was driven to own himself impotent at sea, and the spirits of the French seamen were so broken that they never dared again to put out to sea, save in small numbers for secret and hurried cruises. For the future, the Emperor determined to strike at English commerce by decrees and embargoes, not to attack England herself herself by armed force. Ulm and Austerlitz, end of the Holy Roman Empire. But for the moment, to put down Austria and Russia was his task. Already before Trafalgar had been fought, he had crushed the vanguard of the Austrians at Ulm, where the imbecile General Mack laid down his arms with nearly 40,000 men, while the Russians were still miles away, toiling up from Poland. Vienna fell into his hands before the Allies were able to join their forces. A month later they met the French on the snow-covered hillside of Austerlitz, a village some eighty miles northeast of the Austrian capital. Here Napoleon beat them with awful slaughter. Left with only the wreck of an army, the Emperor Francis II asked for peace, and got it on humiliating terms. He had to cede his Italian dominions, as well as the Tyrol, the very cradle of the Habsburg dynasty. Moreover, he gave up his old title of head of the Holy Roman Empire, the imperial style which had lasted since the days of Charlemagne, and had remained in the Austrian line for 350 years, and was constrained to take the new and humbler name of Emperor of Austria. Death of Pitt, the Ministry of All the Talents the news of this disaster to the coalition, which had cost him so much trouble to knit together, and from which he had expected so much, broke Pitt's heart. He had been in ill health ever since he took office in 1804, the constant stress of responsibility while the invasion was impending, having shattered his nerves. He died on January 23rd, 1806, aged no more than 46. He had been Prime Minister for nearly half this short span of life, and had certainly done more for England in his tenure of office than any man who has ever occupied that position. The death of Pitt and the public dismay at the breaking up of the coalition of 1805 led to a demand for a strong and united ministry that should combine all parties for the national defense. There was no man among the Tories great enough to take up Pitt's mantle, and Addington, the late Prime Minister, Lord Grenville, and several other leaders of that party were ready to admit the long, exiled Whigs to a share in the administration. Administration. The king was discontented at having to receive his old foe, Charles James Fox, as a minister, but bowed to the force of public opinion. Thus came into being the short Fox Grenville cabinet, which contemporary wits called the Ministry of All the Talents, on account of its broad and comprehensive character, for it included all shades of opinion, from Addington at the one end to Fox at the other. Failure of negotiations with Napoleon, death of Fox. Fox had always opposed war with France and had maintained that if the late ministry had met Napoleon in an open and liberal spirit, they might have secured an honorable peace. But when he himself was given the opportunity of testing the Corsican's real temper, he met with a bitter disappointment. Napoleon was too angry with England to think of any accommodation. He offered Fox terms which were absolutely insulting, considering that, that England had held her own and successfully kept off invasion. Fox died soon after, Worn out by the hard work of office, to which he had been a stranger for twenty years. September 1806. End of the Grenville Ministry, Abolition of the Slave Trade. 
After his decease and the failure of the peace negotiations, the Grenville Ministry had no great reason for existence. It was forced to continue the war policy of Pitt, but met with no success in several small expeditions that it sent out to vex the French and Spaniards. In March 1807, the ministers resigned after a quarrel with the king on the same point which had wrecked Pitt in 1802, the question of Catholic emancipation. The only good work which this short administration had done in its 13 months of office was to abolish the slave trade. On the resignation of the Whigs, the Tories came back into power. Their nominal chief was now William Bentick, Duke of Portland, an aged man, one of the Whigs who had been made Tories by the French Revolution. But the shrewd and ambitious Spencer Percival, the new Chancellor of the Exchequer, was the real leader of the Tories. He was a narrow-minded man of moderate ability, whose only merit was that he clung to the policy of Pitt, and continued to hammer away at the French in spite of all checks and failures. The Confederation of the Rhine after Austerlitz, Napoleon assumed the position of tyrant of all Central Europe. He created his younger brother Louis, King of Holland, and drove out the Spanish Bourbons from Naples in order to make his eldest brother Joseph King of the Two Sicilies. He formed the smaller German states into the Confederation of the Rhine, of which he declared himself protector. Prussia declares war on France. These high-handed doings were certain to provoke further fighting, for Russia, though defeated at Austerlitz, did not consider herself beaten, and the strong military state of Prussia was bound to resent the ascendancy of the French in Germany. Frederick William III, the rather irresolute monarch who swayed that country, had been half inclined to help Austria in 1805, but he delayed till the campaign of Austerlitz was over, and then found that he must fight Napoleon alone. Relying on the strength of his army and the old traditions of Frederick the Great, he declared war on France in 1806, hastily patching up treaties of alliance with Russia and England. Battle of Jena Of all the disasters which befell the powers of the continent at Napoleon's hands, none was so sudden and crushing as that which Prussia suffered in 1806. Only a few weeks after the declaration of war, the Prussian monarchy was ruined. The emperor's swiftness and power of concentration were never shown more brilliantly. After defeating the Prussians at Jena, October 1806, he pursued them so furiously that he captured their whole army, more than 100,000 men, at Magdeburg, Lübeck, and Prenzlau. Nearly all the Prussian fortresses surrendered, and Frederick William escaped beyond the Vistula with only 12,000 men to join his Russian allies. After entering Berlin, Napoleon pushed on into Poland to meet the advancing forces of Tsar Alexander. In the bitter cold of a Polish February, he fought the Battle of Eylau with the Russians, and for the first time in his life, failed to gain a decisive victory over these stubborn foes. But in the following May, he finally finally settled the campaign by winning the bloody fight of Friedland, after which the Tsar asked for peace. The Treaty of Tilsit, Dismemberment of Prussia At the Treaty of Tilsit, Napoleon dictated his terms to Russia and Prussia. Alexander was left comparatively unmolested. He was not stripped of territory, but only compelled to promise aid to Napoleon's schemes against England. But Prussia was absolutely crushed. Half her territory was taken from her. The eastern districts to form a new Polish state called the Grand Duchy of Warsaw, the western to make, along with Hanover and Hesse, a new kingdom of Westphalia for Napoleon's youngest brother, Jerome. In addition, all the Prussian fortresses received French garrisons, and a fine of £26 million was imposed on the mutilated kingdom. June 1807. End of section 84. Section 85 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 38 England and Bonaparte 1802-1815 Part 3 The Berlin Decrees Since Trafalgar, the Emperor had been pondering over new schemes for ruining England, 
In a leisure moment during the Prussian campaign, he devised the celebrated Berlin Decrees. The English, as he thought, mainly lived upon the revenues that they earned by being the middlemen between Europe and the distant lands of Asia and America. Their carrying trade was the staple of their prosperity, and if he could destroy it, England must go bankrupt. Accordingly, the Berlin Decrees declared a blockade against goods made or brought over by the English in every country that France could influence. Now the idea of a naval blockade is familiar enough, but Napoleon's scheme contemplated its exact converse. He had resolved to station soldiers and custom house officers round every mile of coast in Europe to prevent English vessels from approaching the shore, and to see that not a pound's worth of English manufactures or colonial produce should be imported. The decrees declared the British Isles under blockade as regards the rest of Europe. No subject of France or of any vassal power was to trade with them. All Napoleon's unfortunate subject allies, Prussia, Holland, Spain, and the powers of Italy, were forced to assent to this strange edict, and the Tsar of Russia was cajoled into accepting it. Napoleon thought that he had thereby struck a deadly blow at England, for every European state, save Sweden, Turkey, and Portugal, and the islands of Sicily and Sardinia, was at his beck and call. He had not calculated on the greatness of the sacrifice which he was asking his allies to make. They were to give up, in order to please him, many of the comforts, even the necessities of life. West Indian sugar and coffee, the tea, pepper, and spices of the East, the cloth and linen of England, the muslin of Hindustan. The Orders in Council of 1807. The English government boldly accepted the Emperor's challenge, and replied that if there was to be no English trade with the continent, there should not be any trade at all. By the Orders in Council of November 1807, the whole coastline of France and her allies was declared in a state of blockade, and the war vessels of England were directed to seize as prizes all ships entering them, whether neutral or not, unless before sailing for the continent such vessels should have touched at an English port. Napoleon replied by the Milan Decrees, December 17, 1807, which declared that any vessel belonging to a neutral power which, which had touched at any British port should be considered a lawful prize, and ordered all British merchandise found on the continent to be confiscated and burnt. Thus, between the Berlin Decrees and the Orders in Council, all the ports of Europe were formally closed. The one great neutral power, the United States of America, felt this blow bitterly and bore a deep grudge against both parties in the strife. Results of the Continental System from the very first, the result of the Continental System, as the Emperor's plan was named, was very different from what he had expected. The English manufacturers and colonial wares, which he intended to exclude, contrived to creep, nevertheless, within the bounds of his empire. All along the coasts of Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, there sprang up an extraordinary development of smuggling. From Heligoland, the Channel Isles, Gibraltar, and Sicily, hundreds of vessels sailed by night to land their cargoes in secret. But if the merchandise arrived, it came by such hazardous and circuitous ways that its price was vastly increased. Napoleon did not succeed in ruining the commerce of England, but he succeeded in making Germans and Russians and Italians pay monstrous prices for their coffee or their sugar, and got their well-earned curses for it. The French Invade Portugal Napoleon's restless energy in carrying out his scheme for the isolation and financial ruin of England led him into new trouble in another part of Europe. Less than three months after he had ended his Polish campaign by the Peace of Tilsit, the little kingdom of Portugal was, with Turkey, almost the last state in Europe which had not accepted the continental system. Loth to lose their valuable commerce with England, the Portuguese tried evasion and returned shifty answers when Napoleon bade their prince regent accept the Berlin decrees. Without waiting for further provocation, the tyrant, who had now grown impatient of the slightest remonstrance against his fiat, declared that the house of Brigand had ceased to reign, and sent an army under General Trot across Spain to occupy Lisbon. The prince regent was forced to fly by sea, and the French overran the whole of his kingdom. Joseph Bonaparte proclaimed King of Spain 
but from the first moment of his interference in the peninsula, it is probable that Napoleon had wider schemes than the mere conquest of Portugal. The crown of Spain was now worn by the imbecile and worthless old King Charles the Fourth, who lived in constant strife with his cowardly and intriguing son and heir, the infant Ferdinand. There is nothing to choose between them in the way of incompetence and effeteness. In 1807, this wretched pair were at the height of their domestic quarrels, and each was trying to curry favor with Napoleon. They were always carrying complaints about each other to him and asking for his support. Then Napoleon, as if he were the recognized arbiter of kings, summoned the quarrelsome father and son to meet him at Bayon, in the French frontier, that he might settle their disputes. They came, each full of charges against his relative, but Napoleon, when he had them both safely under his hand, suddenly adopted a new tone, pronounced them both unfit to rule a great nation, and then declared that his own brother, Joseph Bonaparte, whom he had made ruler of Naples two years before, would be the best king for Spain. Spain. Accordingly, he forced the two Bourbons, half by threats, half by cajolery, to abdicate, and sent them into the interior of France. A few Spanish nobles who had accompanied them to Bayonne were induced to accept Joseph, and then Napoleon pretended that his brother was legally constituted King of Spain. There were many French troops in the peninsula who had been sent there under the pretense that they were to help Junot in conquering Portugal. At the concerted signal, these regiments seized the neighboring Spanish fortresses and proclaimed Joseph King. After a rising of the populace of Madrid had been put down with much bloodshed by the French troops in the capital, it seemed as if Napoleon's piracy and kidnapping were to be crowned with success. June 15th, 1808. Resistance of the Spaniards. This, however, was in reality far from being the case. As a matter of fact, he had now succeeded in involving himself in the most protracted and exhausting war in which he was ever engaged. He had roused by his treachery the most revengeful and fanatical people in Europe, and had now to conquer a barren and arid country, where large armies starve and small armies get beaten. Spain sprung to arms on the news of the crime of Bayonne. The great towns everywhere proclaimed Ferdinand the Seventh King, and though the central government was destroyed, juntas or revolutionary committees were formed in every province and began to raise troops to resist King Joseph. England determines to aid the Spaniards. The news of the Spanish insurrection was received with joy in England, more especially because it was the first really national rising against the emperor that had yet been seen. Even the Whigs were enthusiastic for aiding Spain. Hitherto, said Sheridan, Bonaparte has contended with princes without dignity, numbers without ardor, and peoples without patriotism. He has yet to learn what it is to combat a nation animated by one spirit against him. Misled by their sympathy into overestimating the strength of Spain and the valor of her raw provincial levies, the English government, influenced mainly by Canning, a disciple of Pitt, who was now the most prominent among the younger Tories, statesmen, determined to strike a bold blow by land against Napoleon. For the last three years, the very considerable body of regular troops in England, set free from the task of watching the Boulogne army, had been frittered away on small expeditions against outlying parts of the French and Spanish dominions, and had suffered nothing but checks. Now the cabinet determined to send a really formidable army to the peninsula. It was resolved to throw 20,000 men ashore in Portugal to assail Junot, who was cut off from the rest of the French armies by the revolt in Spain. To the Spaniards were sent subsidies, arms, and money, but no troops. The Capitulation at Balin Bonaparte's notion that Spain could be annexed by a proclamation and held down by 80,000 men was destined to receive a rude shock. Almost simultaneously, two disasters fell upon his armies. A corps had been sent southwards to conquer Andalusia, where the insurrection was at its strongest. Its leader, General Dupont, allowed himself to be surrounded by superior numbers of Spanish levies at Balin, and after some grossly mismanaged fighting, laid down his arms with his whole force of 15,000 men. July 20th, 1808. Battle of Vimiero, the Convention of Sintra. Juno and Portugal suffered almost the same fate. The English began to land in Portugal a few days after the capitulation of Belen. When their leading divisions were ashore, headed by Sir Arthur Wellesley, the victor of Assaye and Argom, 
Juno marched against them to drive them into the sea. Finding Wellesley on the hillside of Bimiero, he attacked him recklessly. August 21st, for the French had not yet learnt to appreciate the worth of the British infantry. He received a crushing defeat, and his army would have been destroyed if Wellesley had been allowed to pursue him. But on the night of the battle, more troops arrived from England, and with them Sir Hugh Dalrymple, who was in command of the whole expedition. The cautious veteran refused Wellesley permission to follow up the flying enemy, and Juno escaped to the Lisbon. But the Frenchman had been so badly beaten that by an agreement called the Convention of Sintra, he gave up Lisbon and all Portugal in return for being granted a safe passage back to France. English public opinion was disappointed that Juno's whole army had not been captured, and Dalrymple and Wellesley were put on trial for not taking Lisbon by force. The former, the responsible person, was deprived of his command. The latter was acquitted and sent back to Portugal to repeat his triumph of Vimiero on larger fields of battle. Meanwhile, while he was being tried in England, Sir John Moore, an able and experienced general, received the command of the English army in the peninsula. Napoleon in Spain, Sir John Moore's campaign. The news of Belen and Vimiero had roused Napoleon to fury, which grew still greater when he heard that his brother Joseph had evacuated Madrid and fallen back behind the Ebro. He determined to march in person against Spain with the Grand Armée, nearly 250,000 veterans, the victors of Austerlitz and Jena, proclaiming that he was about to carry his victorious eagles to the Pillars of Hercules and drive the British leopard into the sea. He hurried over the Pyrenees and fell upon the raw Spanish levies who had now advanced to the line of the Ebro. With a few crushing blows, he scattered them to right and left and entered Madrid, December 4th, 1808. All northern and central Spain were overrun, and Napoleon might have accomplished his boast and advanced to Cadiz and Lisbon, but for the daring diversion made by Sir John Moore and his 25,000 English. When that able officer heard that the emperor had passed southward and taken Madrid, he fell upon his line of communication and threatened to cut off his connection with France. He knew that this act would bring overwhelming numbers against him, but he also knew that it would save southern Spain for a space. When Napoleon Napoleon learnt that Moore was in his rear, he hurriedly left Madrid and directed a hundred thousand men to chase the much daring general. But Moore, satisfied to have drawn off the French, continually retreated before them in the most skilful manner, always offering battle to the French van and retreating when their main body appeared. He thus drew Napoleon up into the extreme northwestern corner of Spain, among the rugged hills of Galicia. While engaged in this pursuit, the emperor received unwelcome news which drew him hastily back to Paris. Napoleon leaves Spain, Battle of Corona. The English government had not been idle during the autumn of 1808, and had formed a new coalition with Austria, who in three years had begun to recover the disaster of Austerlitz, and to chaff against Napoleon's dictatorial ways and the inconvenience of the continental system. Seeing the emperor entangled in the Spanish war, Austria fought the opportunity of attacking him too good to be missed, and was preparing to send her army into South Germany, while Napoleon was chasing war into Galicia. The emperor who was forced to leave the greater part of his army in Spain and to hurry off to the Danube with his guards and picked troops. Marshal Salt, whom he sent in pursuit of Moore, followed him as far as the sea, where an English fleet was waiting at, at Corona to pick up the wave-borne and jaded troops. To secure a safe embarkation, Moore turned sharply on the head of Salt's army and drove it back at the Battle of Corona. January 16th, 1809 he fell in the moment of victory, but his efforts had not been in vain. His troops sailed away in safety, and the French invasion of Spain had been checked for four months by his bold stroke. The English cabinet had resolved not to abandon Spain and Portugal. When Moore's regiments returned to England, many of them were sent back to Lisbon and placed under Wellesley, the victor of Vimiero, whose trial had ended in a triumphant acquittal. In April 1809 began that wonderful series of campaigns which was to last till March 1814 and to bear the English standard in triumph from the Tagus to the Garonne. Fettered by timid instructions from the home government, linked to rash and jealous allies, and starting with no more than 20,000 British troops, Wellesley was bidden to hold his own in the peninsula 
where more than two hundred thousand French troops were still encamped. He showed the rarest combination of prudence and daring, and brought his almost impossible task to a successful end, in spite of the tiresome stupidity of his Spanish confederates and the inefficient support which the home government gave him. At any moment during the first three years of his command, a single defeat would have caused the cabinet to recall him and withdraw his army from the peninsula, but the defeat never came, and Wellesley at last won the confidence he merited, and was given adequate means to carry out his mighty schemes. The story of the war is the best proof of his abilities, a calm, stern, silent man, with an aquiline nose, clear gray eyes, and a slight erect figure, he inspired implicit confidence, if his taciturnity and hatred of display or emotion prevented him from winning the love and enthusiasm of his troops, as many lesser generals have done. The sight of his long nose among us on a battle morning, wrote one of his veterans, was worth ten thousand men of reinforcements any day. Soul driven from Portugal, Battle of Talavera. While Napoleon was engaged in his Austrian War of 1809, Wellesley easily held his own in the peninsula. He defeated Marshal Soule at Oporto and drove him out of Portugal with the loss of all his artillery and baggage. Then, turning southward, he marched against Madrid in the company of the Spanish general Cuesta, but he found his allies almost useless. Cuesta was perverse and imbecile to an incredible degree, and his wretched provincial levies fled at the mere sound of the cannon, unless they were in sconced behind walls and trenches. At Talavera, the Allied armies beat Marshal Victor and King Joseph, but all the fighting fell on the English. Quista's troops sheltered in the town of Talavera, refused to come out of their defences, and left Wellesley 20,000 men to repel the assaults of 40,000 French. After this experience of Spanish cooperation, the victor vowed that he would never again share a campaign with a Spanish army. July 28, 1809. Wellington retires to Portugal, the Walcheren Expedition. The news of Talavera brought the French armies from all sides to aid the defeated marshal, and beset by a hundred thousand men, Wellesley was obliged to retreat on Portugal. He got back in perfect safety, but his imbecile colleague Cuesta was caught and crushed by the by the pursuers. The result of the fighting at Talavera had given the English troops confidence, and the king conferred on the victor the title of Viscount Wellington. He would have preferred to receive reinforcements rather than honorary distinctions, but the cabinet had decreed otherwise. They had sent all the available troops in England, some 40,000 men, on an ill-judged expedition against Antwerp, which was too strongly fortified and lay too far inland to be readily taken by an army of such a size. The general placed in command was Lord Chatham, Pitt's elder brother, a dilatory commander who moved slowly and allowed himself to be detained in the siege of the minor fortresses which guarded the way to Antwerp. The army landed on the swampy isle of Waltron and beleaguered Flushing for three weeks. But in the trenches the troops were smitten with marsh fever, and succumbed so rapidly that the expedition had to be given up when 11,000 men were simultaneously in hospital. Flushing was destroyed, but the troops had to return to England, and had exercised no influence whatever on the fate of the war. July to August 1809. If sent to Wellesley, they would have enabled him to crush King Joseph and take Madrid. Battle of Wagram, Marriage of Napoleon Meanwhile, the Austrian war had ended in the triumph of Napoleon at the Battle of Wagram. August 1809, though the gallant efforts of the Archduke Charles and the insurrection of the patriots of the Tyrol in northern Germany had seemed at first to shake his power, the Emperor of Austria was forced to cede all his Illyrian coastline, that Napoleon might make his blockade of English goods the stricter, to surrender half his share of Poland, and to give the bitterest drop in his cup, the hand of his daughter Maria Luisa, to the conqueror. This unhallowed union was only made possible by the divorce of Josephine Buharnay, the wife with whom Napoleon had lived for the last fourteen years. October 1809. The Lines of Taurus Bejas, Massena's Retreat. Freed from the Austrian war and with his Grand Armée once more unoccupied, Napoleon resolved to make an end of the Spanish insurrection. He gave 70,000 fresh troops to Massena, the ablest of his marshals, and 
bade him drive Wellington into the sea and conquer all Spain and Portugal. The English general had foreseen some such assault from the moment that he heard the news of the defeat of Austria. He spent the winter of 1809 to 1810 in constructing a triple series of fortifications across the peninsula on which Lisbon stands, the famous lines of Torres Vedras. When Massena advanced against Portugal, Wellington retired slowly before him, wasting the country and compelling all the people to take refuge in Lisbon. He turned at Busaco, September 29, 1810, to inflict a sharp check on the heads of Massena's columns, but finally withdrew into his formidable lines. The French were brought to a stand before the unexpected obstacle, but they had no knowledge that Wellington had so strengthened his place of refuge. A position armed with 600 pieces of artillery and defended by 30,000 English, and the whole of the militia of Portugal, seemed too strong to be meddled with. Massena lay in front of the lines for four months, sending in vain for reinforcements to Spain. But his colleague Sol, occupied in the conquest of Andalusia with the sieges of Cadiz and Badajos, would not come to his aid. Massena's army suffered bitter privations in the wasted and depopulated country, and at last, in March 1811, he was fain to draw back and retreat from Portugal after having lost more than 20,000 men by sword and famine. Wellington followed him, perpetually harassing his retreat, and took post again on the borders of Spain, from which he had been forced back six months before. Four, battles of Fuentes de Honoro and Albuera. The triumphant defense of the lines of Torres Vedras was the turning point of the whole peninsular war. The French were never again able to invade Portugal, and Wellington, strongly reinforced from England after his success was known, was for the future able to undertake bolder strokes and no longer forced to keep to the defensive. The last defensive movements of the French were stopped by two bloody actions fought in May 1811, within a few days of each other. In the north, Massena attacked Wellington in order to try to save the beleaguered fortress of Almeida, but he was repulsed in Fuentes de Honoro, May 5th, and was shortly afterwards recalled in disgrace by his master. In the south, Marshal Sol marched to relieve Badajos, which was being besieged by Lord Beresford, Wellington's second in command, aided by the Spanish general Blake. Beresford met the French at Albuera and almost lost the battle, partly by his own unskillful generalship, partly by the sudden flight of his Spanish auxiliaries. But the day was saved by the celebrated charge of the Fusilier Brigade, in which the 7th and 23rd Fusiliers, only 1,500 strong, stormed a precipitous hill held by 7,000 French and forced Sol to retreat. This was the bloodiest fight which an English army ever gained. Berez Ford lost 4,300 men out of 7,500, yet his indomitable troops won the day for him. May 16th. End of section 85. Section 86 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 38. England and Bonaparte, 1802-1815. to Part 4. Further Annexations by Napoleon. The years 1810 to 1811 were the last years of Napoleon's ascendancy in Europe. They are marked by his final attempt to make the continental system effective by the annexation of almost the whole coastline of Central Europe. He had already taken Rome and Central Italy from the Pope in 1809. Now he expelled his own brother Louis from Holland and appropriated that country. He next added to his dominions the whole north coast of Germany as far as the Baltic, including the Hanseatic towns and the realms of four or five of his vassals, the princes of the Confederation of the Rhine. These wild and arbitrary seizures, which made the coast of France extend from Rome to Lübeck, were to Napoleon mere episodes in the struggle with England. The Dutch and Germans would not enforce the blockade against English goods as stringently as he wished, and so he annexed them to make their secret trade with England impossible. 
The continental system was now in full swing. It was working in all Napoleon's own dominions, in France, Italy, and Illyria, in the lands of all his vassals, the German states, Poland, Denmark, Naples, Prussia, and Sweden, where one of his marshals, Bernadotte, had lately been made heir to the throne, and even in the territories of his reluctant allies, the emperors of Austria and Russia. Yet in spite of Napoleon's many assertions to the contrary, England was neither ruined nor likely to sue for peace. Percival and Lord Liverpool were a policy of the Tories. There had of late been many changes in the persons who ruled England, but the policy of Pitt was still maintained by his successors. The old king, George III, had gone mad in 1810, and the nominal control of the country was now in the hands of his worthless, vicious son George, Prince of Wales, the old ally of the Whigs. But the regency was given him guarded with so many checks and limitations that he was completely in the hands of the ministry and could not do much harm. First Percival and after he had been shot by a lunatic in 1812, Robert Jenkinson, Earl of Liverpool, started the policy of England as Prime Minister. Both were men of moderate abilities and narrow minds, but they had the saving virtue of obstinacy and stuck to the old policy of war with France through thick and thin. Their task was no easy one. Debt was accumulating in appalling loads from the expenses of the war, the taxes were increased year by year, trade was much hampered by the continental system, a series of bad harvests raised the cost of corn to famine price and led to endless discontent and rioting both in town and country. Our allies were beaten one by one in the continent. There was no compensating gain save Wellington's successes in Spain and the fact that we had now full control of the seas and had absorbed the colonial trade of the whole world. Yet the Tories hardened their hearts and hammered away at the Corsican ogre with untiring zeal. Nor can it be doubted for a moment that they were right. Napoleon had to be put down, or England must perish. All honor, therefore, to the men, narrow-minded and prejudiced though they were, who carried out the struggle to the bitter end. Russia and the Continental System. They were at last about to be rewarded for their perseverance. Towards the end of 1811, Napoleon became involved in a third struggle with Russia, more deadly than those of 1805 and 1806-7. The cause of the quarrel was the inevitable continental system. Hitherto, England had been the largest buyer of Russian goods, and Russia had been wont to get her luxuries and colonial wares from England. The enforced prohibition of trade with her best customer did Russia untold harm, and the Tsar Alexander found that every class of his subjects was groaning under the yoke of the Berlin decrees. Discontent was rife, and Alexander knew well enough that Russia is a despotism tempered by assassination, and remembered the fate of his own father. He saw at last that his empire was losing more from alliance with Napoleon than she could lose by open war against him. Finally, the Russian government began to provoke the emperor by an almost overt neglect of his wishes, and practically abandoned the continental system. Napoleon's Russian Campaign Napoleon was at the height of his arrogance and autocratic insolence. Instead of making an end to the war in Spain, the running sore, as he called it, from the drain which it caused on his resources, he resolved to impose his will on Russia by force and declared war upon the Tsar. A vast army of 600,000 men was concentrated in eastern Germany and crossed the Niemen in June 1812. But the Russians had taken example by the policy by which Wellington had boiled Messina in 1810. Instead of fighting on their frontier, they withdrew into the heart of their vast plains, wasting the country behind them and leaving no food for the invader. The French army had lost half its horses and a third of its men before it approached Moscow or fought a serious engagement. The Russians turned to bay at Borodino in front of their ancient capital, but Napoleon stormed their entrenchments at the cost of 25,000 men and entered Moscow, but he found it deserted by its inhabitants, and a few days after his arrival the whole city was burnt, whether by the deliberate resolve of the Russians or by the carelessness of the French soldiery. Winter was now at hand, and for want of food and shelter, the emperor resolved to retire on Poland. 
but the season was too late, and he was surprised on his way by the snow. His harassed and half-starved soldiers died by thousands on the roadside. The Russians cut off every straggler, and less than a tenth of the magnificent army that had crossed the Neman struggled back to Germany. November 1812 to January 1813. Storming of Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz. The fortune of war had at last turned, and Napoleon's first disaster was soon to be followed by his fall. Prussia and all his other unwilling subjects in northern Germany took arms when the fate of the Grand Armée became known, and to meet them the Emperor had to call up his last reserves of men, and especially to draw on the large force in the Spanish peninsula. But he found that little help could come from Spain, for 1812 had been as fatal to his marshals in the south as to himself in the far north. Early in the year Wellington had swooped down on Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz, the two fortresses in French hands which covered the Spanish frontier. He stormed each of them after a siege of a few days, making the desperate courage of his soldiery serve instead of a long bombardment, and paying for his rapid success by a heavy loss of men. Badajoz was actually escalated with ladders, the breaches having proved inaccessible. The French marshals came hurrying up to save their strongholds, but found them already fallen into English hands. Battle of Salamanca. They followed the decisive Battle of Salamanca, in which Wellington defeated Marshal Marmont and crushed the main army of the enemy. This fight was a splendid exhibition of his skill. His able adversary had for a moment put his left wing in a hazardous position. Before half an hour had elapsed, Wellington had pounced upon the isolated divisions, routed them, and attacked and scattered the main body. Thus, as was happily said, he beat 40,000 men in 40 minutes. In consequence of this victory, Wellington was able to retake Madrid after it had been four years in hostile hands. To check his further success, the French marshals had to evacuate all southern and central Spain and mass their forces against the victor. When they beset him with 100,000 men, he was forced to retreat towards the Portuguese frontier for a space. For the net result of the campaign had been to deliver Andalusia and most of Castile from the enemy, and more was to follow. Napoleon had to withdraw so many of his veterans from Spain to replace his losses in the Russian War that in the next spring Wellington was no longer in his wanted inferiority of numbers. He used his opportunity with his usual skill and promptness. Battle of Vittoria Last Efforts of the French in Spain Attacking the French before they had concentrated from their scattered winter quarters, he chased them before him in disorder all across northern Spain. It was only at Vitoria, close under the Pyrenees, that they could collect in numbers strong enough to face him. But there he fell upon them, routed Marshal Jordan, cut off his retreat on France, and drove him into the mountains with the loss of every single cannon and wagon that the French army possessed. June 21st, 1813. The autumn of the year was occupied in subduing St. Sebastian and Pampeluna, the two fortresses that guarded the French frontier, in repulsing at the battles of the Pyrenees, two gallant attempts made by Marshal Sol to relieve the beleaguered fortresses. At last they fell, and Wellington prepared to invade France in the next spring. Fall of Napoleon, restoration of Louis the Eighteenth. Meanwhile, Napoleon, with a horde of conscripts and a few veteran troops that he could collect, had been fighting hard in Germany. Against the Russians and Prussians, he held his ground for some time, but when his own father-in-law, Francis of Austria, joined the enemy, he was overwhelmed by numbers. The three days' strife at Leipzig, which the Germans called the Battle of Nations, sealed his fate. It was only with the wrecks of an army that he escaped across the Rhine in the autumn of 1813. The Allies followed him without giving him a moment's respite, a wise strategy that they had learnt from his own earlier doings. The Emperor made a desperate fight in France, for the odds were too much against him. After some ephemeral successes, he was defeated at Lyon by one body of the Allies, and their main army slipped past him and took Paris. April 4th, 1814. On the news of the fall of the capital, the French marshals compelled Napoleon to abdicate and laid down their arms. The humbled despot vainly attempted to commit suicide, fearing death at the victor's hands. But they spared his life, gave him the little Tuscan island of Elba as an appanage, 
and bade the man who had been the ruler of all europe to spend the rest of his life in governing iraq and ten thousand italian peasants the crown of france was given with questionable wisdom to the representative of the bourbons the eldest surviving grandson of louis the fifteenth this shrewd and selfish old invalid who was known as the count of province now took the title of louis the eighteenth and mounted his, his martyred brother's long lost throne wellington in france battle of toulouse while the austrians russians and prussians had been conquering napoleon and capturing paris wellington had not been idle he had invaded france from the south taken the great city of bordeaux and beaten marshal soul at the battle of toulouse when the news of napoleon's abdication brought his brilliant campaign to a conclusion april fourteenth eighteen fourteen the american war naval successes of the united states all europe now began to disarm dreaming that the deadly struggles of the last twenty-two years were over at last diplomatists from all nations were summoned to meet at vienna to rearrange the map of europe and parcel out napoleon's ill-gotten spoils england alone was unable to disband her armies for she had still got a war on hand in eighteen twelve napoleon had succeeded in stirring up against us the united states of america their grievance was the orders in council by which we had prohibited neutral ships from trading with france in retaliation for the emperor's berlin decrees against our own commerce after five years of bickering and recrimination the americans declared war on us though they might with equally good logic have attacked napoleon whose conduct to them had been even more harsh and provoking than that of the percival cabinet with all her attention concentrated on the peninsula in eighteen twelve to thirteen england had little attention to spare for this minor war and canada was left much undermanned but the small garrison and the canadian militia fought splendidly and three separate attempts to overrun the colony were beaten back and two american armies forced to capitulate but while so successful on land the english were much vexed and surprised to suffer several small defeats at sea in duels between single vessels the few frigates which the united states owned were very fine vessels heavily armed and well manned on three successive occasions an american frigate captured an english one of slightly inferior force in single combat a feat which no french ship had ever been able to accomplish in the whole war in the course of time the american vessels were hunted down and destroyed by our squadrons but it was a great blow to english naval pride that the enemy had to be crushed by superiority of numbers instead of being beaten in equal fight but the fact was that individually the american ships were larger and carried heavier guns than our own so that the first defeats were no matter of shame to our navy battles of Bladensburg and new orleans end of the war when napoleon had been crushed england was able to turn serious attention to america and to send many of the old peninsular veterans over the atlantic but their arrival did not crush the enemy so easily as had been expected one expedition under general ross landing in maryland beat the americans at Bladensburg and burnt washington the capital of the united states eighteen fourteen but two others failed the imbeciles to george prevost attacked the state of new york but turned back without having done any serious fighting on the other hand the overbold sir edward pakenham one of the bravest of wellington's officers was slain at new orleans with two thousand of his followers because he endeavoured to storm from the front impregnable earthworks held by a steady foe january eighth eighteen fifteen the war however had ceased just before pakenham fell napoleon having abdicated and the english having withdrawn the orders in council the causes of our strife with america had been removed and the two powers had signed the peace of ghent on december twenty fourth eighteen fourteen this agreement restored the old condition of affairs each party surrendering its conquest and agreeing to let bygones be bygones but the struggle had bred much ill blood not to be forgotten for many a year napoleon escapes from elba by the new year of eighteen fifteen when the treaty of ghent had been signed england was at peace with all men and the liverpool ministry began to take in hand the reduction of our army and navy the restoration of finance and the protection of english interests and the resettlement of europe at the congress at vienna which had met in the previous autumn 
all the diplomatists of the great powers were hard at work settling the new boundaries of their states when suddenly the alarming news was heard that napoleon had escaped from elba and landed in france the rule of the selfish old louis the eighteenth and the elderly companions who had returned with him from a twenty years exile had irritated and disgusted the french and most of all the army when therefore napoleon landed in provence with seven hundred men and called on his countrymen to rise and be half of liberty and expel the imbecile bourbons his appeal met with a success such as he himself had hardly hoped for not a shot was fired against him regiment after regiment went over to his side and louis the eighteenth had at last to fly from paris and take refuge in flanders march eighteen fifteen napoleon proclaimed himself emperor once more but promised the french a liberal constitution in place of his old autocratic rule he also made overtures to the allied powers saying that he was tired of war and would accept any honourable terms but they knew his lying tongue of old and wisely refused to listen to his smooth speeches one after another all the monarchs of europe declared war on him Napoleon enters Belgium, battles of Ligny, and Quatre Bras. Napoleon's second tenure of power was only to last from March 13th till June 22nd, 1815, the hundred days as they are generally called. Forced to fight, he displayed his old energy and resolved to strike at the Allies before they could concentrate their scattered forces from the remotest ends of Europe. He called his old veterans to arms and hastily organized an army of 130,000 men for an immediate attack on the nearest foe. By waiting longer, he could have collected an army thrice as great, but on the other hand, his enemy would have been able to mass their whole force against him. The only troops ready to oppose him by June 1815 were two armies in Belgium, one of Prussians under the old Marshal Blücher, which lay about Namur, Liège, and Charleroi, the other a combined force of British, Germans, and Dutch under Wellington, now a duke, stationed round Brussels and Ghent. The Prussians were 120,000 strong, and Wellington had 30,000 English and 65,000 Hanoverians, Germans, and Dutch. Napoleon was therefore bound to be outnumbered, but he thought that he could crush one army before the other came to its aid, if he could only strike hard and fast enough. His advance into Belgium was rapid and skilful. He made for the point where the English left touched the Prussian right, near Charleroi, and thrust himself between them. On June 16th, he engaged and beat Blücher's Prussians at Ligny, while his lieutenant, Marshal Ney, held back at Quatre Bras the front divisions of Wellington's army as they came marching up to try to join the Prussians. The Prussians were severely beaten, but the indomitable old Blücher gathered together his defeated forces and marched north to rejoin the English, while Napoleon vainly dreamed that he was flying eastward towards Germany. Thus it came to pass that the Emperor sent Marshal Grouchy and 33,000 men to pursue the Prussians on the wrong road, a mistake which allowed Blücher to execute an undisturbed retreat on Wavry, where he was again in touch with the Duke. Meanwhile, Napoleon, on the 17th, marched to join his lieutenant Ney, who had been forced back from Quatre Bras by the English and needed his aid. The Emperor, believing that the Prussians were disposed of, thought he could now deal a crushing blow at Wellington's motley army, and was overjoyed when he found the Duke offering him battle on the hillside of Mount Saint. Jean, twelve miles north of Quatre Bras, in a good position which covered the road to Brussels. On this hillside was fought next day, June 18th, 1815, the decisive battle which the English call Waterloo, from the name of a village where Wellington wrote his dispatch that same night. The Battle of Waterloo the armies were not very different in numbers. Napoleon's 72,000 men were opposed to 67,000 troops in the Allied army, but Wellington could only count on his 23,000 English and 22,000 Hanoverians and Brunswickers for good and zealous service. He was hindered rather than helped by the presence of 20,000 raw Dutch and Belgian conscripts who had no heart in the war and would as soon have fought for Napoleon. His army was stretched along the gentle slope which is crossed by the Brussels Road 
with the infantry in the front line and the cavalry partly in reserve, partly on the wings. In front of his position were the two farms of Pogama and La Haysen, the former held by the English guards, the latter by a picked battalion of Hanoverians. Napoleon ranged his men on the opposite ridge and launched them against the English in successive attacks. His first attempt to storm the farm of Pogama was manfully beaten back. He then sent four heavy columns against the English left, but they were utterly routed by the charge of Picton's infantry and Ponsonby's famous Union Brigade of Dragoons, the Royal Scots Greys, and Enniskillens. His third effort was to break the English centre by the furious charge of 15,000 gallant horsemen, supported by a tremendous fire of artillery. But the English squares held fast, though assailed for five hours by constant onsets of cavalry and pounded in the intervals by an overwhelming force of cannon. Most of the Dutch and Belgians and some of the Germans retired from the field, and many fled to Brussels, but the indomitable squares held their own, even after the farm of La Haysa had been stormed, and a gap opened in the English centre. In the thick of the fighting, Napoleon was surprised to see new troops coming up on his right. They were Blucher's Prussians, marching from Wavre to aid the English, according to a promise which the old marshal had made to the Duke on the previous day. To hold them back, Napoleon had to detach nearly all his reserves, but for a final stroke against Wellington, he sent out 5,000 men of the old yard to break through the long-tried English line. But this last effort was foiled by the steady fire of Maitland's English guards, and when the attacking columns were seen recoiling down the hillside, and Wellington's last cavalry reserves came charging after them, the whole French army broke and fled. Napoleon confined at St. Helena. Never was a more complete rout seen. The defeated army disbanded itself. Napoleon could not rally a man and fled to Paris, where he abdicated for a second time. Wellington and Blucher rapidly followed him and entered Paris, July 6th. The ex-emperor, fearing death at the hands of the infuriated Prussians, fled across France to Russia for, and surrendered himself to the English man of war which blockaded that port. After much discussion, the ministers resolved to send him as a prisoner to the desolate island of St. Helena, where he lived for six years, spending his time in dictating mendacious accounts of his life and campaigns, and in petty quarrels with the governor of the island. Supremacy of the English Mercantile Marine Napoleon was now really disposed of, and the pacification of Europe was complete. The Congress of Vienna had completed its work, and all the territorial changes which it dictated were carried out at leisure. England's share of the plunder in Europe was the islands of Malta and Heligoland and the Ionian Isles. Beyond sea, she got the French Isle of Mauritius and the Indian Ocean, and the valuable Dutch colony of the Cape of Good Hope. But her real gain was the fact that she had absorbed, during the course of the war, nearly the whole of the carrying trade of the world. Twenty years of her ascendancy at sea had destroyed the mercantile marines of France, Holland, Spain, and Italy, and it was many years before those countries could recover from their losses. The naval and commercial supremacy which we enjoy today is the direct result of the Great Wars of 1793 to 1815. The Resettlement of Europe this being so, the changes on the continent were of comparatively little moment to us. France was confined within her old boundaries of 1789, Russia took the greater part of Poland, Austria was given Lombardy and Venetia, Prussia annexed half Saxony and most of the small states along the Rhine, Belgium and Holland were joined in an unnatural union as the Kingdom of the Netherlands, while the old despots of central and southern Italy returned to their long-lost thrones. These boundaries were to last, with little alteration, for half a century. End of section 86. Section 87 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Lawley Jones. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 39. Reaction and Reform. 1815 to 1832. Part 1. The great struggle was now over, and a new period had commenced in which European wars were to be as rare as they had of late been common. For between 1815 and 1848, 
there was no serious strife between any of the powers of Western and Central Europe, and the general peace was only interrupted by comparatively unimportant broils in the Balkan Peninsula and in Spain. England, whose troops were not destined to fire another shot in Europe for forty years, had full leisure to look around her and count up the cost of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. The table of profit and loss was not at first sight a very cheerful one. The weight of debt and taxation was obvious to every man, while the compensating advantages, resulting from the firm establishment of our naval and commercial supremacy in all seas of the world, were only just beginning to make themselves felt. The country and its governors were, at the same time, beginning to feel very uneasy at a silent change in the social life of England. 4. Noticeable as were the years 1793 to 1815 for the display of England's vigour abroad, they were even more remarkable for the social change which was taking place within. In those twenty-three years was consummated the transformation of England from an agricultural to a manufacturing community a transformation the stranger because agriculture was being all the time artificially stimulated, by laws for the protection of the English farmer against foreign competition. So the change in the general character of the English state was due not to a decay in agriculture, but solely to an increase in manufactures. The war which, as Napoleon had trusted, would crush our industries, had only fostered them, by putting us beyond the reach of foreign competition and throwing open to us alone every market and line of trade outside Europe. For instead of our prosperity being checked by the loss of our continental trade, continental prosperity had been checked by the loss of all maritime traffic with Asia and America, which passed entirely into our hands. England therefore had become the manufacturer of the goods of the whole world, not merely owing to her monopoly of trade, but owing to the improved machinery and methods of transit which she adopted long before the rest of Europe. She obtained such a start in the use of the means of industrial production that no state has yet been able to catch her up in the race of commerce. Hence England was, at the end of the war, able to bear a weight of taxation and debt which must have ruined her in its earlier years. Nine hundred millions of national debt, though a tremendous burden, turned out not to be, as many had feared, a ruinously heavy infliction. The forced paper currency, whose introduction in 1797 had appeared to mark a step on the downward road to national bankruptcy, was successfully taken off a few years after the war ended. The great army and navy which had been draining our exchequer were disbanded, when they had finished their duty of protecting us against the threatened invasions of the Revolution and the Empire, and had afterwards played the decisive part in exhausting Napoleon's resources by that long struggle in the Spanish peninsula, which encouraged the rest of Europe to throw off the French yoke. But there were other aspects in which the results of the war had been less happy for England. If the increase of wealth had been enormous, the method of that wealth's distribution was not satisfactory. The new masses of population, which had been called into existence by the development of manufactures, were poor with a poverty which had been unknown in the days when England was still mainly an agricultural country. The introduction of improved machinery, great as was its ultimate benefit, caused, during the years of transition, much misery to the classes whose industry was superseded by it. While English manufacturers were driving out foreign competition all over the world, English mobs were often wrecking the machinery which made these manufacturers possible, in their rage at the ruin of the old handicrafts. Actual famine seemed, several times during the war, to be staring the lower classes in the face, for the largely increased population could no longer be supported on the food supply of England. Nevertheless, in their zeal to encourage English agriculture, the Tory governments of the early years of the century refused to allow the free introduction of the foreign corn, which was really necessary for the increased consumption of the population. And while wheat was dear, 
because limited in quantity, owing to protection, the agricultural classes were not being enriched in the manner which might have been expected. The enhanced profit passed entirely to the farmer and the landlord, not to the laboring population. And at the same moment at which the artisan was breaking machinery, the agricultural laborer was burning his employer's ricks. This unfortunate state of things, however, was due rather to misguided legislation than to any actual danger in the economic conditions of England, and could therefore be relieved by methods which cannot come into play when a real and not a fictitious crisis in the internal state of a country is at hand. The main cause of the degradation of the agricultural labourer in the early years of the 19th century was a series of unwise poor laws, which had been passed at intervals since 1795. There had been much local distress in the early years of the Revolutionary War, and to alleviate it, many parishes had commenced a system of indiscriminate doles of money to poor residents, without much inquiry whether the recipients were deserving or idle able-bodied or impotent. The old test of compelling paupers to enter the workhouse was entirely forgotten, and money was given to everyone who chose to ask for it. Moreover, the rule was laid down that the larger the family, the more was it to draw from the rates in its weekly subsidy. This unwise scheme at once led to the evil of reckless marriages and enormous families, for the laborers saw that the more their children increased, the larger would be their dole from the parish. But not the labourer only was to draw profit from the new poor laws. The farmers began to see that if they kept down the wages of their men, the parish could be trusted to make up the deficiency. It thus became easy for them to pay starvation wages to the labourers, and then force the local rates to support them with a subsidy just sufficient to keep each family out of the workhouse. Thus, the agricultural classes began to live, not on their natural wages, but on a pittance from their employer, supplemented by a weekly grant from the parish. This suited the farmers well enough, but was ruinous to everyone else, for well nigh every labourer was forced to ask for local aid, and thereby to become a pauper. At the same time, the rapid growth of the population caused the burden on the parish to advance by leaps and bounds. At last, the poor rate became an intolerable drain on the resources of the less wealthy districts. A well-known case is quoted in Buckinghamshire, where the annual dole to the paupers grew till it actually exceeded the annual rating of the parish. As long as everyone who chose was able to demand outdoor relief, it was impossible to see where the trouble would end. In the years after the Great War had ended, Actual bankruptcy seemed to be threatening scores of parishes, yet corn was high in price, and the profits of farming, if fairly distributed, ought to have sufficed to keep both landowner, farmer, and labourer in comfort. In considering the political history of England in the years after 1815, this abject distress of the working class, both in town and in countryside, must be continually borne in mind. It was the discontent of the ignorant multitude, feeling its poverty but not understanding its cause, and ready to seek any scheme of redress, wise or unwise, that was at the bottom of the political trouble of the time. The discontent was really social, the result of unwise laws and wrong conceptions of political economy, but it often took shape in political forms and the government of the day thought that it heralded the approach of a catastrophe like the French Revolution. Unfortunately for the prosperity of England, its rulers were, at this moment, committed to a stern and reactionary policy, and would listen to no proposals for change or reform of any kind. The generation of Tories who had grown up during the Great French War had forgotten the old liberal doctrines of their great leader Pitt. Of all the ministers, George Canning was almost the only one who remembered his old master's teaching and was ready to think of introducing reforms, now that peace had once more been obtained. The majority of his colleagues, especially the Premier, the narrow-minded Earl of Liverpool, and the harsh and unbending Foreign Secretary, Lord Castlereagh, 
set their faces against any change in the constitution, however small. Now the Tories had merited well of their country by carrying the war to a successful close. But when the war was over, it was time to be thinking of some way of alleviating the social ills which had been accumulating during its course. This they refused to do, quoting the fate of Louis XVI as the sample of what happens to rulers who yield one inch to the pressure of mob violence. They were still firm in office, for the Whig Party had not yet recovered from the discredit which they had won from the hopeless failure of the Fox-Granville cabinet of 1806-1807. to 1807. But now that their ideas on foreign policy could do no harm, they began to be viewed with more favourable eyes. The ten years which followed the Battle of Waterloo were marked by the gradual passing over of the great middle class to the Whig Party. It was felt that the only hope for the introduction of any scheme of social and political reform lay with the Whigs, and that from them alone could England obtain the liberal measures which Pitt would have granted years ago if the French Revolution had not intervened. But the Whigs were still in a hopeless minority in Parliament though they were gradually growing stronger in the ranks of the nation. It was not till fifteen years had elapsed since the end of the Great War that a Whig ministry once more received the seals of office. The general discontent of the lower classes in the years 1815-20 to 20 found vent in two very different ways. The wilder spirits talked of general insurrection and an assault not only on the government but on all forms of property and all established institutions. A few mischievous demagogues set themselves to fan these rash and ignorant aspirations into a flame, and to bring about anarchy in order thereby to rid the nation of the existing social evils. The cooler and wiser heads were not influenced by these wild notions, but pinned their faith to the modification of the constitution in the direction of popular government. It was their belief that matters would improve the moment that England was governed by the people and for the people. And this end could only be secured by reform of the real governing body, the House of Commons. The idea of making the House truly representative of the nation had been one of Pitt's cherished plans. In 1785 he had actually brought forward a bill for doing away with the worst of the rotten boroughs, but had failed owing to the factious opposition of the Whigs. But Pitt's successors at the head of the Tory party had contrived to forget his teaching. They owed much of their strength to the support of the great boroughmongers, and they now refused to take any measures tending to parliamentary reform. At the bottom of their hearts, they did not trust the masses, and feared that a House of Commons really representing the nation would proceed to wild measures of radical reform and sweep away all the institutions that they held dear. Hence, it came to pass that the Whigs alone supported the idea of parliamentary reform in the early years of the 19th century, and the multitudes who saw in that measure the panacea of all ills were bound to follow them. All the old chiefs of the Whigs were now gone, Fox had died in 1806, Sheridan in 1816, Grenville had retired from public life, and the party was now led by Charles Lord Grey, a very capable and moderate man, who fully shared the notion that parliamentary reform was the one pressing question of the day, but was careful not to go beyond the bounds of wisdom and law in pressing for it. The Whigs got no help from their old friend the Prince of Wales. Since he had obtained the regency in 1811, owing to his father's insanity, George had thrown himself into the hands of the Tories. Personally, he disliked all reforms, for the person in England who most needed reforming was himself. He was now a man of fifty-five, but age had not improved him. To the last, he was as false, vicious, and selfish as in his youth. For many years, his quarrels with his foolish and flighty wife, Caroline of Brunswick, had been a public scandal. She was an intolerably vain and silly woman, but the provocation which he gave her would have driven a wiser head into rebellion. But George's health was weak, owing to his evil life, and it was hoped by many that he would not survive his aged father. 
At his death, the crown would fall to his only daughter, the Princess Charlotte, an amiable and high-spirited young woman of whom all spoke well. But the princess, having married Leopold of Saxe-Coburg in 1816, died in childbirth before the next year was out, to the general grief of the nation. The next heir was Frederick, Duke of York, but as he, though married, had no children and was no stronger in health than his elder brother, it was clear that the crown would not stay long with him. Therefore, all the younger sons of George III hurried into wedlock in 1818, that their father's line might not be extinguished. William, Duke of Clarence, who afterwards reigned as William IV, married Adelaide of Saxe-Meningen. Edward, Duke of Kent, was wedded to Victoria of Saxe-Coburg, and became by her the father of our present queen. Adolphus of Cambridge and Ernest of Cumberland also took wives and had issue, who are still among us. End of section 87《Section 88 of A History of England》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Lawley-Jones A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 39 Reaction and Reform 1815-1832 Part 2 the last days of the reign of George III were full of trouble and disorder, provoked, rather than repressed, by the obstinate rigour with which Lord Liverpool's government put down all agitations, both harmless and dangerous. Some of the riots and risings of the years 1816-20 to were remarkable for the violence and for the wild aims of those who led them. In December 1816, a body of revolutionary enthusiasts who called themselves Spencean philanthropists, raised a tumult in Spa Fields and tried to seize the tower, to distribute arms from its arsenal among the mob. But they were as weak as they were wild, for though they shot one man dead, Lord Mayor Wood and a handful of constables turned them back in front of the Royal Exchange and dispersed them. In June 1817 there was another rising near Derby, but five hundred armed rioters allowed themselves to be stopped and routed by eighteen hussars. But the most celebrated riot of the time was that at Manchester in August 1819. A great mob of thirty thousand persons had assembled in St. Peter's Field to listen to addresses by a demagogue named Hunt. The magistrates attempted to arrest him, but being prevented from reaching him by the enormous crowd, rashly and cruelly ordered a regiment of cavalry to charge the unarmed multitude. There was no resistance made, but some four or five persons were crushed to death and sixty or seventy injured as they trod each other down in escaping from the horsemen. This event was called the Manchester Massacre by the enemies of the government, who were made responsible for it because they commended the violent action of the magistrates. It was with the object of revenging the Manchester Massacre that a bloodthirsty demagogue named Arthur Thistlewood, one of the Spencean philanthropists of 1816, formed a plot for murdering the whole cabinet. Hearing that the ministers were about to dine together on February 23, 1820, he collected a band of twenty-five desperadoes who vowed to slay them all. But one of the gang betrayed the scheme and Thistlewood and his men were seized by the police as they were arming at their trysting place in Cato Street, Edgware Road. They resisted fiercely, and blood was shed on both sides ere they were overpowered. Thistlewood and four of his associates were hung and then beheaded, being the last persons who suffered by the axe in England, for the horrid sight of their decapitation moved public opinion to demand the abolition of this ancient punishment of criminals guilty of treason. Even after the mad Cato Street conspiracy had shocked all the wiser friends of reform, there were isolated outbreaks of rioting all over the north of England and the Scottish lowlands, the last being a skirmish at Bonnymuir near Glasgow, between some Lanarkshire mill hands and the local yeomanry. April, 
1820. The government dealt very harshly with all who gave it trouble, not merely with dangerous rioters, but with writers or speakers who did no more than protest against reactionary legislation or advocate radical reform. Their chief weapons against their enemies were the celebrated Six Acts of 1819, which Addington and Castlereagh, the sternest members of the cabinet, had elaborated with much care. They imposed the heaviest penalties not only on persons caught drilling or using arms or engaging in riots, but on all who wrote what the government chose to consider seditious libels, a term that covered any newspaper article or pamphlet which abused themselves. Footnote Addington had been created Lord Sidmouth long before this, but to avoid confusion his better-known name is still used. End of footnote Repression was in full swing when the old king died, in the tenth year since he had gone mad, January 29th, 1820. The Prince Regent now began to rule as George IV, but his accession made no practical difference in politics. His conduct, however, soon gave his subjects one more additional reason for despising him. He brought his long quarrel with his foolish and reckless wife to a head by refusing to acknowledge her as queen or allow her to be crowned. He accused her of adultery and made Lord Liverpool bring in a bill of pains and penalties to enable him to divorce her. George's life had been such that his attack on Queen Caroline, for conduct much less blameworthy than his own, provoked universal contempt and dislike. Lord Liverpool withdrew his bill in a panic when all London was in an uproar in the Queen's favour. More trouble would undoubtedly have followed if the unhappy Caroline had not died in August, 1821. Her funeral was the occasion of a bloody riot. The abortive bill against the Queen had added the last straw to the unpopularity of the ministry, the best hated cabinet that England has ever known. They felt the fact themselves. Addington resigned in 1821, and Castlereagh, the most harsh and unbending of them all, was so worn out by the stress of his responsibilities and the knowledge of the detestation in which he was held, that he cut his own throat in a fit of temporary insanity in September 1822. Lord Liverpool was helpless when deprived of the two men who had been the chief instigators of his reactionary measures. Abandoning his old policy, he took into partnership George Canning, the chief of the moderate Tories and the wisest disciple of Pitt. Canning took Castlereagh's place as Foreign Secretary, while Addington's place as Home Secretary was given to Robert Peel, a rising young politician with a turn for political economy and an open mind, a very different person from his case-hardened predecessor in the post. Shortly after, Huskinson, the first free trader who had presided over our commercial policy since the Younger Pitt, was made President of the Board of Trade. Thus, the character of the Liverpool Cabinet was completely changed, and for the last four years of its existence, it dropped its old repressive measures and became quite liberal in its legislation. The country at once began to grow quiet, and the old riots and risings ceased. The gradual growth of prosperity in the land, now that the effects of the Great War were passing away, alleviated the violence of the social discontent. But there was a sense of impending change. The immediate domestic question was the removal of religious disabilities, but beyond this lay the questions of parliamentary and municipal reform, of freedom of trade, of simplifying law and legal procedure, and especially of humanising the criminal law. Strange to say, the treatment of the Catholic claims to be represented in Parliament was regarded as an open question in Lord Liverpool's cabinet. Canning was in favour of the admission of the Catholics. Peel was their strenuous opponent. The rule of the Liverpool Canning Ministry was distinguished by the abolition of many old and oppressive laws and the introduction of several reforms of great value. In 1823, Peel began the reform of the criminal law and the reduction of that tangled mass 
with its ghastly list of capital offences, to a shape more consistent with scientific order and common humanity. The old system, a monstrous survival from the Middle Ages, had worked very badly, for juries refused to convict persons who were clearly guilty, because they thought the offence did not deserve the fearful penalty of death. The abolition of capital punishment for so many minor offences put an end to this state of things, and in future the proportion of criminals escaping was marvellously reduced. In the province of trade and finance, several valuable improvements were introduced by the influence of Huskinson. The old navigation laws, dating from the time of Cromwell, which impeded free trade with foreign countries, were abolished. The wise policy of reducing import duties on the raw materials needed for English manufactures was adopted, so that the cost of goods was perceptibly lowered, without any harm to the makers of them. Commercial treaties were concluded with several foreign powers, to the great benefit of both parties concerned. A considerable relief was given to the exchequer by reducing the interest of the many loans raised during the Great War from five or four percent to three and a half. Huskinson had also in hand measures for reducing the duty on the importation of foreign corn, and for the abolition of slavery in the British colonies. But before they could be carried out, the unhappy death of Canning in 1827 broke up the ministry. A word is needed as to the foreign policy of England. The main characteristic of European history from 1815 to 1830 was the renewed despotism of the continental monarchs, when the fear of Bonaparte had vanished from their minds. The emperors of Austria and Russia and the king of Prussia had formed a league called the Holy Alliance for the putting down of liberal opinions and demands for popular government in their own and their neighbours' dominions. The restored Bourbon monarchy in France was equally narrow and reactionary. Not content with crushing liberty in their own realms, the Austrians invaded Naples and the French Spain, when the kings of those countries had been forced to grant constitutional government to their subjects. In each case, the constitution was abolished and despotic rule restored. While Castlereagh was guiding the Foreign Office, the English ministry had refused to interfere with these continental troubles, and had allowed the members of the Holy Alliance to do what they pleased with their smaller neighbours. Canning's advent to power changed this policy. He protected Portugal from an invasion by the French and Spaniards, allied in the cause of despotism, and recognised the independence of the revolted Spanish colonies in America, calling, as he said, the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old. But the sympathy of Canning, and of all men of generous mind in England, was most deeply stirred by the Greek insurrection against the grinding tyranny of the Turks, which had commenced in 1821, and had been struggling on, accompanied by all manner of atrocities and massacres, for six years. The resurrection of the ancient people of Hellas stirred all the memories of the past, and called forth much enthusiasm in England. Many English volunteers hastened to the east to aid the insurgents. Lord Cochrane took command of their fleet, and General Church headed some of their land forces. Even Lord Byron, the poet, roused himself from his misspent life of luxury in Italy, and went out to offer his sword and fortune to a people rightly struggling to be free. His death from marsh fever at Missolonghi caused him to be looked on as the martyr of liberty, and gave England yet a further interest in the cause that he had championed. When the Turks failed to put down the rising, in spite of all their massacres, the Sultan called in the aid of his vassal, Mehmet Ali, Pasha of Egypt, who landed his well-trained army in the Peloponnesus and overran half the peninsula. Canning then induced the Russian and French governments, who had their own private ends to serve, to join him in interfering, and an English fleet was sent out to the coast of Greece. When the Egyptian troops refused to quit the Peloponnesus, and the atrocities continued, Sir Edward Codrington, the English admiral, aided by a few French and Russian ships, sailed into the Bay of Navarino, the ancient Pylos, where the Turkish and Egyptian fleets lay, 
and destroyed them all save a few vessels. In this he had exceeded his instructions, but he had saved the independence of Greece, and English public opinion ratified his action. October 20th, 1827 But ere Navarino had been fought, a new ministry was in power in England. Lord Liverpool had been stricken by paralysis in February 1827, and Canning, as was natural, became Prime Minister. But the weakness of his position was soon apparent. Many Tories who opposed the Catholic claims deserted him. The Whigs would not join him. The strain of responsibility told fatally on his health, and he died on August 8th after less than five months' tenure of the Premiership. The ministry which he had formed continued for a few months under the leadership of the weak and fussy Lord Goderich, who found himself unable to manage Canning's motley following, and was forced to resign before the meeting of Parliament. End of section 88section 89 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by paul lawley jones a history of england by charles oman chapter 39 reaction and reform 1815 to 1832 part 3 the king then proposed that a strong head should be found for the ministry. In the person of a man universally respected and owning a splendid reputation for loyalty and stern sense of duty. The Duke of Wellington, the hero of the Peninsular War. The suggestion was an unhappy one, for Wellington had little political knowledge, had never managed Parliament, and was full of honest but obstinate prejudices. He was, however, made Prime Minister, and troubles soon began to follow. Almost the first utterance of the Duke was to stigmatise the victory of Navarino as an untoward event, which gave great offence, for most men looked upon it as a righteous blow against tyranny and oppression. He refused to continue Canning's efforts in favour of Greece, and that country ultimately obtained her freedom from the not very disinterested hands of Russia. For in 1828, Tsar Nicholas attacked the Turks, sent his armies across the Balkans, and imposed peace on Sultan Mahmud, helping himself to a large slice of Ottoman territory in Asia at the same time that he stipulated for the recognition of Greek independence. Though the most upright and conscientious of men, Wellington proved a very unsatisfactory Prime Minister. His main fault was precisely the one that would least have been expected from an old soldier, a tendency to flinch from his resolves and engagements when he found that public opinion was set against him. Personally, he was a Tory of the old school. For popular cries and magnificent programmes he had a rooted distrust, which he had picked up in the peninsula, while dealing with the bombastic and incapable statesman who led the Liberal Party in the Spanish Cortes. But on the other hand, he had seen so much of the horrors of civil war that he had imbibed a great dread of making himself responsible for any measure that might split the nation into hostile camps and cause domestic strife. These two conflicting impulses acted on his mind in strange and often abrupt alterations. He was always making reactionary declarations, and then receding from them when he found they were unpopular. At first, it seemed likely that he was about to make himself the mouthpiece of the stern and unbending Tories of the school of Castlereagh. Before he had been three months in office, he had dismissed Huskisson, and the other disciples of Canning followed Huskisson into retirement. But very soon, he disappointed his more fanatical followers. In the summer of 1828, he was confronted with a great national agitation in Ireland. Since the Union, that country had been in its normal condition of unrest, but the main grievance which the Irish agitators mooted was the non-fulfilment of the promise of Catholic emancipation which Pitt had made in 1800, when he united the two parliaments. The demand, 
that the majority of the nation should be granted equality of political rights with the minority was obviously just. Yet not only Irish Orangemen, but English Tories had a violent prejudice against Romanism. It was evident that emancipation would not be conceded without a struggle. But the Irish at this moment were headed by the adroit and capable Daniel O'Connell, a wealthy squire of old family, a platform orator of great power and pathos, and a skilful party leader, but vain, scurrilous, and noisy. He founded an association, the prototype of the land leagues and national leagues of our own day, to forward the Catholic claims. He filled the land with monster public meetings and frightened the champions of Protestant ascendancy by vague threats of civil war. To his great credit, he kept his followers from crime, a feat which his successors have not always accomplished. His power was shown by his triumphant return to Parliament, in defiance of the law, for County Clare. Under the influence of their priests, the Irish farmers had broken away from their old subservience to the great landlords, and placed themselves at O'Connell's disposal. Wellington was by birth an Anglo-Irish Protestant, and he detested Romanism, but he detested civil war still more. When O'Connell's agitation grew formidable, and the old Tories urged him to repress it by force, he refused. At last, his mind was made up to grant emancipation. His own words explain his mental attitude. Quote, I have passed a longer period of my life in war than most men, and principally in civil war, and I must say this, that if I could avert by any sacrifice even one month's civil war in the country to which I am attached, I would give my life to do it. End quote. In the spring of 1829, Wellington announced his intention of granting complete equality of civil rights to all Romanists. Many of his followers called him a weathercock and a turncoat, while the vicious old king pretended, in imitation of his father's action in 1801, that his conscience forbade him to violate his coronation oath. But Wellington carried his emancipation bill with the aid of Whig support, and against the votes of all the narrower Tories. The king swallowed his scruples with cowardly haste, and the act was made law, April 14th, 1829. O'Connell and some scores of his followers, his tail, as the English called them, entered Parliament and allied themselves to the Whigs. The emancipation question being moved out of the way, the topic of parliamentary reform came once more to the front as the great difficulty of the day. When the Whigs began to moot it again, they found the time favourable, for the Wellington ministry was grown very weak. The Duke had expelled the moderate Tories from his cabinet in 1828. He had angered the old Tories by his concession to the Romanists in 1829, and could no longer command the loyalty of either section of his party. The agitation for the reform of the Commons began to become formidable in the stormy year of 1830. Unrest was in the air, and all over the world popular risings were rife. In July the French rose in arms, dethroned their dull and despotic king, Charles X, and replaced him by his popular cousin, Louis-Philippe, Duke of Orléans. The Poles raised an insurrection against the tyranny of Tsar Nicholas. There were troubles in Italy and Germany, and open war in Belgium and Portugal. Everywhere the partisans of the Holy Alliance and the old regime were being assailed by riot and insurrection. It was natural that England should feel the influence of this wave of discontent. In the midst of the year, King George died, worn out by his evil living, June 26, 1830. He was succeeded by his third brother, William, Duke of Clarence, for Frederick of York, the second son of George III, had died in 1827. The new king was an eccentric but good-natured old sailor. He was simple, patriotic, and kindly, and carried into all his doings something of the breezy geniality of his old profession. But his elevation almost turned his brain, 
and in the first months of his reign, he was guilty of a dozen absurd actions and speeches which made men fear for his sanity. It is a good sovereign, punned a contemporary wit, but it is a little cracked. The best feature in William was that he was not a party man. He acted all through his reign as a constitutional monarch should, and his personal popularity did much to make the crisis of the reform agitation of 1830 to 1832 pass off without harm. The fall of Wellington's ministry followed very closely on the accession of the new king. A general election in the autumn of 1830 was fatal to the Duke's majority in the Commons. The old Tories refused to interest themselves in his fate, and would not work for him, while the Whigs made a great effort and swept off almost all the seats in which election was really free and open. No less than sixty out of eighty-two county seats in England were captured by them. Parliament reassembled on November 2nd, and on November 15th, Wellington was beaten by a majority of twenty-nine in the lower house, and promptly resigned. William IV immediately took the proper constitutional step of sending for the leader of the opposition, Lord Grey. After an absence of twenty-three years from power, the Whigs once more crossed to the Treasury bench and took over the management of the realm. Their long exile from office had made them better at criticism than administration, and they found it hard to settle down into harness. More especially, as some of the new ministry were wanting in restraint and gravity, notably the Lord Chancellor Brougham, one of the most versatile and able, but also one of the most eccentric and volatile men who has ever sat on the woolsack but the cabinet was much strengthened by the adhesion of two of the Canningite Tories, Lord Melbourne and Lord Palmerston, who became, respectively, Secretary for Ireland and Secretary for Foreign Affairs. The Whigs at once took in hand the chief item of their programme, parliamentary reform, though Connell was doing his best to bring another topic to the front by agitating for home rule, or repeal, as it was then called and was enlisting all Catholic Ireland in a league for that end. In March 1831, Lord John Russell, a young member of one of the greatest Whig houses, and the great-grandson of the Bedford who was minister in 1763, brought forward his famous Reform Bill, which disfranchised most of the rotten boroughs, and distributed their seats among the large towns and the more populous counties. Owing to differences of opinion among the Whigs themselves as to the exact shape it should assume, the bill never reached its third reading in the Commons. The Ministry then dissolved Parliament in order to get a clear verdict from the constituencies on the reform question. They came back to Westminster with a magnificent majority of 136. Lord John Russell again introduced his bill, which passed all its readings with ease, but was rejected by the Tory majority and the House of Lords on October 8, 1831. This rash action of the peers brought about such a quarrel between the two houses as has never been seen before or since, and nearly wrecked the old order of the English constitution, for the peers had never before dared to cross such a crushing majority as the Whigs then possessed in the Commons, backed by the public opinion of the nation. Riotous demonstrations in favour of reform burst out all over the country, often accompanied by violence. At Bristol there was a wild rising, ending in the burning and pillaging of many buildings, public and private. In London a national union of reformers was formed to bring pressure to bear on the Lords. At Birmingham a local radical named Atwood formed an association of 200,000 members who swore to march on London and use force if their cry of the bill, the whole bill, and nothing but the bill, was denied. Strengthened by these demonstrations of popular sympathy, the ministers brought in their bill for the third time, and again sent it up to the Lords. The Upper House was seriously frightened by the turmoil in the country, and allowed the bill to pass its second reading. But the more fanatical Tories made a final rally and mutilated the bill in committee by
by postponing the clauses which disfranchised the rotten boroughs. May 7, 1832 This brought England within a measurable distance of civil war. The ministry resigned, throwing on the king and the lords the responsibility for anything that might occur. King William, in strict constitutional form, asked the Duke of Wellington to form a Tory cabinet. The Duke unwillingly essayed the task, but the feeling of the majority of the Tories was so strongly in favour of leaving to the Whigs the responsibility of facing the crisis, that the Duke threw up the cards and acknowledged his inability to form a ministry. This was fortunate, for the Radicals had been organising armed multitudes and threatened open insurrection. But the eventful ten days during which war was in the air passed over, and the Grey Cabinet came back into power. In the end of May, the bill was sent up to the Lords for the third time. The King promised Lord Grey that if the bill was again rejected, he would create enough new Whig peers to carry it against any opposition. The House of Lords was made aware of this promise, and, to avoid forcing the King to this extremity, Wellington and one hundred Tory peers solemnly left their seats, and allowed the Act to pass by a considerable majority. June 4th, 1832 The details of this measure in its final shape deserve a word of notice. It disfranchised all the absolutely rotten boroughs, i.e. all places with less than two thousand inhabitants, which were no less than fifty-six in number. It took away one member each from thirty boroughs more, which had more than two thousand, but less than four thousand residents. This gave one hundred and forty-three seats for distribution among the unrepresented or underrepresented districts. Of these, sixty-five were given to the counties and seventy-eight to new boroughs. In the former case, the county was broken up into two or more divisions, each returning two members. In the latter, five London boroughs, Lambeth, Greenwich, Marylebone, Finsbury and Tower Hamlets, and twenty-two large places, such as Birmingham and Manchester, received two members each, while twenty-one considerable towns of the second rank got one member each. At the same time, the franchise was made regular all over England. Previously, it had varied in the most arbitrary fashion. Some towns had practically manhood suffrage, in others the corporation had been the only electors. Now, in the boroughs, the power to vote was given to all resident occupiers of premises of ten pounds yearly value, so that all the shopkeeping class and the wealthier artisans got the franchise, but not the poorer inhabitants. In the counties, freeholders, copyholders, and holders of leases for sixty years to the annual value of ten pounds, with occupiers paying a yearly rent of fifty pounds, were enfranchised. Thus, the farmers and yeomen ruled the poll, and the agricultural labourers had no voice in the matter. The franchise in Ireland was assimilated to that in England, thus depriving of their power the two-pound householders who had hitherto been allowed to vote in that country. In Scotland, on the other hand, the rule was slightly more liberal than in England, as occupiers of ten-pound farms were given the franchise, instead of fifty pounds being left as the limit. Thus, the United Kingdom acquired its first representative parliament. But the new body was as yet representative of the middle classes alone. It was thought, wisely enough, that the agricultural labourers and the town poor were as yet unfit to be electors. For thirty years, no serious attempt to extend the limits of the franchise was made, and fifty were to elapse before simple household suffrage in town and county alike was to be made the rule. Meanwhile, the first reform bill amply justified itself and gave England two generations of quiet and orderly government. End of section 89 End of chapter 39「Section 90 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Beckett Wood A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 40 Chartism and the Corn Laws, 1832-52, to 52, Part 1 The struggle over the Reform Bill had been so fierce, and the change in the House of Commons caused by it had been so sweeping, that it was generally supposed at the time that the immediate consequences of the triumph of the Whigs would be very marked and startling. The Tories prophesied the introduction, at no very distant date, of legislation on behalf of all the radical cries which the more extreme followers of Lord Grey had adopted, such as manhood suffrage, vote by ballot, the abolition of the standing army, the disestablishment of the Church of England. Some even whispered that Great Britain would have ceased to be a monarchy within ten years. All these suspicions were unfounded. By the action of the Reform Bill, the power to make and unmake cabinets had passed not into the hands of the masses, but into those of the middle classes, the shopkeepers of the towns and the farmers of the countryside. These were a very different body from the excited mobs who had rioted in the streets and threatened civil war in the years 1830 to 32. As a matter of fact, the bill had done comparatively little for those who supported it most violently and caused grave disappointment to the wilder spirits among the followers of Lord Grey. It had put an end to borough-mongering. No ministry could henceforth hope to keep in office unless it had the support of the majority of the constituencies. It had placed the individual member much more under the control of the electors than had been the case in earlier years, so that the power of public opinion was greatly increased. It had modified the composition of the House of Commons by bringing in a large number of new members of a different type from the old. For the great industrial centres in the North and Midlands, which now obtained representatives for the first time, had mostly returned wealthy local manufacturers and merchants to speak in their behalf. But neither the newly enfranchised classes nor their members in Parliament were likely to be in favour of sudden and violent changes in the Constitution or the social condition of the realm, such as had sometimes appeared imminent in the turbulent years between 1816 and 1832. The Whigs were no radicals. It was more than 30 years before they began seriously to think of enfranchising the labouring classes and facing all the problems of democracy. A sufficient indication of the character of Lord Grey's ministry is to be found in the fact that some of its most important members were recruited from the ranks of the moderate Tories. Lord Palmerston, the Foreign Secretary, and Lord Melbourne, the Home Secretary, had both been followers of Canning, and had joined the ranks of the Whigs only when they saw the Tories under Wellington finally committed to reactionary views. Perhaps Huskisson, Canning's Minister of Commerce, would have gone with them, but he had been killed, just before Lord Grey came into office, in the first railway accident that ever occurred in England. The Grey Ministry held office for four years only, but did much for the country in that time. Its best piece of work was the new Poor Law of 1834, which put an end to the ruinous and degrading system of outdoor relief, which had been crushing the agricultural labourer and loading the parishes with debt ever since the unwise legislation of 1795. The new law reimposed the old test of the workhouse on applicants for charity. Only aged and impotent persons were to receive doles of money and food at their own homes. Able-bodied men were forced to enter the workhouse, which they naturally detested on account of its restraint, or to give up their weekly allowance. The result was to force the farmers to pay the whole of their labourers' wages and to cease to expect the parish to find half of the amount. This was perfectly just and rational, the parish finances were at once lightened of their crushing burden, while the labourers ceased to be pauperised and did not lose anything by the change of the method of payment. 
But if they lost nothing, they gained nothing, and the condition of the rural classes of England still remained much inferior to what it had been in the old days before enclosure acts and high rents came into vogue in the second half of the 18th century. The new poor law compelled small neighbouring parishes to combine into unions to keep a common workhouse, and it was found that one large institution was worked both more efficiently and less expensively than several small ones. In seven years, the total cost of the poor relief of England fell from nearly £8 million to £4,700,000, an immense relief to the country. Another splendid piece of work done by the Ministry of Lord Grey was the final abolition of slavery in the English colonies. Though the slave trade had long been prohibited, yet slavery itself still subsisted, and the West Indian planters were a body strong and wealthy enough to offer a vigorous opposition to the enfranchisement of their Negroes. Many of the old Tories were narrow and misguided enough to lend them aid in Parliament, but the bill was carried. £20 million were set aside to compensate the owners, and on August 1, 1834, all the slaves became free, though they were bound to work as apprentices to their late masters for seven years, a period afterwards shortened to three. A third useful measure was the reform of the municipal corporations of England, of which many had hitherto been wholly unrepresentative bodies, not chosen by the people, but co-opting each other, and often worked by small and corrupt party or family rings. For this absurd arrangement, the Act of 1835 substituted a popular and elective constitution to the enormous improvement of the purity and respectability of the municipal bodies. The European policy of the Whigs was in the hand of the brisk and self-reliant Lord Palmerston, who directed the foreign relations of England for nearly 30 years, with a few intervals of retirement from office. He had left the Tories because he disliked their policy of non-intervention in continental affairs, and because he nourished an active dislike for the despotic monarchies of the Holy Alliance. His end was to raise up a league in Western Europe, which should support national liberties and constitutional government in each country, against the autocratic and reactionary powers of Central and Eastern Europe. He therefore allied himself with Louis-Philippe of Orléans, the new King of France, who had been set up by the Liberal Party in that country as a constitutional king after the expulsion of Charles X. He actively assisted the parties in Spain and Portugal, who were fighting for limited monarchy and the nation's right to choose its own sovereign. In each of those countries there was a civil war in progress between the Liberal Party backing a young queen with a parliamentary title to the crown and the Reactionary Party supported by the priesthood and upholding a prince who claimed the throne under the Salic law and appealed to the divine hereditary right of kings. Palmerston supported both Donna Maria in Portugal and Donna Isabella in Spain against their uncles Don Miguel and Don Carlos by every means short of the actual sending of British troops to the peninsula. But many officers were allowed to volunteer into the Portuguese and Spanish service, and the struggle was largely settled by their aid. The designs of Don Miguel in Portugal were finally frustrated by the defeat of his fleet by Admiral Napier, who commanded the young Queen's ships, 1831. In Spain the fighting lasted much longer, and the efforts of Sir de Lacey Evans, British Legion, against the Carlists were not altogether successful, 1835-38. to 38. But the war ultimately came to an end in the favour of Queen Isabella in 1840. Palmerston also lent his support to the National Party in a struggle nearer home. Holland and Belgium had been united into a single kingdom by the Treaty of Vienna and placed under the House of Orange the old stadtholders of the United Provinces. But the Belgians much disliked the arrangement. They were divided by religion from their northern king's folk and had no national sympathy with them or loyalty to their Dutch king. In 1830 they rose in arms and declared their independence. William I of Holland endeavoured to subdue them, 
and perhaps might have succeeded, but for the interference of England and of Louis Philippe, the new King of France. When the Dutch refused to come to terms, a French army entered Belgium and expelled the garrison of Antwerp, while an English fleet blockaded the Scheldt. On this pressure being applied, the Dutch yielded, and the Kingdom of Belgium was established, its first sovereign being a prince well known in England, Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, the widower of the much-lamented Princess Charlotte. Thus, when France, Spain, Portugal and Belgium were in the hands of governments professing liberal principles and opposed to despotism, the reactionary monarchs of the Holy Alliance ceased to appear such a danger to the existence of constitutional monarchy in Europe. While fairly successful alike in its foreign policy and its English legislation, the Grey Cabinet was never so strong as might have been expected from its triumphant commencement of office. The Tory party, which had seemed shattered forever by the Reform Bill and had remained for some years in a broken and helpless condition, began gradually to reorganise itself under the wise and cautious leadership of Sir Robert Peel. Though Palmerston, Melbourne and the other Canningites, who had quitted it in 1828, did not return to its ranks and remained moderate Whigs, yet there were many others who gradually rallied themselves to the old Church and State Party. The new voters whom the Reform Bill had created did not prove so universally devoted to radical principles as had been expected. There was always much attachment to the old ideals in the middle classes. When Peel appeared as leader, in place of narrow old Tories of the type of Castlereagh and Addington, he was gradually enabled to collect a large body of followers and to form an opposition commanding a respectable number of votes. About this time he wisely dropped the name of Tory and called himself and his followers Conservatives in order to get rid of the unfortunate associations of the older party appellation. But the time was still far off when the Conservatives were to obtain a preponderance in the House of Commons. Lord Grey resigned in 1834, but only to give place to another Whig Prime Minister who continued the policy and work of his predecessor with the aid of most of his cabinet. The change of premiers was due to a division among the Whigs caused by Irish affairs. The grant of Catholic emancipation in 1829 had completely failed to quiet Ireland. It only caused the Irish to substitute new demands for the old ones. O'Connell, flushed with his victory on the emancipation question, had started two new agitations, combined with each other much as home rule and the land question are combined by modern Irish politicians. The first of them was the demand for repeal, that is, the abolition of the Union of 1800, and the establishment of a local parliament in Dublin, the cry that is called home rule in our own day. The second was the tithe war, a crusade against the payment by the Romanist peasantry of tithes for the support of the established Church of Ireland, a body which they naturally detested. The tithe war lasted for six or seven years and was accompanied by much rioting and outrage. The peasantry withheld the tithe and the Protestant clergy were in many cases absolutely ruined and reduced to starvation by being deprived of their sustenance. A coercion bill for the suppression of riots and violence was passed in 1833 and had some effect in restoring order but the ministry was divided on the question of the justice of continuing to extract money from the Romanist peasantry to support an alien church. The Premier proposed that the government should take over the collection of the tithe, but use it for such purposes, secular or otherwise, as might be deemed fit. But many of his colleagues objected to diverting church money from its original uses, and the Cabinet fell to pieces after a stormy scene in the House over a renewal of the Coercion Act. Grey retired, and the King sent for Sir Robert Peel, who at once dissolved Parliament. But the Whigs had a majority in the new House, and Peel fell, after holding office for four months only. Grey's colleague, Lord Melbourne, took over the conduct of affairs, 
and rearranged the cabinet, excluding only the late Premier and his clever but eccentric Chancellor, Lord Broom. This ministry struggled on for six years, confronted always by the strong conservative following and the mastermind of Peel, and dependent on the uncertain support of O'Connell and his tail. Its chief achievement was the final passing of the Irish Tithe Act, which relieved the peasantry of the duty of paying that contribution to the established church and transferred it to their landlords, so that the tithe was for the future a charge on rent. O'Connell accepted this compromise, and the tithe war ended, but the repeal agitation went on vigorously, and monster meetings all over Ireland were continually demanding home rule. O'Connell had the priests on his side to a man, and, using them as his instruments, could dictate orders to the countryside and return all the members for the Catholic districts of Ireland. To his great credit, he kept the agitation clear of outrages, as he had already done in the case of emancipation ten years before. Without having recourse to any such expedients, he was able to keep the government in continual hot water, and more than once to wrest concessions of importance from it. End of section 90《The Melbourne Cabinet was still wandering on its feeble way when on June the 20th, 1837, the worthy old King, William IV, died. His decease had no great effect on the politics of the realm, for when the election for a new Parliament took place, as was necessary on the Sovereign's death, the Ministry was found to have in the new House a small majority of much the same numbers as that which they had enjoyed in the old. The successor of King William was his niece, Victoria, daughter of Edward, Duke of Kent, the fourth son of George the Third. She was a young girl of eighteen, who had been brought up very quietly at Kensington Palace by her widowed mother, Victoria of Saxe-Coburg. Little was known of her by the nation at large, and some of the baser spirits among the Tories whispered at first that she would prove a party sovereign and a mere tool of the Whigs. But it was not long before the world discovered that the young queen was likely to be a model for constitutional monarchs. She was simple, straightforward, filled with a deep consciousness of the responsibility of her position, and anxious to discharge her duties with all possible regard for the well-being of her subjects. The more she was known, the more was she liked and respected, and there was accordingly a general feeling of relief that the throne had not gone to the next heir, the Queen's unpopular uncle, Ernest, Duke of Cumberland. That prince, moreover, now became ruler of Hanover, where the Salic law prevailed, and the kingdom was finally separated from England after a 123 years of union. Thus England was freed from all necessity for interfering in the internal politics of Germany. Lord Melbourne, behind an air of studied levity, possessed a strong will and a conscientious desire to do well by his country. He determined to place his experience at the disposal of the young queen and to teach her the ways of constitutional monarchy. Until her marriage, he acted as her private secretary, using his position for no party purpose. In the language of the Duke of Wellington, he taught her to preside over the destinies of this great country. The Melbourne Cabinet lasted till September 1841, much vexed in its later years by social troubles in England, the result of the growing discontent among the working classes at the failure of the Reform Bill to bring about a golden age. They had thought that the creation of a representative House of Commons would be followed by all manner of radical reforms, and were now complaining that the new government was little better than the old. The Tories scourged us with whips, 
but the Whigs use scorpions, complained Cobbett, the radical pamphleteer, while Lord Grey was still in power. There was this amount of truth in the complaint, that the Tories were always trying to interfere in social matters and believed in paternal government and the duty of the state to care for the individual citizen, but the Whigs, under the influence of the rules of strict political economy, held that the state must not meddle with private men, that the rule of laissez-faire, or non-intervention, was right, and that free competition between man and man was the true order of life. Now, Tory interference with social matters had generally been wrong-headed and disastrous, but Whig indifference and abstention was quite as exasperating to the masses. The old delusion that men can be made happy by legislation and grants of political rights was still universally prevalent, and the discontent of the labouring classes took shape, now, as in the last generation, in a demand for parliamentary reform. The new agitation got its name from the document called The People's Charter, which was put forward as the programme of the movement. It contained five claims. One, for manhood suffrage. Two, for the vote by ballot at elections. Three, for annual parliaments. Four, for the payment of members. Five, for the throwing open of seats in the House of Commons to all men by the abolition of the property qualification, which was still required, in theory, to be possessed by members. It is curious to reflect how entirely useless all these five demands would have been to cure the social discontents of the day. The second and fifth clauses of the Charter have long been granted. The first is practically conceded, and the fourth may be so ere long. Yet the ills against which the Chartists were protesting are still with us. For the real end of the agitation was in truth purely social. It was much the same as the cry for the so-called living wage that is heard among us today. The principle of the People's Charter, said one of its advocates in 1838, is the right of every man to have his home, his hearth and his happiness. It means that every working man in the land has a right to a good coat, a good hat, a good dinner, no more work than will keep him in health, and as much wages as will keep him in plenty. The demagogues, honest or dishonest, who led the Chartist movement, insisted that the Golden Age would follow the introduction of universal suffrage and their other demands, though it is difficult to see how they can have been so simple as to hold such a view. But they were, for the most part, mere windy orators, with no grasp of the means or ends that they needed, the most prominent man of the whole band being Fergus O'Connor, an Irishman with an enormous flow of words and an ill-balanced brain, who ended his days in a lunatic asylum. Riotous public meetings, where threats of physical force were freely used, were rife all through the years 1838 to 42, and gave the Whig ministry no small trouble. But the movement was never so dangerous to law and order as the troubles of the years 1816 to 32 had been, for the Chartists were backed by neither of the great political parties, had no competent leaders, and were detested for their noisy turbulence by the whole of the middle classes, Whig and Tory alike. Parliament refused to take them seriously, even when they kept sending up monster petitions to the House of Commons, purporting to contain a million and a half or even three million signatures. One of these documents, as large in circumference as a cartwheel, had to be carried by sixteen men and stuck in the door of the House, so that it had to be cut up in order to allow it to enter. But petitions, riots and wild talk had none of them any practical effect. There was little that was eventful in the foreign policy of the later years of the Melbourne Cabinet. The only events of importance were our first war with China and our interference in the Levant to prevent the break-up of the Turkish Empire. The Chinese quarrel, the Opium War, as it was often called, arose from the destruction of a quantity of that drug belonging to English merchants by the mandarins of Canton, who had resolved not to allow it to be imported into their country. In consequence, an army was sent out to the Far East, 
which, after some desultory fighting, compelled the Chinese to sue for peace, pay an indemnity of $21 million, and cede the island of Hong Kong, which, in British hands, has since become one of the greatest ports of the world, 1839-41. to 41. The war in Syria was caused by the attempt of Mehemet Ali, the Pasha of Egypt, to assert his independence and to tear Syria and Asia Minor from his suzerain, the Sultan. Thinking that the maintenance of Turkey was essential to British interests in the east, Lord Palmerston bade the rebel Pasha retire within his own borders and, on his refusal, bombarded and took Acre and Sidon. This brought Mohammed Ali to reason, and he acquiesced in an agreement which left him the position of a quasi-independent ruler in Egypt, but stripped him of his conquests beyond the Syrian desert. January 1841 In the year which preceded this last war, England had been rejoiced to see her queen happily married. The young sovereign's choice had been her own first cousin, Albert of Saxe-Coburg, whom the country knew so well first as Prince Albert, then as the Prince Consort. He was very young at the time of the marriage, being only in his twenty-first year, but from his earliest days in England showed a remarkable wisdom and power of adapting himself to his new surroundings. While carefully refraining from taking any ostensible part in politics, he was able in many ways to act as a useful counsellor both for his wife and his wife's ministers, for he had a large knowledge of foreign politics and a sound and cautious judgment. His blameless private life and many amiable qualities endeared him to all who came into personal contact with him. But for many years he was not properly appreciated by the English people, who were vaguely suspicious of a foreign prince placed in such a difficult position as that of husband to a constitutional queen. All their suspicions of him and his influence were ungrounded, but it was not till after his death in 1861 that most men realised what a thoroughly wise and unselfish friend of England he had been. The Melbourne Ministry went out of power a few months after the Queen's marriage. A general election took place in June-July 1841, and a Conservative majority was returned to the House of Commons, whereupon Sir Robert Peel was called upon to take office in the due course of constitutional etiquette. The Tories, now again in power after an interval of twelve years, were a very different party from what they had been in the old days before 1830. The whole body of them had moved slowly forward, but there was still, as always, a more and a less progressive section among them, as in the days of Canning and Castlereagh. Peel himself had generally been considered to belong to the former body, though he had been one of those who opposed parliamentary reform to the last. His own breeding and character account for his position. He was not a member of one of the old aristocratic Tory families, but the son of a wealthy Lancashire mill owner, a representative of the conservatism of the middle classes, not of the old landed interest. He was a firm, able, conscientious man, rather too masterful in dealing with his followers, and prone to command rather than to persuade. But in 1841, his authority over them seemed so firmly established that men prophesied that he would rule for as many years as the younger Pitt. As a matter of fact, his ministry was only to last from September 1841 to July 1846, and, instead of establishing the Conservative Party firmly in power, he was fated to break it up, and to condemn it to almost continuous exile from office for nearly thirty years. But Peel's early years of power promised well. His first achievement was to restore the national finances, which had been left in a most unsatisfactory condition by the Melbourne Ministry. His budget of 1842 was long remembered as being the first important step in the direction of free trade that had been taken for many years. He reduced the import duties on nearly 750 articles of consumption, reasoning that the advantage to the consumer far outweighed the loss to the English manufacturer, 
whose interests were served by the protective duties which he removed. To make up the deficit in the revenue caused by these remissions of import duties, he imposed the income tax, under a pledge that it was to be an exceptional impost. Five years, he said, would suffice to restore the revenue to its old amount, and it should then be dropped. Unfortunately, for all persons with fixed incomes, Peel was out of office long before the five years were over, and none of his successors has ever redeemed his pledge. The income tax still remains with us, the easy and obvious method by which any impecunious Chancellor of the Exchequer can wring more money from the middle classes by adding an extra penny in the pound. It must, however, be granted that at its first imposition it tided England very successfully over a dangerous financial crisis. The Melbourne Cabinet had left the task of dealing with two troublesome agitations as a legacy to their successors. The Chartists were still thundering away at monster meetings and bombarding Parliament with gigantic petitions. One, sent to the House of Commons in 1842, purported to be signed by three million persons, and was actually signed by, perhaps, a third of that number. It was couched in such seditious terms that the government refused to receive it, and was supported by a majority of 238, when certain radical members pressed them to a division. But Peel's hand was known to be firm, and it was obvious that there was no chance of intimidating him, so the Chartist agitation though it continued to simmer all through his time, never boiled up into any dangerous effervescence. End of section 91。section 92 of A History of England。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Beckett Wood A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 40 Chartism and the Corn Laws, 1832-1852 to 1852, Part 3 In Ireland, matters seemed for a time more serious. Daniel O'Connell was still pressing on his campaign for repeal. He was the master of the greater part of the Irish people, and had his well-disciplined tail to follow him in the commons. But as long as both Conservatives and Whigs refused to buy his aid at the price of granting his demands for home rule, he could do no more than bluster and declaim at public meetings. But O'Connell was joined, in the year 1842, by a body of recruits who refused to be fettered by his command to refrain from the use of physical force a band of ardent young politicians, the political heirs of Lord Edward Fitzgerald and Robert Emmett, bound themselves together to strive for repeal by the old method of armed rebellion, when England's extremity should be Ireland's opportunity. They called themselves the Young Ireland Party, revived the old watchwords of the United Irishmen, and gloried in the principles of ninety-eight. The chiefs of this faction were Smith O'Brien, Ma, and Gavin Duffy. O'Connell was afraid of their rashness, and the priesthood, who acted as O'Connell's agents all over Ireland, viewed them with suspicion as possible republicans and atheists, but they gained considerable influence in the land. The repeal agitation came to a head in 1843, when O'Connell gathered several hundred thousand people together at a meeting at Tara, the old seat of the kings of Ireland, and addressed them in an excited strain, promising them a parliament of their own on College Green within the year. But Peel had him and his chief lieutenants arrested and tried for sedition. The whole agitation seemed to collapse when the government made a show of force, and, though O'Connell was ultimately acquitted, his hold on the Irish people was much shaken by the obvious uselessness for any practical end of all his meetings and harangues. The majority of his followers fell back into apathy. The minority resolved to join the Young Irelanders and to plot armed treason at some convenient date in the future. 
Meanwhile, Repeal was dead, and O'Connell died a few years later, just before the miserable years 1846 to 7 revived the troubles of Ireland. English foreign policy in Peel's day continued on the good lines on which Palmerston had placed it, for the new Conservative Party were vigilant to defend our interests abroad and to resent the aggression of our neighbours. A very threatening dispute with the United States about the southwestern boundaries of British America was settled in 1842 by a satisfactory treaty which gave England Vancouver's Island and all the coast north of the Straits of Juan da Fuca, taking the 49th degree of latitude as the dividing line from the Pacific to the end of Lake Superior. The Americans had claimed, but had to give up, the whole western shore of North America, up to the Russian province of Alaska. Twice England appeared likely to engage in war with France in 1844 and 1846, while Peel was in power. The first quarrel was about the annexation of the island of Tahiti in the Pacific, where a French admiral arrested the English consul and seized the island in the most arbitrary way from its queen. But Louis-Philippe did not wish for war with the only power in Europe that looked kindly on a constitutional monarchy in France, and forced his ministers to apologise to England and abandon Tahiti. In the second quarrel, the crafty and intriguing old king was himself to blame. He had formed a design for securing Spain for his younger son, Anthony, Duke of Montpensier, by means of a marriage. The crown of that country was now worn by the young Queen Isabella, whose heiress was her still younger sister, Louisa. Louis-Philippe secured the marriage of the younger princess with his own son. At the same time, by disreputable intrigues with the Spanish Queen Mother, Christina of Naples, and the factious parties in the Cortes, he got the unfortunate Queen married to her cousin, Don Francisco, Duke of Cadiz, a wretched weakling who, as he thought, was certain to die without heirs, so that the crown must ultimately fall to the Montpensiers, 1846. This scheme reproduced the old danger that had brought about the war of the Spanish succession in the days of William III and Anne, the chance that the crowns of Spain and France might be united. The English government and people were bitterly provoked. High words passed between London and Paris, and there appeared for some time a danger that a rupture might ensue. But external events intervened to prevent such a misfortune. Peel's government lost office in 1846, and Louis-Philippe was dethroned in 1848, after which the Spanish marriages ceased to have any importance. While that question was at its height, England had been going through an unexpected political crisis caused by Peel's sudden conversion to complete free trade. His budget of 1842 had shown that all his tendencies lay in that direction, but he had not yet touched the one point which was certain to bring him into collision with the majority of his own party, the question of free trade in corn. Since England had become a great manufacturing country, with a population that advanced by leaps and bounds, it was daily growing more impossible to feed the new mouths with English corn alone. But the heavy duties on imported grain, which survived from the last century, only allowed the foreign wheat to come in at an exorbitant price. Hence the poor man's loaf was always dear. Farmers and landlords profited by this protection of English agriculture, but since the landed interest had ceased to be the most important element in the state, the corn laws injured many more persons than they benefited. For the last five or six years, a vigorous agitation in favour of their abolition had been in progress, whose guiding spirit was Richard Cobden, the prophet of free trade. It seemed more likely that the Whigs would be converted by him than the Conservatives, for the backbone of Peel's majority in the House of Commons was composed of the county members who represented the farmers and landlords of England. But in 1845, a famine in Ireland, caused by the failure of the potato crop, called for a large importation of corn to feed the starving Irish cottiers. 
Peel proposed to suspend the Corn Laws as a temporary measure to allow of the introduction of the needed supply of food at the cheapest possible rate. His colleagues in the Ministry resolved to support the proposal, but they proved unable to persuade the whole of their party to follow them. About a hundred members of the House of Commons, the representatives of the corn-growing shires and the old Tory families, refused to be convinced by Peel's arguments. They were headed by two men of mark, neither of whom had as yet been taken very seriously by the House. The first was Lord George Bentinck, a younger son of the great ducal house of Portland, who had hitherto been seen more frequently on the race course than at St. Stephen's, but who showed an unexpected ability when he proceeded to attack his chief. The second was Benjamin Disraeli, the son of a Jewish man of letters, then known as a young and volatile member of the House, who combined high Tory notions on church and state with extreme radical views on certain social questions. But he had been hitherto more notorious for his eccentric and gorgeous dress and his curious high-flown and bombastic novels than for any serious political doings. When Peel brought forward his bill for abolishing the Corn Laws, he found himself bitterly opposed by Bentinck and Israeli and their protectionist followers, who scouted him as a turncoat and a traitor to the Tory cause. He carried the abolition of the obnoxious duties by the aid of the votes of his enemies, the Whigs, May 15, 1846. A month later, the angry protectionists took their revenge. On the question of an Irish coercion bill, Bentick and Disraeli led some scores of Tory members into the opposition lobby and left the Prime Minister in a minority of 73, June 25, 1846. Peel immediately resigned. He had carried his bill, but broken up his party, and the Whigs were now to have a fresh lease of office that lasted 30 years for the two sections into which the Conservatives had broken up, the Peelites and the Protectionists, would never join again, so bitterly did they dislike each other. In the course of time, most of the Peelites drifted over to the Whig camp, among them two who were destined to be Prime Ministers of England, Lord Aberdeen, who had been Peel's Foreign Secretary, and William Ewart Gladstone, then a rising young member, who had held the presidency of the Board of Trade from 1843 to 1846. The Whigs, or the Liberal Party as they were now beginning to call themselves, came back to power with every advantage, as the opposition was divided into two irreconcilable sections who would never join on account of their old grudge. Yet the new cabinet was never a very strong one, because the Whigs refused to put Lord Palmerston, their strongest and ablest man, at the head of affairs. Some of the party could never forget that he had once been a Canningite, and thought that he was not liberal enough for them. Others were afraid of his firm and incisive way of dealing with foreign powers, and prophesied that he would some day land England unexpectedly in the midst of a great war. Instead of Palmerston, Lord John Russell, the promoter of the Great Reform Bill of 1832, was made Premier. He was a much less notable personage than Palmerston, and not strong enough for his place, being nothing more than an adroit party tactician with no touch of genius about him. Yet he held power for six years and made no great mistakes if he performed no great achievements at home. While, as the foreign policy of England was handed over to Palmerston, there was no lack of strong guidance in things abroad. The chief problem which the Liberal Cabinet found to trouble them when they took office was an Irish one. In 1845 there had been a partial failure of the potato crop, the staple food of the Irish peasantry. This was followed in 1846, just after Lord John Russell came into power, by a far more dreadful disaster of the same kind. In August, the whole potato harvest of southern and western Ireland was struck down by a sudden blight, such had never been seen before or since and four million persons were suddenly brought to the verge of starvation. The disaster was aggravated by the hopeless state of the rural population, 
For the last half century, the population of Ireland had been advancing with disastrous rapidity. It had swelled from five million to eight million, yet there had been no corresponding increase either of improved cultivation or of land taken under tillage. The improvident landlords had allowed the still more improvident tenantry to divide their farms into smaller and smaller fractions till the land only fed its population in years of exceptional fertility. The greater part of Ireland was cut up into miserable slips of a few acres, where the cottier paid intermittently as much as he could of a rent which was rated at a higher amount than the wretched little farm could ever produce. The unexampled disaster of two successive years of blight brought the whole of the miserable peasantry to the edge of the grave. The workhouses were soon crammed, all local funds used up, and yet the people were dying by thousands, from famine or from the fevers which were bred by insufficient nourishment. The government paltered with the evil by establishing relief works and refused for some time to face the fact that nothing but wholesale distribution of food would keep the wretched peasantry alive. It was not till 1847 that they faced the full horror of the problem and established soup kitchens and depots for free food all over the land. By this time, scores of thousands had died, and the bitterest feelings of wrath had been bred in the Irish mind at the neglect or incompetence of the cabinet. When the famine was over, it was generally recognised that the worst of the disaster had been owing to the congested state of the population who were trying to live on smaller farms than could really support them. This led to wholesale evictions by the landlords, who, half ruined by the famine themselves, wished to avoid another such experience by thinning off the pauperised cottiers and throwing several farms into one. In many cases, these evictions were carried out with ruthless haste and cruelty, for the proprietors, often absentees who did not know their tenants by sight, had no sympathy for the wretched peasants and only wanted to be rid of them. The unwilling emigrants were driven out of Ireland by the hundred thousand and retired for the most part to America, carrying away a fanatical hatred for the Anglo-Irish land-holding classes who had evicted them and for the English government which had sanctioned their expulsion. With such class rancour in the air, it was no wonder that troubles broke out in Ireland in 1848, the year after the famine was over. The chiefs of the Young Ireland Party thought that the times were ripe for open insurrection, and, seeing revolutions rife all over Europe, and the Chartist riots stirring again in England, resolved to strike at once. Their leader, Smith O'Brien, after using threatening language in the House of Commons, went over to Ireland and called the discontented to arms. But he proved a very incapable chief when he essayed the part of Catiline. Gathering together some hundreds of armed followers, he attacked fifty constables on Bonla Common in Tipperary. His men scattered after a few volleys, and he and his chief adherents fled to the hills, where they were soon caught, July 1848. They were tried for treason and condemned, but the government commuted their punishment to exile, and a few years later they were given a free pardon. This abortive revolt in Ireland was one of the least noteworthy events of 1848, the most turbulent year of the 19th century. The whole continent was ablaze with insurrections in favour of liberal ideas and national rights. The French drove out Louis Philippe because he had grown reactionary in his old age and refused to grant universal suffrage. On his expulsion, they established a republic. Another great insurrection arose in Hungary when the people tried to wrest a constitution by force of arms from their King Ferdinand, the Austrian Emperor. In the same year, a great rising in Italy strove to win national unity by expelling the Austrians from Lombardy and Venetia and making an end of the petty dukes and kings of central and southern Italy. Germany was at the same time convulsed by popular agitation, which demanded constitutional liberty from its many rulers, while the Diet at Frankfurt, 
declared in favour of unifying the land on a republican basis. All these troubles could not pass unnoticed in England, and the Chartists, whose movements had been small and unimportant for the last five years, once more began to stir up trouble. The last of their monster petitions was sent into the House of Commons, and the five points demanded more noisily than ever. Things came to a head when their chief, Fergus O'Connor, summoned a great meeting on Kennington Common and threatened to march on Westminster with 500,000 men at his back. But the government refused to be cowed, and the middle classes, in fierce anger at the noisy agitation, took arms against the rioters. 200,000 special constables were enrolled to face the rioters. The bridges leading to Westminster were manned with troops, and the great meeting was awaited with resolution. These preparations overawed the rioters. Only a few thousand chartists assembled, and Fergus O'Connor, frightened at the display of military force and the steady attitude of the special constables, bade his followers go home and disappeared. This was the last outbreak of the Chartists, who proved to be a mere bugbear when they were once met and faced. April 1848 For the future England was undisturbed, and, secure at home herself, could watch all the turmoil on the continent with composure. Palmerston did his best to favour the Liberal and National Parties abroad by all peaceful means, but would not commit England to war on their behalf. To his regret, Italy and Hungary were at last reconquered by their old masters, and the German Liberals were also put down, so that the unification of their land was delayed for twenty years, 1849. The French Republic proved weak and ill-governed. After several anarchist risings in Paris had frightened the French bourgeoisie, they took refuge under a military dictatorship, electing as president Louis Napoleon, the nephew of Napoleon I, and son of his younger brother Louis Bonaparte, King of Holland. The new president's record was not encouraging. Twice during the reign of Louis Philippe, he had made harebrained attempts to raise military revolts in France, trading on the great name of his uncle. On each occasion, he had failed lamentably, his preparations having been entirely inadequate to carry out his purpose. He had acquired the reputation of a rash and wild adventurer, ready to embark in any scheme. Yet the French, dazzled by the name of Bonaparte and over-persuaded by his promises to give them peace and prosperity, were unwise enough to elect him as president. Louis Napoleon soon strengthened himself by placing in office, both in the army and the ministry, a band of unscrupulous men whom he could trust to follow him in any dark scheme, if only they were well enough paid. When he had made his preparations, he seized and imprisoned most of the members of the Chamber of Deputies, shot down all who took arms to defend the Republic, and assumed despotic power, December 2nd, 1851. Soon afterwards he assumed the title of Emperor and the name of Napoleon III. The French President's treacherous usurpation brought about Palmerston's dismissal from office and ultimately the fall of the Russell Cabinet. Immediately after Louis Bonaparte had perpetrated his coup d'etat, the great foreign minister expressed to the French ambassador his acquiescence in the revolution. He had so much disliked the turbulent and anarchic republic which the usurper had destroyed that he was quite ready to acknowledge the new government, which was at any rate settled and strong for the moment. Palmerston took this action before he had consulted with his colleagues in the ministry or obtained the formal permission of the Queen to recognise the legality of Bonaparte's position. Both the Sovereign and the Cabinet were vexed at his acting without any consultation, and Lord John Russell dismissed him from office, January 1852. But Palmerston had many friends and admirers and was soon able to revenge himself. Less than a month after his dismissal, he led a section of the Whigs into the opposition lobby on a division concerning a bill to strengthen the militia and put Russell in a minority. The ministry was therefore obliged to resign. 
February 1852. End of section 92. Chapter 41 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 41. The Days of Palmerston, 1852 to 1865. Part 1. Expectations of Peace The Exhibition of 1851 The time which followed the quieting down of England and Europe after the turbulent years 1848 and 1849 was perhaps the most peaceful which the century had known. The English people, overjoyed to find that Chartism was but a bugbear and Irish rebellion a farce, had settled down to enjoy what they trusted would prove a long spell of tranquil prosperity. There was no great political question pending at home, since the corn laws were gone, and the Whigs had refused to take up any radical program. The continent was quiet, though its stillness only resulted from the dying down for a space of the flames of rebellion in Italy, Germany, and Hungary where embers still smouldered beneath the apparent deadness of the surface, and only needed a fresh stirring to make them break out again into a blaze. This fact was not appreciated in England, and the year 1851 saw the high-water mark of a vague and optimistic belief that the troubles of the world were over and a reign of good fellowship and brotherly affection among nations about to begin. When the Prince Consort opened the first great international exhibition in Hyde Park in the May of that year, much wild and visionary talk was heard about the end of war and the advent of an era when all disputes should be settled by arbitration. No expectation was ever more ill-founded after forty years of comparative peace, since the fall of Napoleon, the continent was just about to see the commencement of a series of four great wars, and England, whose soldiers had not fired a shot in Europe since Waterloo, was not to be without her share in them. Steam Navigation The English people were far from guessing this, Nearly all their attention had been given to matters of domestic policy for the last forty years, and no one thought that other topics were now to engross them. But before passing on to the Crimean War and the struggles that followed it, a few words are needed to show how the England of 1852 differed from the England of the days before the Reform Bill. The first and most striking change visible was the enormous development of the means of internal communication in the land. In 1832, the application of steam to locomotive engines alike on water and on land was just beginning to grow common. The first steam tug had been seen on the Clyde as far back as 1802, but no serious attempt to utilize the discovery on a large scale, and for long voyages was made for many years. It was only after 1830 that the steamer began steadily to supersede the sailing ship for ordinary commercial purposes. But within a few years after that date, all passenger traffic was carried on the new paddle steamer, and a large share of the goods traffic also. It was a sign of the indifference of the nation to things military during the years of the great peace that ships of war remained unaltered long after the advantages of steam had been discovered. A few small vessels were fitted with paddle wheels about 1840 and took part in the bombardment of Acre. But even in 1854, most of the line-of-battle ships of Great Britain were still of the old type that Nelson had loved, and depended on their sail power alone. Growth of Railways 
the utilization of steam for locomotion by land had started in the humble shape of the employment of small engines to drag trucks of coal and stone on local tramways at the slowest of paces. After lingering for some thirty years in this embryo stage, it was suddenly and rapidly developed by George Stevenson, a clever North Country engineer. The first railway on which passengers were conveyed, and merchandise of all kinds carried, was a short line between the two towns of Stockton and Darlington, built by Stevenson's advice in 1825. It was not till five years later that the success of the Stockton and Darlington Railway led to the construction of a second and greater venture of the same kind. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway opened in 1830. This line achieved an unhappy notoriety owing to the fact that Huskisson, the Tory free trade minister, was killed by the first train that ran upon it. Though the early railways were slow and inconvenient, their average pace was eight miles an hour, and their carriages were converted stage coaches strapped onto trucks. They soon conquered the public confidence, though old-fashioned persons refused for many years to trust themselves to the new-fangled and dangerous mode of locomotion. Between 1830 and 1840, the companies began to multiply rapidly, and in 1844-45 to 45, there was a perfect mania for railway construction, and schemes were formed to run lines through every corner of England, whether they were likely to pay or not. Many of these plans were never carried out. Others were executed and ruined those who invested in them. But the temporary depression which followed this over-speculation had no long continuance, and the competition of the companies with each other was always increasing the rapidity and comfort of railway traveling. By 1852 it had taken its place among the common places of life and had profoundly modified the condition of England in several ways. The habit of traveling for pleasure, which it begot and fostered, the safe, cheap, and quick transportation of goods, which it rendered possible, and the easy transfer of labor from market to market, which it favored, have all had their share in the making of modern England. The Penny Post and the Telegraph a part only second to that of the railway in modifying the character and habits of the English people was played by two other inventions of the forties. The penny post, introduced by the efforts of Rowland Hill in 1840 into every corner of the kingdom, and superseding the old rates, which ranged up to many shillings, had a marvelous effect in facilitating communication. To supplement it by a yet more rapid process, the first public telegraph offices were opened in 1843. But for many years after, this invention was in the hands of private companies, and was too dear to suit the pocket of the ordinary citizen, who preferred to trust to his letter sent by the penny post. The Factory Acts Meanwhile, many other characteristic features of modern English social life were rapidly developing themselves. We have mentioned the misery of the operative classes in the great towns in an earlier chapter. The first efforts to amend their condition date from the years 1832 to 52. Philanthropists, of whom Lord Shaftesbury was the best known, strove unceasingly to put an end to the worst horrors of the new industrial system. In 1833, acts were passed to prevent mill owners from working children in their factories for more than half time. In 1844, Sir Robert Peel put women under the same protection— prohibited lads under eighteen from being given more than twelve hours labor and appointed inspectors to go round the factories and see that the law was carried out 
The Mines Act of 1842 prohibited women and children from working underground, and a second Mines Act of 1850 put all subterranean labor under government inspection. This benevolent legislation was mainly due to the Tories, for the liberals, wedded to the principles of strict political economy, were loath to interfere between employer and workmen, and generally urged that matters ought to be allowed to right themselves by the laws of supply and demand. Trades Unions a not less effective means of protection for the operative classes was devised by the workmen themselves. Trades unions became possible after the laws prohibiting combination of laborers had been repealed in 1824, though governments, both Whig and Tory, still looked upon them with much suspicion and disapproval and occasionally suppressed them under the plea that they were secret societies for coercing free labor. Strikes, then as now, were often accompanied with violence and rioting, and it had not yet been realized that they might often be justified. But in spite of the frowns of those in authority, the unions were continually growing in number and in power all through the middle of the century though they had not yet assumed the inquisitorial and dictatorial tone which they have adopted in our own day, and were still defensive rather than offensive in their character. THE STATE OF THE CHURCH While social England was thus assuming its modern shape, the chief factors of the spiritual and intellectual life of the present day were also coming into being. To the period 1832 to 52 belongs the rise of both of the movements which have stirred the minds of men during the last fifty years. In the early years of the century, the condition of the Church of England was very unsatisfactory. The only body within its pale who displayed any zeal or true spiritual life were the evangelicals, the heirs of the men who had been stirred by the preaching of the contemporaries of Wesley. But they were not a very numerous body, for their general acceptance of the harshest doctrines of Calvinism repelled the majority. Moreover, they were destitute of organization, for they worked to increase the religious fervor of the individual soul, not to reform the church. Yet the church needed reforming. Its higher ranks were still filled by Greek play bishops and promoted royal chaplains. The bulk of the parish clergy, though genial, honest men, were neither learned, zealous, nor spiritual-minded, differing often only by the color of their coats from the squires with whom they associated. The worst part of the situation was that the new masses of the population in the great towns were slipping out of religious habits altogether, owing to the want of missionary zeal among their pastors, and the deplorable dearth of religious endowment in the new centers of life. The Broad Church Movement the reaction against the deadness of the national church took shape in two new forms. The first was the broad church movement, started by men who wished to broaden and popularize the church by bringing its teaching into accordance with the latest discoveries in science and in history, and by giving it a basis on philosophy rather than on dogma. The first great name in this school was Archbishop Watley, 1787-1863. to He and his contemporaries laid more stress on logic and philosophy than did the younger generation of broad churchmen, who devoted themselves more to reconciling science and religion, and to bringing to bear on the history of Christianity new historical and scientific lights. They only agreed in setting dogma aside, advocating the widest freedom of opinion, and preaching the application of the spirit of Christianity to the everyday acts and duties of life. 
THE TRACTARIAN MOVEMENT Very different were the views and aims of the other party in the Church, which arose in the years between 1830 and 1840. The new High Church school thought that the deadness of spiritual life in their day came from a neglect of dogma and a want of appreciation of the unity and historical continuity of the Church of England. Most men then held that the National Church only dated from the Reformation, and that the Bible was the only basis of its doctrines. Against these views, the leaders of the new school, the Oxford Movement as it was called, because its three leaders, John Henry Newman, John Kebbell, and Edward Pusey, were all resident fellows of Oxford colleges, entered an emphatic protest. They said that the Church of 1835 was the Church of Anselm and Augustine, and that those who wished to make it the Church of Henry VIII, and to cut it off from its place in the unity of Christendom, were guilty of national apostasy. They taught that it was still bound to hold all the dogmas and usages which could be traced back to the days of the early fathers. Most especially, they laid stress on two doctrines of which little had been heard since the days of the Stuarts, the real presence in the sacrament and the sacrificial priesthood of the clergy. Newman started a series of Tracts for the Times, to which his friends and followers contributed. They urged that submission to authority in matters doctrinal and a return to the ritual and practice of the early church could alone revivify English spiritual life. Unfortunately, it was impossible to find any universally received authority to which to appeal, since low churchmen and broad churchmen alike denied the first postulates of the Tractarian Creed and fell back on the Thirty-Nine Articles and the practice of the last two centuries as the only standard of faith and ceremony that they would recognize. They added that those who yearned after medieval doctrine and ritual were mere disguised Romanists and would find what they wanted in popery alone. Newman's Secession A storm of wrath was directed against the new high churchmen, who were denounced as Jesuits and false brethren. Most of all was the outcry loud when Newman in 1841 wrote a pamphlet to prove that by certain ingenious interpretations of loosely worded portions of the Thirty-Nine Articles a man might hold all the leading doctrines of Rome and yet stay inside the English Church. This curious production was a tour de force which, as he afterwards confessed, did not satisfy his own conscience. He retired from teaching for a while, and then seceded to the Romanist communion, where alone he felt that he could realize his desire to belong to a church undoubtedly orthodox and enjoying a right to speak with authority, 1845. Many of his more zealous adherents followed him at intervals in the next ten years. THE HIGH CHURCH PARTY But the bulk of the Tractarians felt sure that the Church of England was a true branch of the Catholic Church and remained within it, gradually conquering the tolerance of their contemporaries by their undoubted zeal and purity of motive. Ere long they acquired a strong position, as their doctrines were very acceptable to the clergy, while the admirable life and work of men like Kebble gradually won over many of the laity to their views. To the new high church party we owe much good work in neglected parishes, and a restoration of decency and order in public worship which was a great improvement on the careless and slovenly practice of the 18th century. Their efforts led to a revival of interest in church history and ecclesiastical antiquities. Their influence made the clergy as a body more spiritual and more hard-working. 
but for a time the Tractarian controversy split England into two hostile camps, and the eccentric medievalism of the ritualists, those of the party who strove to restore the forgotten minutiae of pre-Reformation ceremonies, drove low and broad churchmen into extreme wrath. Even yet the breach is not healed, and the church is divided, though the old bitterness has been forgotten to a great extent in the last ten years. But the net result of the movement has been to substitute zeal, if sometimes the zeal was without discretion, for deadness, and the church of today is far stronger and more powerful than the church of 1830. THE NONCONFORMIST The most unhappy result of the movement has been to drive the nonconformists, to whom high church doctrine was particularly repulsive, into a deeper antagonism to the church than they ever felt before. Hence, dissent has become political, putting the disestablishment of the Church of England before it as one of the ends of its work, side by side with its spiritual aims. The Ecclesiastical Titles Bill The fear that the Tractarian movement would lead to widespread conversions to Romanism turned out to be unjustified. Though a considerable number followed Newman in the forties, the stream soon slackened. Yet, for some years, the nation was nervously anxious about papal aggression, and in 1850, when the Pope issued a bull which appointed a hierarchy of bishops and archbishops to preside over English seas, the government of Lord John Russell passed an ecclesiastical titles bill, imposing penalties on all who acknowledged the validity of the bull. But the excitement died down, and nothing was done to enforce the act. End of section 93section 94 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros a history of england by charles oman chapter 41 the days of palmerston part 2 state of the political parties Meanwhile, if the social and intellectual history of England was interesting, its purely political history was for some years both dull and perplexing. On the fall of the Russell cabinet in the spring of 1852, owing to the quarrel between the Prime Minister and his masterful Foreign Secretary Palmerston, English politics were left in a confused and unsatisfactory condition, for there was no party strong enough to command a majority in the country. The Tories were still split into two sections. Sir Robert Peel was dead, killed by a fall from his horse in St. James Park on July 2, 1850. But his followers still clung together under Lord Aberdeen and Mr. Gladstone, and refused to hold any communication with that larger half of the Conservative Party, which, since Lord George Bentick's death, was led by Disraeli and Lord Derby. The question of protection still lay between them, but a far more real bar to union was their personal dislike for each other, dating back to the hard words used in 1846 over the Corn Laws, now that the Liberal Party had been for a moment broken up by the quarrel of Russell and Palmerston, there were four factions in the House, each of which was largely outnumbered by the junction of the other three. Lord Derby's Ministry It was difficult to see who should be Lord John Russell's successor. But after some doubting, the Queen sent for Lord Derby, one of the chiefs of the protectionist Tories, and asked him to form a cabinet. He complied, knowing that he could not hold office for long, 
unless a general election should change the balance of parties in Parliament. Hence followed the short conservative ministry of March to December 1852, whose tenure of office was marked by only two events of importance, the death of the Duke of Wellington on September 14th, which removed the last great figure that reminded men of the days of the old wars of George the Third, and the proclamation of Louis Napoleon as Emperor of the French on December 1st. The policy of the Derby Disraeli ministry was only notable as showing that even the Tory section of the Conservative Party had learned something from the events of the last six years. They did not make any open attempt to reintroduce protection, and Disraeli's budget as Chancellor of the Exchequer was only remarkable for an effort to substitute direct for indirect taxation, in opposition to the strict rules of political economy. The general election, which presented the only chance of salvation for this weak Tory cabinet, disappointed them deeply. They gained a few seats, but not nearly enough to enable them to secure a majority in the new House of Commons, and had to resign shortly after meeting Parliament. The Peelites and the Whigs To secure any permanent cabinet, a coalition was obviously necessary, and on Lord Derby's resignation the natural result followed. The Peelite Conservatives consented to join the Whigs, and thereby a party with a clear majority was formed. There was nothing strange or at all unworthy in this coalition. The more advanced Conservatives were not separated by any great gulf from men like Palmerston and those other Whigs who thought that reform and change had now gone far enough and that the Constitution needed no further alteration. Both alike believed in free trade. Both were zealous for the safeguarding of English interests abroad. Both were opposed to the radical reforms which the more advanced wing of the Liberal Party were advocating. The Peelites and the moderate Whigs were indeed more at home with each other than with the more extreme men of their own parties. Ere long they coalesced, and, as is always the case, the larger body absorbed the smaller, so that Aberdeen, Gladstone, and their followers became ranked as liberals. Lord Aberdeen's Ministry In the new ministry, Lord Aberdeen was chosen as Prime Minister. Gladstone, the great financier of the Peelite Party, was made Chancellor of the Exchequer. Russell and Palmerston patched up their old quarrel for a space and took office as home and foreign secretaries. The other posts were equally divided between the two sections of the coalition. This cabinet, created by a compromise and not viewed with any great enthusiasm by the nation, was destined to chance upon the gravest foreign complication that England had known for forty years. Louis Napoleon, Designs of the Tsar Nicholas The disturbing elements in Europe at this moment were two in number. The first was the new emperor of the French, who felt his throne unsteady, and thought that it could be best made firm by a war. For, as a Bonaparte, he felt that great deeds of arms were expected from him. He was at first undecided in his choice of a foe, but events in the east of Europe soon settled his resolve. Tsar Nicholas of Russia had long been eyeing the decrepit Turkish Empire with greed. He was not satisfied with his gains in the War of 1828, and thought that his vast army could overrun Turkey with ease, if he could be sure that no other European power would interfere. He knew that an attack on Turkey might be resented by England, France, and Austria, but he was prepared to buy them off with a share in the spoil. His point of view was well expressed in the phrases which he used to an English ambassador in 1853. 
We have on our hands a sick man, a very sick man. It would be a great misfortune if, one of these days, he should slip away from us before the necessary arrangements have been made. Adding that Turkey must break up ere long, he offered England as her share in the spoil, Crete and Egypt. Of course the offer was refused, and the indications of the Tsar's state of mind on the subject were viewed with some dismay. The Greek and Latin churches, Russia, prepares for war. The nominal casus belli in the East was a trivial quarrel between Greek and Latin monks in Palestine. There were some disputed rites in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem and the Church of the Nativity at Bethlehem, to which both Roman Catholics and Greek churchmen have access. All the bloodshed came from a key and a star, as was said at the time the former being the key of the Holy Sepulchre, of which the Greek and Latin patriarchs both claimed the custody, the latter a large emblem that hung over the altar at Bethlehem. When Russia used her power in favor of the Greeks, Louis Napoleon, eager to assert the influence of France in the East, replied by supporting the Latins. Both threatened the unfortunate sultan with their displeasure, and when he decided in favor of the Romanists, the Tsar proceeded to strong measures of coercion. He demanded that the sultan should recognize him as the legal protector and guardian of all the Greek Christians within the Turkish Empire, a preposterous request for to grant it would have been equivalent to giving Russia control over the whole of European Turkey. Prince Menchikov, a stern and blustering old general, was sent to Constantinople to bring pressure to bear on the sultan, and soon after Tsar Nicholas sent his armies over the Pruth and occupied Moldavia and Wallachia, two vassal states of Turkey, July, 1853. Palmerston and Sir Stratford Canning Now England had no interest in the foolish quarrel about the key and the star, but she was deeply concerned at the occupation of Turkish territory by Russian troops, which foreboded a dash at Constantinople, and an attempt to make an end of the Sultan's rule in Europe. The Aberdeen cabinet had no intention to go to war with Russia, but they could not suffer the Tsar's aggression to pass unnoticed, and sent off Sir Stratford Canning, an able diplomatist, who knew the East better than any other living Englishman, to counteract the doings of Prince Menchikov on the Bosphorus. Stratford Canning was an old enemy of Russia, and much trusted by the Sultan, who put himself under his advice, and rejected all the demands of Russia. France, at the same time, bade the sultan stand his ground, for the emperor was set on gaining prestige by checking Russia, and quite ready to make war, if the Tsar would not yield. Palmerston strongly advised Stratford Canning to act vigorously on the same lines as the French ambassador at Constantinople and thus England was gradually drawn into a hostile attitude towards Russia, before Lord Aberdeen and the rest of the ministry had realized the drift of the action of their energetic colleague at the Foreign Office. Russia declares war on Turkey. The Tsar was obstinate and determined not to yield an inch to the threats of Palmerston or Louis Napoleon. He thought England would not fight, and he despised the brand-new emperor at Paris. On November 1, 1853, he declared war on Turkey, and a few days later his troops crossed the Danube while his fleet destroyed a Turkish squadron at Sinope and got complete control of the Black Sea. England and France join the Turks. This violent action put the Aberdeen cabinet in great perturbation of spirit. They did not want to declare war on Russia. 
yet they had gone so far in opposing the Tsar that they could not retire from their position without deep humiliation. Even yet they might have drawn back, if Lord Palmerston had not threatened to resign unless strong measures were taken. Yielding to him, the ministers consented to join the French emperor in sending an ultimatum to St. Petersburg, menacing war unless the Russian troops were withdrawn from Turkish soil. Nicholas I proved recalcitrant and only ordered his armies to press the sieges of the fortresses of Bulgaria, which they were beleaguering. Accordingly, England and France declared war on him on March 27, 1854. Want of Military Preparations in England Thus England had been drawn into a dangerous struggle with the most powerful monarch in Europe before her ministers well realized what they were doing. She was utterly unprepared for war. The army was weak in numbers and had been woefully neglected for the last forty years. It had seen no fighting with a European foe since Waterloo and had quite lost the habit of taking the field. Accustomed to barrack life in England, the men found themselves entirely at a loss when landed on the shores of the Black Sea, and showed little power to shift for themselves. A great proportion of the officers were ignorant of all their duties, save that of facing the enemy with the old English courage. The commissariat service and the other branches of supply proved hopelessly incompetent to keep the army well fed or well clothed. To add to the other misfortunes of England, the leaders of the army were unwisely chosen. The command was given to Lord Raglan, an amiable but worn-out veteran of sixty-six, who had served as Wellington's aide-de-camp in Spain. Many of the divisional commanders owed their place to influence or interest rather than to proved competence in war. Sir Colin Campbell, who had won a great reputation in India, was one of the few among them who thoroughly deserved his place. Sebastopol to be attacked with some difficulty, an expeditionary force of twenty eight thousand men was collected and sent to the east. They landed at Varna on the Black Sea and joined a French army of about the same strength. But it was found that they were not needed on the Danube. The Turks had already thrust the Russians out of Bulgaria, and the Tsar's forces were in retreat towards the Pruth. It thus became necessary to settle on some plan of offensive operations against Russia, which the English and French governments had not hitherto contemplated. Russia is only open to attack from the water on two points, the Baltic and the Black Sea, and the Allies were almost committed to making their main attack on the latter field, as they had already sent their armies in that direction. It was resolved, therefore, to dispatch a powerful fleet to the Baltic to threaten St. Petersburg, but to confine serious operations to the Black Sea. There, the easiest point of attack was the great naval fortress of Sebastopol in the Crimea, the stronghold and arsenal of the Russian fleet. Its destruction would inflict a great blow on the Tsar, and its capture seemed easy, owing to its remoteness from the centers of Russian strength. Accordingly, the Allied armies, somewhat more than 50,000 strong, sailed from Varna on September 7, 1854, and landed on the western shore of the Crimea, 30 miles north of Sebastopol, a few days later. The expedition was very late in starting, it should have sailed in July, and would then have found the Russians unprepared. As it was, Prince Menchikov, now commanding in the Crimea, had got wind of the intention of the Allies, and hastily taken measures to strengthen his position. Battle of the Alma Advancing very slowly towards Sebastopol, the English and French armies found Menchikov with 40,000 men drawn up behind the river Alma, 
in a lofty position strengthened with entrenchments. The Allied generals won the battle that ensued, but their victory was not the reward of their own good generalship. Raglan and the French general Saint-Arnaud did not get on well together, and the latter showed from the first a tendency to throw the heavier work of the campaign on the English. Half of the French army executed a long flank march by the seashore, and never fired a shot in the action. The remaining half allowed themselves to be checked for some time by the Russian left wing, a force of very inferior strength. Meanwhile, the English advanced against the hostile center and right. Their front line outran its supports, crossed the river with a rush, and captured the chief redoubt on the opposite bank. But assailed by the main body of the enemy, it was compelled to fall back, and the heights had to be stormed for a second time by the belated English reserves, which came up at last and swept all before them. Thus the fight was won without any cooperation from the two commanders-in-chief, for Saint-Arnaud was too ill to follow the fortunes of the day, while Lord Raglan had blindly ridden forward, lost touch with his men, and blundered by mistake into the rear of the Russian position, where he might easily have been taken prisoner, September twentieth, 1854. As the French, who had done hardly any fighting, refused to pursue, while the English were worn out, the Russian army got away without being completely destroyed, though the deadly musketry of the English infantry had fearfully thinned its ranks. The Allies followed at a very slow pace. If they had hurried on, they might have captured Sebastopol at once, but Saint-Arnaud was dying and Lord Raglan could not goad the French into action. Even when they approached the fortress, an extraordinary caution and lack of enterprise was displayed. Menchikov had retired into the interior with his army, and left the town to an improvised garrison of sailors and militia, so that it could probably have been stormed offhand. THE SIEGE OF SEBASTOPOL but the Allies sat down before the place to besiege it in full form, and allowed the great engineer Tottleben to cover its weak defenses with a screen of improvised earthworks which daily grew more formidable. Menchikov came back with his army when he saw that Sebastopol could resist, and as Russian reinforcements kept pouring in, the defenders soon outnumbered the beleaguering force. The position of the English and French grew daily more unsatisfactory. They were only blockading the southern half of the town, for they were not numerous enough to encircle the two sides of Sebastopol Harbor. They had chosen to occupy the bleak peninsula of the Chersonnais, where neither food nor fodder could be got, and had no power to make raids into the interior for supplies. The English had to bring their stores up from the small harbor of Balaclava, six miles from the trenches, and much exposed to the danger of an attack from the east. Balaclava, the Charge of the Six Hundred Finding that the bombardment by land and sea was doing no harm, and seeing that they were gradually beginning to outnumber the besiegers, the Russians resolved to make an attack against the English communications. The Battle of Balaclava resulted from an attempt made by a large hostile force to seize Balaclava, which was only protected by two weak brigades of English cavalry, 1,500 sabers in all, a single regiment of Highland infantry, and 3,000 Turks, General Leprandi, with 20,000 men, came down towards the harbor, drove the Turkish auxiliaries from some weak redoubts, and pushed onward. His advance was stopped by the gallant charge of General Scarlet's Brigade of Dragoons, led by the Scots Greys and Innes Killens, who rode down a force of three times their own numbers, and gave the English commander time to hurry up reinforcements from his siege lines. 
the Russians, staggered by the desperate attack of the heavy brigade, halted and began to draw back. Then occurred a dismal blunder. Lord Raglan sent orders for the remainder of the English cavalry, the light brigade, to advance and prevent the enemy from carrying off the guns, meaning the guns in the redoubts which the Turks had lost in the morning. Lord Lucan, the chief of the English cavalry, stupidly or willfully misunderstood the order and sent the light brigade to charge a battery in position which formed the center of the Russian host. Accordingly, the five weak regiments of light cavalry, only 670 sabers in all, which formed Lord Cardigan's brigade, deliberately and without supports attacked a whole army. They rode for a mile and a half through a tempest of shells and bullets, captured the Russian battery, routed the troops in support of it, and then, for want of help from the rear, were forced to retreat by the same way they had come, through a second hail of fire. Out of the famous six hundred, a hundred and thirteen had been killed and a hundred and thirty-four wounded. The charge was absolutely useless, for Lord Raglan did not proceed to follow it up by an infantry attack, though the Russians had been greatly cowed by the frantic courage of the Light Brigade, and would certainly have made off if they had been threatened with more fighting. So the battle ended unsatisfactorily for both parties, for though Balaklava was saved, yet the Russians remained in a position which constantly threatened it with a new attack. October 25th Battle of Inkerman Prince Menchikov was far from being discouraged by the result of the fight, and when fresh reinforcements joined him, resolved to try another assault on the right flank of the English this time it was their siege lines which were to be attacked under cover of the night. Two great columns, mustering more than 40,000 men, secretly assembled opposite the extreme right of the English lines, one coming from Sebastopol, the other from the open country. A thick fog completely hid them from the English, and they were attacking the camp of the second division almost before their arrival was suspected. There followed the fight of Inkerman, the soldiers' battle, as it was called, for the men, surprised in their tents, turned out without orders and almost without guidance, and flung themselves recklessly on the advancing enemy. Arriving in scattered companies and wings, each regiment attacked the first foe it met, and for six hours a desperate fight went on all over Mount Inkerman. In the fog, no one knew where or with what numbers he was fighting, but the general result of the battle was all that could have been desired. Every time that the dark masses of the enemy surged up against the crest of the English position, they were dashed down the hillside by the desperate valor of the thin line of defenders. When, towards midday, some French reinforcements came up, the Russians withdrew, leaving the ground covered with their dead. It was only when the fight was over that the victors realized that 8,000 English, aided late in the day by 6,000 French, had defeated an army of more than 40,000 men, and slain or wounded more than 10,000 of them. The heavy English loss of 2,300 men was not too great a price to pay for the self-confidence and feeling of superiority over their enemies, which the victory of Inkerman gave to the conquerors. November 5, 1854 Sufferings of the Troops Sebastopol might perhaps have fallen if vigorously attacked the day after Inkerman but the English and French commanders did not call on their weary troops for another effort, and the siege dragged on into the winter with the most disastrous results. The army had only been equipped for a short campaign, and no account had been made of the bitter cold of the Crimea. All the commissariat horses and mules died, 
and the supplies had to be brought up from Balaclava for six miles on the backs of the wearied soldiery. Food ran short. The flimsy tents gave no shelter against the storms and snow, and the men were stricken down in hundreds by cold and disease. An unlucky storm sank the ships, which were bringing warm clothing, and in January 1855 Lord Raglan had to report to London that the army comprised 11,000 men under arms and 13,000 in hospital. The French suffered hardly less, but the Emperor continued sending out reinforcements, which kept up their numbers, while the English army had no reserves and could not be quickly recruited. Resignation of Lord Aberdeen When the miserable state of the army in the Crimea became known in England, owing mainly to the reports of newspaper correspondents, a howl of wrath was raised against the men who were responsible for the want and starvation which our troops were enduring. Part of the misery, it is true, was due merely to the inexperience of the English in war, but much more was owing to the inconsiderate slackness and folly of the home authorities, who were responsible for feeding and clothing the army. Almost incredible tales are told of the combination of parsimony and extravagance, red tape and ignorance, which ruined our army. The nation called for scapegoats, and, in deference to its clamor, the Prime Minister, Lord Aberdeen, and the War Minister, the Duke of Newcastle, resigned their offices. They were only guilty of being unable to control their inefficient and ignorant subordinates. End of Section 94 Section 95 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 41. The Days of Palmerston. Part 3. Lord Palmerston, Premier. When Lord Aberdeen retired, he was succeeded by the brisk and vigorous Palmerston, the soul of the war party, who managed to infuse a share of his own energy into the struggle. Supplies and recruits were poured into the Crimea. A railway was built from Balaclava to the front, and the hospitals, where the sick and wounded were dying by thousands, were reformed, and entrusted with success to Florence Nightingale and her volunteer nurses, who came out to supplement the inadequate staff that the government had provided. Victor Emmanuel joins the Allies. Soon the English had nearly 40,000 men in the Crimea, while the French Emperor had raised his troops to 100,000. Further aid was given to the Allies by Sardinia, whose king, Victor Emmanuel, following the old tradition of the House of Savoy, was eager to take part on the stronger side in a great war. His object was partly to gain the gratitude of France, partly to display the strength of his warlike little kingdom in the councils of Europe. Death of the Tsar Nicholas the Russians were now feeling the war bear hardly upon them. Their supplies and reinforcements had to be brought from vast distances, and there were as yet no railways or even good roads over the steppes of southern Russia. So toilsome was the winter march to the Crimea that a quarter of the troops sent thither are said to have fallen by the way. The Tsar Nicholas died on March 2nd, heartbroken by the utter failure of his armies. But his successor, Alexander II, was too proud to ask for peace on such terms as the Allies offered. Negotiations at Vienna for this purpose completely failed. 
the young Tsar was induced to persevere only by the obstinate courage with which the garrison of Sebastopol held out. Guided by the great engineer Tottleben, who had so strengthened the defenses of the place that nothing but a few outlying redoubts had yet fallen into the Allies' hands. Fall of Sebastopol on June 18, 1855, the Allies tried a general assault on the fortress, which failed with heavy loss. Soon after Lord Raglan died, worn out by responsibility and by the knowledge that he was much criticized at home, he was replaced by General Simpson. The French commander, Can Robert, was at the same time superseded by Marshal Pellissier, a rough soldier who did not err from over-caution like his predecessor. On September 8th, the new leaders ordered a general assault on the eastern front of Sebastopol, the French taking as their goal the Malakoff and the English the Redan, two forts which formed the keys of the line of defense. The English assault was beaten off, though the stormers actually got inside the Redan. They were too few to hold their ground. But Pellissier launched more than 20,000 men against the Malakoff and carried it by a bold rush. The loss of this all-important fort broke the Russians' line. In the following night, they set fire to Sebastopol and retired across the harbor, abandoning the town to the Allies. The Treaty of Paris After this disaster, the Tsar was forced to bow to circumstances and sued for peace. This the Emperor of the French was ready to grant on easy terms, for he was satisfied with the prestige that he had acquired by his victory, and did not wish to make Russia his enemy forever. England was desirous of going on with the war to make a thorough end of the aggressive and despotic empire of the Tsars. But when her ally refused to continue the struggle, she was forced to join in the general pacification, though Palmerston declared that Russia was only scotched and would be as powerful as ever in ten years, a true prophecy. By the Treaty of Paris, March 1856, the Tsar engaged to cede to Turkey a small strip of territory at the mouth of the Danube, to keep no war fleet in the Black Sea, and to leave Sebastopol dismantled. The Sultan undertook to grant new rights and liberties to his Christian subjects, a promise most inadequately fulfilled. The opportunity was taken at the same time to settle an old and long disputed question of maritime law. England and the other powers agreed for the future that privateering in time of war should be abolished, and that the neutral flag should cover all goods from seizure, except military stores and other munitions of war. The peace of Paris settled nothing. The late war had disabled Russia for ten or fifteen years, and the Eastern Question did not begin to grow dangerous again till after 1870. But Turkey was no stronger for all the support that she had received. The Sultan's government was hopelessly effete, and when next Russia began to move, the doom of the Turkish power in Europe was near at hand. Supremacy of Palmerston but few men in England understood that the Eastern question had only been shelved for a few years, proud of the valor which the army had displayed, and fondly hoping that the weak points of our military system had now been discovered and remedied. The nation gave all its confidence to the minister, who had brought the war to what was considered a successful conclusion. Palmerston stayed in power for the remaining ten years of his life, save for one short interval in 1858 to 1859. 
He was, as we have already had occasion to remark, less fond of constitutional changes than any other man in the Whig party. He thought that little more remained to be done in matters of internal reform, and used his influence to check the more progressive members of his cabinet. As long as he held office, questions of domestic importance were entirely subordinated to matters of foreign policy. Palmerston was right in thinking that our external relations were likely to be difficult and dangerous during the next few years. The selfish and unscrupulous designs of Louis Napoleon were a disturbing element in Europe so long as the Second Empire lasted, and a watchful eye was always needed to look after England's interests. War with Persia Meanwhile, there were other complications further afield which required attention. The Crimean War was hardly over before England found herself involved in two little wars in the East. One of them was a direct consequence of the great struggle with the Tsar in 1854 to 1855. While it was still in progress, the Shah of Persia had behaved with scant courtesy to the British minister at his court thinking that England was too much engrossed in the strife in Europe to resent his conduct. Finally, he had invaded Afghanistan and taken Herat, though warned that such action meant war, for as Persia was now under Russian influence, this advance toward India could not be tolerated. In the autumn of 1856, Lord Palmerston thought that England was at leisure to chastise the Persians. An army from India was landed at Bushir. It beat the Shah's troops at the Battle of Kushab and occupied most of the ports of southern Persia. Thus brought to reason, Nasr al-Dun asked for peace and obtained it on evacuating Herat. March 1857. That he chose to sue for terms at this moment chanced to be most fortunate for England, for the army which returned from Persia was sorely needed in India to take part in subduing the great mutiny in that country, which we shall have to notice in another chapter. War with China the second little war in which the English were engaged in 1857 was with China. The mandarins of Canton had seized a small trading vessel, the Arrow, flying the British flag, and imprisoned the crew. Lord Palmerston never endured for a moment high-handed acts committed by a barbarous power. He declared war, sent an army and fleet against China, and seized first the forts which command Canton, and afterwards the more important Taku forts, which guard the way to Peking, up the Peho River. In the end, the British troops, aided by a French force, compelled the Emperor of China to pay an indemnity of four million pounds, and to open several ports to English commerce, 1860. The length of the Second Chinese War resulted from the distraction of the English arms to the great mutiny in India. If that struggle had not been raging, the forces of the effete Eastern power would have been crushed much sooner. Attempted Murder of Napoleon by Orsini Long before the end of this weary little war, the attention of the English government was called back to affairs in Europe. The disturbing element was Louis Napoleon, who was once more striving to win personal profit by fostering the old quarrels of other nations. He had half promised to do something to deliver the Italians from the bitter bondage to Austria, which they had endured since 1848. But he was weak and vacillating, and dallied so long that some Italian exiles headed by one Orsini 
tried in revenge to murder him by throwing a bomb into his carriage. The Conspiracy to Murder Bill Palmerston Resigns This attempted assassination led, strange as it may appear, to the temporary displacement of Palmerston from power. Orsini had formed his plot and made his bombs in London, and the French government hotly pressed for the seizure and extradition of his accomplices as would-be murderers. The Prime Minister, who wished to keep on good terms with the Emperor, replied by proposing to the English Parliament the Conspiracy to Murder Bill, which placed political assassination plots among the offenses punishable by penal servitude for life, whether the crime took place in or out of England. But unfortunately for Palmerston, the French press, and more especially the French army, were using at the time very threatening language, which was deeply resented on this side of the channel. Special offense was given by an address to the emperor by certain French colonels, which asked him to permit his army to destroy the infamous haunt in which machinations so infernal are hatched. The opposition charged Palmerston with cringing to the angry clamor of France, though the conspiracy bill in itself was a rational measure enough. The unfounded charge shook for a moment the confidence which the nation and the House of Commons felt in the old minister. His bill was thrown out, and he resigned. February 1858 Lord Derby in Office Disraeli's Reform Bill No liberal ministry could be formed without Palmerston's aid, so the Queen sent for the Conservatives. Lord Derby and Mr. Disraeli took office as they had done in 1852, though they had not a majority in Parliament to back them. As on the previous occasion, their ministry was merely a stopgap, doomed from the first to a speedy end. They clung to office till 1858 had passed by, and well into the following year. Disraeli, who was, as he said, trying hard to educate his party, strove to win popular favor by showing that the conservatives could be friends of domestic reform and progress as much as the liberals. He brought in a reform bill, extending the household franchise both in town and country, but giving extra votes to persons of education and property. This very rational measure was greeted with derision by the liberals, who called the new qualifications for voters, which Disraeli wished to introduce, fancy franchises, and insisted on keeping to the old idea which made householding alone the test of citizenship. The Volunteer Movement The Reform Bill dropped but the conservatives, in their short term of power, conferred one great boon on the nation by encouraging and organizing the volunteer movement. The angry language of the French army at the time of the Orsini plot had provoked both resentment and alarm in England. To guard against the peril of sudden invasion, it was felt that the small regular army and the militia were not numerous enough. Accordingly, men of all classes came forward and formed themselves into volunteer corps, like the old levies of 1803. They undertook to arm and train themselves at their own expense and to take the field for the defense of the realm whenever a peril of invasion should arise. The Derby government encouraged this patriotic scheme. 170,000 men were enrolled in the year 1859, and the volunteer force, though at first it was hampered by the red tape of the war office and somewhat derided by the regulars, has taken a fixed and valuable place in the national line of defense. End of section 95
Section 96 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 41. The Days of Palmerston. Part 4. Napoleon and the Italians. Fortunately, the French scare had soon blown over. Louis Napoleon was scheming against Austria, not against England. The great Sardinian statesman Cavour had induced him to pledge himself to deliver Italy from its oppressors, and after much vacillation the emperor declared war on Francis Joseph II and sent his armies over the Alps. He beat the Austrians at Magenta and Solferino, and the Italians vainly hoped that he would aid them to set up a kingdom of united Italy. But he suddenly stopped short after rescuing Lombardy alone, and made peace with the Austrian enemy. Lombardy was united to Sardinia, but the selfish and greedy emperor took Nice and Savoy from his own ally in return for his aid, and refused to free central or southern Italy. Abandoned by him, the Italians delivered themselves. Sudden insurrections drove out the foreign rulers of Tuscany, Parma, and Modena, and the hero Garibaldi expelled the Bourbons from Naples and Sicily. Thus a kingdom of Italy was created in spite of the French emperor, 1860 to 1861. But he sent troops to Rome to guard the Pope, and would not permit Cavour and Garibaldi to complete their work by adding the ancient capital to the dominions of Victor Emmanuel. Palmerston returns to power. Long ere the Italian war was over, Lord Derby's conservative government had been defeated and had retired from office. Palmerston's doings of 1858 had quickly been forgiven and forgotten by the nation and he returned to office, which he held till his death six years later, the American Civil War. It was well that his strong and practiced hand should be at the helm, for the years 1860 to 1865 were full of delicate problems of foreign policy, which more than once brought England within measurable distance of war, a most formidable difficulty cropped up when the great civil war across the Atlantic broke out in 1861. The southern states seceded from the Union and proclaimed themselves independent under the name of the Confederate States of America. Their avowed reason for separating themselves from the North was that the federal government, under northern control, was infringing the rights of the individual states to self-government. But old sectional jealousies, and especially the fear of the southern planters that the northerners would interfere with their great domestic institution, Negro slavery, were really at the bottom of the quarrel. Attitude of England, seizure of the Trent English opinion was much divided on the subject of the American Civil War. It was urged, on the one hand, that the North were fighting for the cause of liberty against slavery, and this idea affected many earnest-minded men, to the exclusion of any other consideration. On the other side, it was urged that the southern states were exercising an undoubted constitutional right in severing themselves from the Union, and this was true enough in itself. It was certain that the Southerners, who wished for free trade, were likely to be better friends of England than the protectionist North, which had always shown a bitter jealousy of English commerce. Many men were moved by the rather unworthy consideration that America was growing so strong and populous that she might one day become the bully of the world and welcomed a convulsion that threatened to split the Union into two hostile halves. Others illogically sympathized with the South merely because it was the weaker side, or because they thought the Southern planters better men than the hard and astute traders of the North. 
The Palmerston cabinet, with great wisdom, tried to steer a middle course and to avoid all interference. But when eleven powerful states joined in seceding, they thought themselves bound to recognize them as a belligerent power and to treat them as a nation. This gave bitter offense to the North, and war nearly followed for a United States cruiser in 1862 stopped the British steamer Trent and took from her by force two envoys whom the Confederates were sending to Europe. This flagrant violation of the law of nations roused Lord Palmerston to vigorous action. He began sending troops to Canada and demanded the restoration of the envoys Mason and Slidell under pain of war. President Lincoln and his advisers hesitated for a moment, but gave up their prisoners with a bad grace, just as war seemed inevitable. Naturally, this incident did not make the English people love the North any better. The Alabama Another cause of friction was destined to give trouble long after the Civil War had ended, the United States ambassador in London summoned the English government to prevent the sailing from Liverpool of a vessel called the Alabama, which, as he declared, had been bought by the Confederates and was destined to be used by them as a warship. The cabinet were somewhat slow in ordering the detention of the Alabama, which hurriedly put to sea and justified the fears of the American minister by seizing and burning many scores of northern vessels. This damage to commerce was charged to the account of England by the government of President Lincoln, and probably they had some ground for accusing the English officials of slackness. The grudge was carefully nursed in America and put to good use when the war was over. The Cotton Famine but the most painful form in which the American quarrel affected England was the dreadful cotton famine in Lancashire, which set in as the year 1862 wore on. The English mills had always subsisted on the cotton of the southern states, and when the strict blockade instituted by the northerners sealed up New Orleans, Charleston, and the other cotton ports, England suffered terribly for the want of raw material to keep her mills going. The mill hands bore the stoppage of their work and wages with great courage and resignation, but they lived for months on the verge of starvation. A disaster as great as the Irish potato famine of 1846 was only prevented by lavish private charity, which sent two million pounds to the distressed districts of Lancashire, supplemented by the wise measures of the government, who worked so well that hardly a life was lost in spite of the pinching poverty of the times. Cotton was at last brought from Egypt and India in quantities sufficient to set the mills going again, and by 1863 the worst of the trouble was over. In 1865, the southern states were conquered, and the American cotton once more came in. Palmerston and the Danish Duchies Wars nearer home were meanwhile beginning to distract the attention of the English from America. A quarrel between the King of Denmark and his German subjects in the duchies of Schleswig and Holstein led to the interference of Austria and Prussia. The inhabitants of the two duchies wished to cut themselves loose and to join Germany. Bismarck, the iron-handed prime minister of Prussia, saw his way to make profit for his country out of the war and induce the unwise Austrian government to join him in bringing force to bear against the Danes. The English looked upon the struggle as a mere case of bullying by the two German powers, and Palmerston used somewhat threatening language against them. But when he found that his usual ally, the Emperor of the French, was not prepared to help him, he drew back and allowed the Austrians and Prussians to overrun the duchies. Beaten in the field, the Danish king had to consent to their cession. 
Palmerston and the Polish insurrection. To protest, and then to make no attempt to back up words with deeds, is somewhat humiliating. But this course was forced on Palmerston, not only in the case of the Schleswig-Holstein War, but also in the case of Poland in the same year, 1863. Treating the unfortunate Poles with even more than its usual rigor, the Russian government forced them to a fierce but hopeless insurrection. Palmerston sent a note to the Tsar in favor of better treatment of Poland, but met with a rebuff, and was practically told to mind his own business. Not being ready to engage in a second Crimean War without Louis Napoleon's aid, he had to endure the affront. He was much censured for his useless interference, but it is hard to blame him either for his protest or for his refusal to follow it up by plunging England into a dangerous war. Prosperity at Home Rise of Gladstone While these foreign affairs were engrossing most of the nation's attention, domestic matters caused little stir. After the cotton famine ended, the country entered into a cycle of very considerable growth and prosperity. Gladstone, once a Peelite, but now one of the most advanced of the progressive wing of the Liberal Party, was now Chancellor of the Exchequer. Year after year he was able to announce a surplus and to grant the remission of old taxes. His measures were judicious, but the constant growth of the revenue from increased prosperity and the conclusion of a fortunate commercial treaty with France were the real causes of his being able to produce his favorable budgets and won him a financial reputation at a comparatively cheap expense of labor. But his name was rapidly growing greater, and it was beginning to be clear that he would be Palmerston's successor as a leader of the Liberal Party. The old premier did not view this prospect with much satisfaction. Whenever he gets my place, he observed, we shall have strange doings. Death of Palmerston The succession was not long delayed. Lord Palmerston died on October 18, 1865, and on the removal of his restraining hand, the Liberal Party began to show new and rapid signs of change. For the first time it was about, under the guidance of its new leader, to frankly accept the principles of democracy and to throw up its old alliance with the middle classes. Palmerston had been for so many years the leading figure in English politics that his death, at the ripe age of 81, seemed to end an epoch in domestic history. He was by far the most striking personage in the middle years of the century. Faults he had, somewhat overhasty in action, somewhat flippant in language on occasion, too self-confident and too prone to self-laudation. He was yet so resourceful and so full of courage and patriotism that he won and merited the confidence of the nation more than any minister since the younger Pitt. End of Section 96 Section 97 of A History of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Lawley-Jones A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 42 Democracy and Imperialism 1865-1885 Part 1 The death of Lord Palmerston forms a convenient point at which to draw the line between the earlier and the later history of the two great English political parties. Down to 1865, the Liberals and the Conservatives alike retained, in a great measure, the characteristics of their forefathers, the Whigs and Tories. The Liberal host was still largely officered from the old aristocratic Whig houses. Many of its members disliked and distrusted democracy, 
and thought that in all essential things the Constitution had reached a point at which it needed no further reform. As long as Palmerston lived, there was no chance that the more militant and progressive wing of the Liberals would draw the whole party into the paths of radicalism. In a similar way, the Conservative Party still kept somewhat of the old Tory intolerance and inflexibility, though for the last twenty years the younger of its two chiefs, Benjamin Disraeli, had been striving hard to guide it into new lines of thought. After 1865, the new liberalism and the new conservatism came into direct opposition, personified in the two men who were soon to take up the leadership of the two parties, Gladstone and Disraeli. Liberalism, when divested of its wiggery, was practically radicalism. Its younger exponents took up as their official program the ideas that had been afloat for the last forty years in the brains of the more extreme section of their party. Their main aim was the transference of political power from the middle classes to the masses by means of a wide extension of the franchise. The new voters were to be made worthy of the trust by compulsory national education, while to guard them against influences from without, the secret ballot, one of the old Chartist panaceas, was to be introduced. The party which proclaimed itself the friend of democracy was bound to promise tangible benefits to the working classes. But the Liberals were still divided on the question of the advisability of state interference in the private life of the citizen. The younger men were already dreaming of a paternal legislation for the amelioration by law of the conditions of life among the poorer classes, hoping to secure them cheap food, healthy dwellings, shorter hours of labour, and opportunities of recreation and culture by means of state aid and public money. But in the sixties, the Manchester School, as the adherents of laissez-faire and strict political economy were called, was still predominant and social legislation and extensive state interference were not yet enrolled among the official doctrines of the Liberal Party. Its war cry at election time was peace, retrenchment, and reform. The first cry was one that had not been so much heard in Palmerston's day, but on his death his successors showed themselves very cautious in dealing with all foreign powers. Moreover, they wished to win popularity by cheap government a thing incompatible with a spirited foreign policy. Their opponents accused them of allowing the army and navy to grow too weak, and of being compelled in consequence to assume a meek tone in dealing with the powers whom Palmerston had been wont to beard and threaten. Wrapped up in their schemes of domestic reform, they gave comparatively little attention to external affairs. The new conservatism, of which Disraeli was the exponent, was a creed of a very different kind. It was the aim of that statesman to lay the foundations of his party on a combination of social reform and national patriotism. Since his first appearance in Parliament, he had striven to persuade the people that the Conservatives were truer friends of the masses than the Liberals. The latter, he maintained, offered them barren political privileges, the former were ready to aid them by benevolent legislation to secure a practical amelioration of the conditions of their life. They would govern for the people, if not by the people. Even in the direction of enlarging the franchise, Disraeli was prepared to go far, though at first he shrank from granting so much as his rivals, and wished to give an extra voting power to education and wealth. But the feature of the new conservatism which was most attractive to the public was one of which Palmerston would have thoroughly approved. Disraeli had a great confidence in the imperial destiny of Great Britain and a firm belief that she ought to take a bold and decided part in the councils of Europe. With this end in view, he was anxious to keep our armed strength high and his expenditure on military and naval objects was one of the things most frequently thrown in his teeth by his opponents. The Liberals accused him of a tendency towards imperialism, meaning, apparently, to ascribe some discredit to him thereby. He himself never denied the charge, but made his boast of it, though in his mouth 
it had another shade of meaning. To the liberals, it meant presumption, a love of show and of sounding titles, a readiness to annex to the right and the left, a proneness to intervene in foreign quarrels, a policy of bluster, in short. But in the mouth of its exponents, imperialism meant a desire to knit more closely together Great Britain and her colonies, to treat the empire as a whole, and to govern it without any slavish subservience to the parochial politics of England, to make the British name respected by civilized and feared by barbarous neighbors. At the opening of the new period, therefore, the nation was about to be confronted by two rivals, one of whom offered it internal political reform, the other imperial greatness. But at first the issues were not clear. The two parties were still, to a certain extent, draped in the remnant of the old wardrobe of Whiggery and Toryism. Till these were torn away, the meaning of the new movement could not be distinctly seen. On Palmerston's death, the leadership of his cabinet fell to the aged Lord John, now Earl, Russell. His accession to power was followed by the bringing forward of the first of the reform bills which were to occupy the forefront of English politics for the next three years. It was proposed to reduce the qualification for the franchise to the possession of a £14 holding in the counties and a £7 house in the boroughs. Lord Derby and his Conservative followers opposed it, though Disraeli had long ago pointed out that a reform bill of some sort was inevitable. But the Tories were strengthened by seceders from the ministerial camp, followers of the old Palmerstonian policy, who hated the idea of unrestrained democracy. By their aid, the bill was thrown out and Lord John Russell immediately resigned, June 1866. For the third time, Lord Derby and Disraeli were charged with the thankless task of forming a ministry, though they had only a minority in the House of Commons to back them. On this occasion, they were destined to stay in office for more than two years, June 1866 to December 1868, a far longer period of power than they had enjoyed in 1852 and in 1858-9. Apparently Disraeli, into whose hands the age and failing health of Lord Derby were throwing more and more of the real guidance of the party, had resolved to imitate the action of William Pitt in 1784, to display to the nation his readiness to take in hand all rational and moderate measures of reform, and then to appeal to the country at a general election. Accordingly, in the spring of 1867, he introduced a series of resolutions, pledging his party to pass a reform bill, but announcing that he should stipulate for the fancy franchises on which the Conservatives had laid such stress during previous discussions of the question. Persons, one, owning £30 in the savings bank, or two, £50 invested in government funds, or three, paying £1 a year and over in direct taxes, or four, possessed of a superior education, were to have a second vote. In spite of these safeguards, the more unbending Conservatives refused to follow Disraeli, and their chiefs, Lord Carnarvon and Lord Cranbourne, the present Marquess of Salisbury, seceded from the Cabinet. The bill was introduced, but the Liberal majority cut it about by all manner of amendments and utterly refused to accept the fancy franchises. Forced to choose between dropping the bill altogether and resigning, or passing the bill shorn of all its safeguards against the introduction of pure democracy, Disraeli chose the latter alternative and took the leap in the dark, as it was said at the time. The bill so passed reduced the franchise in town to a rating of five pounds thus granting what was practically household suffrage, and added to the householders all lodgers paying £10 a year. In the counties, the franchise was lowered to £12. This still left the agricultural labourer without a vote, but made electors of well-nigh every other class in the kingdom. 
At the same time, 35 seats were taken away, partly from corrupt boroughs, partly from places which had too many members in proportion to their size, and were distributed among London and the great northern shires, which had been still left much underrepresented in the redistribution of 1832. August 15, 1867 While the Reform Bill was engrossing the attention of politicians, the United Kingdom had been passing through a dangerous crisis. Ireland, of which little had been heard since the Potato Famine and Smith O'Brien's Rebellion, was once more giving trouble. The end of the American Civil War in 1865 had thrown on the world large numbers of exiled Irish and Irish Americans who had learnt the trade of war and were anxious to let off their energies by an attack on England. It was they who organized the Fenian Brotherhood, a secret association for promoting rebellion in Ireland. They planned simultaneous risings all over the country, which were to be aided by thousands of trained soldiers from America. To distract the attention of the government, an invasion of Canada was projected, and a number of outrages planned in England itself. The Fenians failed, partly from want of organization, partly from shirking at the moment of danger, partly from secret traitors in their own ranks. The horde which invaded Canada ran away from a few hundred militia. The national rising in Ireland was a fiasco. A few police barracks were attacked, but the assailants fled when they heard of the approach of regular troops. February 1867 A harebrained scheme to surprise the store of arms in Chester Castle failed, because the 1,500 men who had secretly assembled in that quiet town saw that they were watched by special constables. In fact, the only notable achievements of the Fenians were two acts of murder. A band of desperadoes in Manchester stopped a police van and rescued two of their comrades who were in custody by killing one and wounding three of the four unarmed policemen who were in charge. A still more reckless party in London tried to release some friends confined in Clerkenwell Prison by exploding a powder barrel under its wall. This did not injure the prison, but killed or wounded more than a hundred peaceable dwellers in the neighbouring streets. December 1867 For these murders, several Fenians were executed. The abortive revolt of 1867 called English attention once more to Ireland. The Liberal Party insisted that the Fenian disturbance was due not so much to national grudges as to certain practical grievances, such as the existence of the Protestant Established Church of Ireland, supported on the tithes of the country, and the unsatisfactory condition of the peasantry, still tenants at will at rack rents and often in the hands of absentee landlords. The experience of the last twenty years has shown that Irish discontent is far more deeply seated than the Liberals supposed. But in 1868, they seriously thought that it could be pacified by legislation on these two points. Mr. Gladstone selected the church question as the first battleground, and carried against the ministry a resolution in the Commons demanding the abolition of the establishment. Disraeli, now Prime Minister in name as well as in fact, for Lord Derby had retired from ill health in February 1868, appealed to the country by dissolving Parliament. But the Conservatives suffered a decisive defeat at the polls and were forced to resign. December 1868 Abroad, the Derby-Disraeli ministry had witnessed one very stirring episode of European history, but had not intervened in it. In 1866, Count Bismarck guided Prussia into war with Austria, crushed the great empire at the Battle of Königgratz, annexed Hanover and Hesse, and united all the lands north of the Main under Prussian headship into the North German Confederation. The struggle did not directly affect England, and the Conservative Ministry made no attempt to interfere, and watched with equanimity Prussia supplant Austria as the chief power in Central Europe. The only warlike enterprise of the years 1866-8 to 8 
was the costly but almost bloodless Abyssinian expedition, Disraeli's first attempt to vindicate British prestige in remote corners of the earth. Theodore, king of Abyssinia, a savage despot, had imprisoned some British subjects. To deliver them, Sir Robert Napier led an Indian army to Magdala, the Abyssinian capital. He stormed the place and released the captives. Theodore blew out his brains when he saw his stronghold taken, and on his death the victors retired unmolested. End of section 97「Section 98 of the History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tatiana Chichilla. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 42. Democracy and Imperialism, 1865-1885. to 1885, Part 2. Mr. Gladstone came into office in December 1868 with a majority of 120 votes in the Commons, and at once proceeded to carry out his Irish policy. The position of the Irish Church was very open to attack, for a Protestant establishment in a country where 75% of the population were Romanists was too anomalous to be easily defended. This was felt by the Conservatives themselves, and, in spite of the protests of the Irish Protestants, a bill for disestablishing the Church passed both houses, June 1869. Its endowments were taken away at the same time, but the churches and buildings were retained by their old owners, and compensation was granted to all incumbents and curates. So far from being ruined by the blow, the Irish church has remained a vigorous and increasing body. Having dealt with the Irish church, Mr. Gladstone then turned to the second grievance, whose removal, as he then hoped, would do away with Ireland's grudge against England. By his Irish Land Act of 1870, he gave the tenants a right to be compensated for any improvements they might have made on their holdings when they resigned them or were evicted from them. He also permitted the outgoing tenant to sell his goodwill to his successor. To facilitate the creation of a peasant proprietary, the government undertook to lend money to any tenant who wished to buy his farm from his landlord if the latter was willing to sell it. But the land bill was far from contenting the Irish peasantry, who were seeking not merely a reasonable rent and a fair compensation for improvements, but complete possession of their holdings. Agrarian outrages, which had been widespread ever since the Fenian Rising of 1867, remained as numerous as ever. So far was Ireland from being quieted that the government had to pass a stringent peace preservation act and to send additional troops across the channel. The policy of conciliation had thus far proved a complete failure. Mr. Gladstone's tenure of office was signalized by a long series of domestic reforms, the most momentous of which was the Education Act, introduced in 1870 by Forster, the Vice President of the Council of Education, for providing sufficient school accommodation for the whole infant population of the country and making the attendance of all children at school compulsory. Another important measure was the introduction of the secret ballot at parliamentary elections, this act tended to diminish bribery by depriving the buyer of votes of the power of ascertaining whether the elector with whom he had trafficked had kept his word or no, but it was far from destroying it altogether, and actually enabled many corrupt voters to sell their promise to both sides. It was not till stringent penalties were imposed, both on the briber and the bribed, by laws passed ten years later, that English parliamentary elections attained their present high standard of purity. The leading event of this period in the sphere of foreign affairs was the great Franco-German War of 1870-71, to in which England preserved a strict neutrality. The French emperor had provoked the contest in the most wanton way, in the hope of making firm his tottering throne. His defeat and capture at Sedan, September 1, 1870, swept away a power which had, since its first creation in 1852, formed a public danger to Europe from its purely selfish and personal policy. When Bismarck substituted United Germany for Imperial France as the chief state of the continent, the world was the gainer. But the fall of Napoleon III affected English interests in the East in a less satisfactory fashion. The united power of France and Great Britain had hitherto compelled Russia to abide by the stipulations of the Treaty of Paris, but the moment that the fall of the emperor was known, the Tsar issued a declaration that he should no longer consider himself bound by its terms. He began to rebuild his Black Sea fleet, to re-fortify Sebastopol, and the English government could not resent the affront. About the same time, England was involved in an awkward dispute with the United States, who, ever since the American Civil War, had been clamoring for compensation for the ravages committed by the Alabama on northern shipping. 
Lord Darby's cabinet had staved off the question, but in 1870 the language of the Americans grew so threatening that the liberals had to choose between submission or the chance of a war. They took refuge in a middle course, preferring to refer the liability of England for the doings of the Alabama to a court of arbitration composed of foreign lawyers. But in the principles laid down on which the arbitrators were to give their decision, so much was conceded to the Americans that the result, if not the amount, of the award was a foregone conclusion. The referees met at Geneva and compelled England to pay three million pounds, which sufficed not only to pay all the claims made against the Alabama, but to leave a handsome surplus in the American Treasury, 1872. The knowledge that the people were growing alarmed and impatient at the military weakness of England, especially after the sudden collapse of France in 1870-71, to induced the government to bring in a scheme for improving the national defenses. Cardwell, the Minister of War, introduced in 1872 a bill to reorganize the army on the short-service system, which had been found to work so well in Germany. For the future, instead of enlisting for the long service of 20 years, the soldier was to engage for seven years with the colors and five in the reserve. The reserve was only to be called out in time of danger, but when war was at hand, it was to join the ranks. Thus the strength of the army could be raised by 60,000 trained and seasoned men on the outbreak of hostilities. It must be allowed that in peacetime the battalions are prone to be filled with very young men, all under seven years' service. But as the reserves, when they have been called out, have always appeared promptly and in full numbers, the change was undoubtedly wise and beneficial. An attempt made at the same time to localize all the regiments in particular districts once they were to draw all their recruits, has not been so successful, owing to the fact that some counties supply men in much greater proportion than others. One more military reform, the abolition of purchase, formed part of Cardwell's scheme. It put an end to the system by which retiring officers sold their commissions to their successors, a practice that had often kept poor men of merit for many years unpromoted. The measure was obviously right, but Mr. Gladstone provoked much criticism by putting it forth in a royal warrant, instead of passing it through the two houses in the usual form. After the rush of legislation in the period 1869-72, to the last years of the Gladstone ministry seemed tame and uneventful. In the spring of 1873, they were beaten on the comparatively small question of a bill to establish a secular university in Ireland. Next winter, Mr. Gladstone dissolved Parliament and, on appealing to the constituencies, suffered a crushing defeat. January 1874. End of section 98. Section 99 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 42. Democracy and Imperialism, 1865-1885, to 1885, Part 3. For the first time since 1846, Parliament was in the hands of a solid conservative majority in both houses, and Disraeli, seated firmly in power, was able to display the characteristics of the new Toryism. He announced that he took office to secure a space of rest from harassing legislation at home, and to defend the honor and interests of England abroad. His first two years of power, 1875-76, to 76, were among the quietest which the century has known. They were only marked by some excellent measures of social and economic reform, such as the Artisan's Dwelling Act, which permitted corporations to build model houses for workmen, and the Agricultural Holdings Act, which granted to farmers compensation for unexhausted improvements on their land when they gave up their farms to their landlord. But signs of coming trouble were soon apparent both at home and abroad. In the Commons, the Ministry was beginning to be harassed by the Irish members, who had latterly banded themselves together, under the leadership of Isaac Butt, to demand home rule. This trouble, however, was as yet but in its infancy. A more pressing cause of disquietude was arising in the East, on which England had always kept a watchful eye since the Crimean War. Two separate difficulties were beginning to arise in that quarter. The first was in Egypt, a land which had grown very important to England since the use of the overland route to India by Alexandria and the Red Sea had been discovered, and still more so, since de Lesseps had constructed the Suez Canal in 1868. The thriftless and ostentatious Khedive Ismail, by his extravagance and oppression at home and his unwise conquests in the Sudan, had reduced Egypt to a state of misery, and seemed not far from bankruptcy. To get ready money, he proposed to sell his holding, nearly one half, of the shares of the Suez Canal Company. Disraeli at once bought them by telegram for four million pounds. The investment was wise and profitable. The shares are now worth five times the sum expended, and their possession gives England the authority that is her due in the conduct of this great international venture. 
but a far more ominous storm cloud was rising in the Balkan Peninsula. England had been very jealous of the action of the Tsar in the East since the abrogation of the Treaty of Paris in 1870. She had been greatly stirred by the activity of the Russians in Central Asia, where, by overrunning Turkestan and reducing Kiva and Bukhara to vassalage, they had made a long step forward in the direction of India. But now a new trouble arose near her home, in the shape of sporadic insurrections which broke out all over European Turkey. The misgovernment of the port was enough to account for them, but it was suspected, and with good cause, that they were being deliberately fomented by Russian intriguers with the tacit approval of the imperial government. The rising began in Bosnia in 1875. In the summer of 1876, the princes of Serbia and Montenegro took arms to aid the Bosnians, and thousands of Russian volunteers flocked across the Danube to join the Serbian army. Next, while the Turks were sending all their disposable troops against the two princes, a rising broke out in Bulgaria. This insurrection was put down by bands of Circassians and armed Muslim villagers, with a ruthless cruelty, which had a most marked effect on English public opinion. Hitherto, the government had been showing some intention of resenting Russian interference in the Balkans. But the news of the Bulgarian atrocities so shocked the country that any such design had to be abandoned. Mr. Gladstone, who had given up the leadership of the opposition for the last two years, emerged from his retirement and made a series of speeches against the Turks which had a profound effect, and when, in 1877, the Tsar openly declared war on Turkey and sent his armies across the Danube, the English government stood aside in complete neutrality. The Turks held out with unexpected firmness, but in the early winter of 1877-78, their resistance broke down, and the Russians came pouring on towards Constantinople. The English government, though prevented from interfering in behalf of the Sultan by public opinion, had been watching the advance of the Russians with much anxiety. When the victorious armies of Alexander II approached the Bosphorus, Disraeli, who had now taken the title of Earl of Beaconsfield and retired to the upper house, began to take measures which seemed to forebode war. He asked for a grant of six million pounds for military purposes and ordered up the Mediterranean squadron into the Sea of Marmora, placing it within a few miles of Constantinople. If the Tsar's troops had struck at the Turkish capital, a collision must have occurred, and a general European war might have followed. But the Russian ranks were sorely thinned by the late winter campaign, and their generals shrank from provoking a new enemy. Instead of attacking Constantinople, they offered the Sultan terms, which he accepted, March 3, 1878. The Treaty of St. Stefano gave Russia a large tract in Asia around Kars and Batum, and advanced her frontier at the Danube mouth to its old position in the days before the Crimean War. Serbia, Romania, and Montenegro received large slices of Turkish territory, but the great feature of the treaty was the creation of a new principality of Bulgaria, reaching from the Danube to the Aegean, and cutting European Turkey in two. Persuaded that the Treaty of San Stefano made all the states of the Balkan Peninsula vassals and dependents of Russia, Lord Beaconsfield refused to acquiesce in the arrangement. He called out the army reserves, hurried off more ships to the Mediterranean, and began to bring over Indian troops to Malta by way of the Suez Canal. In view of his menacing attitude, the Tsar consented to a complete revision of the Treaty of San Stefano. At the Berlin Conference, June through July 1878, its terms were modified. The new Bulgaria was cut up into two states, and its frontier pushed back from the Aegean. The Sultan undertook to introduce reforms into his provinces, and England guaranteed the integrity of his remaining Asiatic dominions. In return for this, Abdul Hamid placed the island of Cyprus in British hands, though retaining his nominal suzerainty over it. Lord Beaconsfield returned triumphant from Berlin in July 1878, claiming that he had obtained peace with honor for England, and had added a valuable naval station to our possessions in the Mediterranean. But the advantages which he had secured were in some ways more apparent than real. He had checked and irritated Russia without setting up any sufficient barrier against her. He had pledged England to introduce reforms in Turkey, a promise which she was never able to induce the Sultan to perform. Cyprus turned out harborless and barren, a source of expense rather than profit. Later events show that the partition of Bulgaria was a mistake, and that the creation of a strong principality on both sides of the Balkans would have been the most effective bar to a Russian advance towards Constantinople. The scarcely averted war between England and the Tsar had a tiresome and costly sequel in the East, the Afghan War of 1878-80, to which we describe in Chapter 44, a struggle which was not without its disasters, and formed one of the chief reasons for the gradual loss of popularity by the Beaconsfield cabinet in the years that followed the Treaty of Berlin. A similar result was produced by the mismanaged Zulu War and the disaster at Isandula, 1879, while at home the ministry was kept in perpetual difficulties by the obstructive tactics of the Irish party, who are now headed by the astute and unscrupulous Charles Stuart Parnell. They wasted time and provoked perpetual scenes. In June 1880, Lord Beaconsfield dissolved Parliament, and a liberal majority of 100 was returned to the House of Commons from Great Britain, 
while in Ireland the home rulers swept almost every constituency except those of Ulster. End of section 99. Section 100 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 42. Democracy and Imperialism, 1865-1885. to 1885, Part 4. Mr. Gladstone now took office for the second time, pledged to pacify Ireland, and to carry out a policy of peace abroad and of reform and liberal measures at home. But the years 1880 to 84 were full of costly and unsatisfactory wars. Scarcely was the new cabinet installed when the Boers, the inhabitants of the recently annexed Transvaal, revolted. The small English force in South Africa suffered a crushing defeat at Majuba Hill, whereupon the government, ere reinforcements could arrive, made peace with the rebels, and granted them independence, 1880 to 81. Soon after the Transvaal War had reached its disastrous conclusion, fresh troubles broke out in Egypt. Since Lord Beaconsfield first interfered in that country by buying for England the Suez Canal shares of the Khedive Ismail, Egyptian affairs had been going from bad to worse. After driving the country to the verge of bankruptcy, the old Khedive abdicated in 1879 in favor of his son Tufik. But England and France joined to establish the dual control over the young sovereign and appointed ministers to take charge of the finances of Egypt. Tufik himself made little or no objection to this assertion of foreign domination, but some of his officers and ministers resented it, and in 1882, Arabi Pasha, an ambitious soldier, executed a coup d'etat, drove away the foreign ministers, and raised the cry of Egypt for the Egyptians. It was expected that the two powers who had established the dual control would unite to put down Arabi, but the French ministry, jealous of England, and hoping to draw its private profit out of the complication, refused to join in any action against him. It is probable that the Gladstone cabinet had no intention at first of provoking a war, but the English Mediterranean squadron was ordered to Alexandria, which Arabi was busily engaged in fortifying. On June 11th, a great riot broke out in that city, and the mob massacred many hundreds of European residents. This made hostilities inevitable. When the Egyptian authorities refused to dismantle their new forts, Admiral Seymour bombarded the place, July 11th, and drove out the garrison. Shortly after, English troops landed and seized the ruined city. The struggle which followed was brought to a prompt end by the quick and decisive action of Sir Garnet Wolseley, who seized the Suez Canal and marched across the desert on Cairo, while the Egyptians were expecting him on the side of Alexandria. By a daring night surprise, he carried the lines of Tel el-Kibir, September 13th, and routed Arabi's host. A day later, his cavalry seized Cairo by a wonderful march of 50 miles in 12 hours, and the rebellion was at an end. Arabi was exiled to Ceylon, and the Khedive was restored to his place in Cairo, but for all intents and purposes, the war left England supreme in Egypt, a very anomalous position, which Mr. Gladstone soon proceeded to make yet more so, by promising France and Turkey that the English troops should be withdrawn so soon as order and good government should be restored. He might, perchance, have carried out his engagement, but for the outbreak of the disastrous Sudan War of 1883. During Arabi's rebellion, troubles had broken out in the Egyptian provinces on the Upper Nile, where the Pashas had been subjecting the wild Arab tribes to cruel oppression. A fanatic named Muhammad Ahmed of Dongola put himself at the head of the rising, proclaiming that he was the Mahdi, the prophet whom Muslims expect to appear in the last days before the end of the world. When the English had put down Arabi, they found themselves forced to cope with the insurrection in the Sudan. Accordingly, General Hicks was dispatched with a raw native army to attack the Mahdi, but he and all his troops were cut to pieces, October 3rd, 1883. The government then resolved to send to the Sudan Charles Gordon, a brave and pious engineer officer, who had won much credit for his wise administration of the land in the days of the old Khedive Ismail. But he was given no troops to aid him, and was merely told to withdraw the Egyptian garrisons from the Upper Nile, as the cabinet did not wish to reconquer the lost provinces, and thought that the insurgents had been justified in their rebellion by the atrocious misgovernment of their Egyptian masters. Gordon reached Khartoum, the capital of the Sudan, but immediately on his arrival there, was beleaguered by the hordes of the Mahdi, February 1884. With two or three Europeans only to aid him, and no troops but the cowed and dispirited Egyptians, who had been driven to Khartoum from their other posts in the lost provinces, Gordon made a heroic defense. But, as he could not withdraw his garrison without help from outside, he besought the cabinet for English troops, pointing out that the Sudanese enemy were not patriots struggling to be free, 
but ferocious fanatics who massacred all who refused to acknowledge the Mahdi and believed themselves destined to conquer the whole world. The English ministry ultimately sent a small force under Lord Wolseley, the victor of Tel el-Kabir, with orders to rescue Gordon and his garrison and then to retire. But the expedition was dispatched too late. After forcing their way in small boats up the Nile and marching 180 miles across the waterless Bayuda Desert, the main column of the relieving army beat the Mahdi's hordes at the hard-fought fight of Abu Kli, January 22, 1885, and forced their way to within 100 miles of Khartoum. But there learnt that the place had been stormed, and Gordon, with the 11,000 men of his garrison, cut to pieces, four days after the Battle of Abu Kli, January 26, 1885. The English then retired and abandoned the whole Sudan to the Mahdi's wild followers, who soon threatened Egypt itself. Two successive expeditions were sent to Swakim, on the Red Sea, to endeavor to attack the Mahdists from that side. Both had to withdraw after advancing a few miles inland, foiled by the waterless desert and the incessant harassing of the rebels. Somewhat later, the fanatics twice endeavored to force their way up the Nile from the south, and were only cast back after heavy fighting at Wadi Halfa, on the very frontier of Egypt. The war in the Sudan dealt a heavy blow to the reputation of the Gladstone cabinet. In the meantime, it was beset by even greater difficulties arising out of the Irish question. In 1880, the government brought up a bill forbidding any landlord to evict a tenant without paying him compensation for disturbance. The bill was rejected by the House of Lords. In 1881, they brought forward and carried the second Irish land bill, appointing a commission or land court to fix all rents for 15 years. But the peasantry were far from being satisfied, and aimed at making an end of landlordism altogether. Their leaders had founded the celebrated Land League, which organized a system of terrorism all over the country. Outrage grew more and more rampant, and at last the government, abandoning the idea of pacification, seized and imprisoned Parnell and 40 other prominent chiefs of the Land League. In revenge for this, the No Rent Manifesto was published by the surviving leaders of the League, and largely acted upon in the south and west of the country. Chaos seemed to have set in, and matters were made no better by the release of Parnell and his friends under the so-called Kilmenham Treaty, in which the Premier consented to negotiate with his prisoners for a cessation of hostilities. Forster, the Irish Secretary, and Lord Spencer, the Viceroy, resigned to show their disapproval of the Cabinet's policy. To replace Forster, Lord Frederick Cavendish was made Secretary for Ireland, but six days after his appointment, he and his undersecretary, Mr. Burke, were murdered in broad day in Phoenix Park by some members of a Dublin secret society known as the Invincibles, June 1882. Universal horror was excited by his murder, but the country did not quiet down, and a stringent crimes bill passed on the same autumn did not suffice to stop the agrarian outrages which reigned throughout Ireland. All through the days of the Gladstone cabinet, the island remained in most deplorable condition, and the Irish Parliamentary Party continued to be a thorn in the side of the government. Unhappy both at home and abroad, and fearing the results of a general election, the Prime Minister reverted to the old liberal cry of parliamentary reform, and produced the Reform Bill of 1884, which conferred the franchise on the agricultural laborers, the last considerable class in the country who still lacked the vote. It was urged by the conservative opposition that redistribution, the adjustment of seats to population in due proportion, ought to accompany this change. The House of Lords threw out the Reform Bill on this plea. Mr. Gladstone then consented to combine redistribution with enfranchisement, and the bill was passed in its new shape. The small boroughs with less than 15,000 inhabitants, which had escaped the Bill of 1832, were deprived of their members, and the seats thus obtained were divided among the more populous districts and towns. In June 1885, a chance combination of conservatives and home rulers beat the government on the budget. Mr. Gladstone resigned, and the opposition took office. Though, like Lord Darby in 1852 and 1866, they had only a minority in the House. Beaconsfield had died in 1882, and the Conservatives were now led by Lord Salisbury, the Foreign Minister of the years 1878-80. to 80. When the session was over, Lord Salisbury dissolved Parliament, and a general election followed. The Liberals gained many of the new county seats, but the Conservatives did so well in the boroughs that the numbers of the two parties in the new Parliament were not far from equal. This put the balance of power into the hands of the home rulers, who could give the majority to the party with whom they choose to vote. The first use of their strength was to turn out the Conservative ministry, January 1886. Mr. Gladstone then took office, though he too had a majority in the Commons only so long as it pleased the Irish members to vote with him. But soon it appeared that he was prepared to secure their allegiance by promising them home rule. Several members of his cabinet thereupon resigned. In April, a bill for conceding practical legislative independence to Ireland was brought in. 
It was thrown out by the action of 97 English and Scotch liberals who voted against their party. The Gladstone cabinet at once resigned, a general election followed, and a large majority of Unionists was returned. End of section 100. Section 101 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 43. The Last Years of Queen Victoria, 1886-1901. to 1901. The South African War, 1899-1902. to 1902. Part 1. In August 1886, Lord Salisbury took office, with the most powerful majority at his back that any minister had enjoyed since the days of Lord Grey and the Reform Bill. He was supported by 316 conservatives and aided by 78 liberal unionists, while the Gladstonian liberals had shrunk to 191, so that the Parnellites, with their 85 votes, no longer had the balance of power in their hands. Some political prophets had expected that the return of a majority pledged to resist home rule to the death would render the situation in Ireland more hopeless than ever, and lead to a general outburst of riot and assassination. The reverse was the case. A distinct improvement was perceptible after the fall of the Gladstone ministry, and in 1887-8, to matters began to quiet down. The Parnellites indeed tried to embitter matters by a scheme called the Plan of Campaign, by which the peasantry were to refuse to pay more rent than they thought proper. But it failed, and a stringent coercion bill passed in July 1887 did much to repress disorder. A land bill which accompanied the Coercion Act was less successful. It pleased neither landlords nor tenants, and had no appreciable result, good or bad. But on the whole, Mr. Arthur Balfour, the new Secretary for Ireland, had a far more prosperous career than any of his predecessors. He was one of the very few politicians who gained, rather than lost, credit, while holding the unenviable post now assigned to him. In 1887, the Irish question began at last to recede into the background, and cease to monopolize public attention. In that year occurred the Queen's first jubilee, June 21st. The celebration of the 50th anniversary of her accession was taken as the opportunity for a great imperial pageant, in which representatives, drawn not only from the United Kingdom, but from India and all the colonies, did homage to their admirable sovereign. The display of respect and love for the Queen, reported from every corner of her dominions, showed that the crown, when placed on a worthy head, might not be the least of the links which bind the empire together. Foreign politics during the first Salisbury administration sometimes looked threatening, but never reached any dangerous crisis. There was occasional friction with France concerning the question of Egypt. Mr. Gladstone had unwisely promised to evacuate that country when peace was restored, and the French government repeatedly hinted that the time had arrived. Fortunately, the continued existence of the Mahdi's savage hordes on the Upper Nile, and their frequent attempts to penetrate downstream, supplied a sufficient reason for the continuation of the British protectorate and the retention of the British garrison. But with Germany, our relations were also sometimes very delicate. This was due to that wholesale annexation of unoccupied corners of the earth, which was the main feature of German colonial policy between 1885 and 1891. The regions, generally most uninviting in character, which Germany annexed, were in close proximity to old British settlements, both in Africa and Australasia, and lay in some cases in quarters where British influence had hitherto been paramount. Much friction ensued, and ultimately, as we shall see in our colonial chapter, complicated exchanges and delimitations of territory had to be carried out. This was the period in which we first discovered that Germany, no less than France, was for the future to be a rival in colonial expansion. Meanwhile, continental politics were suffering radical changes, which had to be carefully watched. With the death of the aged Emperor William of Germany in 1888, and the dismissal of Prince Bismarck from office in 1890, the old conditions of the balance of power in Europe were altered. The Tsar Alexander III was no friend to Germany, and the young Kaiser William II did not share his grandfather's regard for Russia. For the League of the Three Emperors, Russia, Germany, Austria, which had been the predominant fact in the 70s and early 80s, there were substituted a new system of alliances. Germany and Austria took Italy into partnership while Russia drew nearer to France, when it was seen that there was some stability in the Republic, a fact that was not certain until the ridiculous fiasco of the theatrical adventurer General Boulanger in 1888. By 1891, in the later days of the first Salisbury ministry, this new arrangement of the powers of Europe was definitely established. It had for Great Britain the advantage that the two leagues balanced each other, 
and that it was unlikely that both at once would take a hostile attitude towards us. The wisdom of that policy of neutrality and of abstention from interference in purely continental affairs, which had long been our practice, became under the circumstances more obvious than ever. The danger for the future lay in colonial questions, rather than in the internal politics of Europe. The domestic policy of the Salisbury cabinet followed the lines that Lord Beaconsfield had laid down in 1874-80, to the aim of the ministers being to show that the Conservative Party could be as fruitful in measures of practical reform as their predecessors. To this period belonged the local government bill of 1888, creating the county councils, which have worked so well ever since, the Free Education Act of 1891, and the great conversion of the national debt. By this latter measure, Mr. Goshen, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, reduced the 3% interest on the national debt to 2 and 3 quarters percent, paying off in ready money the few creditors of the nation who refused to accept the reduction. Thus, £1,400,000 a year was saved and the new stock, till the financial disturbance caused by the late South African War, was generally worth in the market more than the old three percents. The chief event in home politics during the later years of the Salisbury Ministry was the disappearance of Parnell, the dominating spirit of the Irish party for the last ten years. In 1889 he had triumphantly vindicated himself from a charge of having approved the Phoenix Park murders, and had obtained £5,000 damages from the Times newspaper for having circulated the charge, on the authority of a forger named Piggott. But less than a year later, he appeared as defendant, and not as plaintiff, in the law courts, in the unenviable capacity of co-respondent in a discreditable divorce case. The time has long gone by when a notorious evil liver can be accepted as the leader of a great party. Mr. Gladstone announced to the Irish members that they must depose their chief. The majority consented. But Parnell, supported by a few of his followers, refused to accept British dictation, or to bow before the nonconformist conscience. The Irish party split up into the fiercely opposed factions of Parnellites and anti-Parnellites, whose abuse of each other did much to disgust their liberal allies. Parnell himself died in 1891, but the schism continued and lasted for nearly ten years, destroying much of the power of the Home Rule movement and the Irish party. Nine months after Parnell's death, Lord Salisbury dissolved Parliament, July 1892. At the general election which followed, there was visible that swing of the pendulum, which has usually been a feature of such times during the 19th century. An outgoing government has always offended some interests and disappointed others. There are always a certain number of voters who think it fair to give the other side a chance and vote for the opposition, whoever may be the ins or the outs. Though the Salisbury ministry had not been conspicuously unsuccessful at home or abroad, it found itself left in a minority when the elections were over. The Queen, therefore, sent for Mr. Gladstone and bade him form a liberal ministry. He had to face a difficult situation, for his majority was small and composed entirely of the Irish, very exacting, untrustworthy, and reckless supporters. The new Parliament showed 274 Gladstonians and 81 Irish home rulers, 269 conservatives, and 46 liberal unionists. Being compelled to rely on the Irish for his majority, Gladstone had to make home rule the main plank of his party platform. This was not at all to the taste of many of his British followers, who would have liked to give precedence to their own particular schemes, for the abolition of the House of Lords, the disestablishment of the Welsh and Scottish churches, the introduction of temperance legislation, of universal suffrage, and of numberless other local and sectional projects. In February 1893, Mr. Gladstone produced his second Home Rule Bill, which differed from the first mainly in providing Ireland with two, instead of one, Houses of Parliament, and in leaving at Westminster 80 Irish members, who were to vote on imperial, but not on purely British, concerns. Essentially, it was the same as its predecessor of 1885. The measure was debated with great fierceness, and at enormous length. It occupied the House of Commons from February to September, and was only carried finally when the discussion of many clauses had been stifled by the use of the closure. The third reading passed on September 1st by a majority of 34, 301 to 267 votes. The bill then went up to the House of Lords, who made short work of it, casting it out on September 8th by a majority of 10 to 1, 419 to 41. The conservative leaders had taken this bold step because they believed that the country at large was profoundly uninterested in the bill, and would view its rejection with equanimity. If it had been a really popular measure, the House of Lords would not have dared to deal with it in such a drastic fashion. By their abrupt action, they challenged Mr. Gladstone to a second appeal to the nation. 
if he chose to dissolve Parliament, held another general election, and was once more triumphant, the peers would have to bow to the general wish of the country. But Gladstone and his colleagues had no desire to try the experiment. While professing much righteous indignation, they proclaimed their determination to put home rule aside for the moment, and to proceed to the introduction of other measures of radical reform. This resolve incensed the Irish, on whom the government's majority depended, while the English radicals were so much split up into cliques with different ideals that it was hard to keep them together. The Gladstone government passed nothing but a parish council's bill, which extended to small communities that same power of governing themselves by elective boards, which the late conservative ministry had granted to the counties. In March 1894, the premier announced that he was compelled to retire from office by his increasing physical infirmities. Even his splendid constitution was at last giving way, and with no immediate prospect of carrying out any great measure before him, he had resolved to retire from public life. He was succeeded by Lord Rosebery, his foreign secretary, who was rather a type of the Whig than of the Radical. He had ably managed the external relations of Great Britain and had shown himself an exponent of colonial expansion rather than an anti-imperialist. Like many a Whig statesman of the 18th century, he was a keen lover of sport, and alone among British premiers has run winners for the Derby. He had never professed any great belief in or love for home rule. His character and his views seemed little adapted to make him an appropriate leader for the Gladstonian party. But as its ablest man, he was charged with the formation of the new ministry. His tenure of power lasted for 16 months, March 1894 to June 1895. It was mainly filled by a record of bills introduced, but never carried, a Welsh Disestablishment Act, an Irish Land Act, and a local option act to please the temperance party were all brought forward, but none reached fruition. The votaries of each measure hindered the progress of the others, and discussed that their own was not given priority. The party was rent by feuds and intrigues, and in disgust at the situation, Lord Rosebery took the opportunity of a casual vote on a small military matter, which had gone against the ministry, and dissolved Parliament. The ensuing general election resulted in the complete rout of the Liberal Party, they had been in power for three years, but had accomplished nothing, owing to their internal divisions and the necessary dependence on the Irish vote, which hampered all their enterprises. Tired of their futile proceedings, the electors made a clean sweep of them, and gave Lord Salisbury a majority even larger than he had possessed in 1886. The new House of Commons of August 1895 showed 340 conservatives and 71 liberal unionists, but only 177 liberals, with 70 anti-Parnellite and 12 Parnellite home rulers. Lord Salisbury's second ministry was differentiated from his first by the fact that it opened its ranks to the Liberal Unionists, Mr. Chamberlain representing the Radicals, and Lord Hartington representing the Whig wings of that party, received cabinet office, and minor posts went to their followers. This ministry was destined to see the century out, to survive the venerable Queen Victoria, and to face with success the ordeal of a general election, which no cabinet had done since Lord Palmerston's day. Its record has been a stormy one, mainly because it has carried out the mandate given to it in 1895, by taking in hand a strong imperial and colonial policy. In its first year, it became involved in a noisy quarrel with the President of the United States, who had interfered with language of an unnecessarily brusque and provocative kind in a frontier dispute concerning boundaries in Guiana, which had been forced upon Britain by the Republic of Venezuela. Fortunately, the cabinet kept cool, American feeling calmed down, and the dispute ended in a satisfactory arbitration, which gave us practically all that we had ever claimed. This dispute was in full career when a much more dangerous question was opened by the mad and piratical Jameson Reid. Ever since Mr. Gladstone had granted independence to the Transvaal Boers after the defeat of Majuba Hill, the condition of affairs in South Africa had grown progressively worse. The two races of white settlers in that region nourished incompatible ambitions. To the British colonists, it seemed natural and proper that all the southern end of the Dark Continent should some day federate itself under the Union Jack. The Dutch had another ideal, that of a Republican South Africa, in which their own nationality should be dominant. It was shared not only by the burghers of the Transvaal and the Orange River Free State, but by the larger part of the Dutch-born inhabitants of Cape Colony. These rival ideals were inevitably bound to lead to a collision. The Boers were much incensed at our annexations to the north of their homes, which in 1889 made Matabella Land and Mashona Land British and cut off from them the power of expanding towards the interior. The main agent in this advance had been Mr. Cecil Rhodes, the founder of the British South African Company, which first seized and exploited the coveted territories. This brought upon him much indignation from the Boers, and he was soon to merit more. 
Meanwhile, the British section in South Africa also had its grievances. The discovery of rich gold reefs in the Transvaal brought to that land a large mining population, mainly of British extraction, and led to the founding of the golden city of Johannesburg. Willing to profit from the discovery of the mines, but frightened and angered by the influx of aliens, the Transvaal government refused the settlers any of the duties and privileges of citizenship. Their autocratic ruler, President Kruger, a clever but narrow-minded and unscrupulous old man, made it the keystone of his policy to keep down the miners and refuse them all political rights. His corrupt and retrograde government irritated the Uitlanders, and in 1895 they formed a conspiracy to rise at Johannesburg and win their desire by armed rebellion. When the plot had come to a head, Dr. Jameson, a trusted lieutenant of Mr. Rhodes, crossed the British frontier with 500 mounted police and dashed for Johannesburg. He was surrounded, beaten, and captured with all his followers, whereupon the Uitlander malcontents also laid down their arms. On inquiry, it was found that Mr. Rhodes himself had a guilty knowledge of the plan, a thing utterly incompatible with his position as British Premier of Cape Colony. President Kruger imprisoned his captives for some time, and then fined them and let them go. The British government cashiered the officers concerned in the plot, but did nothing to Rhodes, though he soon lost his premiership at the Cape. An unwisely worded telegram of congratulation sent by the German emperor to Mr. Kruger caused considerable indignation in England and led to a temporary coolness between Berlin and London. But this was the smallest of the evil results of the Jameson raid, which embittered to an intolerable degree the already existing feud between the British and the Dutch inhabitants of South Africa. Yet it was to be nearly four years more before the steep-lying hatred led to open war. Meanwhile, there was a delusive interval of quiet, during which there took place the second jubilee of Queen Victoria, who had now reached the 60th year of her reign and the 78th of her life. It was celebrated, June 20th, 1897, with the deepest personal devotion to the aged sovereign, and with an even greater display of imperial sentiment all round the British world than had been seen in 1887. Ere three years had elapsed, it was to be proved that this display of loyalty to the crown and the empire from the British colonies was no vain show, but the manifestation of a very real solidarity of sentiment and interests. End of section 101. Section 102 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Binns. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 43. The Last Years of Queen Victoria. 1886-1901. to 1901. The South African War. 1899-1902. to 1902. Part 2. Domestic politics, meanwhile, remained barren and uninteresting. The government carried through nothing more than a few small measures of social reform, and an Irish Local Government Act, 1898, of doubtful expediency. But their opponents showed no rallying power. Mr Gladstone died on May the 19th, 1898, at the great age of 88. After his decease, his late followers were more divided than ever, and seemed unable to formulate any common political programme, or to discover any means of appealing to popular sentiment. The Radical Party changed its leader twice in three years, and could never make up its mind whether Home Rule was dead, or whether it had to be resuscitated as a war cry, with which Irish allies might be lured back to the fold. Meanwhile, foreign affairs once more grew threatening, and in 1898 we were to be upon the brink of a struggle with our nearest European neighbour. Ever since the Gladstone Ministry in 1885 abandoned the Sudan to the fanatic followers of the Mahdi, the southern frontier of Egypt had been exposed to the raids of the wild Sudanese. To end this nuisance, the Salisbury government resolved to undertake the reconquest of Khartoum and the destruction of the Mahdist power. In 1896, the first step was taken, when Sir Herbert Kitchener subdued Dongola and the northern provinces which obeyed the Khalifa Abdullah, the successor of the Mahdi. In 1898, an Egyptian army, strengthened by a large British contingent, marched under the same commander to complete the work. In a great battle outside Omdurman, the hordes of the Khalifa were routed, and he himself forced to fly into the desert, where he perished a year later in a small skirmish. But when Kitchener took over the administration of the reconquered lands, he was surprised to find a French force on the Upper Nile, 
at Fashoda, above Khartoum. A small expedition under a major marchand had pushed across from the Congo and established itself in the middle of one of the old Egyptian provinces where the tricolor had been hoisted, apparently with the intention of setting up a claim to territorial acquisitions in the Sudan. The French government had been warned long before that an invasion of this region would be regarded as an unfriendly act. It was now summoned to withdraw Marchand or face the consequences. For a moment, war seemed probable, but fortunately the ministers of the Republic faltered and withdrew their claim. This was a happy chance, as Great Britain a year later was to be engaged in another struggle, which would have taken a very different turn if we had already been engaged in hostilities with a great European power. In 1899, the South African problem, which had been growing more and more dangerous since the Jameson raid, came to a head. President Kruger had spent the time in accumulating enormous storms of arms and munitions of war from Europe, in concluding an offensive and defensive alliance with his neighbours of the Orange Free State, and in establishing relations with the discontented Dutch colonists of the Cape. This last was the most disquieting feature of the situation. An association called the Africanda Bond organised the colonial burghers into almost openly avowed hostility to the British connection, and manifested effusive sympathy with Kruger's policy. The old president's rule over the Eightlanders had become more oppressive than ever since the raid. He very naturally regarded these aliens as enemies, refused them any concessions, and maddened them with monopolies, corrupt legislation, and insulting speeches. In April 1899, a great petition signed by 21,000 British subjects in the Transvaal was sent to the Queen, setting forth their unhappy condition and begging that an inquiry might be made into their wrongs. This appeal led to the Bloemfontein Conference of May 1899, in which Sir Alfred Milner met President Kruger and tried to induce him to grant the Eightlanders the power of obtaining civic rights after five years' residence in the Transvaal. The President not only refused this, but disputed the existence of the British suzerainty over the Republic, established by the Convention of 1882. The negotiators parted in a state of mutual exasperation, Milner reporting to London that the British suzerainty was in danger, and that he could only get the most vague and illusory promises of concession for the Eightlanders, while Kruger told his Rad that though he did not desire war, he could not give way an inch. From this moment, armed strife was inevitable though the British government and nation do not seem to have realised the fact. Mr Chamberlain kept making proposals for a resumption of negotiations during the summer, but, after long delays, received in September nothing but a formal notice that the President disowned any British suzerainty over the Transvaal. This looked ominous, and the Cabinet resolved to reinforce the garrisons of the Cape and Natal, where in August there were in all only 6,000 troops. By September... This force was nearly tripled by battalions sent in from India and from the home stations. Then followed, to the intense surprise of all who had not been studying African politics very closely, an insulting ultimatum from Pretoria, to the effect that if the reinforcements were not at once withdrawn, a declaration of war would follow in 24 hours, October 9th, 1899. Next day, hostilities began, and the Boer army, which had been mobilising for many days, crossed the frontier of Natal. The Orange River Free State declared war on the same day. The strength of the two republics had been utterly miscalculated by the home authorities, even when they saw war impending. The burghers could put 70,000 well-armed mounted riflemen into the field, and were supplied with superabundant stores of modern cannon and munitions. They were also relying on the support of a general rebellion of the Cape Dutch, who had been secretly armed and organised during the preceding months. It was fortunate for Britain that the Boers' strategy was very bad. Instead of entering Cape Colony, where they could have raised the whole countryside in their aid, they sent their main army into Natal, and most of their other forces to besiege the outlying garrisons of Mafeking and Kimberley. This misdirection of their energy saved the British domination in South Africa. After a few preliminary skirmishes, the Burghers beat Sir George White, our commander in Natal, at the Battle of Lombard's Cop, October 30th. He retired into a fortified position at Ladysmith, 
trusting that the enemy would gather round him instead of pushing further into British territory. This expectation was correct. The burghers surrounded the 12,000 men concentrated at Ladysmith, built lines to shut them in, and worried them by a fruitless bombardment, but they did not attempt to close or to destroy the army by a general assault. The same took place in the other centres of strife, both at Mafeking and Kimberley, the enemy wasted their strength in tedious blockades, while the time of their predominance was passing away. During the first two months of the war, they had a threefold superiority of numbers, and only used it in shutting up the three garrisons. The British military authorities, still gravely underrating their adversaries, had dispatched in November an army corps of 40,000 men, which they thought sufficient to end the war. There was such a misconception of the numbers and fighting power of the Boers, that when the colonies began to offer aid, the war office actually told them that infantry would be preferred, for a campaign in which the enemy consisted entirely of lightly moving mounted riflemen. The command was given to Sir Redvers Buller, a veteran of the Zulu and Sudan wars, of whom much was expected. Buller went to Natal himself with 18,000 men, sending the rest of his troops to Cape Colony, where one column under Lord Methuen marched to relieve Kimberley, while another under General Gattaca moved up to suppress the rebellion already springing up in the northern parts of Cape Colony. Then followed the Black Week of December 9th to 16th, 1899. The force under Lord Methuen forced its way almost to Kimberley, after severe fighting, but on December 11th was beaten back with great loss from an attempt to storm by night the lines of Magusfontein. At the same time, the column under Gattaca was routed by the rebels at Stormberg, but the worst disaster was suffered by Buller himself. He found the main Boer army still round Ladysmith with a covering force arranged behind the Tugela in the lines of Calenzo. In an attempt to break through by a reckless and unskillful frontal attack, he suffered a complete defeat, losing ten guns and a thousand men. So entirely was his confidence destroyed that he suggested to Sir George White that he might have to surrender Ladysmith, and reported that the Colenso position could not be forced. Fortunately, the enemy did not take the offensive. Both at Magusfontein and at Colenso, they remained passive in their lines, and allowed the British to rally and reform. The only wise move which they made was to begin to send considerable forces into Cape Colony, where many districts at once rose in rebellion to aid them, but their main strength still lay round in the beleaguered towns of Ladysmith, Mafeking and Kimberley, where they accomplished nothing. The disasters of December caused intense dismay in England, but the cabinet and the nation faced the situation with coolness and determination. There was no panic, but only a resolve that the full force of the empire should be turned upon South Africa. Not only were the few remaining regular battalions from the home station sent out, and the militia mobilised for garrison duty, but a general appeal was made for volunteers both in Britain and in the colonies. It was at last realised that mounted men were required. The mother country gave 12,000 yeomanry at the first summons, but the colonies did even more, both Canada and Australia contributing men and horses with a liberality that was absolutely astounding. The Australian colonies in New Zealand sent to South Africa in the space of two years no less than 22,000 mounted rifles. The South African loyalists gave 12,000, Canada 6,000, and other colonies smaller numbers. But a new commander was even more needed than new troops. Lord Roberts, the hero of the Kabul-Kandahar march, was sent out to take charge of the war, with Lord Kitchener, the victor of Omdurman, as his chief of the staff. Even before the bulk of the reinforcements had arrived, The change in the direction of affairs was soon marked by a turn in the tide of success. Lord Roberts massed 35,000 men on the western line of advance, where Methuen was still standing at bay, opposite the entrenchments of Magus Fontaine. By a sudden flank march, he evicted the Boers from this position, relieved Kimberley, and captured General Cronier and 4,000 of the late besiegers at Paderberg, February 27th. Then, moving into the heart of the Orange Free State, he swept aside all opposition and occupied Bloemfontein, its capital, March 11th, 1900. 
Bula, meanwhile, with the army of Natal, made two more ill-managed attempts to relieve Ladysmith. They failed, but a third assault was more successful, and the Boer lines were pierced after much hard fighting, ending in the Battle of Peter's Hill. The enemy withdrew to defend the Transvaal, and Sir George White's garrison was relieved when it had been reduced to starvation point and was at the very end of its resources, February 29, 1900. The second period of the war had now arrived, in which the British could take the offensive. They had by this time a vast superiority of force, having 200,000 men in South Africa, while the Cape rebels had mostly surrendered, and many even of the burghers of the two republics had retired to their homes in despair. Lord Roberts brought the regular fighting to an end in two campaigns. During his first, April to May 1900, he fought his way to Johannesburg and Pretoria, and captured both places. After a short rest, he marched against the main Boer army, which had rallied in the eastern Transvaal, and forced it to disperse or to retire over the Portuguese frontier, August to September 1900. President Kruger fled to Europe with the state chest of the Republic, and devoted himself to the task of stirring up public opinion on the continent against Great Britain, a task in which he had only too much success. It had been hoped that when the regular resistance of the Boers ceased, the war would come to a speedy end. After Lord Roberts returned to England, the impression was strengthened almost to certainty. But a bitter disappointment awaited the British cabinet and nation. Instead of surrendering, the enemy broke up into guerrilla bands, which rode through the country cutting railways, capturing convoys, and destroying isolated detachments and small garrisons. There were still 40,000 of them in arms and such a force ranging over a country as large as France and Germany put together was most difficult to deal with. They maintained their desperate struggle for no less than 19 months, October 1900 to April 1902. Lord Kitchener finally had to subdue them by the method of attrition. It was only by constant drives, in which large numbers of mounted troops scoured the countryside to catch the bands, and by the building of lines of blockhouses across their favourite spheres of action, that the burghers were finally worn down. They displayed an enterprise and a reckless courage in these last months of the war, which they had been far from showing at its commencement. But at last, even their stubborn spirits were humbled to the idea of surrender. After more than half of them had been captured or slain, and when all their families had been removed to concentration camps, they opened negotiations. May 1902 and finally laid down their arms to the number of 21,000 men. Under a wise and conciliatory government, there seems no reason to doubt that they may ultimately become useful and trustworthy citizens of the British Empire, but it will try all the wisdom of the able administrator who now presides over all South Africa, from Cape Town to the Zambezi, to settle the multifarious problems which the war has left behind it. Meanwhile, Britain is quit of the most dangerous war which she has waged since Waterloo, a war which brought to light many faults in her military system and much incompetence among her generals, but which also revealed that the heart of her people was sound and the unity of her empire solid. It was a most reassuring sign that the nation paid no attention to the desperate attempts made to exploit the early disasters of the war for party purposes and to get up an agitation against the government. The movement fell flat, and at the general election, which occurred in the middle of the war, the Salisbury cabinet was replaced in power with a very large majority. Still more notable was the splendid loyalty with which the colonies rallied round the mother country in her day of need, and poured in their best fighting men for an imperial war, in which it might have been pleaded that they were not directly concerned. Not even the blindest observer can fail to see that it is futile to doubt any longer the existence of the imperial sentiment. It was a source of regret to every loyal inhabitant of the British dominions that the aged sovereign under whom the war began did not survive to see its victorious termination and to close her eyes on a world at peace. But Queen Victoria, whose powers had been slowly failing for the last year of her life, only just lived to see the new century, and expired on the 22nd of January, 1901. She was followed to the grave by the regrets of a people who realised fully what they owed to one who had been the model of constitutional sovereigns, and had set so high the standard of public as well of domestic duty. 
Personally, she had done more to secure the perpetuation of the British monarchy than even the most sanguine observer could have hoped when she came to the throne, an unexperienced girl of 18, in the year 1837. Surveying her eventful reign of 64 years, the longest in English history, with all its progress and endeavour, we trust that our descendants may look upon the Victorian age as not the least glorious period in our country's annals. End of section 102「Section 103 of A History of England」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman Chapter 44 India and the Colonies, 1815 through 1902, Part 1 down to the end of the great struggle with revolutionary and imperial France, the history of the rise and development of the British Empire beyond seas is intimately connected with the history of Britain's wars in Europe. The contest for colonial and commercial supremacy is at the root alike of the War of the Austrian Secession, the Seven Years' War, the War of American Independence, and the War with Bonaparte. But after 1815, this close interpenetration of the European and colonial affairs of England comes to an abrupt end. For the last 80 years, they have touched each other at very rare intervals. The only occasions of importance when European complications have reacted on our dominions overseas have been when our strained relations with Russia have led to troubles on the northwestern frontier of India. For the most part, the development of the colonial and Indian empire of Britain has gone on unvexed by any interference from without. We have therefore relegated our treatment of it to a separate chapter set apart from our domestic annals. In 1815, the British territories in India were already by far the most important of our possessions, but they comprise not one-fourth of the dominions which now acknowledge Edward VII as their direct sovereign. In Africa, we owned only a few fever-smitten ports on the Gulf of Guinea, and the newly annexed Dutch colony of the Cape of Good Hope, inhabited by a scanty and disaffected population of boars and a multitude of wild Kaffirs. In Australia, the small convict settlements of New South Wales and Tasmania gave little signs of development, blighted as they were by the unsatisfactory character of the unwilling emigrants. Our group of colonies in North America was the most promising possession of the crown, granted a liberal constitution by Pitt's Wise Canada Act. They were growing rapidly in wealth and population. They had shown a most commendable loyalty during the American War of 1812-14 to and the divergence in race and religion between the old French habitants of the province of Quebec and the new English settlers in Upper Canada had not as yet brought any trouble. But the greatest part of British North America was still a wilderness. The limit of settled land was only just approaching Lake Huron. Even in the more eastern provinces, such as Quebec and Nova Scotia, there were still vast, unexplored tracts of waste and forest. Into the far west, the basins of the Columbia and Mackenzie Rivers, only a few adventurers, fur traders of the Hudson's Bay Company, and French half-breed trappers had as yet penetrated. The West Indian colonies, somewhat increased in number by the results of our wars between 1793 and 1815, had suffered many evils from French privateering and Negro rebellions, but were now at the height of their prosperity. Vigorously, if recklessly developed by the slave-owning planters, they were at this moment the main producers of sugar and coffee for the whole world. The colonies of France and Spain had suffered so fearfully that they could hardly attempt competition. Other outlying possessions were in the hands of England, some destined to prosperity, some to obscurity, such as Mauritius, the Falklands, St. Helena, Bermuda, but we have no space for more than a hasty mention of them. The history of the more important groups, 
India, Australia, Canada, and South Africa requires a more detailed treatment. At the Great Peace of 1815, we were masters in northern India of the great province of Bengal, lately increased by the northwest provinces, the territory between Allahabad and Delhi, which we had taken from the Sindhya in 1801 through 1803. We had also annexed in the same year the possessions of the Raja of Barar in Orissa. These three tracts constituted the presidency of Bengal and were governed from Calcutta. South of Orissa, the whole east coast of Hindustan was in our hands, the Carnatic having been annexed in 1799. The Carnatic, the lands taken from Sultan Tipu and the Sirkars, which the Nizam had ceded to us, formed the presidency of Madras. Our possessions in this quarter were completed by Ceylon, which we had acquired from the Dutch at the Treaty of Amiens. In western India, the Bombay presidency consisted as yet of no more than the islands of Bombay and Salset, and a few ports along the coast. But in addition to these dominions ruled directly by the company, English influence was predominant in a much larger tract of India. The Nawab of Oud in the north, the Nizam in the Deccan, the Raja of Mysore in the south, the Peshwa in the west, and many smaller princes were all bound to us by subsidiary treaties. They had covenanted to guide their foreign policy by our own and to supply us with troops and subsidies in time of war. In all the Indian peninsula, there were only three groups of states which were still independent of the British power. The more remote Maratha powers, the realms governed by the Sindhya, Holkar, Gaikwar, and the Raja of Barar, were still, for all intents and purposes, autonomous. The treaties which Lord Wellesley had made with them were not enforced by his weaker successors, and the Maratha princes continued their feuds with each other and their incursions into those parts of India which were not yet under British control. Their chief victims were the unfortunate states of Rajputana, where a cluster of native princes of ancient stock were as yet unprotected by the treaties with the East India Company. Beyond the Rajputs lay the third district of India, which was still independent, the Sikh principality of the Punjab. The Sikhs were a sect of religious enthusiasts who had revolted against the misgovernment of the great Mughal some fifty years before, and had formed themselves into a disorderly commonwealth. But one great chief, Ranjit Singh, had taught them to combine and forced them into union. He ruled them for many years and organized the whole sect into an army which combined the courage of fanaticism with the strictest discipline. He was friendly to the British and took care never to come into collision with them. Thus, in 1815, the British in India held a position dominating half the peninsula, but unprovided with any solid frontier on the land side. They were charged with the care of several weak and imbecile dependent states, surrounded by greedy and vigorous neighbors. Unless they were to make up their minds to go back, they were bound to go forward, for no final peace was possible till it should be settled whether the East India Company or the Marathas and Sikhs were to be the dominating power in the whole land between the Indus and the Bay of Bengal. The first important advance after the departure of Wellesley was made by the Marquis of Hastings, Governor-General, from 1814 to 1823. This active ruler was resolved not to permit the petty insults to British territory and the plundering of British allies, which the unsettled condition of the frontier made possible. In 1814, he attacked and drove back into their hills the Gurkhas, the hill tribes of Nepal, who had been wont to harass the northern frontier of Bengal and Oud. They offered a desperate resistance, but when once beaten, became the fast friends of the British, and have given valuable aid in every war which we have since waged in India." 
The Nepal War having ended in 1815, Hastings took a larger matter in hand. The dominions of our vassal, the Nizam, and the other princes of central India were much vexed by the Pindaris, organized bands of marauders, like the free companies of the Middle Ages, who found harborage in the territories of the Marathas, and when not employed in the civil wars of those chiefs, plundered on their own account all over the Deccan, under the great captain of adventurers named Chitu. These hordes became a public danger to all India. Hastings had them hunted down and destroyed by armies which started simultaneously from Madras, Bengal, and Bombay. They were completely exterminated, and their leader, Chitu, fled alone to the jungle and was devoured by a tiger. The Pindaris had long received the secret countenance of the Maratha chiefs, and while the British were still engaged in chasing the marauders, three of the great chiefs of western India took arms. The Peshwa Baji Rao was anxious to free himself from the dependence which Wellesley had imposed on him in 1801. He conspired with the Raja of Berar and the regents who ruled for the young Holkar. But the event of the Third Maratha War, 1817-18, through 18, was not for a moment doubtful. The Allied chiefs never succeeded in joining each other. Baji Rao was defeated in front of Pune by a mere handful of British troops, and after long wanderings was forced to lay down his arms and surrender. The army of the Holkar state was routed after a much harder struggle at Mahidpur. The hordes of the Raja of Berar fled before 1,500 British troops at Sitabaldi. Each of the Confederates fought for his own hand without aid from his neighbor, and all alike were crushed. The campaign of 1817 through 18 made an end of the independence of the Marathas. The Peshwa's whole realm was annexed to the Bombay presidency. He himself was sent to live on a government pension at Kanpur, far away in Oud. One-third of the dominions of Holkar was confiscated. The Raja of Berar was deposed. Stringent terms of subjection were imposed on both their states. All the Maratha principalities now came under British control. For Sindhya and the Gaikor of Baruta, who had taken no part in the war, consented to sign treaties which made them the vassals of the company. The same position was gladly assumed by the chiefs of Rajputana, who had suffered many ills at the hands of their Maratha neighbors and were only too glad to gain immunity from assault under the protection of the company's flag. In all India, only the realm of Ranjit Singh beyond the Sutlej was now outside the sphere of British influence. Owing to the wisdom of that aged prince, it was to be yet many years before the English and the Sikhs came into collision. For some years after the victories of Lord Hastings in 1817 through 18, India enjoyed a term of comparative peace. Lord Amherst and Lord William Bentinck, the two next governor generals, were more noted for the internal reforms which they carried out than for the wars which they waged. The only important annexation of the period 1823 through 35 resulted from a struggle with a power which lay altogether outside the bounds of India. The king of Burma assailed the eastern limits of Bengal and was punished by being deprived of Assam and Arakan. But the times of Lord Amherst and Lord William Bentick have a far better distinction from the liberal measures of reform which they introduced than from any annexations. The latter governor-general, a man of strong will and a very enlightened mind, put down the horrible practice of suti, or widow-burning, and crushed the thugs, the disguised gang-robbers who infested the roads and took life half for plunder and half as a religious sacrifice. He lent his support to Christian missions, which the company had hitherto discouraged from a dread of offending native susceptibilities. He introduced steamships on the Ganges and worked out a scheme for the carrying of the mails to Europe by way of the Red Sea and the short overland journey from Suez to Alexandria. But this wise plan was not finally adopted till many years after.
In 1833, while Lord William Bentick was still in power, the East India Company's charter from the Crown ran out and was only renewed by the Whig government of Lord Grey on the condition that the company should entirely give up its old commercial monopolies and confine itself to the exercise of patronage and the duties of administration. For the last 25 years of its rule, the tone of the great corporation was vastly improved. Now, the dividends were not the sole aim of its directors. End of section 103. Section 104 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 44. India and the Colonies, 1815 through 1902, Part 2. In 1836, Lord Auckland took over the Governor-Generalship. His tenure of power is mainly notable for the commencement of the disastrous First Afghan War. Frightened by the intrigues of the Russians with Dust Muhammad, the ruler of Afghanistan, Lord Auckland unwisely determined to interfere with the internal politics of that barren and warlike country. There was living in exile in India Shah Suja, a prince who had once ruled at Kabul, but had long been driven out by his countrymen. The governor-general determined to restore him by force of arms and to make him the vassal of England. Though we could only approach Afghanistan by crossing the neutral territory of the Sikhs, this distant enterprise was taken in hand. An English army passed the Suleiman Mountains, occupied Kandahar, stormed Ghuzni, and finally entered Kabul, 1839. Shah Suja was placed on his ancient throne, and part of the victorious troops were withdrawn to India. But the Afghan tribes hated the nominee of the stranger and refused to obey the Shah. Lord Auckland was compelled to leave an English force at Kandahar and another at Kabul to support his feeble vassal. For two uneasy years, the garrison held its own, 1839 through 41, against sporadic risings. But in the winter of 1841-42, a general insurrection of the whole of the tribes of Afghanistan swept all before it. The very townsmen of Kabul took arms and murdered the English resident almost under the eyes of the Shah. General Elphinstone, who commanded the brigade at Kabul, was a feeble old invalid. He allowed himself to be shut up in his entrenched camp, saw his supplies cut off, and was finally compelled to make a retreat in the depth of winter after signing a humiliating treaty with the Afghan chiefs and giving them hostages. But the treacherous victors attacked the retreating army as it struggled through the snow of the Kurd Kabul Pass and massacred the whole force. One British regiment, three sepoy regiments, and 12,000 camp followers were cut to pieces. Only a single horseman, Dr. Bryden, made his way through to Jalalabad, the nearest English garrison, to bear the tidings of the annihilation of the whole army. Sah Suja was murdered by his rebellious subjects, and all Afghanistan was lost save the two fortresses of Kandahar and Jalalabad, whose gallant defense forms the only redeeming episode in the war. But to revenge our disaster, if for no better purpose, a new English army under General Pollock forced the Khyber Pass, defeated the Afghans, and reoccupied Kabul. They evacuated it after destroying its chief buildings, and Dust Mohammed, whom we had deposed in 1839, was permitted to return to the throne from which we had evicted him. For long years after we left Afghanistan alone, the memory of the massacre in the Kurd Kabul Pass sufficing to deter even the most enterprising governor generals from interfering with its treacherous and fanatical tribes. 
Ere the Afghan war was over, Lord Auckland had been superseded by Lord Ellenborough, an able and active ruler whose qualities were only marred by a tendency to grandiloquence and proclamations in the style of the great Napoleon. He not only brought the Afghan war to its close, but annexed Sinda, the barren lower valley of the Indus. We were drawn into a quarrel with the emirs of that country, and it was overrun by a small army under Sir Charles Napier, who beat the emirs at Mini, though their forces outnumbered him twelvefold. Sinda was annexed to the Bombay presidency, and by its possession we encompassed on two sides the Punjab, the only remaining independent state in India. Ranjit Singh had died in 1839, and his successors were weak princes who perished in civil wars or by palace conspiracies. They were utterly unable to restrain their arrogant and unruly army, which made and unmade sovereigns at Lahore like the Roman Praetorians of the 3rd century. In 1845, the rash and ignorant generals of the Sikhs resolved to attack the British and dreamed of overrunning all India. They crossed the Sutlej and invaded the northwestern provinces ere the new governor-general, Lord Hardinge, had fully realized that war was at hand. Our Sikh wars saw the hardest fighting which has ever taken place in India. The army which Ranjit Singh had spent his life in training was a splendid force and proved able in the shock of battle to beat the sepoys of the company. It was only by the desperate fighting of the British troops, little aided by their native auxiliaries, that the Sikhs were finally driven back. Unfortunately, Lord Goff, the commander-in-chief, was a reckless general, whose only idea of tactics was to dash his men at the center of the enemy's position, regardless of batteries, obstacles, and earthworks. A more circumspect officer could probably have attained his end at much less cost of life. At Ferozeshah, he was completely foiled in his first attempt to force the entrenched camp of the Sikhs and only succeeded on the next day because the enemy, who had suffered as heavily as the British, had not the heart to stand up to a second battle within 24 hours and retired from his position. Sobran, the decisive engagement of the campaign, was even more bloody, but on this occasion the Sikhs fought with the Sutlej at their backs, and when at last they were driven from their lines, a fourth of their army perished in the river, February 10, 1846. The Lahore government then asked for peace, which was granted them on condition that Dulip Singh, the young son of Runjit Singh, should acknowledge the suzerainty of the British. But the brave and obstinate Sikhs did not yet consider themselves beaten. Less than two years after the first struggle was over, they again tried the fortune of war. In March 1848, Mulraj, the governor of Multan, rose in rebellion to throw off the British suzerainty. The whole Sikh army fell away to him, and a campaign not less desperate than that of 1845-6 began. Lord Goff, who was still in command, repeated his former tactics at Chilianwala and flung his army against a line of batteries hidden by jungle. The British only carried them with heavy loss, the 24th foot being completely cut to pieces. The old general's disregard for common prudence and the lives of his men so irritated his officers that when they again met the enemy at the decisive battle of Guzerat, February 22, 1849, they clandestinely confined him on a housetop till the Sikh entrenchments had been pounded for three hours by an overwhelming fire of artillery. The British infantry were then let loose, carried the earthworks with little loss, and brought the campaign to a prompt end, for the whole Sikh army surrendered a few days later, March 12, 1849. The Punjab was now annexed, for Lord Dalhousie, the governor-general who had succeeded Lord Hardinge, did not intend to give the Sikhs the opportunity of raising a third war. Dulip Singh, the titular Maharaja, was sent to live in England on a pension. 
Certain outlying districts, such as Kashmir, were left to chiefs who had not opposed us in the struggle of 1848. But Lahore and the whole of the plain of the Five Rivers were put under British rule. The officers to whom the settlement of the Punjab was given over were the picked men of India. So ably and genially did they do their work that the Sikhs soon settled down into quiet and loyal subjects. When next the British Empire in Hindustan was in danger, it was largely saved by the gallant aid of levies from the Punjab. After the great struggle with the Sikhs was over, the rest of Lord Dalhousie's administration was comparatively uneventful. The Second Burmese War of 1852, provoked by the ill-treatment of English merchants at Rangoon, was a short and easy campaign, which resulted in the annexation of Pegu, the coast district of the Burmese kingdom, and the mouths of the Irrawaddy. But some of the doings of Dalhousie in India itself, though they made little noise at the time, were fated to have grave consequences. He held strongly the doctrine that direct British administration was the best thing for natives, and took every opportunity of annexing vassal states where the ruling houses died out. This was much against the prejudices of the Hindus, who always try to perpetuate their family by adoption when natural heirs fail. By refusing to allow of this custom, Lord Dalhousie was able to annex the great Maratha state of the Rajas of Berar, the old opponents of Wellesley and Hastings. He also took over the smaller Maratha states of Hansi and Satara and refused to allow the deposed Peshwa Baji Rao to pass on his title and pension to his adopted son, the Nana Sahib. There is no doubt that these acts gravely displeased pious Hindus. Moreover, in 1856, Dalhousie, more by the company's wish than by his own, completed his wide annexations by dethroning the king of Oud, the chief Muslim state of northern India and the oldest of the vassals of the British. His abominable misgovernment and folly drew down his fate deservedly enough, but the seizure of Oud was not popular even among the subjects who were delivered from the tyrant's rule, and it created a feeling of distrust and resentment among all the surviving feudatories of the company. End of Section 104 Section 105 of A History of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of England by Charles Oman. Chapter 44. India and the Colonies, 1815 through 1902. Part 3. Lord Dalhousie, broken down by hard work, returned to England to die, soon after the annexation of Oud. He was succeeded by Lord Canning, the son of the great Tory Prime Minister of 1827. Scarcely had Canning gathered up the reins of power when the terrible Sepoy Mutiny of 1857 broke out. A power which undertakes to hold down a vast empire by a great mercenary army raised from among the peoples of the land is always exposed to the danger of military rebellion. The army has no other incentives than its pay, its habit of disciplined obedience, and its loyalty to its officers to keep it true to its foreign masters. If the soldiery realize their power and are ready to unite with each other for a common end, they may aspire to cast out their employers and rule for their own benefit. Mutinies of single regiments were not unfrequent episodes in the history of the Indian army, but hitherto no general revolt had occurred. In 1857, the proportion of British to native troops in India was abnormally low, the regiments withdrawn for the Crimean War had never been replaced, and small expeditions to Persia and China were absorbing many more. In the whole peninsula, the Europeans stood to the sepoy troops in the ratio of only one to six. At present, one to three is considered the least that is safe. 
Moreover, the spirit of many of the native troops was very bad. They had been so flattered and pampered by the government that they believed themselves to be the masters of the situation and despised the few white regiments scattered among them. The army was arrogant and discontented. The old ruling families of the lately annexed states were intriguing and conspiring all over northern India. A widely spread prophecy that the rule of the British was only to last for a hundred years, dating from Plassey and the annexation of Bengal, was disturbing the minds of the masses when a trivial incident let loose the elements of discord. The government was introducing among the native troops the use of rifles in place of the old musket. The new weapons required greased cartridges, which were duly issued, when some mischievous incendiary spread among the Bengal sepoys the rumor that they were being defiled. The cartridges, it was said, were lubricated with the grease of pigs and cattle in order that the Hindus might lose their caste by touching the flesh of the sacred cow, and the Muslims might be polluted by the contamination of the unholy swine. When all had become unclean, it was said, the government intended to make Christians of them. This foolish rumor sufficed to set the army in a flame. Two regiments, which mutinied near Calcutta, were easily disbanded, but a formidable and successful revolt of the Sepoy Brigade at Meerut near Delhi, May 10, 1857, was the signal for the outbreak of well-nigh the whole Bengal army. In the months of May and June, more than 40 garrisons in the valleys of the Ganges and the Jumna mutinied. In most cases, their rising was followed by hideous cruelty. The European officers were treacherously shot and hundreds of women and children massacred. Both Hindus and Muslims eagerly joined the rising, but the main guidance of the mutiny was in the hands of the latter. They proclaimed the descendant of the great Mughal, who still resided at Delhi, the heir of the empire of his ancestors. Delhi itself, where there was no British garrison, fell into their hands after the great magazine had been blown up by the desperate courage of Lieutenant Willoughby. The ancient city became the center of the rebellion in the north, while further south, in Oud, the whole population rose in arms to restore their late king and beleaguered in the residency of Lucknow the one British regiment which formed part of the garrison of the newly annexed state. Except in Oud and certain parts of the northwest provinces, the rebellion was purely military, and the peasantry preserved a timid neutrality in the strife. But the whole Bengal army, with hardly an exception, rose, or tried to rise, against its masters. Fortunately for England, the mutiny did not affect the Madras presidency at all, and only spread to a small corner of the Bombay presidency. But all northern India, from Benares to the Sutlej, was lost for a time. Unwarlike Bengal remained quiet, and the Punjab, where English regiments were more numerous than in any other part of India, was kept under control by its able governor, Sir John Lawrence. But all that lay between them was a seething flood of rebellion, where a few English garrisons lay scattered like islands in a tempestuous sea. Agra, Kanpur, Lucknow, Allahabad were all insufficiently held. Only at the third of them was there so much as a single regiment of British infantry. While the authorities at Calcutta were collecting the few European troops who could be gathered from Burma and Madras and were making desperate appeals for prompt aid from home, the governor of the Punjab struck the first blow for the reconquest of the lost provinces. 4,000 Europeans and some hastily raised Sikh levies crossed the Sutlej and marched on Delhi, now held by at least 30,000 mutineers. They defeated the rebels in the field and commenced the siege of the royal city on June 10, 1857. This bold move threw the enemy on the defensive, and the rising spread no further in the north. 
But Delhi was beleaguered for 14 weeks, and even when every available British soldier had been drawn from the Punjab, the storming of the place was a hazardous task, only carried to a successful end by the reckless courage of the assailants. After six days of deadly street fighting, September 14th through 20th, 1857, the rebels were driven out, and their titular leader, the aged Grand Mogul, with all his family, was captured. Bahandur Shah himself was only banished to Burma, but his sons and grandson were shot without trial by Major Hodson, the daring cavalry officer who had tracked and captured them. While the siege of Delhi was still in progress, a small force had been collected at Calcutta and hurried northward to attack Oud and relieve the beleaguered garrisons of Kanpur and Lucknow. General Havelock commanded this brigade, a mere handful of 1,200 men. He pushed on from Allahabad on June 30, but when he had cut his way to Kanpur after four considerable fights, he found that he was too late. The small garrison there, hampered with many hundreds of women and children, had held out for a month, but surrendered on June 27th to the chief of the rebels, Nana Sahib, the adopted son of the late Peshwa, whose pension and title had been denied him. This revengeful and treacherous ruffian promised the besieged a safe passage to Allahabad, but as soon as they had evacuated their entrenchments, he massacred them all in cold blood, save two hundred women and children, whom he saved alive. When the news of Havelock's victorious advance was heard, he had these poor survivors hacked to death and cast into the famous Well of Kanpur, July 15th. The British brigade cut its way into the city a day too late to save the prisoners, but was able to wreak a terrible vengeance on their murderers, though the Nana himself, to the bitter disappointment of all, got safely away and died a fugitive in the jungles of Nepal. Havelock had to wait some time at Kanpur for reinforcements before he could march on Lucknow, where the garrison, some 1,000 strong, had maintained themselves for 87 days behind the walls of the hastily fortified residency. The much-tried defenders were cheered by the arrival of Havelock, who, with 3,000 men, forced his way into the residency after a day's street fighting. But 60,000 rebels, the whole fighting population of the province of Oud, still hung round the place, and Havelock could not drive them away. The final relief of Lucknow was only accomplished by Lord Clyde, the Colin Campbell of the Crimean War, who had arrived in India with the first reinforcements from home. On November 9th, he swept away the rebels and liberated the garrison. But Havelock died the very day after he and his troops were delivered. Lord Clyde drew back to Kanpur with the rescued garrison, leaving Lucknow to be reoccupied by the rebels. He was forced to turn because the Maratha army of Sindhya had just revolted and joined the Oud insurgents. Clyde beat them on December 6th, just outside Kanpur, and drove them back on to central India. The final stage of the war was reached in March 1858, when Clyde marched for the second time against Lucknow, stormed the city, and drove the remnants of the rebel army of Oud to Bareilly, where they were crushed in the last general engagement but one of the war, May 7th. Meanwhile, Sir Hugh Rose had collected an army from the Bombay Presidency and overrun Sindhya's dominions and Bundelkhand, where the rebellion of the Marathas had been headed by the Rani of Hansi and Tantia Tope, a clever leader of irregular troops. On June 16th, he beat them in front of Gwalior, and the Rani was slain, and her army dispersed. But Tantia Tope took to the jungles and was not finally caught and hung till the spring of the succeeding year. Thus ended the Great Mutiny of 1857-58, a ferocious struggle in which the treachery and cruelty of the sepoys were amply punished by the ruthless severity of their victors, who gave no quarter, blew prominent traitors from the cannon's mouth, and hung meaner prisoners by the hundred.
the English nation were convinced that something must be done to reform the administration of India, and the East India Company was abolished by Act of Parliament in 1858, the whole administration, civil and military, of the peninsula being now taken over by the Queen's government. To mark that no blame was thrown on the Governor General, Lord Canning, whose conduct all through the war had been most cool and courageous, he was made the first viceroy of the new empire. Since the mutiny, the annals of India have been comparatively peaceful, and hardly a shot has been fired within the bounds of the peninsula. The history of the last thirty years has been a record of growing prosperity, of the development of trade and industries, the building of railways and canals, and the marvelous increase of seaborne trade. Since the Suez Canal has brought India so close to Europe, the arable land is everywhere encroaching on the jungle, and the main difficulty of the future appears likely to be the overgrowth of population in the thickly settled districts, where, more than once, a year of dearth has slain thousands and brought tens of millions to the edge of starvation. The terrible Madras famine of 1877, the worst of its kind, is said to have cost the lives of 1,500,000 peasants. The one great warlike episode in the history of British India remaining to be chronicled is the Second Afghan War of 1878-80. to This struggle was a consequence of the Russo-Turkish War of the previous year and of the estrangement between Russia and England which resulted therefrom. Lord Lytton, the Viceroy of the years 1876 to 80, was a disciple of Lord Beaconsfield and a believer in a spirited foreign policy. He found that Shir Ali, the emir of Afghanistan, was intriguing with the Russian governor of Turkestan and promptly summoned him to sign a treaty of alliance and receive a British resident at his court. The emir refused and at once saw his dominions invaded. When General Roberts stormed the Paywar Kotal and advanced within a few miles of Kabul, the emir fled towards the Russian frontier and died on the way. His son, Yakub Khan, accepted the British suzerainty and promised all that was required. But when the army had retired, the populace of Kabul rose just as in 1842 and murdered Sir Louis Cavagnari, the British resident and all his escort. A second invasion at once began, and Yakub Khan was deposed and sent to India. Lord Lytton would probably have annexed the whole country but for the troubles which broke out in the winter of 1879-80 when the Afghan tribes took arms and assailed the garrisons of Kabul and Kandahar. Roberts was besieged in his entrenchments at Kabul but finally drove off the insurgents and held his own. But in the south, General Burroughs, advancing to attack the pretender Ayub Khan, was totally defeated at Maywand with the loss of half his brigade and chased back into Kandahar. He was only saved by the rapid and masterly march of Roberts, who in 23 days forced his way from Kabul to Kandahar, routed the army of the Ayub, and liberated the Kandahar garrison September 1st, 1880. But the disaster of Maywand had troubled English public opinion, and a liberal government had now replaced Lord Beaconsfield at home. Afghanistan was evacuated, and Abdur Rahman Khan, a nephew of Shir Ali, was recognized as ruler of the whole country, where he maintained himself with success till his death in 1901, and proved faithful to the English alliance. Perhaps Lord Lytton's administration may ultimately be remembered less for his unhappy Afghan war than for his proclamation of the Queen as Empress of India in the great Durbar held in Delhi in 1877. This step marked the commencement of a new and more intimate relation of England and India, of which an earnest had been given two years before by the Prince of Wales's tour through the peninsula. Since then, every attempt has been made to enlist the sympathies of the natives on behalf of the British rule. 
their princes have been encouraged to visit England to interest themselves in public works, education, and internal reforms, and to supply troops for the general service of the empire. Elective municipalities have been created in the cities to teach their motley population the art of self-government, which they are still very far from having learnt. A share in the administration, which some think unduly large, is granted to native civil servants, and the native press has been granted a liberty which it often abuses. All financial and agrarian legislation is framed to press as lightly as possible on the masses, but the results of these efforts are still somewhat problematic, and the British bayonet is still needed to keep the peace between contending races and creeds. End of section 105section 106 of a history of england this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a history of england by charles oman chapter 44 india and the colonies 1815 to 1902 part 4 in strong contrast with the stirring annals of British India are the unromantic details of the development of our Australian colonies. We have alluded to the uncompromising foundation of our first establishment in Botany Bay by the dispatch thither of the gangs of convicts who in an earlier age used to be sent into servitude in America, 1788. For many years, this annual crop of ruffianism swamped all attempts at real colonization in New South Wales. But after a time, the extraordinary fertility of the soil began to attract more immigrants, while the mitigation of the English penal law under the hands of Sir Robert Peel decreased the number of convicts. As the free population grew, they began to protest so strongly against the companions who were drafted in upon them that the government diverted the stream of convicts to new settlements in Tasmania and Western Australia. For long years, New South Wales remained a purely pastoral colony, and its immense plains were inhabited only by the squatters, the proprietors, who had bought large tracts of land from the government. They dwelt in stations thinly scattered over the face of the country, rearing vast herds of cattle and sheep. It was as exporting wool, hides, and tallow alone that Australia first became known to the commercial world of Europe. In 1851, however, an enormous difference was made by the discovery of rich alluvial gold deposits near Port Phillip on the southern shore of New South Wales. The washings proved so productive that thousands of immigrants of all sorts and conditions poured in to profit by them. The Port Phillip district was cut off from New South Wales and made into the new colony of Victoria, 1851. Its population went up from 80,000 to 450,000 in the ten years that followed the discovery of gold. When the alluvial deposits were exhausted, it was found that large reefs of auriferous quartz lay below them, and a steady development of scientific mining by machinery superseded the haphazard work of the early diggers. Victoria still continues one of the great gold-producing centers of the world. New South Wales still remains a mainly pastoral country, though here, too, considerable gold fields have been found. After throwing off its southern districts to form the colony of Victoria, it ceded its northern territory to form the colony of Queensland, 1859. The semi-tropical climate of this last province differentiates it from the rest of Australia. The great heat makes European labor difficult during the greater part of the year. South Australia, settled in 1836, is mainly an agricultural country with some copper mines. Western Australia, originating in a convict settlement in 1829, has lagged behind the rest of the sister colonies for want of any of the natural advantages which attract immigrants. But the tardy discovery of gold in 1892 may suffice at last to draw thither the much-needed population. 
Tasmania, originating like Western Australia in a penal colony, has developed into a small island community of steady prosperity. Far to the east of Australia lie the twin islands of New Zealand, first explored by Captain Cook in 1773, but not planted with English colonists till 1839. Unlike the aborigines of Australia, the lowest and feeblest savages in the world, the natives of New Zealand were a fierce and clever race of cannibals named Maoris. They bitterly resented the settlement of their islands and raised two considerable wars, for the second of which, 1861 through 66, British troops had to be brought to this remote colony and had hard work to expel the Maoris from their pas, or stockades. After their defeat, they quieted down and are now slowly dying out before the progress of civilization, which seems fatal to them, though they are a vigorous and intelligent race. New Zealand more resembles Great Britain in climate and situation than does any other of our colonies and has enjoyed a long career of prosperity, somewhat checked of late by a tendency to a rash extension of the public debt. Passing westward across the Indian Ocean, we come to the second great group of English colonies, those of South Africa. The old Dutch dominion of the Cape of Good Hope was conquered by the British in 1806 and secured to us by the Treaty of Vienna in 1815. It reached only as far as the Orange River and was thinly settled by Dutch farmers, or Boers, scattered among a population of Kaffirs, whom they had in many cases reduced to slavery. When English emigration was directed to the Cape, the Boers resented the intrusion of the foreigner, and many of them trekked, that is to say migrated, into the wilderness to conquer new homes among the Kaffirs. But the British government followed them and annexed their first settlement in Natal, 1843. They then moved inland and finally established, 1852-54, to the two republics of the Orange Free State and the Transvaal, which still remain, though each of them was for a short time under British control. The history of the Cape Colony till within the last few years was one of comparatively slow development and of frequent Kaffir wars. No less than eight such struggles with the natives are recorded between 1815 and 1881, some of them of considerable length and difficulty. Each led to an annexation till at last all of the countries south of the Orange River had passed into the hands of the settlers though large reserved tracts were set aside for the native tribes. Meanwhile, the Dutch and English colonists held apart and have always remained more or less estranged. The first rapid development of the settlement began in 1867, when the discovery of diamond mines in Griqualand West, beyond the Orange River, led to the northward extension of the British boundary, to the grave discontent of the Boers of the Orange Free State. 1872. The great mining town of Kimberley has arisen as the center of this arid but busy district. The most formidable difficulty which the English have met in South Africa came from the annexation of the Transvaal in 1877. The Boers of that republic, having engaged themselves in dangerous wars with the natives, Lord Beaconsfield's government resolved to place them under British rule. This was done, and, as heirs to the Boers' quarrels, we fought out the Sanguinary Zulu War of 1879. The Zulus, an immigrant tribe from the north, had built up a military monarchy over their neighbors under a despot named Chaka, who had disciplined them and formed them into regiments in imitation of European organization. We made war on his grandson, Setsueo, and incurred, on our first meeting with the formidable Zulu army, the disaster of Izangela, where a whole British battalion and 1,000 native auxiliaries were exterminated to the last man. It required the dispatch of 10,000 men from England under Sir Garnet Wolsey and three sharp battles at Eco, Kambula, and Ulundi to break Setsueo's army and restore the prestige of the British arms. Hardly was the Zulu war over when the Boers of the Transvaal revolted and defeated the small British force in Natal at Langsneck and Majuba Hill. 
We have related elsewhere how the Gladstone government thereupon made peace and gave the Boers their independence. The history of British Africa during the years 1885 to 95 was mainly the story of a scramble with the other European powers for the possession of the unoccupied parts of the continent. Since the Germans began to seize large tracts of southern Africa and the French to extend their power into the Sahara and the Valley of the Niger, the British government was forced in self-defense to make similar seizures in order to prevent its colonies from being cut off from the interior. This has resulted in the annexation of three great tracts, one reaching from the Orange River and Griqualand up to the Zambezi and circling round three sides of the Transvaal Republic, a second round Lake Nyasa, a third further north including a slip of coast about Mombasa and Witu and running up inland to the great equatorial lakes which feed the Nile so as to include the kingdom of Uganda. At the same time, the Niger Company has been allowed to establish a protectorate over the lower valley of that great river, where a colony is being built up which throws into the shade the old pestilential seaports at Sierra Leone and on the Gold Coast, which were once the only British possessions in Guinea. The annals of South Africa from the day of the Jameson Raid, December 29, 1895, onward have possessed so much more than local importance that they will be found recorded in the general chapter dealing with the closing years of Queen Victoria. The history of British colonies in North America is of a very different character from that of British South Africa. We have spoken in an earlier page of the gallant aid which the colonists gave England in her struggle with the United States during the years 1812 through 15. When the excitement of this war had died down, there arose a slowly increasing estrangement between the two provinces of Upper and Lower Canada. The English settlers of the former and the old French habitants of the latter were separated from each other by race, language, religion, and prejudices. They were, moreover, administered as wholly different colonies. Gradually, a dangerous spirit developed itself among the French Canadians, who complained that their governors and officials were unsympathetic and chafed against the limited self-government allowed them by Pitt's Canada Act of 1791. Even some of the settlers of the upper province expressed disloyal sentiments on this latter grievance and spoke of asking for annexation to the United States. This discontent took shape in the Canadian Rebellion of 1837, a movement almost entirely confined to the French-speaking districts and easily suppressed by the Loyalists, aided by a few British troops. After investigating the grievances which had led to the rising, the home government resolved to unite the two provinces into a single colony, that the French districts might be more closely linked to and controlled by the English. At the same time, a more liberal measure of self-government was conceded. The Constitution for the Future comprised an elective lower house and an upper house of life members, who stood to the governor much as the two houses of the English Parliament stand to the Queen. 1840 The most important event in the history of British North America has been the federation of all its colonies into the single Dominion of Canada in the years 1867 through 1871. The danger which the British possessions had experienced during the threatened war with the United States in 1862 and the Fenian invasions of 1866 through 7 impelled the provinces toward the Union which gives strength. Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, British Columbia consented to federate themselves with Canada. Only the remote and thinly populated fishing station of Newfoundland has preferred to remain outside the alliance. The four other colonies send deputies to the Dominion Parliament, which meets at Ottawa, though they retain for local purposes provincial legislatures of their own. The Canadian Pacific Railway was completed in 1885 so that free communication exists across the whole continent from Nova Scotia to British Columbia. Since then, the broad plains between the Great Lakes and the Rocky Mountains are being rapidly peopled. 
the old settlement of Manitoba and the newer provinces of Assiniboia, Saskatchewan, and Alberta are all being put under the plow or turned into cattle runs. Our general survey of the history of the British colonial empire brings us to the topic which will be all important in the 20th century, the practicability of imperial federation. At the present moment, the crown is the only formal link between the many colonies and possessions over which the Union Jack floats. Is a closer connection desirable and practicable? May we look forward to a firm and well-compacted league of all the British lands. Such a union might almost control the world, but it is hard to bring about. First among the difficulties in the way is the doubt whether Great Britain would ever allow herself to be outvoted by her colonies in an imperial parliament, and whether Canada would submit to the dictation of Australia or Australia to the dictation of South Africa in matters where their interests clashed. Next comes the question of free trade and protection. Most of the colonies are zealously protectionist in spirit, and as a condition of federation, they would probably demand that the mother country should give their goods a preference over those of foreign states by means of a revised customs tariff. A third set of objections turn on the likelihood of the colonies refusing to countenance the purely European policy of England. A fourth and formidable question is the place which India would have to take in the Confederacy. She is not yet fit for self-government and equal partnership with the rest. If she were, the votes of her 250 million inhabitants would swamp those of all of the other members of the League. Yet none of these difficulties appear wholly insuperable. The idea of Federation is in the air both in Great Britain and in her daughter states. The day has long gone by when a not inconsiderable number of English statesmen looked forward to the time when the colonies should, as it was phrased, cut the painter and steer their own course. The consciousness of common origin and interests grows stronger. The interdependence of the mother country and her colonies is more realized. The development of rapid communication by sea and land makes the distance between the various British communities in different hemispheres less felt as every year rolls by. Facts like the splendid aid granted by all the colonies for the late South African War speak for themselves. But there are still difficulties in the way. If local jealousies prevail and the English-speaking peoples drift asunder, each must be content to play a comparatively unimportant part in the annals of the 20th century. If, on the other hand, the project of Federation can be worked out to a successful end, the future of the world lies in the hands of the Anglo-Saxon race. End of Section 106 End of A History of England by Charles Oman